Chapter 34 The Last Village It was after dark when they reached Carysford, longer than Rand had thought it would take from what Master Kinch said when he let them down. He wondered if his whole sense of time was getting skewed. Only three nights since Howell Goad and Four Kings, two since Peter had surprised them in Market Sheeran. Just a bare day since the nameless dark friend woman tried to kill them in the stable of the Queen's man. But even that seemed a year ago, or a lifetime. Whatever was happening to time, Carysford appeared normal enough, on the surface at least. Neat vine-covered brick houses and narrow lanes, except for the Camelin Road itself, quiet and outwardly peaceful. But what's underneath? he wondered. Market Sheeran had been peaceful to look at, and so had the village where the woman... He had never learned the name of that one, and he did not want to think about it. Light spilled from the windows of the houses into streets all but empty of people. That suited Rand. Slinking from corner to corner, he avoided the few people abroad. Matt stuck to his shoulder, freezing when the crunch of gravel announced the approach of a villager, dodging from shadow to shadow when the dim shape had gone past. The river carry was a bare thirty paces wide there, and the black water moved sluggishly, but the ford had long since been bridged over. Centuries of rain and wind had worn the stone abutments until they seemed almost like natural formations. Years of freight wagons and merchant trains had ground at the thick wooden planks, too. Loose boards rattled under their boots, sounding as loud as drums. Until long after they were through the village and into the countryside beyond, Rand waited for a voice to demand to know who they were. Or worse, knowing who they were. The countryside had been filling up the further they went, becoming more and more settled. There were always the lights of farmhouses in sight. Hedges and rail fences lined the road and the fields beyond. Always the fields were there, and never a stretch of woods close to the road. It seemed as if they were always on the outskirts of a village, even when they were hours from the nearest town. Neat and peaceful, and with never an indication that dark friends or worse might be lurking. Abruptly Matt sat down in the road. He had pushed the scarf up on top of his head now that the only light came from the moon. Two paces to the span, he muttered. A thousand spans to the mile, four miles to the league. I'm not walking another ten paces unless there's a place to sleep at the end of it. Something to eat wouldn't be amiss either. You haven't been hiding anything in your pockets, have you? An apple, maybe? I won't hold it against you if you have. You could at least look. Rand peered down the road both ways. They were the only things moving in the night. He glanced at Matt, who had pulled off one boot and was rubbing his foot. Or they had been. His own feet hurt, too. A tremor ran up his legs as if to tell him he had not yet regained as much strength as he thought. Dark mounds stood in a field just ahead of them. Haystacks, diminished by winter feeding, but still haystacks. He nudged Matt with his toe. We'll sleep there. Haystacks again. Matt sighed, but he tugged on his boot and got up. The wind was rising, the night chill growing deeper. They climbed over the smooth poles of the fence and quickly were burrowing into the hay. The tarp that kept the rain off the hay cut the wind, too. Rand twisted around in the hollow he had made until he found a comfortable position. Hay still managed to poke at him through his clothes, but he had learned to put up with that. He tried counting the haystacks he had slept in since Whitebridge. Heroes in the stories never had to sleep in haystacks or under hedges. But it was not easy to pretend any more that he was a hero in a story, even for a little while. With a sigh, he pulled his collar up in the hopes of keeping Hay from getting down his back. Rand, Matt said softly. Rand, do you think we'll make it? Tarvalin? It's a long way yet, but... Camelin. Do you think we'll make it to Camelin? Rand raised his head, but it was dark in their burrow. The only thing that told him where Matt was was his voice. Master Kinch said two days. Day after tomorrow, the next day, we'll get there. If there aren't a hundred dark friends waiting for us down the road, or a fade or two. There was silence for a moment, then Matt said, I think we're the last ones left, Rand. He sounded frightened. 
Whatever it's all about, it's just us two now. Just us. Rand shook his head. He knew Matt could not see in the darkness, but it was more for himself than Matt anyway. Go to sleep, Matt, he said tiredly. But he lay awake a long time himself before sleep came. Just us. A cock's crow woke him, and he scrambled out into the false dawn, brushing hay off his clothes. Despite his precautions, some had worked its way down his back. The straws clung between his shoulder blades, itching. He took off his coat and pulled his shirt out of his breeches to get to it. It was while he had one hand down the back of his neck and the other twisted up behind him that he became aware of the people. The sun was not yet truly up, but already a steady trickle moved down the road in ones and twos, trudging toward Camelon, some with packs or bundles on their backs, others with nothing but a walking staff, if that. Most were young men, but here and there was a girl or someone older. One and all they had the travel-stained look of having walked a long way. Some had their eyes on their feet and a weary slump to their shoulders, early as it was. Others had their gaze fixed on something out of sight ahead, something toward the dawn. Matt rolled out of the haystack, scratching vigorously. He only paused long enough to wrap the scarf around his head. It shaded his eyes a little less this morning. You think we might get something to eat today? Rand's stomach rumbled in sympathy. We can think about that when we're on the road, he said. Hastily arranging his clothes, he dug his share of their bundles out of the haystack. By the time they reached the fence, Matt had noticed the people, too. He frowned, stopping in the field while Rand climbed over. A young man not much older than they glanced at them as he passed. His clothes were dusty, and so was the blanket roll strapped across his back. "'Where are you bound?' Matt called. "'Why, Camelin, for to see the dragon!' the fellow shouted back without stopping. He raised an eyebrow at the blankets and saddlebags hanging from their shoulders and added, Just like you! With a laugh he went on, his eyes already seeking eagerly ahead. Matt asked the same question several times during the day, and the only people who did not give much the same answer were local folk. If those answered at all, it was by spitting and turning away in disgust. They turned away, but they kept a watchful eye, too. They looked at all the travelers the same way out of the corners of their eyes. Their faces said strangers might get up to anything if not watched. People who lived in the area were not only wary of the strangers, they seemed more than a little put out. Just enough people were on the road, scattered out just enough, that when farmers' carts and wagons appeared with the sun peeking over the horizon, even their usually slow pace was halved. None of them was in any mood to give a ride. A sour grimace and maybe a curse for the work they were missing were more likely. The merchants' wagons rolled by with little hindrance beyond shaken fists, whether they were going toward Camelin or away from it. When the first merchant's train appeared early on in the morning, coming at a stiff trot with the sun barely above the horizon behind the wagons, Rand stepped out of the road. They gave no sign of slowing for anything, and he saw other folks scrambling out of the way. He moved all the way over onto the verge, but kept walking. A flicker of motion as the first wagon rumbled close was all the warning he had. He went sprawling on the ground as the wagon driver's whip cracked in the air where his head had been. From where he lay, he met the driver's eyes as the wagon rolled by. Hard eyes above a mouth in a tight grimace. Not a care that he might have drawn blood or taken an eye. Light blind you! Matt shouted after the wagon. You can't! A mounted guard caught him on the shoulder with the butt of his spear, knocking him down atop Rand. Out of the way, you dirty dark friend, the guard growled without slowing. After that they kept their distance from the wagons. There were certainly enough of them. The rattle and clatter of one hardly faded before another could be heard coming. Guards and drivers, they all stared at the travelers heading for Camelin as if seeing dirt walk. Once Rand misjudged a driver's whip just by the length of the tip. Clapping his hand to the shallow gash over his eyebrow, he swallowed hard to keep from vomiting at how close it had come to his eye. The driver smirked at him. With his other hand, he grabbed Matt to stop him knocking an arrow. Let it go, he said. He jerked his head at the guards riding alongside the wagons. Some of them were laughing. Others gave Matt's bow a hard eye. If we're lucky, they'd just beat us with their spears. If we're lucky. 
Matt grunted sourly, but he let Rand pull him on down the road. Twice squadrons of the Queen's guards came trotting down the road, streamers on their lances fluttering in the wind. Some of the farmers hailed them, wanting something done about the strangers, and the guards always paused patiently to listen. Near midday, Rand stopped to listen to one such conversation. Behind the bars of his helmet, the guard captain's mouth was a tight line. If one of them steals something or trespasses on your land, he growled at the lanky farmer frowning beside his stirrup, I'll haul him before a magistrate. But they break no queen's law by walking on the queen's highway. But they're all over the place, the farmer protested. Who knows who they are or what they are? All this talk about the dragon. Light, man, you only have a handful here. Camelin's walls are bulging with them, and more coming every day. The captain's scowl deepened as he caught sight of Rand and Matt standing in the road nearby. He gestured down the road with a steel-backed gauntlet. Get on with you, or I'll have you in for blocking traffic. His voice was no rougher with them than with the farmer, but they moved on. The captain's eyes followed them for a time. Rand could feel them on his back. He suspected the guards had little patience left with the wanderers and no sympathy for a hungry thief. He decided to stop Matt if he suggested stealing eggs again. Still, there was a good side to all the wagons and people on the road, especially all the young men heading for Camelin. For any dark friends hunting them, it would be like trying to pick out two particular pigeons in a flock. If the murder all on winter night had not known exactly who it was after, maybe its fellow would do no better here. His stomach rumbled frequently, reminding him that they had next to no money left, certainly not enough for a meal at the prices charged this close to Camelin. He realized once he had a hand on the flute case, and firmly pushed it around to his back. Goad had known all about the flute and the juggling. There was no telling how much Baalzamon had learned from him before the end, if what Rand had seen had been the end, or how much had been passed to other dark friends. He looked regretfully at a farm they were passing. A man patrolled the fences with a pair of dogs, growling and tugging at their leashes. The man looked as if he wanted nothing more than an excuse to let them loose. Not every farm had the dogs out, but no one was offering jobs to travelers. Before the sun went down, he and Matt walked through two more villages. The village folk stood in knots, talking among themselves and watching the steady stream pass by. Their faces were no friendlier than the faces of the farmers, or the wagon drivers, or the queen's guards. All these strangers going to see the false dragon. Fools who did not know enough to stay where they belonged. Maybe followers of the false dragon. Maybe even dark friends. If there was any difference between the two. With evening coming, the stream began to thin at the second town. The few who had money disappeared into the inn though there seemed to be some argument about letting them inside. Others began hunting for handy hedges or fields with no dogs. By dusk he and Matt had the Camelin Road to themselves. Matt began talking about finding another haystack, but Rand insisted on keeping on. As long as we can see the road, he said, the further we go before stopping, the further ahead we are. If they are chasing you, why should they chase now? when they've been waiting for you to come to them so far. It was argument enough for Matt. With frequent glances over his shoulder, he quickened his step. Rand had to hurry to keep up. The night thickened, relieved only a bit by scant moonlight. Matt's burst of energy faded, and his complaints started up again. Aching knots formed in Rand's calves. He told himself he had walked further in a hard day working on the farm with Tam, but repeated as often as he would, he could not make himself believe it. Gritting his teeth, he ignored the aches and pains and would not stop. With Matt complaining and him concentrating on the next step, they were almost on the village before he saw the lights. He tottered to a stop, suddenly aware of a burning that ran from his feet right up his legs. He thought he had a blister on his right foot. At the sight of the village lights, Matt sagged to his knees with a groan. Can we stop now? he panted. Or do you want to find an inn and hang out a sign for the dark friends? Or a fade? The other side of the town, Rand answered, staring at the lights. From this distance, in the dark, it could have been Eamon's Field. What's waiting there? Another mile, that's all. 
All? I'm not walking another span. Rand's legs felt like fire, but he made himself take a step and then another. It did not get any easier, but he kept on, one step at a time. Before he had gone ten paces, he heard Matt staggering after him, muttering under his breath. He thought it was just as well he could not make out what Matt was saying. It was late enough for the streets of the village to be empty, though most houses had a light in at least one window. The inn in the middle of town was brightly lit, surrounded by a golden pool that pushed back the darkness. Music and laughter, dimmed by thick walls, drifted from the building. The sign over the door creaked in the wind. At the near end of the inn, a cart and horse stood in the Camelin Road with a man checking the harness. Two men stood at the far end of the building, on the very edge of the light. Rand stopped in the shadows beside a house that stood dark. He was too tired to hunt through the lanes for a way around. A minute resting could not hurt. Just a minute. Just until the men went away. Matt slumped against the wall with a grateful sigh, leaning back as if he meant to go to sleep right there. Something about the two men at the rim of the shadows made Rand uneasy. He could not put a finger on anything at first, but he realized the man at the cart felt the same way about them. He reached the end of the strap he was checking, adjusted the bit in the horse's mouth, then went back and started over from the beginning again. He kept his head down the whole while, his eyes on what he was doing and away from the other men. It could have been that he simply was not aware of them, though they were less than fifty feet off, except for the stiff way he moved and the way he sometimes turned awkwardly in what he was doing so he would not be looking toward them. One of the men in the shadows was only a black shape, but the other stood more into the light with his back to Rand. Even so, it was plain he was not overjoyed at the conversation he was having. He wrung his hands and kept his eyes on the ground, jerking his head in a nod now and then at something the other had said. Rand could not hear anything, but he got the impression that the man in the shadows was doing all the talking. The nervous man just listened and nodded and wrung his hands anxiously. Eventually, the one who was wrapped in darkness turned away, and the nervous fellow started back into the light. Despite the chill, he was mopping his face with the long apron he wore, as if he were drenched in sweat. Skin prickling, Rand watched the shape moving off in the night. He did not know why, but his uneasiness seemed to follow that one, a vague tingling in the back of his neck and the hair stirring on his arms, as if he had suddenly realized something was sneaking up on him. With a quick shake of his head, he rubbed his arms briskly. Getting as foolish as Matt, aren't you? At that moment the form slipped by the edge of the light from a window, just on the brink of it, and Rand's skin crawled. The inn sign went scree, scree, scree in the wind, but the dark cloak never stirred. Fade, he whispered, and Matt jerked to his feet as if he had shouted. What? He clamped a hand over Matt's mouth, softly. The dark shape was lost in the darkness. Where? It's gone now, I think. I hope. He took his hand away. The only sound Matt made was a long, indrawn breath. The nervous man was almost to the inn door. He stopped and smoothed down his apron, visibly composing himself before he went inside. Strange friends you've got, Raymond Holdwin, the man by the cart said suddenly. It was an old man's voice, but strong. The speaker straightened, shaking his head. Strange friends in the dark for an innkeeper. The nervous man jumped when the other spoke looking around as if he had not seen the cart and the other man until right then. He drew a deep breath and gathered himself, then asked sharply, "'And what do you mean by that, Alman Bunt?' "'Just what I said, Holdwin. Strange friends. He's not from around here, is he? Lot of odd folk coming through the last few weeks. Awful lot of odd folk. "'You're a fine one to talk,' Holdwin cocked an eye at the man by the cart. "'I know a lot of men, even men from Camelin.' Not like you, cooped up alone out on that farm of yours. He paused, then went on as if he thought he had to explain further. He's from Four Kings, looking for a couple of thieves, young men. They stole a Heronmark sword from him. 
Rand's breath had caught at the mention of Four Kings. At the mention of the sword, he glanced at Matt. His friend had his back pressed hard against the wall and was staring into the darkness with eyes so wide they seemed to be all whites. Rand wanted to stare into the night, too. The half-man could be anywhere. But his eyes went back to the two men in front of the inn. A Heronmark sword, Bunt exclaimed. No wonder he wants it back. Holdwin nodded. Yes, and them too. My friend's a rich man, a, a merchant, and they've been stirring up trouble with the men who work for him, telling wild stories and getting people upset. They're dark friends, and followers of Loghain, too. Dark friends and followers of the false dragon, and telling wild stories, too. Getting up to a lot for young fellows. You did say they were young. There was a sudden note of amusement in Bunt's voice, but the innkeeper did not seem to notice. Yes, not yet twenty. There's a reward, a hundred crowns in gold, for the two of them. Holdwin hesitated, then added, They've sly tongues, these two. The light knows what kind of tales they'll tell, trying to turn people against one another. And dangerous, too, even though they don't look it. Vicious. Best you stay clear if you think you see them. Two young men, one with a sword, and both looking over their shoulders. If they're the right ones, my, my friend will pick them up once they're located. You sound almost as if you know them to look at. I'll know them when I see them, Holdwin said confidently. Just don't try to take them yourself. No need for anyone to get hurt. Come tell me if you see them. My friend will deal with them. A hundred crowns for the two, but he wants the pair. A hundred crowns for the two, Bunt mused. How much for this sword he wants so bad? Abruptly, Holdwin appeared to realize the other man was making fun of him. I don't know why I'm telling you, he snapped. You're still fixed on that fool plan of yours, I see. Not such a fool plan, Bunt replied placidly. There might not be another false dragon to see before I die, light send it so, and I'm too old to eat some merchant's dust all the way to Camelon. I'll have the road to myself, and I'll be in Camelon bright and early tomorrow. To yourself? The innkeeper's voice had a nasty quiver. You can never tell what might be out in the night, Almond Bunt. All alone on the road, in the dark. Even if somebody hears you scream, there's no one will unbar a door to help. Not these days, Bunt. Not your nearest neighbor. None of that seemed to ruffle the old farmer at all. He answered as calmly as before. If the Queen's guards can't keep the roads safe this close to Camelon, then we're none of us safe, even in our own beds. If you ask me, one thing the guards could do to make sure the roads are safe would be to clap that friend of yours in irons, sneaking around in the dark, afraid to let anybody get a look at him. Can't tell me he's not up to no good. Afraid? Holdwin exclaimed. You old fool, if you knew— His teeth clicked shut abruptly, and he gave himself a shake. I don't know why I'm wasting time on you. Get off with you. Stop cluttering up the front of my place of business. The door of the inn boomed shut behind him. Muttering to himself, Bunt took hold of the edge of the cart seat and set his foot on the wheel hub. Rand hesitated only a moment. Matt caught his arm as he started forward. Are you crazy, Rand? He'll recognize us for sure. You'd rather stay here, with a fade around? How far do you think we'll get on foot before it finds us? He tried not to think of how far they would get in the cart if it found them. He shook free of Matt and trotted up the road. He carefully held his cloak shut so the sword was hidden. The wind and the cold were excuse enough for that. I couldn't help overhearing you're going to Camelon, he said. Bunt gave a start, jerking a quarterstaff out of the cart. His leathery face was a mass of wrinkles, and half his teeth were gone, but his gnarled hands held the staff steady. After a minute he lowered one end of the staff to the ground and leaned on it. So you two are going to Camelon. To see the dragon, eh? Rand had not realized that Matt had followed him. Matt was keeping well back, though, out of the light, watching the inn and the old farmer with as much suspicion as he was the night. The false dragon, Rand said with emphasis. Bunt nodded. Of course, of course. He threw a sideways look at the inn, then abruptly shoved his staff back under the cart seat. Well, if you want a ride, get in. I've wasted enough time. He was already climbing to the seat. Rand clambered over the back as the farmer flicked the reins. 
Matt ran to catch up as the cart started off. Rand caught his arms and pulled him aboard. The village faded quickly into the night at the pace bunt set. Rand lay back on the bare boards, fighting the lulling creak of the wheels. Matt stifled his yawns with a fist, warily staring into the countryside. Darkness weighed heavily on the fields and farms, dotted with the lights of farmhouses. The lights seemed distant, seemed to struggle vainly against the night. An owl called, a mourner's cry, and the wind moaned like lost souls in the shadow. It could be out there anywhere, Rand thought. Bunt seemed to feel the oppression of the night, too, for he suddenly spoke up. You two ever been to Caneland before? He gave a little chuckle. Don't suppose you have. Well, wait till you see it. The greatest city in the world. Oh, I've heard all about Ilion and Ibu Dar, and Tyr and all. There's always some fool thinks a thing is bigger and better just because it's off somewheres over the horizon. But for my money, Camelin is the grandest there is. Couldn't be grander. No, it couldn't. Unless maybe Queen Morgay's the light illumine her got rid of that witch from Tarvalon. Rand was lying back with his head pillowed on his blanket roll atop the bundle of Tom's cloak, watching the night drift by, letting the farmer's words wash by him. A human voice kept the darkness at bay and muted the mournful wind. He twisted around to look up at the dark mass of Bunt's back. You mean an Aes Sedai? What else would I mean? Sitting there in the palace like a spider. I'm a good queen's man, never say I'm not. But it just isn't right. I'm not one of those saying Elida's got too much influence over the queen, not me. And as for the fools who claim Elida's really the queen in all but name, he spat into the night. That for them. Morgay's is no puppet to dance for any Tarvalon witch. Another eyes Sedai. If... When Moiraine got to Camelin, she might well go to a sister eyes Sedai. If the worst happened, this Elida might help them reach Tarvalon. He looked at Matt, and just as if he had spoken aloud, Matt shook his head. He could not see Matt's face, but he knew it was fixed in denial. Bunt went right on talking, flicking the reins whenever his horse slowed, but otherwise letting his hands rest on his knees. I'm a good queen's man, like I said. But even fools say something worthwhile now and again. Even a blind pig finds an acorn sometimes. There's got to be some changes. This weather, the crops failing, cows drying up, calves and lambs born dead or with two heads. Bloody ravens don't even wait for things to die. People are scared. They want somebody to blame. Dragon's fang turning up on people's doors. Things creeping about in the night. Barns getting burned. Fellows around like that friend of Holdwin scaring people. The Queen's got to do something before it's too late. You see that, don't you? Rand made a non-committal sound. It sounded as if they had been even luckier than he had thought to find this old man and his cart. They might not have gotten further than that last village if they had waited for daylight. Things creeping about in the night. He lifted up to look over the side of the cart at the darkness. Shadows and shapes seemed to writhe in the black. He dropped back before his imagination convinced him there was something there. Bunt took it for agreement. Right. I'm a good queen's man, and I'll stand against any who try to harm her— but I'm right. You take the Lady Elaine and the Lord Gawain now. There's a change wouldn't harm anything and might do some good. Sure, I know we've always done it that way in Andor. Send the daughter heir off to Tarvalon to study with the Aes Sedai and the eldest son off to study with the warders. I believe in tradition, I do. But look what it got us last time. Luke dead in the blight before he was ever anointed First Prince of the Sword, and Tigraine vanished run off or dead, when it came time for her to take the throne. Still troubling us that. There's some saying she's still alive, you know, that Morgay's isn't the rightful queen, bloody fools. I remember what happened, remember like it was yesterday. No daughter heir to take the throne when the old queen died, and every house in Andor scheming and fighting for the right. And Tarengale Domadred. You wouldn't have thought he'd lost his wife— him hot to figure which house would win so he could marry again and become prince consort after all. Well, he managed it. Though why Morgays chose... Ah, no man knows the mind of a woman, and a queen is twice a woman. Wed to a man, 
went to the land. He got what he wanted anyway, if not the way he wanted it. Brought Kyrie Ann into the plotting before he was done, and you know how that ended. The tree chopped down and black-veiled Aiel coming over the dragon wall. Well, he got himself decently killed after he'd fathered Elaine and Gawain, so there's an end to it, I suppose. But why send them to Tarvalon? It's time men didn't think of the throne of Andor and Aes Sedai in the same thought any more. If they've got to go someplace else to learn what they need, well, ilion has got libraries as good as Tarvalon, and they'll teach the Lady Elaine as much about ruling and scheming as ever the witches could. Nobody knows more about scheming than an Ilioner, and if the guards can't teach the Lord Gawain enough about soldiering, well, they've soldiers in Ilion too, and in Shinar and Tyr, for that matter. I'm a good queen's man, but I say let's stop all this truck with Tarvalon. Three thousand years is long enough, too long. Queen Morgays can lead us and put things right without help from the White Tower. I tell you, there's a woman makes a man proud to kneel for her blessing. Why, once Rand fought the sleep his body cried out for, but the rhythmic creak and sway of the cart lulled him, and he floated off on the drone of Bunt's voice. He dreamed of Tam. At first... They were at the big oak table in the farmhouse, drinking tea while Tam told him about prince consorts and daughter heirs and the dragon wall and black-veiled Aielman. The Heronmark's sword lay on the table between them, but neither of them looked at it. Suddenly he was in the westwood, pulling the makeshift litter through the moonbright night. When he looked over his shoulder, it was Tom on the litter, not his father, sitting cross-legged and juggling in the moonlight. "'The queen is wed to the land.' Tom said as brightly colored balls danced in a circle. But the dragon, the dragon is one with the land, and the land is one with the dragon. Further back, Rand saw a fade coming, black cloak undisturbed by the wind, horse ghosting silently through the trees. Two severed heads hung at the Murdra Al's saddlebow, dripping blood that ran in darker streams down its mount's coal-black shoulder. Lan and Moiraine, Faces distorted in grimaces of pain. The fade pulled on a fistful of tethers as it rode. Each tether ran back to the bound wrists of one of those who ran behind the soundless hooves, their faces blank with despair. Matt and Perrin. And Egwene. Not her! Rand shouted. The light blast you, it's me you want, not her! The halfman gestured, and flames consumed Egwene, flesh crisping to ash, bone blacking and crumbling. The dragon is one with the land, Tom said, still juggling unconcernedly, and the land is one with the dragon. Rand screamed and opened his eyes. The cart creaked along the Camelin Road, filled with night and the sweetness of long-vanished hay and the faint smell of horse. A shape blacker than the night rested on his chest, and eyes blacker than death looked into his. "'You are mine,' the raven said, and the sharp beak stabbed into his eye. He screamed as it plucked his eyeball out of his head. With a throat-ripping shriek he sat up, clapping both hands to his face. Early morning daylight bathed the cart. Dazed he stared at his hands. No blood. No pain. The rest of the dream was already fading, but that. Gingerly he felt his face and shuddered. At least, Matt yawned, cracking his jaws, at least you got some sleep. There was little sympathy in his bleary eyes. He was huddled under his cloak with his blanket roll doubled up beneath his head. He talked all bloody night. You all the way awake? Bunt said from the driver's seat. Gave me a start, you did, yelling like that. Well, we're there. He swept a hand out in front of them in a grand gesture. Camelin, the grandest city in the world. Chapter 35 Camelin Rand twisted up to kneel behind the driver's seat. He could not help laughing with relief. We made it, Matt. I told you we'd... Words died in his mouth as his eyes fell on Camelin. After Berlin, even more after the ruins of Shadar Logoth, he had thought he knew what a great city would look like. But this, this was more than he would have believed. 
Outside the great wall, buildings clustered as if every town he had passed through had been gathered and set down there, side by side, and all pushed together. Inns thrust their upper stories above the tile roofs of houses, and squat warehouses, broad and windowless, shouldered against them all. Red brick and grey stone and plastered white, jumbled and mixed together, they spread as far as the eye could see. Berlin could have vanished into it without being noticed, and Whitebridge swallowed up twenty times over with hardly a ripple. And the wall itself, the sheer fifty-foot height of pale grey stone streaked with silver and white, swept out in a great circle, curving to north and south till he wondered how far it must run. All along its length towers rose, round and standing high above the wall's own height, red and white banners whipping in the wind atop each one. From inside the wall, other towers peeked out, slender towers even taller than those at the walls, and domes gleaming white and gold in the sun. A thousand stories had painted cities in his mind, the great cities of kings and queens, of thrones and powers and legends, and Camelin fit into those mind-deep pictures as water fits into a jug. The cart creaked down the wide road toward the city, toward tower-flanked gates, the wagons of a merchant's train rolled out of those gates, under a vaulting archway in the stone that could have let a giant through, or ten giants abreast. Unwalled markets lined the road on both sides, roof tiles glistening red and purple with stalls and pens in the spaces between. Calves bawled, cattle lowed, geese honked, chickens clucked, goats bleated, sheep baaed, and people bargained at the top of their lungs. A wall of noise funneled them toward the gates of Camelin. What did I tell you? Bunt had to raise his voice to near a shout in order to be heard. The grandest city in the world. Built by Ogre, you know. Least the inner city and the palace were. It's that old Camelin is. Camelin, where good Queen Morgays the light illumine her, makes the law and holds the peace for Andor. The greatest city on earth. Rand was ready to agree. His mouth hung open, and he wanted to put his hands over his ears to shut out the din. People crowded the road as thick as folk in Eamon's field crowded the green at Beltine. He remembered thinking there were too many people in Berlin to be believed, and almost laughed. He looked at Matt and grinned. Matt did have his hands over his ears, and his shoulders were hunched up as if he wanted to cover them with those, too. "'How are we going to hide in this?' he demanded loudly when he saw Rand looking. How can we tell who to trust with so many? So bloody many! Light the noise! Rand looked at Bunt before answering. The farmer was caught up in staring at the city, with the noise he might not have heard anyway. Still Rand put his mouth close to Matt's ear. How can they find us among so many? Can't you see it, you wool-headed idiot? We're safe if you ever learn to watch your bloody tongue. He flung out a hand to take in everything, the markets, the city walls still ahead. Look at it, Matt. Anything could happen here, anything. We might even find Moiraine waiting for us, and Egwene and all the rest. If they're alive. If you ask me, they're as dead as the Gleeman. The grin faded from Rand's face, and he turned to watch the gates come nearer. Anything could happen in a city like Camelin. He held that thought stubbornly. The horse could not move any faster, flapped the reins as Bunt would. The closer to the gates they came, the thicker the crowd grew, jostling together, shoulder to shoulder, pressing against the carts and wagons heading in. Rand was glad to see a good many were dusty young men, afoot with little in the way of belongings. Whatever their ages, a lot of the crowd pushing toward the gates had a travel-worn look, rickety carts and tired horses, clothes wrinkled from many nights of sleeping rough, dragging steps and weary eyes. But weary or not, those eyes were fixed on the gates as if getting inside the walls would strip away all their fatigue. Half a dozen of the Queen's guards stood at the gates, their clean red and white tabards and burnished plate and mail a sharp contrast to most of the people streaming under the stone arch. Backs rigid and heads straight, they eyed the incomers with disdainful wariness. It was plain they would just as soon have turned away most of those coming in. Aside from keeping a way clear for traffic leaving the city, though, and having a hard word with those who tried to push too fast, they did not hinder anyone. "'Keep your places. Don't push. Don't push the light blind you. There's room for everybody, the light help us. Keep your places.' 
Bunt's cart rolled past the gates with the slow tide of the throng. Into Camelon. The city rose on low hills like steps climbing to a center. Another wall encircled that center, shining pure white and running over the hills. Inside that were even more towers and domes, white and gold and purple, their elevation atop the hills making them seem to look down on the rest of Camelon. Rand thought that must be the inner city of which Bunt had spoken. The Camelon Road itself changed as soon as it was inside the city, becoming a wide boulevard, split down the middle by broad strips of grass and trees. The grass was brown and the tree branches bare, but people hurried by as if they saw nothing unusual, laughing, talking, arguing, doing all the things that people do, just as if they had no idea that there had been no spring yet this year and might be none. They did not see, Rand realized, could not or would not. Their eyes slid away from leafless branches, and they walked across the dead and dying grass without once looking down. What they did not see, they could ignore. What they did not see was not really there. Gaping at the city and the people, Rand was taken by surprise when the cart turned down a side street, narrower than the boulevard, but still twice as wide as any street in Eamon's Field. Bunt drew the horse to a halt, and turned to look back at them hesitantly. The traffic was a bit lighter here. The crowd split around the cart without breaking stride. But you're hiding under your cloak. Is it really what Holdwin says? Rand was in the act of tossing his saddlebags over his shoulder. He did not even twitch. What do you mean? His voice was steady, too. His stomach was a sour knot, but his voice was steady. Matt stifled a yawn with one hand, but he shoved the other under his coat, clutching the dagger from Shadar Logoth, Rand knew, and his eyes had a hard-hunted look under the scarf around his head. Bunt avoided looking at Matt, as if he knew there was a weapon in that hidden hand. Don't mean nothing, I suppose. Look now, if you heard I was coming to Camelin, you were there long enough to hear the rest. Was I after a reward, I'd have made some excuse to go in the goose and crown, speak to Holdwin. Only I don't much like Holdwin, and I don't like that friend of his. Not at all. Seems like he wants you two more than he wants anything else. I don't know what he wants, Rand said. We've never seen him before. It might even be the truth. He could not tell one fade from another. Uh-huh. Well, like I say, I don't know nothing, and I guess I don't want to. There's enough trouble around for everybody without I go looking for more. Matt was slow in gathering his things, and Rand was already in the street before he started climbing down. Rand waited impatiently. Matt turned stiffly from the cart, hugging bow and quiver and blanket roll to his chest, muttering under his breath. Heavy shadows darkened the undersides of his eyes. Rand's stomach rumbled, and he grimaced. Hunger, combined with a sour twisting in his gut, made him afraid he was going to vomit. Matt was staring at him now, expectantly. Which way to go? What to do now? Bunt leaned over and beckoned him closer. He went, hoping for advice about Camelon. I'd hide that. The old farmer paused and looked around warily. People pushed by on both sides of the cart, but except for a few passing curses about blocking the way, no one paid them any attention. Stop wearing it, he said. Hide it, sell it, give it away. That's my advice. A thing like that's going to draw attention. And I guess you don't want any of that. Abruptly he straightened, clucking to his horse, and drove slowly on down the crowded street without another word or a backward glance. A wagon loaded with barrels rumbled toward them. Rand jumped out of the way, staggered, and when he looked again, Bunt and his cart were lost to sight. "'What do we do now?' Matt demanded. He licked his lips, staring wide-eyed at all the people pushing by, and the buildings towering as much as six stories above the street. "'We're in Camelon. But what do we do?' He had uncovered his ears, but his hands twitched as if he wanted to put them back. A hum lay on the city— the low, steady drone of hundreds of shops working, thousands of people talking. To Rand it was like being inside a giant beehive, constantly buzzing. Even if they are here, Rand, how could we find them in all of this? 
Moiraine will find us, Rand said slowly. The immensity of the city was a weight on his shoulders. He wanted to get away, to hide from all the people and noise. The void eluded him despite Tam's teachings. His eyes drew the city into it. He concentrated instead on what was right around him, ignoring everything that lay beyond. Just looking at that one street, it almost seemed like Berlin. Berlin, the last place they had all thought they were safe. Nobody's safe anymore. Maybe they are all dead. What do you do then? They're alive. Egwene's alive, he said fiercely. Several passers-by looked at him oddly. Maybe, Matt said, maybe. What if Moiraine doesn't find us? What if nobody does but the... the... He shuddered, unable to say it. We'll think about that when it happens, he told Matt firmly, if it happens. The worst meant seeking out Elida, the eyes Sedai in the palace. He would go on to Tarvalan first. He did not know if Matt remembered what Tom had said about the Red Aja and the Black, but he surely did. His stomach twisted again. Tom said to find an inn called the Queen's Blessing. We'll go there first. How? We can't afford one meal between the two of us. At least it's a place to start. Tom thought we could find help there. I can't. Rand, they're everywhere. Matt dropped his eyes to the paving stones and seemed to shrink in on himself, trying to pull away from the people that were all around them. Wherever we go, they're right behind us, or they're waiting for us. They'll be at the Queen's Blessing, too. I can't. I... Nothing's going to stop a fade. Rand grabbed Matt's collar in a fist that he was trying hard to keep from trembling. He needed Matt. Maybe the others were alive. Light, please. But right then and there, it was just Matt and him. The thought of going on alone... He swallowed hard, tasting bile. He looked around quickly. No one seemed to have heard Matt mention the fade. The crowd pressed past, lost in its own worries. He put his face close to Matt's. We've made it this far, haven't we? He asked in a hoarse whisper. They haven't caught us yet. We can make it all the way if we just don't quit. I won't just quit and wait for them like a sheep for slaughter. I won't. Well, are you going to stand here till you starve to death? Or until they come pick you up in a sack? He let go of Matt and turned away. His fingernails dug into his palms, but his hands still trembled. Suddenly Matt was walking alongside him, his eyes still down, and Rand let out a long breath. I'm sorry, Rand, Matt mumbled. Forget it, Rand said. Matt barely looked up enough to keep from walking into people while the words poured out in a lifeless voice. I can't stop thinking I'll never see home again. I want to go home. Laugh if you want, I don't care. What I wouldn't give to have my mother blessing me out for something right now. It's like weights on my brain, hot weights. Strangers all around and no way to tell who to trust if I can trust anybody. Light the two rivers is so far away it might as well be on the other side of the world. We're alone and we'll never get home. We're going to die, Rand. Not yet we won't, Rand retorted. Everybody dies. The wheel turns. I'm not going to curl up and wait for it to happen, though. You sound like Master Alvear, Matt grumbled, but his voice had a little spirit in it. Good, Rand said. Good. Light, let the others be all right. Please don't let us be alone. He began asking directions to the Queen's blessing. The responses varied widely, a curse for all those who did not stay where they belonged, or a shrug and a blank look being the most common. Some stalked on by with no more than a glance, if that. A broad-faced man nearly as big as Perrin cocked his head and said, The Queen's blessing, eh? You country boys, Queen's men? He wore a white cockade on his wide-brimmed hat and a white armband on his long coat. Well, you've come too late. He went off roaring with laughter, leaving Rand and Matt to stare at one another in puzzlement. Rand shrugged. There were plenty of odd folk in Camelin, people like he had never seen before. Some of them stood out in the crowd, skins too dark or too pale, 
coats of strange cut or bright colors, hats with pointed peaks or long feathers. There were women with veils across their faces, women in stiff dresses as wide as the wearer was tall, women in dresses that left more skin bare than any tavern maid he had seen. Occasionally a carriage, all vivid paint and gilt, squeezed through the thronged streets behind a four- or six-horse team with plumes on their harness. Sedan chairs were everywhere, the pullmen pushing along with never a care for who they shoved aside. Rand saw one fight start that way, a brawling heap of men swinging their fists while a pale-skinned man in a red-striped coat climbed out of the sedan chair lying on its side. Two roughly dressed men, who seemed to have been just passing by up till then, jumped on him before he was clear. The crowd that had stopped to watch began to turn ugly, muttering and shaking fists. Rand pulled at Matt's sleeve and hurried on. Matt needed no second urging. The roar of a small riot followed them down the street. Several times men approached the two of them instead of the other way around. Their dusty clothes marked them as newcomers, and seemed to act like a magnet on some types. Furtive fellows, who offered relics of Loghain for sale with darting eyes and feet set to run. Rand calculated he was offered enough scraps of the false dragon's cloak and fragments of his sword to make two swords and half a dozen cloaks. Matt's face brightened with interest, the first time at least, but Rand gave them all a curt no, and they took it with a bob of the head and a quick, light illumine the queen, good master, and vanished. Most of the shops had plates and cups painted with fanciful scenes purporting to show the false dragon being displayed before the queen in chains. And there were white cloaks in the streets. Each walked in an open space that moved with him, just as in Berlin. Staying unnoticed was something Rand thought about a great deal. He kept his cloak over his sword, but that would not be good enough for very long. Sooner or later someone would wonder what he was hiding. He would not, could not, take Bunt's advice to stop wearing it. Not his link to Tam. To his father. Many others among the throng wore swords, but none with the heron mark to pull the eye. All the Camelin men, though, and some of the strangers, had their swords wound in strips of cloth, sheath and hilt, red bound with white cord, or white bound with red. A hundred heron marks could be hidden under those wrappings, and no one would see. Besides, following local fashion would make them seem to fit in more. A good many shops were fronted with tables displaying the cloth and cord, and Rand stopped at one. The red cloth was cheaper than the white, though he could see no difference apart from the color, so he bought that and the white cord to go with it, despite Matt's complaints about how little money they had left. The tight-lipped shopkeeper eyed them up and down with a twist to his mouth while he took Rand's coppers, and cursed them when Rand asked for a place inside to wrap his sword. "'We didn't come to see Loghain,' Rand said patiently. "'We just came to see Camelin. He remembered Bunt and added, "'The grandest city in the world.' The shopkeeper's grimace remained in place. "'The light illumined good Queen Morgaze,' Rand said hopefully. "'You make any trouble,' the man said sourly and there's a hundred men in sound of my voice will take care of you, even if the guards won't. He paused to spit, just missing Rand's foot. Get on about your filthy business. Rand nodded as if the man had bid him a cheerful farewell and pulled Matt away. Matt kept looking back over his shoulder toward the shop, growling to himself until Rand tugged him into an empty alleyway. With their backs to the street, no passerby could see what they were doing. Rand pulled off the sword belt and set to wrapping the sheath and hilt. I'll bet he charged you double for that bloody cloth, Matt said. Triple. It was not as easy as it looked, fastening the strips of cloth and the cord so the whole thing would not fall off. They'll all be trying to cheat us, Rand. They think we've come to see the false dragon like everybody else. We'll be lucky if somebody doesn't hit us on the head while we sleep. This is no place to be. There are too many people. Let's leave for Tarvalan now, or south, to Ilion. I wouldn't mind seeing them gather for the hunt of the horn. If we can't go home, let's just go. I'm staying, Rand said. If they're not here already, they'll come here sooner or later looking for us. He was not sure if he had the wrappings done the way everyone else did, but the herons on scabbard and hilt were hidden, and he thought it was secure. As he went back out on the street, he was sure that he had one less thing to worry about causing trouble. Matt trailed along beside him as reluctantly as if he were being pulled on a leash. 
Bit by bit, Rand did get the directions he wanted. At first they were vague on the order of somewhere in that direction and over that way. The nearer they came, though, the clearer the instructions, until at last they stood before a broad stone building with a sign over the door creaking in the wind. A man kneeling before a woman with red-gold hair and a crown, one of her hands resting on his bowed head. The Queen's Blessing Are you sure about this? Matt asked. Of course, Rand said. He took a deep breath and pushed open the door. The common room was large and panelled with dark wood, and fires on two hearths warmed it. A serving maid was sweeping the floor, though it was clean, and another was polishing candlesticks in the corner. Each smiled at the two newcomers before going back to her work. Only a few tables had people at them, but a dozen men was a crowd for so early in the day, and if none looked exactly happy to see him and Matt, at least they looked clean and sober. The smells of roasting beef and baking bread drifted from the kitchen, making Rand's mouth water. The innkeeper was fat, he was pleased to see, a pink-faced man in a starched white apron, with graying hair combed back over a bald spot that it did not quite cover. His sharp eye took them in from head to toe, dusty clothes and bundles and worn boots, but he had a ready, pleasant smile, too. Basil Gill was his name. Master Gill, Ran said, a friend of ours told us to come here, Tom Merrillan. He... the innkeeper's smile slipped. Rand looked at Matt, but he was too busy sniffing the aromas coming from the kitchen to notice anything else. Is something wrong? You do know him. I know him, Gill said curtly. He seemed more interested in the flute case at Rand's side now than in anything else. Come with me. He jerked his head toward the back. Rand gave Matt a jerk to get him started, then followed, wondering what was going on. In the kitchen, Master Gill paused to speak to the cook, a round woman with her hair in a bun at the back of her head, who almost matched the innkeeper pound for pound. She kept stirring her pots while Master Gill talked. The smells were so good. Two days' hunger made a fine sauce for anything, but this smelled as good as Mr. Salvier's kitchen, that Rand's stomach growled. Matt was leaning toward the pot's nose first. Rand nudged him. Matt hastily wiped his chin where he had begun drooling. Then the innkeeper was hurrying them out the back door. In the stable yard he looked around to make sure no one was close, then rounded on them. On Rand. What's in the case, lad? Tom's flute, Rand said slowly. He opened the case, as if showing the gold-and-silver-chased flute would help. Matt's hand crept under his coat. Master Gill did not take his eyes off Rand. Aye, I recognize it. I saw him play it often enough, and there's not likely two like that outside a royal court. The pleasant smiles were gone, and his sharp eyes were suddenly as sharp as a knife. How did you come by it? Tom would part with his arm as soon as that flute. He gave it to me. Rand took Tom's bundled cloak from his back and set it on the ground, unfolding enough to show the colored patches as well as the end of the harp case. Tom's dead, Master Gill. If he was your friend, I'm sorry. He was mine, too. Dead, you say? How? Uh, a man tried to kill us. Tom pushed this at me and told us to run. The patches fluttered in the wind like butterflies. Rand's throat caught. He folded the cloak carefully back up again. We'd have been killed if it hadn't been for him. We were on our way to Camelin together. He told us to come here to your inn. I'll believe he's dead, the innkeeper said slowly, when I see his corpse. He nudged the bundled cloak with his toe and cleared his throat roughly. Nay, nay, I believe you saw whatever it was you saw. I just don't believe he's dead. He's a harder man to kill than you might believe is old Tom Merrillan. Rand put a hand on Matt's shoulder. It's all right, Matt. He's a friend. Master Gill glanced at Matt and sighed. I suppose I am at that. Matt straightened up slowly, folding his arms over his chest. He was still watching the innkeeper warily, though, and a muscle in his cheek twitched. Coming to Camelin, you say? The innkeeper shook his head. This is the last place on earth I'd expect Tom to come, excepting maybe it was Tarvalin. 
He waited for a stableman to pass, leading a horse, and even then he lowered his voice. You've trouble with the eyes, Sedai, I take it. Yes, Matt grumbled at the same time that Rand said, What makes you think that? Master Guild chuckled dryly. I know the man, that's what. He'd jump into that kind of trouble, especially to help a couple of lads about the age of you. The reminiscence in his eyes flickered out, and he stood up straight with a cherry look. Now, um, I'm not making any accusations, mind, but, uh, I take it neither of you can, uh, what I'm getting at is, uh, what exactly is the nature of your trouble with Tarvalon, if you don't mind my asking? Rand's skin prickled as he realized what the man was suggesting. The one power. No, no, nothing like that. I swear. It was even an Aes Sedai helping us. Moiraine was... He bit his tongue, but the innkeeper's expression never changed. Glad to hear it. Not that I've all that much love for Aes Sedai, but better them than... that other thing. He shook his head slowly. Too much talk of that kind of thing with Loghain being brought here. No offense meant, you understand, but... Well, I had to know, didn't I? No offense, Rand said. Matt's murmur could have been anything, but the innkeeper appeared to take it for the same as Rand had said. You two look the right sort, and I do believe you were, are, friends of Tom. But it's hard times and stony days. I don't suppose you can pay. No, I didn't think so. There's not enough of anything, and what there is costs the earth, so I'll give you beds, not the best, but warm and dry, and something to eat, and I cannot promise more, however much I'd like. Thank you, Rand said with a quizzical glance at Matt. It's more than I expected. What was the right sort? And why should he promise more? Well, Tom's a good friend. An old friend. Hot-headed and liable to say the worst possible thing to the one person he shouldn't. But a good friend all the same. If he doesn't show up, well, we'll figure something out then. Best you don't talk any more about Aes Sedai helping you. I'm a good queen's man, but there are too many in Camelin right now who take it wrong, and I don't mean just the white cloaks. Matt snorted. For all I care, the ravens can take every eyes to die straight to Sheol Ghoul. Watch your tongue, Master Gill snapped. I said I don't love them. I didn't say I'm a fool thinks they're behind everything that's wrong. The queen supports Elida, and the guards stand for the queen. The lights send things don't go so bad that changes. Anyway, lately some guards have forgotten themselves enough to be a little rough with folks they overhear speaking against Aes Sedai. Not on duty, thank the light, but it's happened just the same. I don't need off-duty guards breaking up my common room to teach you a lesson, and I don't need white cloaks egging somebody on to paint the dragon's fang on my door. So if you want any help out of me, you just keep thoughts about Aes Sedai to yourself, good or bad. He paused thoughtfully, then added, Maybe it's best you don't mention Tom's name, either, or anybody but me can hear. Some of the guards have long memories, and so does the Queen. No need taking chances. Tom had trouble with the Queen, Rand said incredulously, and the innkeeper laughed. So he didn't tell you everything. Don't know why he should. On the other hand, I don't know why you shouldn't know, either. Not like it's a secret, exactly. Do you think every Gleeman thinks as much of himself as Tom does? Well, come to think of it, I guess they do. But it always seemed to me Tom had an extra helping of thinking a lot of himself. He wasn't always a Gleeman, you know, wandering from village to village and sleeping under a hedge as often as not. There was a time Tom Merrillan was court barred right here in Camelin, and known in every royal court from Tyr to Maradon. Tom? Matt said. Rand nodded slowly. He could picture Tom at a queen's court with his stately manner and grand gestures. That he was, Master Gill said. It was not long after Tarangale Domadred died that the trouble about his nephew cropped up. There were some said Tom was, shall we say, closer to the queen than was proper. But Morgaze was a young widow, and Tom was in his prime then, and the queen can do as she wishes is the way I look at it. Only she's always had a temper, has our good Morgaze, 
and he took off without a word when he learned what kind of trouble his nephew was in. The Queen didn't much like that. Didn't like him meddling in Aes Sedai matters, either. Can't say I think it was right, either, nephew or no. Anyway, when he came back, he said some words all right. Words you don't say to a queen. Words you don't say to any woman with Morghese's spirit. Elida was set against him because of his trying to mix in the business with his nephew. And between the queen's temper and Elida's animosity, Tom left Camelin half a step ahead of a trip to prison, if not the headsman's axe. As far as I know, the writ still stands. If it was a long time ago, Rand said, maybe nobody remembers. Master Gill shook his head. Gareth Bryn is Captain General of the Queen's Guards. He personally commanded the guardsmen Morgays sent to bring Tom back in chains, and I misdoubt he'll ever forget returning empty-handed to find Tom had already been back to the palace and left again. And the Queen never forgets anything. You ever know a woman who did? My, but Morgays was in a taking. I'll swear the whole city walked soft and whispered for a month. Plenty of other guardsmen old enough to remember, too. No, best you keep Tom as close a secret as you keep that Aes Sedai of yours. Come, I'll get you something to eat. You look as if your bellies are gnawing at your backbones. Chapter 36 Web of the Pattern Master Gill took them to a corner table in the common room and had one of the serving maids bring them food. Rand shook his head when he saw the plates with a few thin slices of gravy-covered beef, a spoonful of mustard greens, and two potatoes on each. It was a rueful, resigned headshake, though, not angry. Not enough of anything, the innkeeper had said. Picking up his knife and fork, Rand wondered what would happen when there was nothing left. It made his half-covered plate seem like a feast. It made him shiver. Master Gill had chosen a table well away from anyone else, and he sat with his back to the corner where he could watch the room. Nobody could get close enough to overhear what they said without him seeing. When the maid left, he said softly, Now, why don't you tell me about this trouble of yours? If I'm going to help, I'd best know what I'm getting into. Rand looked at Matt, but Matt was frowning at his plate, as if he were mad at the potato he was cutting. Rand took a deep breath. I don't really understand it myself, he began. He kept the story simple, and he kept trollocs and fades out of it. When somebody offered help, it would not do to tell them it was all about fables. But he did not think it was fair to understate the danger, either. Not fair to pull someone in when they had no idea what they were getting into. Some men were after him and Matt, and a couple of friends of theirs, too. They appeared where they were least expected, these men, and they were deadly dangerous and set on killing him and his friends, or worse. Moraine said some of them were dark friends. Tom did not trust Moraine completely, but he stayed on with them, he said, because of his nephew. They had been separated during an attack while trying to reach Whitebridge, and then in Whitebridge Tom died, saving them from another attack. And there had been other tries. He knew there were holes in it, but it was the best he could do on short notice without telling more than was safe. We just kept on till we reached Camelin, he explained. That was the plan originally. Camelin and then Tarvalin. He shifted uncomfortably on the edge of his chair. After keeping everything secret for so long, it felt odd to be telling somebody even as much as he was. If we stay on that route, the others will be able to find us sooner or later. If they're alive, Matt muttered at his plate. Rand did not even glance at Matt. Something compelled him to add, It could bring you trouble helping us. Master Gill waved it off with a plump hand. Can't say as I want trouble, but it wouldn't be the first I've seen. No bloody dark friend will make me turn my back on Tom's friends. This friend of yours from up north now. If she comes to Camelin, I'll hear. There are people keep their eyes on comings and goings like that around here, and word spreads. Rand hesitated, then asked, What about Elida? The innkeeper hesitated, too, and finally shook his head. I don't think so. Maybe if you didn't have a connection to Tom. She'd winkle it out, and then where would you be? No telling. Maybe in a cell. Maybe worse. They say she has a way of feeling things, what's happened, what's going to happen. They say she can cut right through to what a man wants to hide. I don't know, but I wouldn't risk it. If it wasn't for Tom, you could go to the guards. 
They'd take care of any dark friends quick enough. But even if you could keep Tom quiet from the guards, word would reach Elida as soon as you mentioned dark friends. And then you're back where we started. No guards, Rand agreed. Matt nodded vigorously while stuffing a fork into his mouth and got gravy on his chin. Trouble is, you're caught up in the fringes of politics, lad, even if it's none of your doing. And politics is a foggy mire full of snakes. What about... Rand began, but the innkeeper grimaced suddenly, his chair creaking under his bulk as he sat up straight. The cook was standing in the doorway to the kitchen, wiping her hands with her apron. When she saw the innkeeper looking, she motioned for him to come, then vanished back into the kitchen. Might as well be married to her, Master Gill sighed. Finds things that need fixing before I know there's anything wrong. If it's not the drains stopped up or the downspouts clogged, it's rats. I keep a clean place, you understand. But with so many people in the city, rats are everywhere. Crowd people together and you get rats, and Camelin has a plague of them all of a sudden. You wouldn't believe what a good cat a prime ratter fetches these days. Your room is in the attic. I'll tell the girls which. Any of them can show you to it. And don't worry about dark friends. I can't say much good about the white cloaks, but between them and the guards, that sort won't dare show their filthy faces in Camelin. His chair squeaked again as he pushed it back and stood. I hope it isn't the drains again. Rand went back to his food, but he saw that Matt had stopped eating. I thought you were hungry, he said. Matt kept staring at his plate, pushing one piece of potato in a circle with his fork. You have to eat, Matt. We need to keep up our strength if we're going to reach Tarvalon. Matt let out a low, bitter laugh. Tarvalon. All this time it's been Camelin. Moraine would be waiting for us in Camelin. We'd find Perrin and Egwene in Camelin. Everything would be all right if we only got to Camelin. Well, here we are and nothing's right. No Moraine, no Perrin, no anybody. Now it's everything will be all right if we only get to Tarvalon. We're alive, Rand said, more sharply than he had intended. He took a deep breath and tried to moderate his tone. We are alive. That much is all right and I intend to stay alive. I intend to find out why we're so important. I won't give up. All these people and any of them could be dark friends. Master Gill promised to help us awfully quick. What kind of man just shrugs off Aes Sedai and dark friends? It isn't natural. Any decent person would tell us to get out or, or, or something. Eat, Rand said gently, and watched until Matt began chewing a piece of beef. He left his own hands resting beside his plate for a minute, pressing them against the table to keep them from shaking. He was scared. Not about Master Gill, of course, but there was enough without that. Those tall city walls would not stop a fade. Maybe he should tell the innkeeper about that. But even if Gill believed, would he be as willing to help if he thought a fade might show up at the Queen's blessing? And the rats... Maybe rats did thrive where there were a lot of people, but he remembered the dream that was not a dream in Berlin, and a small spine snapping. Sometimes the Dark One uses carrion eaters as his eyes, Lan had said. Ravens, crows, rats. He ate, but when he was done he could not remember tasting a single bite. A serving maid, the one who had been polishing candlesticks when they came in, showed them up to the attic room. A dormer window pierced the slanting outer wall with a bed on either side of it and pegs beside the door for hanging their belongings. The dark-eyed girl had a tendency to twist her skirt and giggle whenever she looked at Rand. She was pretty, but he knew if he said anything to her he would just make a fool of himself. She made him wish he had Perrin's way with girls. He was glad when she left. He expected some comment from Matt. But as soon as she was gone, Matt threw himself on one of the beds, still in his cloak and boots, and turned his face to the wall. Rand hung his things up, watching Matt's back. He thought Matt had his hand under his coat, clutching that dagger again. "'You just going to lie up here hiding?' he said finally. "'I'm tired,' Matt mumbled. "'We have questions to ask Master Gill yet. He might even be able to tell us how to find Egwene and Perrin. They could be in Camelin already if they managed to hang on to their horses.' "'They're dead,' Matt said to the wall. Rand hesitated, then gave up. 
He closed the door softly behind him, hoping Matt really would sleep. Downstairs, however, Master Gill was nowhere to be found, though the sharp look in the cook's eye said she was looking for him too. For a while Rand sat in the common room, but he found himself eyeing every patron who came in, every stranger who could be anyone or anything, especially in the moment when he was first silhouetted as a cloaked black shape in the doorway. A fade in the room would be like a fox in a chicken coop. A guardsman entered from the street. The red-uniformed man stopped just inside the door, running a cool eye over those in the room who were obviously from outside the city. Rand studied the tabletop when the guardsman's eyes fell on him. When he looked up again, the man was gone. The dark-eyed maid was passing with her arms full of towels. They do that sometimes, she said in a confiding tone as she went by, just to see there's no trouble. They look after good queen's folk, they do. Nothing for you to worry about. She giggled. Rand shook his head. Nothing for him to worry about. It was not as if the guardsman would have come over and demanded to know if he knew Tom Marilyn. He was getting as bad as Matt. He scraped back his chair. Another maid was checking the oil in the lamps along the wall. Is there another room where I could sit? he asked her. He did not want to go back upstairs and shut himself up with Matt's sullen withdrawal. Maybe a private dining room that's not being used? There's the library. She pointed to a door. Through there to your right at the end of the hall. Might be empty this hour. Thank you. If you see Master Gill, would you tell him Randolph Thor needs to talk to him if he can spare a minute? I'll tell him, she said, then grinned. Cook wants to talk to him, too. The innkeeper was probably hiding, he thought, as he turned away from her. When he stepped into the room to which she had directed him, he stopped and stared. The shelves must have held three or four hundred books, more than he had ever seen in one place before. Cloth-bound, leather-bound with gilded spines. Only a few had wooden covers. His eyes gobbled up the titles, picking out old favorites. The Travels of Jayan Farstrider. The Essays of Willem of Maneches. His breath caught at the sight of a leather-bound copy of Voyages Among the Sea Folk. Tam had always wanted to read that. Picturing Tam turning the book over in his hands with a smile, getting the feel of it before settling down before the fireplace with his pipe to read, his own hand tightened on his sword hilt with a sense of loss and emptiness that dampened all his pleasure in the books. A throat cleared behind him, and he suddenly realized he was not alone. Ready to apologize for his rudeness, he turned. He was used to being taller than almost everyone he met, but this time his eyes traveled up, and up, and up, and his mouth fell open. Then he came to the head, almost reaching the ten-foot ceiling. A nose as broad as the face, so wide it was more a snout than a nose. Eyebrows that hung down like tails, framing pale eyes as big as teacups. Ears that poked up to tufted points through a shaggy black mane. Trollock! He let out a yell and tried to back up and draw his sword. His feet got tangled, and he sat down hard instead. "'I wish you humans wouldn't do that,' rumbled a voice as deep as a drum. The tufted ears twitched violently, and the voice became sad. "'So few of you remember us. It's our own fault, I suppose. Not many of us have gone out among men since the shadow fell on the ways. That's, oh, six generations now. Right after the Trolloc Wars it was.' The shaggy head shook and let out a sigh that would have done credit to a bull. Too long, too long, and so few to travel and see. It might as well have been none. Rand sat there for a minute with his mouth hanging open, staring up at the apparition in wide-toed, knee-high boots and a dark blue coat that buttoned from the neck to the waist, then flared out to his boot tops like a kilt over baggy trousers. In one hand was a book seeming tiny by comparison, with a finger broad enough for three marking the place. "'I thought you were—' he began, then caught himself. "'What are—' that was not any better. Getting to his feet, he gingerly offered his hand. "'My name is Randolph Thor.' A hand as big as a ham engulfed his. It was accompanied by a formal bow. "'Loyal son of Arendt, son of Halan.' 
Your name sings in my ears, Randolph Thor. That sounded like a ritual greeting to Rand. He returned the bow. Your name sings in my ears, loyal son of Arendt, uh, son of Halan. It was all a little unreal. He still did not know what loyal was. The grip of Loyal's huge fingers was surprisingly gentle, but he was still relieved to get his hand back in one piece. "'You humans are very excitable,' Loyal said in that bass rumble. "'I had heard all the stories and read the books, of course, but I didn't realize. My first day in Camelin I could not believe the uproar. Children cried and women screamed, and a mob chased me all the way across the city, waving clubs and knives and torches and shouting Trolloc. I'm afraid I was almost beginning to get a little upset. There's no telling what would have happened if a party of the Queen's guards hadn't come along. A lucky thing, Rand said faintly. Yes, but even the guardsmen seemed almost as afraid of me as the others. Four days in Camelin now, and I haven't been able to put my nose outside this inn. Good Master Gill even asked me not to use the common room. His ears twitched. Not that he hasn't been very hospitable, you understand, but there was a bit of trouble that first night. All the humans seemed to want to leave at once. Such screaming and shouting, everyone trying to get through the door at the same time. Some of them could have been hurt. Rand stared in fascination at those twitching ears. I'll tell you, it was not for this I left the steading. You're an ogre, Rand exclaimed. Wait, six generations? You said the Trolloc Wars. How old are you? He knew it was rude as soon as he said it, but Loyal became defensive rather than offended. Ninety years, the ogre said stiffly. In only ten more I'll be able to address the stump. I think the elders should have let me speak, since they were deciding whether I could leave or not. But then they always worry about anyone of any age going outside. You humans are so hasty, so erratic. He blinked and gave a short bow. Please forgive me. I shouldn't have said that. But you do fight all the time, even when there's no need to. That's all right, Rand said. He was still trying to take in Loyal's age. Older than old Ken Booya, and still not old enough to... He sat down in one of the high-backed chairs. Loyal took another, made to hold two. He filled it. Sitting, he was as tall as most men standing. At least they did let you go. Loyal looked at the floor, wrinkling his nose and rubbing at it with one thick finger. Well, as to that now... You see, the stump had not been meeting very long, not even a year. But I could tell from what I heard that by the time they reached a decision I would be old enough to go without their permission. I am afraid they'll say I put a long handle on my axe, but I just... left. The elders always said I was too hot-headed, and I fear I've proven them right. I wonder if they have realized I'm gone yet. But I had to go. Rand bit his lip to keep from laughing. If Loyal was a hot-headed ogre, he could imagine what most ogre were like. It had not been meeting very long, not even a year. Master Alvir would just shake his head in wonder. A village council meeting that lasted half a day would have everybody jumping up and down, even Hara Luhan. A wave of homesickness swept over him, making it hard to breathe for memories of Tam and Egwene and the wine spring in, and bell tine on the green in happier days. He forced them away. If you don't mind my asking, he said, clearing his throat, why did you want to go, uh, outside so much? I wish I'd never left my home myself. Why to see, Loyal said, as if it were the most obvious thing in the world. I read the books, all the travelers' accounts, and it began to burn in me that I had to see, not just read. His pale eyes brightened, and his ears stiffened. I studied every scrap I could find about traveling, about the ways and customs in human lands and the cities we built for you humans after the breaking of the world. And the more I read, the more I knew that I had to go outside, go to those places we had been, and see the groves for myself. Rand blinked. 
groves? Yes, the groves. The trees. Only a few of the great trees, of course, towering to the sky to keep memories of the steading fresh. His chair groaned as he shifted forward, gesturing with his hands, one of which still held the book. His eyes were brighter than ever, and his ears almost quivered. Mostly they used the trees of the land and the place. You cannot make the land go against itself. Not for long. The land will rebel. You must shape the vision to the land, not the land to the vision. In every grove was planted every tree that would grow and thrive in that place, each balanced against the next, each place to complement the others, for the best growing, of course, but also so that the balance would sing in the eye and the heart. Ah, uh, the books spoke of groves to make elders weep and laugh at the same time, groves to remain green in memory forever. What about the cities? Rand asked. Loyal gave him a puzzled look. The cities? The cities the Ogre built. Here, for instance, Camelon. Ogre built Camelon, didn't you? The stories say so. Working with stone... His shoulders gave a massive shrug. That was just something learned in the years after the breaking, during the exile when we were still trying to find the steading again. It is a fine thing, I suppose, but not the true thing. Try as you will, and I have read that the ogre who built those cities truly did try. You cannot make stone live. A few still do work with stone, but only because you humans damage the buildings so often with your wars. There were a handful of ogre in, uh, Kyrien, it's called now, when I passed through. They were from another steading, luckily, so they didn't know about me. But they were still suspicious that I was outside alone so young. I suppose it's just as well there was no reason for me to linger there. In any case, you see, working with stone is just something that was thrust on us by the weaving of the pattern. The groves came from the heart. Rand shook his head. Half the stories he had grown up with had just been stood on their heads. I didn't know Ogre believed in the pattern, Loyal. Of course we believe. The wheel of time weaves the pattern of the ages, and lives are the threads it weaves. No one can tell how the thread of his own life will be woven into the pattern, or how the thread of a people will be woven. It gave us the breaking of the world, and the exile, and stone, and the longing. And eventually it gave us back the steading before we all died. Sometimes I think the reason you humans are the way you are is because your threads are so short. They must jump around in the weaving. Oh, there I've done it again. The elders say you humans don't like to be reminded of how short a time you live. I hope I didn't hurt your feelings. Rand laughed and shook his head. Not at all. I suppose it'd be fun to live as long as you do, but I never really thought about it. I guess if I live as long as old Ken Booya, that'll be long enough for anybody. He is a very old man. Rand just nodded. He was not about to explain that old Ken Booya was not quite as old as Loyal. Well, Loyal said, perhaps you humans do have short lives, but you do so much with them, always jumping around, always so hasty, and you have the whole world to do it in. We ogre are bound to our steading. You're outside. For a time, Rand. But I must go back eventually. This world is yours, yours and your kind's. The steading are mine. There's too much hurly-burly outside, and so much has changed from what I read about. Well, things do change over the years, some anyway. Some? Half the cities I read about aren't even there any longer, and most of the rest are known by different names. You take Kyrien, the city's proper name is al Nalan, Hill of the Golden Dawn. They don't even remember, for all of the sunrise on their banners. And the grove there, I doubt if it has been tended since the Trolloc Wars. It's just another forest now where they cut firewood. The great trees are all gone, 
and no one remembers them. And here, Camelin is still Camelin, but they let the city grow right over the grove. We're not a quarter of a mile from the centre of it, right where we sit, from where the centre of it should be. Not a tree of it left. I've been to Tyr and Ilion, too. Different names and no memories. There's only pasture for their horses where the grove was at Tyr, and at Ilion the grove is the king's park where he hunts his deer, and none allowed inside without his permission. It has all changed, Rand. I fear very much that I will find the same everywhere I go. All the groves gone, all the memories gone, all the dreams dead. You can't give up, Loyal. You can't ever give up. If you give up, you might as well be dead. Rand sank back in his chair as far as he could go, his face turning red. He expected the ogre to laugh at him, but Loyal nodded gravely instead. Yes, that's the way of your kind, isn't it? The ogre's voice changed, as if he were quoting something. Till shade is gone, till water is gone, into the shadow with teeth bared, screaming defiance with the last breath, to spit in Sightblinder's eye on the last day. Loyal cocked his shaggy head expectantly, but Rand had no idea what it was he expected. A minute went by with Loyal waiting, then another, and his long eyebrows began to draw down in puzzlement. But he still waited, the silence growing uncomfortable for Rand. The great trees, Rand said finally, just for something to break that silence, are they like Avendasora? Loyal sat up sharply. His chair squealed and cracked so loudly Rand thought it was going to come apart. You know better than that. You of all people. Me? How would I know? Are you playing a joke on me? Sometimes you Aielmen think the oddest things are funny. What? I'm not an Aielmen. I'm from the two rivers. I never even saw an Aielmen. Loyal shook his head, and the tufts on his ears drooped outward. You see, everything has changed, and half of what I know is useless. I hope I did not offend you. I'm sure your two rivers is a very fine place, wherever it is. Somebody told me, Rand said, that it was once called Manetheran. I'd never heard it, but maybe you. The ogre's ears had perked up happily. Ah, yes, Manetheran. The tufts went down again. There was a very fine grove there. Your pain sings in my heart, Randalthor. We could not come in time. Loyal bowed where he sat, and Rand bowed back. He suspected Loyal would be hurt if he did not, would think he was rude at the least. He wondered if Loyal thought he had the same sort of memories the ogre seemed to. The corners of Loyal's mouth and eyes were certainly turned down, as if he were sharing the pain of Rand's loss, just as if the destruction of Manetheran were not something that happened two thousand years ago, near enough, something that Rand only knew about because of Moiraine's story. After a time, Loyal sighed. The wheel turns, he said, and no one knows it's turning. But you have come almost as far from your home as I have, a very considerable distance as things are now. When the ways were freely open, of course, but that is long past. Tell me, what brings you so far? Is there something you want to see, too? Rand opened his mouth to say that they had come to see the false dragon, and he could not say it. Perhaps it was because Loyal acted as if he were no older than Rand, ninety years old or no ninety years old. Maybe for an ogre, ninety years was not any older than he was. It had been a long time since he had been able to really talk to anyone about what was happening, always the fear that they might be dark friends or think he was. Matt was so drawn in on himself, feeding his fears on his own suspicions, that he was no good for talking. Rand found himself telling Loyal about Winter Night, not a vague story about dark friends, the truth about Trollocs breaking in the door, 
and a fade on the quarry road. Part of him was horrified at what he was doing, but it was almost as if he were two people, one trying to hold his tongue while the other only felt the relief at being able to tell it all finally. The result was that he stumbled and stuttered and jumped around in the story, Shadar Logoth and losing his friends in the night, not knowing if they were alive or dead. The fade in Whitebridge, and Tom dying so they could escape. The fade in Berlin. Dark friends later, Howell Goad, and the boy who was afraid of them, and the woman who tried to kill Matt. The halfman outside the Goose and Crown. When he started babbling about dreams, even the part of him that wanted to talk felt the hackles rising on the back of his neck. He bit his tongue, clamping his teeth shut. Breathing heavily through his nose, he watched the ogre warily, hoping he thought he had meant nightmares. The light knew it all sounded like a nightmare, or enough to give anyone nightmares. Maybe Loyal would just think he was going mad. Maybe... To Viren, Loyal said. Rand blinked. What? To Viren. Loyal rubbed behind a pointed ear with one blunt finger and gave a little shrug. Elder Heyman always said I never listened, but sometimes I did. Sometimes I listened. You know how the pattern is woven, of course. I never really thought about it, he said slowly. It just is. Um, yes, well, not exactly. You see, the wheel of time weaves the pattern of the ages, and the threads it uses are lives. It has not fixed the pattern, not always. If a man tries to change the direction of his life and the pattern has room for it, the wheel just weaves on and takes it in. There is always room for small changes. But sometimes the pattern simply won't accept a big change, no matter how hard you try. You understand. Rand nodded. I could live on the farm or in Eamon's field, and that would be a small change. If I wanted to be a king, though... He laughed, and Loyal gave a grin that almost split his face in two. His teeth were white and as broad as chisels. Yes, that's it. But sometimes the change chooses you, or the wheel chooses it for you. And sometimes the wheel bends a life thread or several threads in such a way that all the surrounding threads are forced to swirl around it, and those force other threads, and those still others, and on and on. That first bending to make the web, that is Taviran, and there is nothing you can do to change it, not until the pattern itself changes. The web, Tamara Lylan it's called, can last for weeks or for years. It can take in a town or even the whole pattern. Arthur Hawkwing was Taviran. So was Luz Theron Kinslayer, for that matter, I suppose. He let out a booming chuckle. Elder Heyman would be proud of me. He always droned on, and the books about traveling were much more interesting. But I did listen sometimes. That's all very well, Rand said. But I don't see what it has to do with me. I'm a shepherd, not another Arthur Hawkwing. And neither is Matt or Perrin. It's just ridiculous. I didn't say you were, but I could almost feel the pattern swirl just listening to you tell your tale, and I have no talent there. You are Taviran, all right. You, and maybe your friends, too. The ogre paused, rubbing the bridge of his broad nose thoughtfully. Finally, he nodded to himself as if he had reached a decision. I wish to travel with you, Rand. For a minute Rand stared, wondering if he had heard correctly. With me? he exclaimed when he could speak. Didn't you hear what I said about... He eyed the door suddenly. It was shut tight and thick enough that anyone trying to listen on the other side would hear only a murmur, even with his ear pressed against the wooden panels. Just the same, he went on in a lower voice. About who's chasing me? Anyway, I thought you wanted to go see your trees. There is a very fine grove at Tarvalon, 
and I have been told the Aes Sedai keep it well tended. Besides, it is not just the groves I want to see. Perhaps you are not another Arthur Hawkwing, but for a time at least, part of the world will shape itself around you, perhaps is even now shaping itself around you. Even Elder Haman would want to see that. Rand hesitated. It would be good to have someone else along. The way Matt was behaving, being with him was almost like being alone. The ogre was a comforting presence. Maybe he was young, as ogre reckoned age, but he seemed as unflappable as a rock, just like Tam. And Loyal had been all of those places and knew about others. He looked at the ogre sitting there with his broad face a picture of patience. Sitting there, and taller sitting than most men standing. How do you hide somebody almost ten feet tall? He sighed and shook his head. I don't think that is a good idea, Loyal. Even if Moiraine finds us here, we'll be in danger all the way to Tarvalon. If she does not... If she doesn't, then she's dead and so is everyone else. Oh, Egwene! He gave himself a shake. Egwene was not dead and Moiraine would find them. Loyal looked at him sympathetically and touched his shoulder. I am sure your friends are well, Rand. Rand nodded his thanks. His throat was too tight to speak. Will you at least talk with me sometimes? Loyal sighed, a bass rumble, and perhaps play a game of stones. I have not had anyone to talk to in days except good Master Gill, and he is busy most of the time. The cook seems to run him unmercifully. Perhaps she really owns the inn? Of course I will. His voice was hoarse. He cleared his throat and tried to grin. And if we meet in Tarvalan, you can show me the grove there. They have to be all right. Lights send they're all right. Chapter 37 The Long Chase Nynaeve gripped the reins of the three horses and peered into the night, as if she could somehow pierce the darkness and find the eyes Sedai in the water. Skeletal trees surrounded her, stark and black in the dim moonlight. The trees and the night made an effective screen for whatever Moiraine and Lan were doing, not that either of them had paused to let her know what that was. A low, keep the horses quiet, from Lan, and they were gone, leaving her standing like a stable boy. She glanced at the horses and sighed with exasperation. Mandar blended into the night almost as well as his master's cloak. The only reason the battle-trained stallion was letting her get this close was because Lan had handed her the reins himself. He seemed calm enough now, but she remembered all too well the lips drawing back silently when she reached for his bridle without waiting for Lan's approval. The silence had made the bared teeth seem that much more dangerous. With a last wary look at the stallion, she turned to peer in the direction the other two had gone, idly stroking her own horse. She gave a startled jump when Aldeeb pushed a pale muzzle under her hand, but after a minute she gave the white mare a pat, too. No need to take it out on you, I suppose, she whispered, just because your mistress is a cold-faced... She strained at the darkness again. What were they doing? After leaving Whitebridge they had ridden through villages that seemed unreal in their normality. Ordinary market villages that seemed to Nynaeve unconnected to a world that had fades and trollocs and eyes sedai. They had followed the Camelin Road, until at last Moiraine sat forward in Aldeeb's saddle, peering eastward as if she could see the whole length of the great highway, all the many miles to Camelin, and see, too, what waited there. Eventually the eyes sedai let out a long breath and settled back. The wheel weaves as the wheel wills, she murmured but I cannot believe it weaves an end to hope. I must first take care of that of which I can be certain. It will be as the wheel weaves. And she turned her mare north, off the road into the forest. One of the boys was in that direction, with the coin Moiraine had given him. Lan followed. Nynaeve gave a long last look at the Camelin Road. Few people shared the roadway with them there a couple of high-wheeled carts and one empty wagon in the distance, 
a handful of folk afoot with their belongings on their backs or piled on pushcarts. Some of those were willing to admit they were on their way to Camelin to see the false dragon, but most denied it vehemently, especially those who had come through Whitebridge. At Whitebridge she had begun to believe Moiraine. Somewhat. More, at any rate. And there was no comfort in that. The warder and the Aes Sedai were almost out of sight through the trees before she started after them. She hurried to catch up. Lan looked back at her frequently and waved for her to come on, but he kept at Moiraine's shoulder and the Aes Sedai had her eyes fixed ahead. One evening after they left the road, the invisible trail failed. Moiraine, the unflappable Moiraine, suddenly stood up beside the small fire where the tea kettle was boiling, her eyes widening. It is gone, she whispered at the night. He is... Nynaeve could not finish the question. Light, I don't even know which one it is. He did not die, the Aes Sedai said slowly. But he no longer has the token. She sat down, her voice level and her hands steady as she took the kettle off the flames and tossed in a handful of tea. In the morning we will keep on as we've been going. When I get close enough I can find him without the coin. As the fire burned down to coals, Lan rolled himself in his cloak and went to sleep. Nynaeve could not sleep. She watched the eyes Sedai. Moiraine had her eyes closed, but she sat upright and Nynaeve knew she was awake. Long after the last glow had faded from the coals, Moiraine opened her eyes and looked at her. She could feel the eyes Sedai's smile even in the dark. He has regained the coin, Wisdom. All will be well. She lay down on her blankets with a sigh and almost at once was breathing deep in slumber. Nynaeve had a hard time joining her, tired as she was. Her mind conjured up the worst, no matter how she tried to stop it. All will be well. After Whitebridge she could no longer make herself believe that so easily. Abruptly Nynaeve was jerked from memory back to the night. There really was a hand on her arm. Stifling the cry that rose in her throat, she fumbled for the knife at her belt, her hand closing on the hilt before she realized that the hand was Lan's. The warder's hood was thrown back, but his chameleon-like cloak blended so well with the night that the dim blur of his face seemed to hang suspended in the night. The hand on her arm appeared to come out of thin air. She drew a shuddering breath. She expected him to comment on how easily he had come on her unaware, but instead he turned to dig into his saddlebags. "'You are needed,' he said, and knelt to fasten hobbles on the horses. As soon as the horses were secured, he straightened, grasped her hand, and headed off into the night again. His dark hair fit into the night almost as well as his cloak, and he made even less noise than she did. Grudgingly, she had to admit that she could never have followed him through the darkness without his grip as a guide. She was not certain she could pull loose if he did not want to release her anyway. He had very strong hands. As they came up on a small rise, barely enough to be called a hill, he sank to one knee pulling her down beside him. It took her a moment to see that Moiraine was there, too. Unmoving, the eyes Sedai could have passed for a shadow in her dark cloak. Lan gestured down the hillside to a large clearing in the trees. Nynaeve frowned in the dim moonlight, then suddenly smiled in understanding. Those pale blurs were tents in regular rows, a darkened encampment. White cloaks, Lan whispered. Two hundred of them, maybe more. There's good water down there. And the lad we're after. In the camp? She felt more than saw Lan nod. In the middle of it. Moiraine can point right to him. I went close enough to see he's under guard. A prisoner? Nynaeve said. Why? I don't know. The children should not be interested in a village boy not unless there was something to make them suspicious. The light knows it doesn't take much to make White Cloak suspicious, but it still worries me. How are you going to free him? It was not until he glanced at her that she realized how much assurance there had been in her that he could march into the middle of two hundred men and come back with the boy. Well, he is a warder. Some of the stories must be true. 
She wondered if he was laughing at her, but his voice was flat and businesslike. I can bring him out, but he'll likely be in no shape for stealth. If we're seen, we may find two hundred white cloaks on our heels, and us riding double. Unless they are too busy to chase us. Are you willing to take a chance? To help an Eamon's fielder? Of course. What kind of chance? He pointed into the darkness again, beyond the tents. This time she could make out nothing but shadows. They're horse lines. If the picket ropes are cut, not all the way through, but enough so they'll break when Moiraine creates a diversion, the White Cloaks will be too busy chasing their own horses to come after us. There are two guards on that side of the camp, beyond the picket lines. But if you are half as good as I think you are, they'll never see you. She swallowed hard. Stalking rabbits was one thing. Guards, though, with spears and swords. So he thinks I'm good, does he? I'll do it. Len nodded again as if he had expected no less. One other thing. There are wolves about tonight. I saw two. And if I saw that many, there are probably more. He paused, and though his voice did not change, she had the feeling he was puzzled. It was almost as if they wanted me to see them. Anyway, they shouldn't bother you. Wolves usually stay away from people. I wouldn't have known that, she said sweetly. I only grew up around shepherds. He grunted, and she smiled into the darkness. We'll do it now, then, he said. Her smile faded as she peered down at the camp full of armed men. Two hundred men with spears and swords, and— Before she could reconsider, she eased her knife in its sheath and started to slip away. Moiraine caught her arm in a grip almost as strong as Lan's. Take care, the Aes Sedai said softly. Once you cut the ropes, return as quickly as you can. You are a part of the pattern, too, and I would not risk you any more than any of the others, if the whole world was not at risk in these days. Nynaeve rubbed her arm surreptitiously when Moiraine released it. She was not about to let the Aes Sedai know the grip had hurt, but Moiraine turned back to watching the camp below as soon as she let go. And the warder was gone, Nynaeve realized with a start. She had not heard him leave. Light blind the bloody man. Quickly she tied her skirts up to give her legs freedom, and hurried into the night. After that first rush, with fallen branches cracking under her feet, she slowed down, glad there was no one there to see her blush. The idea was to be quiet, and she was not in any kind of competition with the warder. Oh, no. She shook off the thought and concentrated on making her way through the dark woods. It was not hard in and of itself. The faint light of the waning moon was more than enough for anyone who had been taught by her father, and the ground had a slow, easy roll. But the trees, bare and stark against the night sky, constantly reminded her that this was no childhood game, and the keening wind sounded all too much like trollic horns. Now that she was alone in the darkness, she remembered that the wolves that usually ran away from people had been behaving differently in the two rivers this winter. Relief flooded through her like warmth when she finally caught the smell of horses. Almost holding her breath, she got down on her stomach and crawled upwind toward the smell. She was nearly on the guards before she saw them, marching toward her out of the night, white cloaks flapping in the wind and almost shining in the moonlight. They might as well have carried torches. Torchlight could not have made them much more visible. She froze, trying to make herself a part of the ground. Nearly in front of her, not ten paces away, they marched to a halt with a stomp of feet, facing each other, spears shouldered. Just beyond them she could make out shadows that had to be the horses. The stable smell, horse and manure, was strong. "'All is well with the night,' one white-cloaked shape announced. "'The light illumine us and protect us from the shadow.' "'All is well with the night,' the other replied. "'The light illumine us and protect us from the shadow.' With that they turned and marched off into the darkness again. Nynaeve waited, counting to herself while they made their circuit twice. Each time they took exactly the same count, and each time they rigidly repeated the same formula, not a word more or less. Neither so much as glanced to one side. They stared straight ahead as they marched up, then marched away. She wondered if they would have noticed her even if she had been standing up. 
Before the knight swallowed the pale swirls of their cloaks a third time, she was already on her feet, running in a crouch toward the horses. As she came close, she slowed so as not to startle the animals. The white-cloaked guards might not see what was not shoved under their noses, but they would certainly investigate if the horses suddenly began whickering. The horses along the picket lines, there was more than one row, were barely realized masses in the darkness, heads down. Occasionally one snorted or stamped a foot in its sleep. In the dim moonlight she was nearly on the end post of the picket line before she saw it. She reached for the picket line and froze when the nearest horse raised its head and looked at her. Its single lead rein was tied in a big loop around the thumb-thick line that ended at the post. One whinny. Her heart tried to pound its way out of her chest, sounding loud enough to bring the guards. Never taking her eyes off the horse, she sliced at the picket rope, feeling in front of her blade to see how far she had cut. The horse tossed its head, and her breath went cold. Just one whinny. Only a few thin strands of hemp remained whole under her fingers. Slowly she headed toward the next line, watching the horse until she could no longer see if it was looking at her or not, then drew a ragged breath. If they were all like that, she did not think she would last. At the next picket rope, though, and the next and the next, the horses remained asleep, even when she cut her thumb and bit off a yelp. Sucking the cut, she looked warily back the way she had come. Upwind as she was, she could no longer hear the guards make their exchange, but they might have heard her if they were in the right place. If they were coming to see what the noise had been, the wind would keep her from hearing them until they were right on top of her. Time to go. With four horses out of five running loose, they won't be chasing anyone. But she did not move. She could imagine Lan's eyes when he heard what she had done. There would be no accusation in them, her reasoning was sound, and he would not expect any more of her. She was a wisdom, not a bloody great invincible warder who could make himself all but invisible. Jaw set, she moved to the last picket line. The first horse on it was Bela. There was no mistaking that squat, shaggy shape. For there to be another horse like that here and now was too big a coincidence. Suddenly she was so glad that she had not left off this last line that she was shaking. Her arms and legs trembled so that she was afraid to touch the picket rope, but her mind was as clear as the wine-spring water. Whichever of the boys was in the camp, Egwene was there too, and if they left riding double, some of the children would catch them, no matter how well the horses were scattered, and some of them would die. She was as certain as if she were listening to the wind. That stuck a spike of fear into her belly, fear of how she was certain. This had nothing to do with weather or crops or sickness. Why did Moiraine tell me I can use the power? Why couldn't she leave me alone? Strangely, the fear stilled her trembling. With hands as steady as if she were grinding herbs in her own house, she slit the picket rope as she had the others. Thrusting the dagger back into its sheath, she untied Bela's lead rein. The shaggy mare woke with a start, tossing her head, but Nynaeve stroked her nose and spoke comforting words softly in her ear. Bela gave a low snort and seemed content. Other horses along that line were awake, too, and looking at her. Remembering Mandarb, she reached hesitantly to the next lead rein. But that horse gave no objection to a strange hand. Indeed, it seemed to want some of the muzzle-stroking that Bela had received. She gripped Bela's rein tightly and wrapped the other around her other wrist, all the while watching the camp nervously. The pale tents were only thirty yards off, and she could see men moving among them. If they noticed the horses stirring and came to see what caused it. Desperately she wished for Moiraine not to wait on her return. Whatever the Aes Sedai was going to do, let her do it now. Light, make her do it now before... Abruptly lightning shattered the night overhead, for a moment obliterating darkness. Thunder smote her ears so hard she thought her knees would buckle, as a jagged trident stabbed the ground just beyond the horses, splashing dirt and rocks like a fountain. The crash of riven earth fought the thunderstroke. The horses went mad, screaming and rearing. The picket ropes snapped like thread where she had cut them. Another lightning bolt sliced down before the image of the first faded. 
Nynaeve was too busy to exult. At the first clash, Bela jerked one way while the other horse reared away in the opposite direction. She thought her arms were being pulled out of their sockets. For an endless minute she hung suspended between the horses, her feet off the ground, her scream flattened by the second crash. Again the lightning struck, and again and again in one continuous raging roar from the heavens. Balked in the way they wanted to go, the horses surged back, letting her drop. She wanted to crouch on the ground and soothe her tortured shoulders, but there was no time. Bela and the other horse buffeted her, eyes rolling wildly till only whites showed, threatening to knock her down and trample her. Somehow she made her arms lift, clutched her hands in Bela's mane, pulled herself onto the heaving mare's back. The other rein was still around her wrist, pulled tight into the flesh. Her jaw dropped as a long gray shadow snarled past, seeming to ignore her and the horses with her, but teeth snapping at the crazed animals now darting in every direction. A second shadow of death followed close behind. Nynaeve wanted to scream again, but nothing came out. Wolves! Light help us! What is Moiraine doing? The heels she dug into Bela's sides were not needed. The mare ran, and the other was more than happy to follow. Anywhere, so long as they could run, so long as they could escape the fire from the sky that killed the night. Chapter 38 Rescue Perrin shifted as best he could with his wrists bound behind him and finally gave up with a sigh. Every rock he avoided brought him two more. Awkwardly he tried to work his cloak back over him. The night was cold and the ground seemed to draw all the heat out of him, as it had every night since the white cloaks took them. The children did not think prisoners needed blankets or shelter, especially not dangerous dark friends. Egwene lay huddled against his back for warmth, sleeping the deep sleep of exhaustion. She never even murmured at his shifting. The sun was long hours below the horizon, and he ached from head to foot after a day walking behind a horse with a halter around his neck. But sleep would not come for him. The column did not move that fast. With most of their remounts lost to the wolves in the steading, the white cloaks could not push on as hard as they wanted. The delay was another thing they held against the Eamons fielders. The sinuous double line did move steadily, though. Lord Bornhald meant to reach Camelin in time for whatever it was, and always in the back of Perrin's mind was the fear that if he fell, the white cloak holding his leash would not stop, no matter Lord Captain Bornhald's orders to keep them alive for the questioners in Amador. He knew he could not save himself if that happened. The only times they freed his hands were when he was fed and for visits to the latrine pit. The halter made every step momentous, every rock underfoot potentially fatal. He walked with muscles tense, scanning the ground with anxious eyes. Whenever he glanced at Egwene, she was doing the same. When she met his eyes, her face was tight and frightened. Neither of them dared take their eyes off the ground long enough for more than a glance. Usually he collapsed like a wrung-out rag as soon as the white cloaks let him stop, but tonight his mind was racing. His skin crawled with dread that had been building for days. If he closed his eyes... He would see only the things Bayar promised for them once they reached Amador. He was sure Egwene still did not believe what Bayar told them in that flat voice. If she did, she would not be able to sleep, no matter how tired she was. In the beginning he had not believed Bayar either. He still did not want to. People just did not do things like that to other people. But Bayar did not really threaten... As if he were talking about getting a drink of water, he talked about hot irons and pincers, about knives slicing away skin and needles piercing. He did not appear to be trying to frighten them. There was never even a touch of gloating in his eyes. He just did not care if they were frightened or not, if they were tortured or not, if they were alive or not. That was what brought cold sweat to Perrin's face once it got through to him. That was what finally convinced him Bayar was telling the simple truth. The two guards' cloaks gleamed grayly in the faint moonlight. He could not make out their faces, but he knew they were watching, as if they could try something, tied hand and foot the way they were. 
From when there had been still light enough to see, he remembered the disgust in their eyes and the pinched looks on their faces, as though they had been set to guard filth-soaked monsters, stinking and repellent to look at. All the white cloaks looked at them that way. It never changed. Light, how do I make them believe we aren't dark friends when they're already convinced we are? His stomach twisted sickeningly. In the end, he would probably confess to anything just to make the questioners stop. Someone was coming, a white cloak carrying a lantern. The man stopped to speak with the guards, who answered respectfully. Perrin could not hear what was said, but he recognized the tall, gaunt shape. He squinted as the lantern was held close to his face. Bayar had Perrin's axe in his other hand. He had appropriated the weapon as his own. At least Perrin never saw him without it. Wake up, Bayar said emotionlessly, as if he thought Perrin slept with his head raised. He accompanied the words with a heavy kick in the ribs. Perrin gave a grunt through gritted teeth. His sides were a mass of bruises already from Bayar's boots. I said wake up. The foot went back again, and Perrin spoke quickly. I'm awake. You had to acknowledge what Bayar said, or he found ways to get your attention. Bayar set the lantern on the ground and bent to check his bonds. The man jerked roughly at his wrist, twisting his arms in their sockets. Finding those knots still as tight as he had left them, Bayar pulled at his ankle rope, scraping him across the rocky ground. The man looked too skeletal to have any strength, but Perrin might as well have been a child. It was a nightly routine. As Bayar straightened, Perrin saw that Egwene was still asleep. Wake up, he shouted. Egwene, wake up. Wha? What? Egwene's voice was frightened and still thick with sleep. She lifted her head, blinking in the lantern light. Bayar gave no sign of disappointment at not being able to kick her awake. He never did. He just jerked at her ropes the same way he had at Perrin's, ignoring her groans. Causing pain was another of those things that seemed not to affect him one way or another. Perrin was the only one he really went out of his way to hurt. Even if Perrin could not remember it, Bayar remembered that he had killed two of the children. Why should dark friends sleep? Bayar said dispassionately when decent men must stay awake to guard them. For the hundredth time, Egwene said wearily, we aren't dark friends. Perrin tensed. Sometimes such a denial brought a lecture delivered in a grating near monotone on confession and repentance, leading into a description of the questioner's methods of obtaining them. Sometimes it brought the lecture and a kick. To his surprise, this time Bayar ignored it. Instead, the man squatted in front of him, all angles and sunken hollows, with the axe across his knees. The golden sun on his cloak's left breast and the two golden stars beneath it glittered in the lantern light. Taking off his helmet, he set it beside the lantern. For a change, there was something besides disdain or hatred on his face, something intent and unreadable. He rested his arm on the axe handle and studied Perrin silently. Perrin tried not to shift under that hollow-eyed stare. You are slowing us down, dark friend, you and your wolves. The Council of the Anointed has heard reports of such things, and they want to know more, so you must be taken to Amador and given to the questioners. But you are slowing us down. I had hoped we could move fast enough, even without the remounts. But I was wrong. He fell silent, frowning at them. Perrin waited. Bayar would tell him when he was ready. The Lord Captain is caught in the cleft of a dilemma, Bayar said finally. Because of the wolves he must take you to the council, but he must reach Camelin too. We have no spare horses to carry you, but if we continue to let you walk we will not reach Camelin by the appointed time. The Lord Captain sees his duties with a single-minded vision, and he intends to see you before the council. Egwene made a sound. Bayar was staring at Perrin, and he stared back, almost afraid to blink. I don't understand, he said slowly. There is nothing to understand, Bayar replied, nothing but idle speculation. If you escaped, we would not have time to track you down. We don't have an hour to spare if we are to reach Camelin in time. 
If you frayed your ropes on a sharp rock, say, and vanished into the night, the Lord Captain's problem would be solved. Never taking his gaze from Perrin, he reached under his cloak and tossed something on the ground. Automatically, Perrin's eyes followed it. When he realized what it was, he gasped. A rock. A split rock with a sharp edge. Just idle speculation, Bayar said. Your guards tonight also speculate. Perrin's mouth was suddenly dry. Think it through. Light, help me think it through and don't make any mistakes. Could it be true? Could the White Cloak's need to get to Camelin quickly be important enough for this? Letting suspected dark friends escape? There was no use trying that way. He did not know enough. Bayar was the only White Cloak who had talked to them, aside from Lord Captain Bornhald, and neither was exactly free with information. Another way. If Bayar wanted them to escape, why not simply cut their bonds? If Bayar wanted them to escape? Bayar, who was convinced to his marrow that they were dark friends? Bayar, who hated dark friends worse than he did the dark one himself? Bayar, who looked for any excuse to cause him pain because he had killed two white cloaks? Bayar wanted them to escape? If he had thought his mind was racing before, now it sped like an avalanche. Despite the cold, sweat ran down his face in rivulets. He glanced at the guards. They were only shadows of pale gray, but it seemed to him that they were poised, waiting. If he and Egwene were killed trying to escape, and their ropes had been cut on a rock that could have been lying there by chance, the Lord Captain's dilemma would be solved all right, and Bayar would have them dead the way he wanted them. The gaunt man picked up his helmet from beside the lantern and started to stand. Wait, Perrin said hoarsely. His thoughts tumbled over and over as he searched in vain for some way out. Wait, I want to talk. I... Help comes. The thought blossomed in his mind, a clear burst of light in the midst of chaos, so startling that for a moment he forgot everything else, even where he was. Dapple was alive. Elias, he thought of the wolf, demanding without words to know if the man was alive. An image came back. Elias lying on a bed of evergreen branches beside a small fire in a cave, tending a wound in his side. It all took only an instant. He gaped at Bayar, and his face broke into a foolish grin. Elias was alive. Dapple was alive. Help was coming. Bayar paused, risen only to a crouch, looking at him. Some thought has come to you, Perrin of the Two Rivers and I would know what it is. For a moment Perrin thought he meant the thought from Dapple. Panic fled across his face, followed by relief. Bayar could not possibly know. Bayar watched his changes of expression, and for the first time the white cloak's eyes went to the rock he had tossed on the ground. He was reconsidering, Perrin realized. If he changed his mind about the rock, would he dare risk leaving them alive to talk? Ropes could be frayed after the people wearing them were dead, even if it made for risk of discovery. He looked into Bayar's eyes. The shadowed hollows of the man's eye sockets made them appear to stare at him from dark caves. And he saw death decided. Bayar opened his mouth, and as Perrin waited for sentence to be pronounced, things began to happen too fast for thought. Suddenly one of the guards vanished. One minute there were two dim shapes. The next the knight swallowed one of them. The second guard turned, the beginning of a cry on his lips. But before the first syllable was uttered there was a solid chunk, and he toppled over like a felled tree. Bayar spun, swift as a striking viper, the axe whirling in his hand so fast that it hummed. Perrin's eyes bulged as the knight seemed to flow into the lantern light. His mouth opened to yell but his throat locked tight with fear. For an instant he even forgot that Bayar wanted to kill them. The White Cloak was another human being, and the night had come alive to take them all. Then the darkness invading the light became Lan, cloaks swirling through shades of gray and black as he moved. 
The axe in Bayar's hands lashed out like lightning, and Lance seemed to lean casually aside, letting the blade pass so close he must have felt the wind of it. Bayar's eyes widened as the force of his blow carried him off balance. As the warder struck with hands and feet in rapid succession, so quick that Perrin was not sure what he had just seen, what he was sure of was Bayar collapsing like a puppet. Before the falling white cloak had finished settling to the ground, the warder was on his knees, extinguishing the lantern. In the sudden return to darkness, Perrin stared blindly. Land seemed to have vanished again. Is it really? Egwene gave a stifled sob. We thought you were dead. We thought you were all dead. Not yet. The warder's deep whisper was tinged with amusement. Hands touched Perrin, found his bonds. A knife sliced through the ropes with barely a tug, and he was free. Aching muscles protested as he sat up. Rubbing his wrists, he peered at the graying mound that marked Bayar. Did you? Is he? No. Land's voice answered quietly from the darkness. I do not kill unless I mean to. But he won't bother anyone for a while. Stop asking questions and get a pair of their cloaks. We do not have much time. Perrin crawled to where Bayar lay. It took an effort to touch the man, and when he felt the white cloak's chest rising and falling, he almost jerked his hands away. His skin crawled as he made himself unfasten the white cloak and pull it off. Despite what Land said, he could imagine the skull-faced man suddenly rearing up. Hastily he fumbled around till he found his axe, then crawled to another guard. It seemed strange at first that he felt no reluctance to touch this unconscious man, but the reason came to him. All the white cloaks hated him. But that was a human emotion. Bayar felt nothing beyond that he should die. There was no hate in it, no emotion at all. Gathering the two cloaks in his arms, he turned, and panic grabbed him. In the darkness he suddenly had no sense of direction, of how to find his way back to Lan and the others. His feet rooted to the ground, afraid to move. Even Bayar was hidden by the night without his white cloak. There was nothing by which to orient himself. Any way he went might be out into the camp. Here. He stumbled toward Lan's whisper until hands stopped him. Egwene was a dim shadow, and Lan's face was a blur. The rest of the warder seemed not to be there at all. He could feel their eyes on him, and he wondered if he should explain. Put on the cloaks, Lan said softly. Quickly, bundle your own, and make no sound. You aren't safe yet. Hurriedly, Perrin passed one of the cloaks to Egwene, relieved at being saved from having to tell of his fear. He made his own cloak into a bundle to carry, and swung the white cloak around his shoulders in its place. He felt a prickle as it settled around his shoulders, a stab of worry between his shoulder blades. Was it Bayar's cloak he had ended up with? He almost thought he could smell the gaunt man on it. Land directed them to hold hands and Perrin gripped his axe in one hand and Egwene's hand with the other, wishing the warder would get on with their escape so he could stop his imagination from running wild. But they just stood there, surrounded by the tents of the children, two shapes in white cloaks and one that was sensed but not seen. Soon, Lan whispered. Very soon. Lightning broke the night above the camp, so close that Perrin felt the hair on his arms, his head lifting, as the bolt charged the air. Just beyond the tents the earth erupted from the blow, the explosion on the ground merging with that in the sky. Before the light faded, Lan was leading them forward. At their first step another strike sliced open the blackness. Lightning came like hail so that the night flickered as if the darkness were coming in momentary flashes. Thunder drummed wildly, one roar rumbling into the next, one continuous rippling peal. Fear-stricken horses screamed, their whinnies drowned except for moments when the thunder faded. Men tumbled out of their tents, some in their white cloaks, some only half-clothed, some dashing to and fro, some standing as if stunned. Through the middle of it, Land pulled them at a trot, Perrin bringing up the rear. White cloaks looked at them wild-eyed as they passed. 
A few shouted at them, the shouts lost in the pounding from the heavens, but with their white cloaks gathered around them no one tried to stop them. Through the tents, out of the camp, and into the night, and no one raised a hand against them. The ground turned uneven under Perrin's feet, and Brush slapped at him as he let himself be drawn along. The lightning flickered fitfully and was gone. Echoes of thunder rolled across the sky before they too faded away. Perrin looked over his shoulder. A handful of fires burned back there, among the tents. Some of the lightning must have struck home, or perhaps men had knocked over lamps in their panic. Men still shouted, voices tiny in the night, trying to restore order to find out what had happened. The land began to slope upwards, and tents and fires and shouting were left behind. Suddenly he almost trod on Egwene's heels as land stopped. Ahead in the moonlight stood three horses. A shadow stirred, and Moraine's voice came, weighted with irritation. Nynaeve has not returned. I fear that young woman has done something foolish. Land spun on his heel as if to return the way they had come, but a single whip-crack word from Moiraine halted him. No! He stood looking at her sideways, only his face and hands truly visible, and they but dimly shadowed blurs. She went on in a gentler tone, gentler but no less firm. Some things are more important than others. You know that. The warder did not move, and her voice hardened again. Remember your oaths, Alan Mandragoran, Lord of the Seven Towers. What of the oath of a diademed battle lord of the Malkiri? Perrin blinked. Lan was all of that? Egwene was murmuring, but he could not take his eyes off the tableau in front of him. Lan standing like a wolf from Dapple's pack, a wolf at bay before the diminutive Aes Sedai, and vainly seeking escape from doom. The frozen scene was broken by a crash of breaking branches in the woods. In two long strides Lan was between Moiraine and the sound, the pale moonlight rippling along his sword. To the crackle and snap of underbrush a pair of horses burst from the trees, one with a rider. Bela! Egwene exclaimed at the same time that Nynaeve said from the shaggy mare's back, I almost didn't find you again. Egwene, thank the light you're alive! She slid down off Bela, but as she started toward the Eamon's fielders, Lan caught her arm, and she stopped short, staring up at him. We must go, Lan, Moiraine said, once more sounding unruffled, and the warder released his grip. Nynaeve rubbed her arm as she hurried to hug Egwene, but Perrin thought he heard her give a low laugh, too. It puzzled him, because he did not think it had anything to do with her happiness at seeing them again. Where are Rand and Matt? he asked. Elsewhere, Moiraine replied, and Nynaeve muttered something in a sharp tone that made Egwene gasp. Perrin blinked. He had caught the edge of a wagoneer's oath, and a coarse one. The lights send they are well, the Aes Sedai went on as if she had not noticed. We will none of us be well, Lan said, if the white cloaks find us. Change your cloaks and get mounted. Perrin scrambled up onto the horse Nynaeve had brought behind Bela. The lack of a saddle did not hamper him. He did not ride often at home, but when he did it was more likely bareback than not. He still carried the white cloak, now rolled up and tied to his belt. The warder said they must leave no more traces for the children to find than they could help. He still thought he could smell Bayar on it. As they started out, the warder leading on his tall black stallion, Perrin felt Dapple's touch on his mind once more. One day again. More a feeling than words, it sighed with the promise of a meeting foreordained, with anticipation of what was to come, with resignation to what was to come, all streaked in layers. He tried to ask when and why, fumbling in haste and sudden fear. The trace of the wolves grew fainter, fading. His frantic questions brought only the same heavy-laden answer. One day again. It hung haunting in his mind, long after awareness of the wolves winked out. Land pressed southward, slowly but steadily. 
the night-draped wilderness all rolling ground and underbrush hidden until it was underfoot, shadowed trees thick against the sky, allowed no great speed in any case. Twice the warder left them, riding back toward the slivered moon, he and Mandarb becoming one with the night behind. Both times he returned to report no sign of pursuit. Egwene stayed close beside Nynaeve. Soft-spoken scraps of excited talk floated back to Perrin. Those two were as buoyed up as if they had found home again. He hung back at the tail of their little column. Sometimes the wisdom turned in her saddle to look back at him, and each time he gave her a wave, as if to say that he was all right, and stayed where he was. He had a lot to think about, though he could not get any of it straight in his head. What was to come? What was to come? Perrin thought it could not be much short of dawn when Moiraine finally called a halt. Lan found a gully where he could build a fire hidden within a hollow in one of the banks. Finally, they were allowed to rid themselves of the white cloaks, burying them in a hole dug near the fire. As he was about to toss in the cloak he had used, the embroidered golden sun on the breast caught his eye, and the two golden stars beneath. He dropped the cloak as if it stung and walked away, scrubbing his hands on his coat, to sit alone. Now, Egwene said, once Lan was shoveling dirt into the hole, will somebody tell me where Rand and Matt are? I believe they are in Camelin, Moraine said carefully, or on their way there. Nynaeve gave a loud, disparaging grunt, but the Aes Sedai went on as if she had not been interrupted. If they are not... I will yet find them. That I promise. They made a quiet meal on bread and cheese and hot tea. Even Egwene's enthusiasm succumbed to weariness. The wisdom produced an ointment from her bag for the wheels the ropes had left on Egwene's wrists, and a different one for her other bruises. When she came to where Perrin sat on the edge of the firelight, he did not look up. She stood looking at him silently for a time, then squatted with her bag beside her, saying briskly, Take your coat and shirt off, Perrin. They tell me one of the white cloaks took a dislike to you. He complied slowly, still half lost in Dapple's message, until Nynaeve gasped. Startled, he stared at her, then at his own bare chest. It was a mass of color. The newer purple blotches overlaying older ones faded into shades of brown and yellow. Only thick slabs of muscle earned by hours at Master Luhan's forge had saved him from broken ribs. With his mind filled by the wolves, he had managed to forget the pain. But he was reminded of it now, and it came back gladly. Involuntarily he took a deep breath and clamped his lips on a groan. How could he have disliked you so much? Nynaeve asked wonderingly. I killed two men. Aloud, he said, I don't know. She rummaged in her bag, and he flinched when she began spreading a greasy ointment over his bruises. Ground ivy, five finger, and sunburst root, she said. It was hot and cold at the same time, making him shiver while he broke into a sweat. But he did not protest. He had had experience of Nynaeve's ointments and poultices before. As her fingers gently rubbed the mixture in, the heat and cold vanished, taking the pain with them. The purple splotches faded to brown, and the brown and yellow paled, some disappearing altogether. Experimentally he took a deep breath. There was barely a twinge. "'You look surprised,' Nynaeve said. She looked a little surprised herself and strangely frightened. Next time you can go to her. Not surprised, he said soothingly, just glad. Sometimes Nynaeve's ointments worked fast and sometimes slow, but they always worked. What? What happened to Rand and Matt? Nynaeve began stuffing her vials and pots back into her bag, jamming each one in as if she were thrusting it through a barrier. She says they're all right. She says we'll find them. In Camelin, she says. She says it's too important for us not to, whatever that means. She says a great many things. 
Perrin grinned in spite of himself. Whatever else had changed, the wisdom was still herself, and she and the Aes Sedai were still far from fast friends. Abruptly, Nynaeve stiffened, staring at his face. Dropping her bag, she pressed the backs of her hands to his cheeks and forehead. He tried to pull back, but she caught his head in both hands and thumbed back his eyelids, peering into his eyes and muttering to herself. Despite her small size, she held his face easily. It was never easy to get away from Nynaeve when she did not want you to. I don't understand, she said finally, releasing him and settling back to sit on her heels. If it was yellow-eye fever, you wouldn't be able to stand. But you don't have any fever, and the whites of your eyes aren't yellowed, just the irises. Yellow? Moraine said, and Perrin and Nynaeve both jumped where they sat. The eyes Sedai's approach had been utterly silent. Egwene was asleep by the fire, wrapped in her cloaks, Perrin saw. His own eyelids wanted to slide closed. It isn't anything, he said, but Moraine put a hand under his chin and turned his face up so she could peer into his eyes the way Nynaeve had. He jerked away, prickling. The two women were handling him as if he were a child. I said it isn't anything. There was no foretelling this. Moraine spoke as if to herself. Her eyes seemed to look at something beyond him. Something ordained to be woven, or a change in the pattern. If a change, by what hand? The wheel weaves as the wheel wills. It must be that. Do you know what it is? Nynaeve asked reluctantly, then hesitated. Can you do something for him? Your healing? The request for aid, the admission that she could do nothing, came out of her as if dragged. Perrin glared at both the women. If you're going to talk about me, talk to me. I'm sitting right here. Neither looked at him. Healing? Moraine smiled. Healing can do nothing about this. It is not an illness, and it will not... She hesitated briefly. She did glance at Perrin then, a quick look that regretted many things. That look did not include him, though, and he muttered sourly as she turned back to Nynaeve. I was going to say it will not harm him, but who can say what the end will be? At least I can say it will not harm him directly. Nynaeve stood, dusting off her knees, and confronted the eyes Sedai eye to eye. That's not good enough. If there's something wrong with... What is, is. What is woven already is past changing. Moraine turned away abruptly. We must sleep while we can and leave at first light. If the Dark One's hand grows too strong, we must reach Cainlan quickly. Angrily, Nynaeve snatched up her bag and stalked off before Perrin could speak. He started to growl an oath, but a thought hit him like a blow, and he sat there gaping silently. Moiraine knew. The Aes Sedai knew about the wolves, and she thought it could be the Dark One's doing. A shiver ran through him. Hastily he shrugged back into his shirt, tucking it in awkwardly, and pulled his coat and cloak back on. The clothing did not help very much. He felt chilled right down to his bones, his marrow like frozen jelly. Land dropped to the ground cross-legged, tossing back his cloak. Perrin was glad of that. It was unpleasant, looking at the warder and having his eyes slide past. For a long moment they simply stared at one another. The hard planes of the warder's face were unreadable, but in his eyes Perrin thought he saw... something. Sympathy? Curiosity? Both? You know he said, and Lan nodded. I know some, not all. Did it just come to you, or did you meet a guide, an intermediary? There was a man, Perrin said slowly. He knows. But does he think the same as Moraine? He said his name was Elias, Elias Machira, Len drew a deep breath, and Perrin looked at him sharply. You know him? 
I knew him. He taught me much about the blight and about this. Lan touched his sword hilt. He was a warder before... before what happened. The Red Aja. He glanced to where Moiraine was, lying before the fire. It was the first time Perrin could remember any uncertainty in the warder. At Shadar Logoth, Lan had been sure and strong, and when he was facing Fades and Trollocs. He was not afraid now. Perrin was convinced of that. But he was wary, as if he might say too much, as if what he said could be dangerous. I've heard of the Red Aja, he told Lan. And most of what you've heard is wrong, no doubt. You must understand, there are factions within Tarvalon. Some would fight the Dark One one way, some another. The goal is the same, but the differences... The differences can mean lives changed, or ended. The lives of men or nations. He is well, Elias? I think so. The White Cloaks said they killed him, but Dapple... Perrin glanced at the warder uncomfortably. I don't know. Lan seemed to accept that he did not, reluctantly, and it emboldened him to go on. This communicating with the wolves. Moiraine seems to think it's something the... something the Dark One did. It isn't, is it? He would not believe Elias was a Dark Friend. But Lan hesitated and sweat started on Perrin's face, chill beads made colder by the night. They were sliding down his cheeks by the time the warder spoke. Not in itself, no. Some believe it is, but they are wrong. It was old and lost long before the Dark One was found. But what of the chance involved, Blacksmith? Sometimes the pattern has a randomness to it, to our eyes at least. But what chance that you should meet a man who could guide you in this thing, and you one who could follow the guiding. The pattern is forming a great web, what some call the lace of ages, and you lads are central to it. I don't think there is much chance left in your lives now. Have you been chosen out then? And if so, by the light or by the shadow? The Dark One can't touch us unless we name him. Immediately Perrin thought of the dreams of Baalzamon, the dreams that were more than dreams. He scrubbed the sweat off his face. He can't! Rock-hard stubborn, the warder mused. Maybe stubborn enough to save yourself in the end. Remember the times we live in, Blacksmith. Remember what Moiraine Sedai told you. In these times, many things are dissolving and breaking apart. Old barriers weaken. Old walls crumble. The barriers between what is and what was. Between what is and what will be. His voice turned grim. The walls of the Dark One's prison. This may be the end of an age. We may see a new age born before we die. Or perhaps it is the end of ages. The end of time itself. The end of the world. Suddenly he grinned, but his grin was as dark as a scowl. His eyes sparkled merrily, laughing at the foot of the gallows. But that's not for us to worry about, eh, blacksmith? We'll fight the shadow as long as we have breath, and if it overruns us we'll go under biting and clawing. You two rivers folk are too stubborn to surrender. Don't you worry whether the Dark One has stirred in your life. You are back among friends now. Remember, the wheel weaves as the wheel wills, and even the Dark One cannot change that, not with Moiraine to watch over you. But we had better find your friends soon. What do you mean? They have no eyes said I touching the true source to protect them. Blacksmith. Perhaps the walls have weakened enough for the Dark One himself to touch events. Not with a free hand, or we'd be done already, but maybe tiny shiftings in the threads. A chance turning of one corner instead of another. A chance meeting. A chance word, or what seems like chance. 
and they could be so far under the shadow not even Moiraine could bring them back. We have to find them, Perrin said, and the warder gave a grunt of a laugh. What have I been saying? Get some sleep, blacksmith. Land's cloak swung back around him as he stood. In the faint light from fire and moon, he seemed almost part of the shadows beyond. We have a hard few days to Camelon. Just you pray we find them there. But Moraine, she can find them anywhere, can't she? She says she can. But can she find them in time? If the Dark One is strong enough to take a hand himself, time is running out. You pray we find them in Camelon, blacksmith, or we may all be lost. Chapter 39 Weaving of the Web Rand looked down on the crowds from the high window of his room in the Queen's Blessing. They ran shouting along the street, all streaming in the same direction, waving pennants and banners, the white lion standing guard on a thousand fields of red. Camelaners and outlanders, they ran together, and for a change no one appeared to want to bash anyone else's head. Today, maybe, there was only one faction. He turned from the window, grinning. Next to the day when Egwene and Perrin walked in, alive and laughing over what they had seen, this was the day he had been waiting for most. "'Are you coming?' he asked again. Matt glowered from where he lay curled up in a ball on his bed. "'Take that trollic you're so friendly with.' "'Blood and ashes, Matt, he's not a trollic. You're just being stubborn stupid. How many times do you want to have this argument?' Light, it's not as if you'd never heard of Ogre before. I never heard they looked like Trollocs. Matt pushed his face into his pillow and curled himself tighter. Stubborn stupid, Rand muttered. How long are you going to hide up here? I'm not going to keep bringing you your meals up all those stairs forever. You could do with a bath, too. Matt shrugged around on the bed as if he were trying to burrow deeper into it. Rand sighed, then went to the door. Last chance to go together, Matt. I'm leaving now. He closed the door slowly, hoping that Matt would change his mind. But his friend did not stir. The door clicked shut. In the hallway, he leaned against the doorframe. Master Gill said there was an old woman two streets over, Mother Grub, who sold herbs and poultices, besides birthing babies, tending the sick, and telling fortunes. She sounded a little like a wisdom. Nynaeve was who Matt needed, or maybe Moiraine, but Mother Grub was who he had. Bringing her to the Queen's blessing might bring the wrong kind of attention as well, though, if she would even come, for her as well as for Matt and him. Herbalists and hedge doctors were lying low in Camelin right now. There was talk against anyone who did any kind of healing or fortune-telling. Every night the dragon's fang was scrawled on doors with a free hand, sometimes even in the daylight, and people might forget who had cured their fevers and poulticed their toothaches when the cry of Dark Friend went up. That was the temper in the city. It was not as if Matt were really sick. He ate everything Rand carried up from the kitchen. He would take nothing from anyone else's hand, though, and never complained about aches or fever. He just refused to leave the room. But Rand had been sure today would bring him out. He settled his cloak on his shoulders and hitched his sword belt around so the sword and the red cloth wrapped around it was covered more. At the foot of the stairs he met Master Gill just starting up. "'There's someone been asking after you in the city,' the innkeeper said around his pipe. Rand felt a surge of hope. "'Asking after you and those friends of yours, by name. You younglings, anyway. Seems to want you three lads most.' Anxiety replaced hope. "'Who?' Rand asked. He still could not help glancing up and down the hall. Except for they, too, it was empty, from the exit into the alley to the common room door. Don't know his name. Just heard about him. I hear most things in Camelin, eventually. Beggar, the innkeeper grunted. Half mad, I hear. Even so, he could take the Queen's bounty at the palace, even with things as hard as they are. On high days the queen gives it out with her own hands, and there's never anyone turned away for any reason. No one needs to beg in Camelin. Even a man under warrant can't be arrested while he's taking the queen's bounty. A dark friend? 
Rand said reluctantly. If the dark friends know our names. You've got dark friends on the brain, young fellow. They're around, certainly. But just because the White Cloaks have everybody stirred up is no reason for you to think the city's full of them. Do you know what rumor those idiots have started now? Strange shapes. Can you believe it? Strange shapes creeping around outside the city in the night. The innkeeper chuckled till his belly shook. Rand did not feel like laughing. Hyam Kinch had talked about strange shapes, and there had surely enough been a fade back there. What kind of shapes? What kind? I don't know what kind. Strange shapes. Trollocs, probably. The Shadow Man. Luz Theron Kinslayer himself come back fifty feet high. What kind of shapes do you think people will imagine now the ideas in their heads? It's none of our worry. Master Gill eyed him for a moment. Going out, are you? Well, I can't say I care for it myself, even today. But there's hardly anybody left here but me. Not your friend? Matt's not feeling very well. Maybe later. Well, be that as it may. You watch yourself now. Even today, good Queen's men will be outnumbered out there. Light burn the day I ever thought to see it so. Best you leave by the alleyway. There's two of those blood-be-damned traitors sitting across the street watching my front door. They know where I stand by the light. Rand stuck his head out and looked both ways before slipping into the alley. A bulky man Master Gill had hired stood at the head of the alley, leaning on a spear and watching the people run past with an apparent lack of interest. It was only apparent, Rand knew. The fellow, his name was Lamguin, saw everything through those heavy-lidded eyes, and for all his bullish bulk he could move like a cat. He also thought Queen Morgay's was the light made flesh, or near enough. There were a dozen like him scattered around the Queen's blessing. Lamguin's ear twitched when Rand reached the mouth of the alley, but he never took his disinterest off the street. Rand knew the man had heard him coming. Watch your back today, man. Lemguin's voice sounded like gravel in a pan. When the trouble starts, you'll be a handy one to have here, not somewhere with a knife in your back. Rand glanced at the blocky man, but his surprise was muted. He always tried to keep the sword out of sight. But this was not the first time one of Master Gill's men had assumed he would know his way in a fight. Lemguin did not look back at him. The man's job was guarding the inn, and he did it. Pushing his sword back a little further under his cloak, Rand joined the flow of people. He saw the two men the innkeeper had mentioned, standing on upturned barrels across the street from the inn so they could see over the crowd. He did not think they noticed him coming out of the alley. They made no secret of their allegiance. Not only were their swords wrapped in white tied with red, they wore white armbands and white cockades on their hats. He had not been in Camelin long before learning that red wrappings on a sword or a red armband or cockade meant support for Queen Morgays. White said the Queen and her involvement with Aes Sedai and Tarvalon were to blame for everything that had gone wrong, for the weather and the failed crops, maybe even for the false dragon. He did not want to get involved in Camelin politics, only it was too late now. It was not just that he had already chosen, by accident, but there it was. Matters in the city had gone beyond letting anyone stay neutral. Even outlanders wore cockades and armbands or wrapped their swords, and more wore the white than the red. Maybe some of them did not think that way, but they were far from home, and that was the way sentiment was running in Camelin. Men who supported the Queen went about in groups for their own protection, when they went out at all. Today, though, it was different on the surface at least. Today Camelin celebrated a victory of the light over the shadow. Today the false dragon was being brought into the city to be displayed before the queen before he was taken north to Tarvalon. No one talked about that part of it. No one but the Aes Sedai could deal with a man who could actually wield the one power, of course, but no one wanted to talk about it. The light had defeated the shadow, and soldiers from Andor had been in the forefront of the battle. For today that was all that was important. For today, everything else could be forgotten. Or could it? Rand wondered. The crowd ran, singing and waving banners, laughing, but men displaying the red kept together in knots of ten or twenty, and there were no women or children with them. 
He thought there were at least ten men showing white for every one proclaiming allegiance to the queen. Not for the first time he wished white cloth had been the cheaper. But would Master Gill have helped if you'd been showing the white? The crowd was so thick that jostling was inevitable. Even white cloaks did not enjoy their little open spaces in the throng today. As Rand let the crowd carry him toward the inner city, he realized that not all animosities were being reined in. He saw one of the children of the light, one of three, bumped so hard he almost fell. The white cloak barely caught himself and started an angry oath at the man who had bumped him, when another man staggered him with a deliberate aimed shoulder. Before matters could go any further, the white cloak's companions pulled him over to the side of the street to where they could shelter in a doorway. The three seemed caught between their normal glaring stare and disbelief. The crowd streamed on by as if none had noticed, and perhaps none had. No one would have dared do such a thing two days earlier. More, Rand realized, the men who had done the bumping wore white cockades on their hats. It was widely believed the white cloaks supported those who opposed the queen and her Aes Sedai advisor, but that made no difference. Men were doing things of which they had never before thought. Jostling a white cloak today. Tomorrow, perhaps pulling down a queen. Suddenly he wished there were a few more men close to him showing red. Jostled by white cockades and armbands, he abruptly felt very alone. The white cloaks noticed him looking at them and stared back as if meeting a challenge. He let a singing swirl in the crowd, sweep him out of their sight, and joined in their song. Forward the lion, forward the lion, the white lion takes the field. Roar defiance at the shadow, forward the lion, forward and or triumphant. The route that would bring the false dragon into Camelin was well known. Those streets themselves were kept clear by solid lines of the Queen's guards and red-cloaked pikemen, but people packed the edges of them shoulder to shoulder, even the windows and the rooftops. Rand worked his way into the inner city, trying to get closer to the palace. He had some thought of actually seeing Loghain displayed before the queen. To see the false dragon and a queen both, that was something he had never dreamed of back home. The inner city was built on hills, and much of what the ogre had made still remained. Where streets in the new city mostly ran every which way in a crazy quilt, here they followed the curves of the hills as if they were a natural part of the earth. Sweeping rises and dips presented new and surprising vistas at every turn. Parks seen from different angles, even from above, where their walks and monuments made patterns pleasing to the eye, though barely touched with green. Towers suddenly revealed, tile-covered walls glittering in the sunlight with a hundred changing colors. Sudden rises where the gaze was thrown out across the entire city to the rolling plains and forests beyond. All in all, it would have been something to see if not for the crowd that hurried him along before he had a chance to really take it in. And all those curving streets made it impossible to see very far ahead. Abruptly he was swept around a bend, and there was the palace. The streets, even following the natural contours of the land, had been laid out to spiral in on this, this gleeman's tale of pale spires and golden domes and intricate stonework traceries, with the banner of Andor waving from every prominence, a centerpiece for which all the other vistas had been designed. It seemed more sculpted by an artist than simply built like ordinary buildings. That glimpse showed him he would get no nearer. No one was being allowed close to the palace. Queen's guards made scarlet ranks ten deep flanking the palace gates. Along the tops of the white walls, on high balconies and towers, more guards stood rigidly straight, bows precisely slanted across breastplated chests. They too looked like something out of a gleeman's tale, a guard of honor. But Rand did not believe that was why they were there. The clamoring crowd lining the streets was almost solid with white-wrapped swords, white armbands, and white cockades. Only here and there was the white wall broken by a knot of red. The red-uniformed guards seemed a thin barrier against all that white. Giving up on making his way closer to the palace, he sought a place where he could use his height to advantage. He did not have to be in the front row to see everything. The crowd shifted constantly, people shoving to get nearer the front, people hurrying off to what they thought was a better vantage point. In one of those shifts he found himself only three people from the open street, 
and all in front of him were shorter than he, including the pikemen. Almost everyone was. People crowded against him from both sides, sweating from the press of so many bodies. Those behind him muttered about not being able to see and tried to wriggle past. He stood his ground, making an impervious wall with those to either side. He was content. When the false dragon passed by, he would be close enough to see the man's face clearly. Across the street and down toward the gates to the new city, a ripple passed through the tight-packed crowd. Around the curve, an eddy of people was drawing back to let something go by. It was not like the clear space that followed White Cloaks on any day but today. These people jerked themselves back with startled glances that became grimaces of distaste. Pressing themselves out of the way, they turned their faces from whatever it was, but watched out of the corners of their eyes until it was past. Other eyes around him noted the disturbance, too. Keyed for the coming of the dragon, but with nothing to do now but wait, the crowd found anything at all worthy of comment. He heard speculation ranging from an eyes Sedai to Loghain himself, and a few coarser suggestions that brought rough laughter from the men and disdainful sniffs from the women. The ripple meandered through the crowd, drawing closer to the edge of the street as it came. No one seemed to hesitate in letting it go where it wanted even if that meant losing a good spot for viewing as the crowd flowed back in on itself behind the passing. Finally, directly across from Rand, the crowd bulged into the street, pushing aside red-cloaked pikemen who struggled to shove them back, and broke open. The stooped shape that shuffled hesitantly out into the open looked more like a pile of filthy rags than a man. Rand heard murmurs of disgust around him. The ragged man paused on the far edge of the street. His cowl, torn and stiff with dirt, swung back and forth as if searching for something or listening. Abruptly he gave a wordless cry and flung out a dirty claw of a hand, pointing straight at Rand. Immediately he began to scuttle across the street like a bug. The beggar. Whatever ill chance had led the man to find him like this, Rand was suddenly sure that, dark friend or not, he did not want to meet him face to face. He could feel the beggar's eyes like greasy water on his skin. Especially he did not want the man close to him here, surrounded by people balanced on the brink of violence. The same voices that had laughed before now cursed him as he pushed his way back, away from the street. He hurried, knowing the densely packed mass through which he had to shove and wriggle would give way before the filthy man. Struggling to force a path through the crowd, he staggered and almost fell when he abruptly broke free. Flailing his arms to keep his balance, he turned the stagger into a run. People pointed at him. He was the only one not pressing the other way, and running at that. Shouts followed him. His cloak flapped behind him, exposing his red-clad sword. When he realized that, he ran faster. A lone supporter of the Queen, running, could well spark a white cockaded mob to pursuit even today. He ran, letting his long legs eat paving stones. Not until the shouts were left far behind did he allow himself to collapse against a wall, panting. He did not know where he was except that he was still within the inner city. He could not remember how many twists and turns he had taken along those curving streets. Poised to run again, he looked back the way he had come. Only one person moved on the street, a woman walking placidly along with her shopping basket. Almost everyone in the city was gathered for a glimpse of the false dragon. He can't have followed me. I must have left him behind. The beggar would not give up, he was sure of it, though he could not say why. That ragged shape would be working its way through the crowds at that very minute, searching, and if Rand returned to see Loghain, he ran the risk of a meeting. For a moment he considered going back to the Queen's blessing, but he was sure he would never get another chance to see a queen, and he hoped he would never have another to see a false dragon. There seemed to be something cowardly in letting a bent beggar, even a dark friend, chase him into hiding. He looked around, considering. The way the inner city was laid out, buildings were kept low, if there were buildings at all, so that someone standing at a particular spot would have nothing to interrupt the planned view. There had to be places from where he could see the procession pass with the false dragon. Even if he could not see the queen, he could see Loghain. Suddenly determined, he set off. 
In the next hour he found several such places, every last one already packed cheek to cheek with people avoiding the crush along the procession route. They were a solid front of white cockades and armbands, no red at all. Thinking what the sight of his sword might do in a crowd like that, he slipped away carefully and quickly. Shouting floated up from the new city, cries and the blaring of trumpets, the martial beat of drums. Loghain and his escort were already in Camelin, already on their way to the palace. Dispirited, he wandered the all but empty streets, still half-heartedly hoping to find some way to see Loghain. His eyes fell on the slope, bare of buildings, rising above the street where he was walking. In a normal spring the slope would be an expanse of flowers and grass, but now it was brown all the way to the high wall along its crest, a wall over which the tops of trees were visible. This part of the street had not been designed for any grand view, but just ahead, over the rooftops, he could see some of the palace spires, topped by white lion banners fluttering in the wind. He was not sure exactly where the curve of the street ran after it rounded the hill beyond his sight, but he suddenly had a thought about that hilltop wall. The drums and trumpets were drawing nearer, the shouting growing louder. Anxiously he scrambled up the slope. It was not meant to be climbed, but he dug his boots into the dead sod and pulled himself up using leafless shrubs as handholds. Panting as much with desire as effort, he scrambled the last yards to the wall. It reared above him easily twice his height and more. The air thundered with the drumbeat, rang with trumpet blasts. The face of the wall had been left much in the natural state of the stone. The huge blocks fitted together so well that the joins were nearly invisible the roughness making it seem almost a natural cliff. Rand grinned. The cliffs just beyond the sand hills were higher, and even Perrin had climbed those. His hands sought rocky knobs, his booted feet found ridges. The drums raced him as he climbed. He refused to let them win. He would reach the top before they reached the palace. In his haste the stone tore his hands and scraped his knees through his breeches but he flung his arms over the top and heaved himself up with a sense of victory. Hastily he twisted himself around to a seat on the flat, narrow top of the wall. The leafy branches of a towering tree stuck out over his head, but he had no thought for that. He looked across tiled rooftops, but from the wall his line of sight was clear. He leaned out just a little and could see the palace gate and the queen's guards drawn up there and the expectant crowd expectant, their shouts drowned out by the thunder of drums and trumpets, but waiting still. He grinned. I won. Even as he settled in place, the first part of the procession rounded the final curve before the palace. Twenty ranks of trumpeters came first, splitting the air with peal after triumphant peal, a fanfare of victory. Behind them, as many drummers thundered. Then came the banners of Camelin, white lions on red, borne by mounted men, followed by the soldiers of Camelin, rank on rank on rank of horsemen, armor gleaming, lances proudly held, crimson pennants fluttering. Treble rows of pikemen and archers flanked them, and came on and on after the horsemen began passing between the waiting guards and through the palace gates. The last of the foot soldiers rounded the curve, and behind them was a massive wagon. Sixteen horses pulled it in hitches of four. In the center of its flat bed was a large cage of iron bars, and on each corner of the wagon bed sat two women, watching the cage as intently as if the procession and the crowd did not exist. Eyes Sedai, he was certain. Between the wagon and the footman, and to either side, rode a dozen warders, their cloaks swirling and tangling the eye. If the Eyes Sedai ignored the crowd, the warders scanned it as if there were no other guards but they. With all of that, it was the man in the cage who caught and held Rand's eyes. He was not close enough to see Loghain's face as he had wanted to, but suddenly he thought he was as close as he cared for. The false dragon was a tall man, with long dark hair curling around his broad shoulders. He held himself upright against the sway of the wagon with one hand on the bars over his head. His clothes seemed ordinary, a cloak and coat and breeches that would not have caused comment in any farming village. 
but the way he wore them, the way he held himself. Loghain was a king in every inch of him. The cage might as well not have been there. He held himself erect, head high, and looked over the crowd as if they had come to do him honor. And wherever his gaze swept, there the people fell silent, staring back in awe. When Loghain's eyes left them, they screamed with redoubled fury as if to make up for their silence. But it made no difference in the way the man stood, or in the silence that passed along with him. As the wagon rolled through the palace gates, he turned to look back at the assembled masses. They howled at him beyond words, a wave of sheer animal hate and fear, and Loghain threw back his head and laughed as the palace swallowed him. Other contingents followed behind the wagons, with banners representing more who had fought and defeated the false dragon. The golden bees of Ilion, the three white crescents of Tyr, the rising sun of Kyrien, others, many others, of nations and of cities, and of great men with their own trumpets, their own drums to thunder their grandeur. It was anticlimactic after Loghain. Rand leaned out a bit further to try to catch one last sight of the caged man. He was defeated, wasn't he? Light, he wouldn't be in a bloody cage if he wasn't defeated. Overbalanced, he slipped and grabbed at the top of the wall, pulled himself back to a somewhat safer seat. With Loghain gone, he became aware of the burning in his hands where the stone had scraped his palms and fingers. Yet he could not shake free of the images. The cage and the eyes sedai. Loghain, undefeated. No matter the cage, that had not been a defeated man. He shivered and rubbed his stinging hands on his thighs. Why were the Aes Sedai watching him? he wondered aloud. They're keeping him from touching the true source, silly. He jerked to look up toward the girl's voice, and suddenly his precarious seat was gone. He had only time to realize that he was toppling backward, falling, when something struck his head and a laughing Loghain chased him into spinning darkness. Chapter 40 The Web Titans It seemed to Rand that he was sitting at table with Loghain and Moiraine. The Aes Sedai and the False Dragon sat watching him silently, as if neither knew the other was there. Abruptly he realized the walls of the room were becoming indistinct, fading off into gray. A sense of urgency built in him. Everything was going, blurring away. When he looked back to the table, Moraine and Loghain had vanished, and Baalzamon sat there instead. Rand's whole body vibrated with urgency. It hummed inside his head louder and louder. The hum became the pounding of blood in his ears. With a jerk he sat up, and immediately groaned and clutched his head, swaying. His whole skull hurt. His left hand found sticky dampness in his hair. He was sitting on the ground, on green grass. That troubled him vaguely, but his head spun and everything he looked at lurched, and all he could think of was lying down until it stopped. The wall. The girl's voice. Steadying himself with one hand flat on the grass, he looked around slowly. He had to do it slowly. When he tried to turn his head quickly, everything started whirling again. He was in a garden, or a park. A slate-paved walk meandered by through flowering bushes not six feet away, with a white stone bench beside it, and a leafy arbor over the bench for shade. He had fallen inside the wall. And the girl? He found the tree close behind his back and found her, too, climbing down out of it. She reached the ground and turned to face him, and he blinked and groaned again. A deep blue velvet cloak lined with pale fur rested on her shoulders, its hood hanging down behind to her waist with a cluster of silver bells at the peak. They jingled when she moved. A silver filigree circlet held her long red-gold curls, and delicate silver rings hung at her ears, while a necklace of heavy silver links and dark green stones he thought were emeralds lay around her throat. Her pale blue dress was smudged with bark stains from her tree-climbing, but it was still silk, 
and embroidered with painstakingly intricate designs, the skirts slashed with inserts the color of rich cream. A wide belt of woven silver encircled her waist, and velvet slippers peeked from under the hem of her dress. He had only ever seen two women dressed in this fashion, Moiraine and the dark friend who had tried to kill Matt and him. He could not begin to imagine who would choose to climb trees in clothes like that, but he was sure she had to be someone important. The way she was looking at him redoubled the impression. She did not seem in the least troubled at having a stranger tumble into her garden. There was a self-possession about her that made him think of Nynaeve or Moiraine. He was so enmeshed in worrying whether or not he had gotten himself into trouble, whether or not she was someone who could and would call the Queen's guards, even on a day when they had other things to occupy them, that it took him a few moments to see past the elaborate clothes and lofty attitude to the girl herself. She was perhaps two or three years younger than he, tall for a girl, and beautiful, her face a perfect oval framed by that mass of sunburst curls, her lips full and red, her eyes bluer than he could believe. She was completely different from Egwene in height and face and body, but every bit as beautiful. He felt a twinge of guilt, but told himself that denying what his eyes saw would not bring Egwene safely to Camelin one whit faster. A scrabbling sound came from up in the tree, and bits of bark fell, followed by a boy dropping lightly to the ground behind her. He was a head taller than she, and a little older, but his face and hair marked him as her close kin. His coat and cloak were red and white and gold, embroidered and brocaded, and for a male even more ornate than hers. That increased Rand's anxiety. Only on a feast day would any ordinary man dress in anything like that, and never with that much grandeur. This was no public park. Perhaps the guards were too busy to bother with trespassers. The boy studied Rand over the girl's shoulder, fingering the dagger at his waist. It seemed more a nervous habit than any thought that he might use it. Not completely, though. The boy had the same self-possession as the girl, and they both looked at him as if he were a puzzle to be solved. He had the odd feeling that the girl, at least, was cataloguing everything about him from the condition of his boots to the state of his cloak. "'We will never hear the end of this, Elaine, if Mother finds out,' the boy said suddenly. "'She told us to stay in our rooms, but you just had to get a look at Loghain, didn't you? Now look what it has got us. Be quiet, Gawain. She was clearly the younger of the two, but she spoke as though she took it for granted that he would obey. The boy's face struggled as if he had more to say, but to Rand's surprise he held his peace. "'Are you all right?' she said suddenly. It took Rand a minute to realize she was speaking to him. When he did, he tried to struggle to his feet. "'I'm fine. I just—' He tottered, and his legs gave way. He sat back down hard. His head swum. "'I'll just climb back over the wall,' he muttered. He attempted to stand again, but she put a hand on his shoulder, pressing him down. He was so dizzy the slight pressure was enough to hold him in place. "'You are hurt.' Gracefully she knelt beside him. Her fingers gently parted the blood-matted hair on the left side of his head. "'You must have struck a branch coming down. You will be lucky if you didn't break anything more than your scalp. I don't think I ever saw anyone as skillful at climbing as you. But you don't do so well falling.' "'You'll get blood on your hands,' he said, drawing back. Firmly she pulled his head back to where she could get at it. "'Hold still.' She did not speak sharply, but again there was that note in her voice, as if she expected to be obeyed. "'It does not look too bad, thank the light.' From pockets on the inside of her cloak she began taking out an array of tiny vials and twisted packets of paper, finishing with a handful of wadded bandage. He stared at the collection in amazement. It was the sort of thing he would have expected a wisdom to carry, not someone dressed as she was. She had gotten blood on her fingers, he saw, but it did not seem to bother her. "'Give me your water flask, Gawain,' she said. "'I need to wash this.' The boy she called Gawain unfastened a leather bottle from his belt and handed it to her, then squatted easily at Rand's feet with his arms folded on his knees. Elaine went about what she was doing in a very workmanlike manner. He did not flinch at the sting of cold water when she washed the cut in his scalp, 
but she held the top of his head with one hand as if she expected him to try to pull away again, and would have none of it. The ointment she smoothed on after, from one of her small vials, soothed almost as much as one of Nynaeve's preparations would have. Gawain smiled at him as she worked, a calming smile, as if he too expected Rand to jerk away and maybe even run. She's always finding stray cats and birds with broken wings. You are the first human being she has had to work on. He hesitated, then added, Do not be offended. I am not calling you a stray. It was not an apology, just a statement of fact. No offense taken, Rand said stiffly. But the pair were acting as if he were a skittish horse. She does know what she is doing, Gawain said. She has had the best teachers, so do not fear you are in good hands. Elaine pressed some of the bandaging against his temple and pulled a silk scarf from her belt, blue and cream and gold. For any girl in Eamon's field it would have been a treasured feast-day cloth. Elaine deftly began winding it around his head to hold the wad of bandage in place. "'You can't use that,' he protested. She went on winding. "'I told you to hold still,' she said calmly. Rand looked at Gawain. "'Does she always expect everybody to do what she tells them?' A flash of surprise crossed the young man's face, and his mouth tightened with amusement. Most of the time she does, and most of the time they do. Hold this, Elaine said. Put your hand there while I tie. She exclaimed at the sight of his hands. You did not do that falling. Climbing where you should not have been climbing is more like it. Quickly finishing her knot, she turned his palms upward in front of him muttering to herself about how little water was left. The washing made the lacerations burn, but her touch was surprisingly delicate. Hold still this time. The vial of ointment was produced again. She spread it thinly along the scrapes, all of her attention apparently on rubbing it in without hurting him. A coolness spread through his hands, as if she were rubbing the torn places away. Most of the time they do exactly what she says. Gowan went on with an affectionate grin at the top of her head. Most people. Not Mother, of course. Or Elida. And not Linny. Linny was her nurse. You can't give orders to someone who switched you for stealing figs when you were little. And even not so little. Elaine raised her head long enough to give him a dangerous look. He cleared his throat and carefully blanked his expression before hurrying on. And Gareth, of course. No one gives orders to Gareth. Not even mother, Elaine said, bending her head back over Wren's hands. She makes suggestions, and he always does what she suggests, but I've never heard her give him a command. She shook her head. I don't know why that always surprises you, Gawain answered her. Even you don't try telling Gareth what to do. He's served three queens and been Captain General and First Prince Regent for two. I dare say there are some think he's more a symbol of the throne of Andor than the queen is. "'Mother should go ahead and marry him,' she said absently. Her attention was on Rand's hands. "'She wants to. She can't hide it from me. And it would solve so many problems.' Gawain shook his head. "'One of them must bend first. Mother cannot, and Gareth will not. If she commanded him, he would obey, I think. But she won't. You know she won't.' Abruptly they turned to stare at Rand. He had the feeling they had forgotten he was there. Who... He had to stop to wet his lips. Who is your mother? Elaine's eyes widened in surprise, but Gawain spoke in an ordinary tone that made his words all the more jarring. Morgays, by the grace of the light Queen of Andor, protector of the realm, defender of the people, high seat of the house Trakund. The Queen, Rand muttered, shock spreading through him in waves of numbness. For a minute he thought his head was going to begin spinning again. Don't attract any attention. Just fall into the queen's garden and let the daughter heir tend your cuts like a hedge doctor. He wanted to laugh, and knew it for the fringes of panic. Drawing a deep breath, he scrambled hastily to his feet. He held himself tightly in rain against the urge to run, but the need to get away filled him, to get away before anyone else discovered him there. Elaine and Gawain watched him calmly, and when he leaped up they rose gracefully, not hurried in the least. He put up a hand to pull the scarf from his head, and Elaine seized his elbow. 
Stop that. You will start the bleeding again. Her voice was still calm, still sure that he would do as he was told. I have to go, Rand said. I'll just climb back over the wall and... You really didn't know. For the first time she seemed as startled as he was. Do you mean you climbed up on that wall to see Loghain without even knowing where you were? You could have gotten a much better view down in the streets. I... I don't like crowds, he mumbled. He sketched a bow to each of them. If you'll pardon me, uh, milady. In the stories, royal courts were full of people all calling one another Lord and Lady and Royal Highness and Majesty. But if he had ever heard the correct form of address for the daughter heir, he could not think clearly enough to remember. He could not think clearly about anything beyond the need to be far away. If you will pardon me, I'll just leave now. Uh, thank you for the... He touched the scarf around his head. Thank you. Without even telling us your name, Gawain said, a poor payment for Elaine's care. I've been wondering about you. You sound like an Andorman, though not a Camelaner, certainly. But you look like... Well, you know our names. Courtesy would suggest you give us yours. Looking longingly at the wall, Rand gave his right name before he thought what he was doing, and even added, From Eamon's Field in the Two Rivers. From the west, Gawain murmured. Very far to the west. Rand looked around at him sharply. There had been a note of surprise in the young man's voice, and Rand caught some of it still on his face when he turned. Gawain replaced it with a pleasant smile so quickly, though, that he almost doubted what he had seen. Tabak and wool, Gawain said. I have to know the principal products of every part of the realm, of every land, for that matter. Part of my training, principal products and crafts and what the people are like, their customs, their strengths and weaknesses. It's said Two Rivers people are stubborn. They can be led if they think you are worthy, but the harder you try to push them, the harder they dig in. Elaine ought to choose her husband from there. It'll take a man with a will like stone to keep from being trampled by her. Rand stared at him. Elaine was staring, too. Gawain looked as much under control as ever, but he was babbling. Why? What's this? All three of them jumped at the sudden voice and spun to face it. The young man who stood there was the handsomest man Rand had ever seen, almost too handsome for masculinity. He was tall and slender, but his movements spoke of whipcord strength and a sure confidence. Dark of hair and eye, he wore his clothes only a little less elaborate in red and white than Gawain's, as if they were of no importance. One hand rested on his sword-hilt, and his eyes were steady on Rand. "'Stand away from him, Elaine,' the man said. "'You too, Gawain.' Elaine stepped in front of Rand, between him and the newcomer, head high and as confident as ever. "'He is a loyal subject of our mother, and a good queen's man.' and he is under my protection, Galad. Rand tried to remember what he had heard from Master Kinch, and since from Master Gill. Galadidrid Damodred was Elaine's half-brother, Elaine's and Gawain's, if you remembered correctly. The three shared the same father. Master Kinch might not have liked Tarangale Damodred too well, neither did anyone else that he had heard, but the son was well thought of by wearers of the red and the white alike, if talk in the city was any guide. I am aware of your fondness for strays, Elaine, the slender man said reasonably, but the fellow is armed, and he hardly looks reputable. In these days we cannot be too careful. If he's a loyal queen's man, what is he doing here where he does not belong? It is easy enough to change the wrappings on a sword, Elaine. He is here as my guest, Galad, and I vouch for him. Or have you appointed yourself my nurse to decide whom I may talk to and when? Her voice was rich with scorn, but Galad seemed unmoved. You know I make no claims for control over your actions, Elaine, but this guest of yours is not proper, and you know that as well as I. Gawain, help me convince her. Our mother would— Enough, Elaine snapped. You are right that you have no say over my actions, nor have you any right to judge them. You may leave me. Now! 
Galad gave Gawain a rueful look. At one and the same time it seemed to ask for help, while saying that Elaine was too headstrong to be helped. Elaine's face darkened, but just as she opened her mouth again, he bowed. In all formality, yet with the grace of a cat, took a step back, then turned and strode down the paved path, his long legs carrying him quickly out of sight beyond the arbor. I hate him, Elaine breathed. He is vile and full of envy. There you go too far, Elaine, Gawain said. Galad does not know the meaning of envy. Twice he has saved my life, with none to know if he held his hand. If he had not, he would be your first prince of the sword in my place. Never, Gawain. I would choose anyone before Galad. Anyone. The lowest stable boy. Suddenly she smiled and gave her brother a mock stern look. You say I am fond of giving orders. Well, I command you to let nothing happen to you. I command you to be my first prince of the sword when I take the throne. The light send that day is far off. And to lead the armies of Andor with the sort of honor Galad cannot dream of. As you command, my lady. Gawain laughed, his bow a parody of Galad's. Elaine gave Rand a thoughtful frown. Now we must get you out of here quickly. Galad always does the right thing, Gawain explained, even when he should not. In this case, finding a stranger in the gardens, the right thing is to notify the palace guards, which I suspect he is on his way to do right this minute. Then it's time I was back over the wall, Rand said. A fine day for going unnoticed. I might as well carry a sign. He turned to the wall, but Elaine caught his arm. Not after the trouble I went to with your hands. You'll only make fresh scrapes and then let some back-alley crone put the light nose what on them. There is a small gate on the other side of the garden. It's overgrown, and no one but me even remembers it's there. Suddenly Rand heard boots pounding toward them over the slate paving stones. Too late, Gawain muttered. He must have started running as soon as he was out of eyeshot. Elaine growled an oath, and Rand's eyebrows shot up. He had heard that one from the stableman at the Queen's Blessing, and had been shocked then. The next moment she was in cool self-possession once more. Gawain and Elaine appeared content to remain where they were, but he could not make himself stay for the Queen's guards with such equanimity. He started once more for the wall, knowing he would be no more than halfway up before the guards arrived, but unable to stand still. Before he had taken three steps, red-uniformed men burst into sight, breastplates catching the sun as they dashed up the path. Others came like breaking waves of scarlet and polished steel, seemingly from every direction. Some held drawn swords. Others only waited to set their boots before raising bows and knocking feathered shafts. Behind the barred face guards, every eye was grim and every broadhead arrow was pointed unwaveringly at him. Elaine and Gawain leaped as one, putting themselves between him and the arrows, their arms spread to cover him. He stood very still and kept his hands in plain sight away from his sword. While the thud of boots and the creak of bowstring still hung in the air, one of the soldiers, with the golden knot of an officer on his shoulder, shouted, My lady, my lord, down quickly! Despite her outstretched arms, Elaine drew herself up regally. You... Dare to bring bare steel into my presence, Tullinvor? Gareth Bryn will have you mucking stables with the meanest trooper for this, if you are lucky. The soldiers exchanged puzzled glances, and some of the bowmen uneasily half-lowered their bows. Only then did Elaine let her arms down, as if she had only held them up because she wished to. Garwin hesitated, then followed her example. Rand could count the bows that had not been lowered. The muscles of his stomach tensed as though they could stop a broadhead shaft at twenty paces. The man with the officer's knot seemed the most perplexed of all. Milady, forgive me, but Lord Galadadrid reported a dirty peasant skulking in the gardens, armed and endangering Milady Elaine and my Lord Gawain. His eyes went to Rand, and his voice firmed. If Milady and my Lord will please to step aside, I will take the villain into custody. There is too much riffraff in the city these days. I doubt very much if Galad reported anything of the kind, Elaine said. Galad does not lie. Sometimes I wish he would, Gawain said softly for Rand's ear. Just once. It might make living with him easier. This man is my guest, Elaine continued, and here under my protection. 
you may withdraw, Talonvor. I regret that will not be possible, my lady. As my lady knows, the queen, your lady mother, has given orders regarding anyone on palace grounds without her majesty's permission, and word has been sent to her majesty of this intruder. There was more than a hint of satisfaction in Talonvor's voice. Rand suspected the officer had had to accept other commands from Elaine that he did not think proper. This time the man was not about to, not when he had a perfect excuse. Elaine stared back at Talonvor. For once she seemed at a loss. Rand looked a question at Gawain, and Gawain understood. Prison, he murmured. Rand's face went white, and the young man added quickly, Only for a few days, and you will not be harmed. You'll be questioned by Gareth Bryn, the Captain General, personally, but you will be set free once it's clear you meant no harm. He paused, hidden thoughts in his eyes. I hope you were telling the truth, Randall Thor, from the two rivers. You will conduct all three of us to my mother, Elaine announced suddenly. A grin bloomed on Gawain's face. Behind the steel bars across his face, Talonvor appeared taken aback. My lady, I... Or else conduct all three of us to a cell, Elaine said. We will remain together. Or will you give orders for hands to be laid upon my person? Her smile was victorious, and the way Talonvor looked around as if he expected to find help in the trees said he too thought she had won. Won what? How? Mother is viewing Loghain, Gawain said softly, as if he had read Rand's thoughts. And even if she was not busy, Talonvor would not dare troop into her presence with Elaine and me as if we were under guard. Mother has a bit of a temper sometimes. Rand remembered what Master Gill had said about Queen Morgays. A bit of a temper? Another red-uniformed soldier came running down the path, skidding to a halt to salute with an arm across his chest. He spoke softly to Talonvor, and his words brought satisfaction back to Talonvor's face. The Queen, your lady mother, Talonvor announced, commands me to bring the intruder to her immediately. It is also the Queen's command that my lady Elaine and my lord Gawain attend her. Also immediately. Gawain winced, and Elaine swallowed hard. Her face composed, she still began industriously brushing at the stains on her dress. Aside from dislodging a few pieces of bark, her effort did little good. If my lady pleases, Talonvor said smugly. My lord? The soldiers formed around them in a hollow box that started along the slate path with Talonvor leading. Gawain and Elaine walked on either side of Rand, both appearing lost in unpleasant thoughts. The soldiers had sheathed their swords and returned arrows to quivers, but they were no less on guard than when they had had weapons in hand. They watched Rand as if they expected him at any moment to snatch his sword and try to cut his way to freedom. Try anything? I won't try anything. Unnoticed. Ha! Watching the soldiers watching him, he suddenly became aware of the garden. He had regained his balance completely since the fall. One thing had happened after another. Each new shock coming before the last had a chance to fade, and his surroundings had been a blur except for the wall and his devout wish to be back on the other side of it. Now he saw the green grass that had only tickled the back of his mind before green. A hundred shades of green, trees and bushes green and thriving, thick with leaves and fruit, lush vines covering arbors over the path, flowers everywhere, so many flowers, spraying the garden with color. Some he knew, bright golden sunburst and tiny pink tallow end, crimson star blaze and purple Eamon's glory, roses in every color from purest white to deep, deep red, but others were strange, so fanciful in shape and hue he wondered if they could be real. It's green, he whispered. Green. The soldiers muttered to themselves. Talonvor gave them a sharp look over his shoulder, and they fell silent. Elida's work, Gawain said absently. It is not right, Elaine said. She asked if I wanted to pick out the one farm she could do the same for, while all around it the crops still failed. But it still isn't right for us to have flowers when there are people who do not have enough to eat. She drew a deep breath and refilled her self-possession. 
"'Remember yourself,' she told Rand briskly. "'Speak up clearly when you are spoken to, and keep silent otherwise, and follow my lead. All will be well.' Rand wished he could share her confidence. It would have helped if Gawain had seemed to have it as well. As Talonvor led them into the palace, he looked back at the garden, at all the green streaked with blossoms, colors wrought for a queen by an eyes Sedai's hand. He was in deep water, and there was no bank in sight. Palace servants filled the halls in red liveries with collars and cuffs of white, the white lion on the left breast of their tunics, scurrying about intent on tasks that were not readily apparent. When the soldiers trooped by with Elaine and Gawain and Rand in their midst, they stopped dead in their tracks to stare open-mouthed. Through the middle of all the consternation, a grey-striped tomcat wandered unconcernedly down the hall, weaving between the goggling servants. Suddenly the cat struck Rand as odd. He had been in Berlin long enough to know that even the meanest shop had cats lurking in every corner. Since entering the palace, the tom was the only cat he had seen. "'You don't have rats?' he said in disbelief. Every place had rats. Elida doesn't like rats, Gowan muttered vaguely. He was frowning worriedly down the hall, apparently already seeing the coming meeting with the queen. We never have rats. Both of you be quiet. Elaine's voice was sharp, but as absent as her brother's. I am trying to think. Rand watched the cat over his shoulder until the guards took him round a corner, hiding the tom from sight. A lot of cats would have made him feel better. It would have been nice if there was one thing normal about the palace, even if it was rats. The path Talonvor took turned so many times that Rand lost his sense of direction. Finally the young officer stopped before tall double doors of dark wood, with a rich glow, not so grand as some they had passed, but still carved all over with rows of lions finely wrought in detail. A liveried servant stood to either side. At least it isn't the Grand Hall, Gawain laughed unsteadily. I never heard that Mother commanded anyone's head cut off from here. He sounded as if he thought she might set a precedent. Talonvor reached for Rand's sword, but Elaine moved to cut him off. He is my guest, and by custom and law guests of the royal family may go armed even in Mother's presence. Or will you deny my word that he is my guest? Talonvor hesitated locking eyes with her, then nodded. Very well, my lady. She smiled at Rand as Talonvor stepped back, but it lasted only a moment. First rank to accompany me, Talonvor commanded. Announce the Lady Elaine and the Lord Gawain to Her Majesty, he told the doorkeepers. Also guardsman Lieutenant Talonvor at Her Majesty's command, with the intruder under guard. Elaine scowled at Talonvor, but the doors were already swinging open. A sonorous voice sounded, announcing those who came. Grandly, Elaine swept through the doors, spoiling her regal entrance only a little by motioning for Rand to keep close behind her. Gawain squared his shoulders and strode in flanking her, one measured pace to her rear. Rand followed, uncertainly keeping level with Gawain on her other side. Talonvor stayed close to Rand, and ten soldiers came with him. The doors closed silently behind them. Suddenly Elaine dropped into a deep curtsy, simultaneously bowing from the waist, and stayed there, holding her skirt wide. Rand gave a start, then hastily emulated Gawain and the other men, shifting awkwardly until he had it right. Down on his right knee, head bowed, bending forward to press the knuckles of his right hand against the marble tiles, his left hand resting on the end of his sword hilt. Gawain, without a sword, put his hand on his dagger the same way. Rand was just congratulating himself on getting it right when he noticed Talonvor, his head still bent, glaring sideways at him from behind his face guard. Was I supposed to do something else? He was suddenly angry that Talonvor expected him to know what to do when no one had told him, and angry over being afraid of the guards. He had done nothing to be fearful for. He knew his fear was not Talonvor's fault, but he was angry at him anyway. Everyone held their positions, frozen as if waiting for the spring thaw. He did not know what they were waiting for, but he took the opportunity to study the place to which he had been brought. He kept his head down, just turning it enough to see. Talonvor's scowl deepened, but he ignored it. 
The square chamber was about the size of the common room at the Queen's Blessing, its walls presenting hunting scenes carved in relief in stone of the purest white. The tapestries between the carvings were gentle images of bright flowers and brilliantly plumaged hummingbirds, except for the two at the far end of the room, where the white lion of Andor stood taller than a man on scarlet fields. Those two hangings flanked a dais, and on the dais a carved and gilded throne, where sat the queen. A bluff, blocky man stood bareheaded by the queen's right hand in the red of the queen's guards, with four golden knots on the shoulder of his cloak and wide golden bands breaking the white of his cuffs. His temples were heavy with gray, but he looked as strong and immovable as a rock. That had to be the Captain General, Gareth Bryn. Behind the throne, and to the other side, a woman in deep green silk sat on a low stool, knitting something out of dark, almost black wool. At first the knitting made Rand think she was old, but at second glance he could not put an age to her at all. Young, old, he did not know. Her attention seemed to be entirely on her needles and yarn, just as if there were not a queen within arm's reach of her. She was a handsome woman, outwardly placid, yet there was something terrible in her concentration. There was no sound in the room except for the click of her needles. He tried to look at everything, yet his eyes kept going back to the woman with the gleaming wreath of finely wrought roses on her brow, the rose crown of Andor. A long red stole, the lion of Andor marching along its length, hung over her silken dress of red and white pleats, and when she touched the Captain General's arm with her left hand, a ring in the shape of the great serpent, eating its own tail, glittered. Yet it was not the grandeur of clothes or jewelry or even crown that drew Rand's eyes again and again. It was the woman who wore them. Morgay's had her daughter's beauty, matured and ripened. Her face and figure, her presence, filled the room like a light that dimmed the other two with her. If she had been a widow in Eamon's field, she would have had a line of suitors outside her door, even if she was the worst cook and most slovenly housekeeper in the two rivers. He saw her studying him and ducked his head, afraid she might be able to tell his thoughts from his face. Light, thinking about the queen like she was a village woman. You fool! You may rise, Morgay said in a rich, warm voice that held Elaine's assurance of obedience a hundred times over. Rand stood with the rest. Mother, Elaine began, but Morgay's cut her off. You have been climbing trees, it seems, daughter. Elaine plucked a stray fragment of bark from her dress, and finding there was no place to put it, held it clenched in her hand. In fact, Morgay's went on calmly, it would seem that despite my orders to the contrary, you have contrived to take your look at this Loghain. Gawain, I have thought better of you. You must learn not only to obey your sister, but at the same time to be counterweight for her against disaster. The queen's eyes swung to the blocky man beside her, then quickly away again. Bryn remained impassive, as if he had not noticed. But Rand thought those eyes noticed everything. That Gawain is as much the duty of the First Prince as is leading the armies of Andor. Perhaps if your training is intensified, you will find less time for letting your sister lead you into trouble. I will ask the Captain General to see that you do not lack for things to do on the journey north. Gawain shifted his feet, as if about to protest, then bowed his head instead. As you command, Mother. Elaine grimaced. Mother, Gawain cannot keep me out of trouble if he is not with me. It was for that reason alone he left his rooms. Mother, surely there could be no harm in just looking at Loghain. Almost everyone in the city was closer to him than we. Everyone in the city is not the daughter heir. Sharpness underlay the queen's voice. I have seen this fellow Loghain from close, and he is dangerous, child. Caged, with eyes Sedai to guard him every minute, he is still as dangerous as a wolf. I wish he had never been brought near Camelon. He will be dealt with in Tarvalon. The woman on the stool did not take her eyes from her knitting as she spoke. What is important is that the people see that the light has once again vanquished the dark, and that they see you are a part of that victory, Morgays. Morgays waved a dismissive hand. I would still rather he had never come near Camelin. 
Elaine, I know your mind. Mother, Elaine protested, I do mean to obey you. Truly I do. You do? Morgaze asked in mock surprise, then chuckled. Yes, you do try to be a dutiful daughter, but you constantly test how far you may go. Well, I did the same with my mother. That spirit will stand you in good stead when you ascend to the throne, but you are not queen yet, child. You have disobeyed me and had your look at Loghain. Be satisfied with that. On the journey north you will not be allowed within one hundred paces of him, neither you nor Gawain. If I did not know just how hard your lessons will be in Tarvalon, I would send Linny along to see that you obey. She, at least, seems able to make you do as you must. Elaine bowed her head sullenly. The woman behind the throne seemed occupied with counting her stitches. In one week, she said suddenly, you will be wanting to come home to your mother. In a month you will be wanting to run away with the travelling people. But my sisters will keep you away from the unbeliever. That sort of thing is not for you, not yet. Abruptly she turned on the stool to look intently at Elaine, all her placidity gone as if it had never been. You have it in you to be the greatest queen that Andor has ever seen, that any land has seen in more than a thousand years. It is for that we will shape you, if you have the strength for it. Rand stared at her. She had to be Elida, the Aes Sedai. Suddenly he was glad he had not come to her for help, no matter what her Aja. A sternness far beyond Moiraine's radiated from her. He had sometimes thought of Moiraine as steel covered with velvet. With Elida, the velvet was only an illusion. Enough, Elida, Morghese said, frowning uneasily. She has heard that more than enough. The wheel weaves as the wheel wills. For a moment she was silent, looking at her daughter. Now there is the problem of this young man. She gestured to Rand without taking her eyes off Elaine's face. And how and why he came here, and why you claimed guest right for him to your brother. May I speak, mother? When Morghese nodded her assent, Elaine told of events simply from the time she first saw Rand climbing up the slope to the wall. He expected her to finish by proclaiming the innocence of what he had done, but instead she said, Mother, often you tell me I must know our people, from the highest to the lowest, but whenever I meet any of them it is with a dozen attendants. How can I come to know anything real or true under such circumstances? In speaking with this young man I have already learned more about the people of the two rivers, what kind of people they are, than I ever could from books. It says something that he has come so far and has put on the red, when so many incomers wear the white from fear. Mother, I beg you not to misuse a loyal subject, and one who has taught me much about the people you rule. A loyal subject from the two rivers. Morghese sighed. My child, you should pay more heed to those books. The two rivers has not seen a tax collector in six generations, nor the queen's guards in seven. I dare say they seldom even think to remember they are part of the realm. Rand shrugged uncomfortably recalling his surprise when he was told the two rivers was part of the realm of Andor. The queen saw him and smiled ruefully at her daughter. You see, child? Elida had put down her knitting, Rand realized, and was studying him. She rose from her stool and slowly came down from the dais to stand before him. From the two rivers, she said. She reached a hand toward his head. He pulled away from her touch, and she let her hand drop. With that red in his hair and grey eyes, two rivers people are dark of hair and eye, and they seldom have such height. Her hand darted out to push back his coat sleeve, exposing lighter skin the sun had not reached so often. Or such skin. It was an effort not to clench his fists. I was born in Eamon's Field, he said stiffly. My mother was an outlander. That's where my eyes come from. My father is Tamal Thor, a shepherd and farmer as I am. Elida nodded slowly, never taking her eyes from his face. He met her gaze with a levelness that belied the sour feeling in his stomach. He saw her note the steadiness of his look. Still meeting him eye to eye, she moved her hand slowly toward him again. 
he resolved not to flinch this time. It was his sword she touched, not him, her hand closing around the hilt at the very top. Her fingers tightened and her eyes opened wide with surprise. A shepherd from the two rivers, she said softly, a whisper meant to be heard by all, with a heronmark sword. Those last few words acted on the chamber as if she had announced the Dark One. Leather and metal creaked behind Rand, boots scuffling on the marble tiles. From the corner of his eye he could see Talonvor and another of the guardsmen backing away from him to gain room, hands on their swords, prepared to draw and from their faces prepared to die. In two quick strides Gareth Bryn was at the front of the dais between Rand and the Queen. Even Gawain put himself in front of Elaine, a worried look on his face and a hand on his dagger. Elaine herself looked at him as if she were seeing him for the first time. Morgay's did not change expression, but her hands tightened on the gilded arms of her throne. Only Elida showed less reaction than the Queen. The Aes Sedai gave no sign that she had said anything out of the ordinary. She took her hand from the sword, causing the soldiers to tense even more. Her eyes stayed on his unruffled and calculating. Surely, Morgay said, her voice level, he is too young to have earned a heronmark blade. He cannot be any older than Garwin. It belongs with him, Gareth Bryn said. The queen looked at him in surprise. How can that be? I do not know, Morgay, Bryn said slowly. He is too young. Yet still it belongs with him, and he with it. Look at his eyes. Look how he stands, how the sword fits him, and he it. He is too young, but the sword is his. When the Captain General fell silent, Elida said, How did you come by this blade, Randolph Thor, from the two rivers? She said it as if she doubted his name as much as she did where he was from. My father gave it to me, Rand said. It was his. He thought I'd need a sword out in the world. Yet another shepherd from the two rivers with a heronmark blade. Elida's smile made his mouth go dry. When did you arrive in Camelon? He had had enough of telling this woman the truth. She made him as afraid as any dark friend had. It was time to start hiding again. Today, he said, this morning. Just in time, she murmured. Where are you staying? Don't say you have not found a room somewhere. You look a little tattered, but you have had a chance to freshen. Where? The Crown and Lion. He remembered passing the Crown and Lion while looking for the Queen's blessing. It was on the other side of the new city from Master Gill's Inn. I have a bed there, in the attic. He had the feeling that she knew he was lying, but she only nodded. What chance this, she said. Today the unbeliever is brought into Camelon. In two days he will be taken north to Tarvalon, and with him goes the daughter heir for her training. And at just this juncture a young man appears in the palace gardens, claiming to be a loyal subject from the two rivers. I am from the two rivers. They were all looking at him but all ignored him. All but Talonvor and the guards. Those eyes never blinked. With a story calculated to entice Elaine and bearing a heronmark blade. He does not wear an armband or a cockade to proclaim his allegiance, but wrappings that carefully conceal the heron from inquisitive eyes. What chance this, Morgays? The queen motioned the captain-general to stand aside. And when he did, she studied Rand with a troubled look. It was to Elida that she spoke, though. What are you naming him? Dark friend? One of Loghain's followers? The Dark One stirs in Sheol Ghul, the Aes Sedai replied. The shadow lies across the pattern, and the future is balanced on the point of a pin. This one is dangerous. Suddenly Elaine moved, throwing herself onto her knees before the throne. Mother, I beg you not to harm him. He would have left immediately had I not stopped him. He wanted to go. It was I who made him stay. I cannot believe he is a dark friend. 
Morgaze made a soothing gesture toward her daughter, but her eyes remained on Rand. Is this a foretelling, Elida? Are you reading the pattern? You say it comes on you when you least expect it, and goes as suddenly as it comes. If this is a foretelling, Elida, I command you to speak the truth clearly, without your usual habit of wrapping it in so much mystery that no one can tell if you have said yes or no. Speak. What do you see? This I foretell, Elida replied, and swear under the light that I can say no clearer. From this day Andor marches toward pain and division. The shadow has yet to darken to its blackest, and I cannot see if the light will come after. Where the world has wept one tear, it will weep thousands. This I foretell. A pall of silence clung to the room, broken only by Morgay's expelling her breath as if it were her last. Elida continued to stare into Rand's eyes. She spoke again, barely moving her lips, so softly that he could barely hear her less than an arm's length away. This too I foretell. Pain and division come to the whole world, and this man stands at the heart of it. I obey the queen, she whispered, and speak it clearly. Rand felt as if his feet had become rooted in the marble floor. The cold and stiffness of the stone crept up his legs and sent a shiver up his spine. No one else could have heard, but she was still looking at him, and he had heard. I'm a shepherd, he said for the entire room, from the two rivers, a shepherd. The wheel weaves as the wheel wills, Elida said aloud, and he could not tell if there was a touch of mockery in her tone or not. Lord Gareth, Morgays said, I need the advice of my Captain General. The blocky man shook his head. Elida Sedai says the lad is dangerous, my queen. And if she could tell more, I would say, summon the headsman. But all she says is what any of us can see with our own eyes. There's not a farmer in the countryside won't say things will get worse, without any foretelling. Myself, I believe the boy is here through mere happenstance, though an ill one for him. To be safe, my queen... I say, clap him in a cell, till the Lady Elaine and the Lord Garwin are well on their way. Then let him go. Unless, I said I, you have more to foretell concerning him? I have said all that I have read in the pattern, Captain General, Elida said. She flashed a hard smile at Rand, a smile that barely bent her lips, mocking his inability to say that she was not telling the truth. A few weeks imprisoned will not harm him and it may give me a chance to learn more. Hunger filled her eyes, deepening his chill. Perhaps another foretelling will come. For a time Morgaze considered, chin on her fist and elbow on the arm of her throne. Rand would have shifted under her frowning gaze if he could have moved at all, but Elida's eyes froze him solid. Finally the queen spoke. Suspicion is smothering Camelon, perhaps all of Andor. Fear and black suspicion. Women denounce their neighbors for dark friends. Men scrawl the dragon's fang on the doors of people they have known for years. I will not become part of it. More gaze, Elida began, but the queen cut her off. I will not become part of it. When I took the throne, I swore to uphold justice for the high and the low. And I will uphold it even if I am the last in Andor to remember justice. Randall Thor, do you swear under the light that your father, a shepherd in the two rivers, gave you this heronmark blade? Rand worked his mouth to get enough moisture to speak. I do. Abruptly remembering to whom he was speaking, he hastily added, My queen. Lord Gareth raised a heavy eyebrow, but Morgaze did not seem to mind. And you climbed the garden wall simply to gain a look at the false dragon? Yes, my queen. Do you mean harm to the throne of Andor? Or to my daughter or my son? Her tone said the last two would gain him even shorter shrift than the first. I mean no harm to anyone, my queen. To you and yours least of all. I will give you justice then, Randall Thor, she said. 
First, because I have the advantage of Elida and Gareth in having heard Two Rivers' speech when I was young. You have not the look, but if a dim memory can serve me, you have the Two Rivers on your tongue. Second, no one with your hair and eyes would claim that he is a Two Rivers' shepherd unless it was true, and that your father gave you a heronmark blade is too preposterous to be a lie. And third, the voice that whispers to me that the best lie is often one too ridiculous to be taken for a lie. That voice is not proof. I will uphold the laws I have made. I give you your freedom, Randolph Thor, but I suggest you take a care where you trespass in the future. If you are found on the palace grounds again, it will not go so easily with you. Thank you, my queen, he said hoarsely. He could feel Elida's displeasure like a heat on his face. Talonvor, Morgaze said, escort this, escort my daughter's guest from the palace and show him every courtesy. The rest of you go as well. No, Elida, you stay, and if you will too, please, Lord Gareth. I must decide what to do about these white cloaks in the city. Talonvor and the guardsmen sheathed their swords reluctantly, ready to draw again in an instant. Still, Rand was glad to let the soldiers form a hollow box around him and to follow Talonvor. Elida was only half attending what the queen was saying. He could feel her eyes on his back. What would have happened if Morghese had not kept the eyes Sedai with her? The thought made him wish the soldiers would walk faster. To his surprise, Elaine and Gawain exchanged a few words outside the door, then fell in beside him. Talonvor was surprised, too. The young officer looked from them back to the doors, closing now. "'My mother,' Elaine said, "'ordered him to be escorted from the palace, Talonvor, with every courtesy. What are you waiting for?' Talonvor scowled at the doors, behind which the queen was conferring with her advisers. "'Nothing, my lady,' he said sourly, and needlessly ordered the escort forward. The wonders of the palace slid by Rand unseen. He was befuddled, snatches of thought spinning by too fast to grasp. You have not the look. This man stands at the heart of it. The escort stopped. He blinked, startled to find himself in the great court at the front of the palace, standing at the tall gilded gates gleaming in the sun. Those gates would not be opened for a single man, certainly not for a trespasser, even if the daughter heir did claim guest right for him. Wordlessly, Talonvor unbarred a sally port, a small door set within one gate. It is the custom, Elaine said, to escort guests as far as the gates, but not to watch them go. It is the pleasure of a guest's company that should be remembered, not the sadness of parting. Thank you, my lady, Rand said. He touched the scarf bandaging his head. For everything. Custom in the two rivers is for a guest to bring a small gift. I'm afraid I have nothing. Although, he added dryly, apparently I did teach you something of the two rivers folk. If I had told Mother I think you are handsome, she certainly would have had you locked in a cell. Elaine favored him with a dazzling smile. Fare you well, Randall Thor. Gaping, he watched her go, a younger version of Morghese's beauty and majesty. Do not try to bandy words with her. Gawain laughed. She will win every time. Rand nodded absently. Handsome. Light, the daughter heir to the throne of Andor. He gave himself a shake to clear his head. Gawain seemed to be waiting for something. Rand looked at him for a moment. My lord, when I told you I was from the two rivers, you were surprised. And everybody else, your mother, Lord Gareth, Elida Sedai, a shiver ran down his back. None of them. He could not finish it. He was not even sure why he started. I am Tamal Thor's son, even if I was not born in the two rivers. Gawain nodded as if it was for this he had been waiting. Still he hesitated. Rand opened his mouth to take back the unspoken question, and Gawain said, Wrap a shufa around your head, Rand, and you would be the image of an Aielman. 
Odd, since Mother seems to think you sound like a Two Rivers man, at least. I wish we could have come to know one another, Randolph Orr. Fare you well. An Aeelman. Rand stood watching Gawain's retreating back until an impatient cough from Talonvor reminded him where he was. He ducked through the sally port, barely clearing his heels before Talonvor slammed it behind him. The bars inside were jammed into place loudly. The oval plaza in front of the palace was empty now. All the soldiers gone, all the crowds, trumpets and drums vanished in silence. Nothing left but a scattering of litter blowing across the pavement, and a few people hurrying about their business now that the excitement was done. He could not make out if they showed the red or the white. Aeelman. With a start he realized he was standing right in front of the palace gates, right where Elida could find him easily once she finished with the queen. Pulling his cloak close, he broke into a trot across the plaza and into the streets of the inner city. He looked back frequently to see if anyone was following him, but the sweeping curves kept him from seeing very far. He could remember Elida's eyes all too well, though, and imagine them watching. By the time he reached the gates to the new city, he was running. Chapter 41 Old Friends and New Threats Back at the Queen's blessing, Rand threw himself against the front door frame, panting. He had run all the way, not caring if anyone saw that he wore the red, or even if they took his running as an excuse to chase him. He did not think even a fade could have caught him. Lamguin was sitting on a bench by the door, a brindle cat in his arms, when he came running up. The man stood to look for trouble the way Rand had come, still calmly scratching behind the cat's ears. Seeing nothing, he sat back down again careful not to disturb the animal. Fools tried to steal some of the cats a while back, he said. He examined his knuckles before going back to his scratching. Good money in cats these days. The two men showing the white were still across the way, Rand saw, one with a black eye and a swollen jaw. That one wore a sour scowl and rubbed his sword hilt with a sullen eagerness as he watched the inn. Where's Master Gill? Rand asked. Library, Lamguin replied. The cat began purring, and he grinned. Nothing bothers a cat for long, not even somebody trying to stick him in a sack. Rand hurried inside through the common room, now with its usual complement of men wearing the red and talking over their ale. About the false dragon, and whether the white cloaks would make trouble when he was taken north. No one cared what happened to Loghain, but they all knew the daughter heir and Lord Garwin would be travelling in the party, and no man there would countenance any risk to them. He found Master Gill in the library, playing stones with Loyal. A plump tabby sat on the table, feet tucked under her, watching their hands move over the cross-hatched board. The Ogre placed another stone with a touch oddly delicate for his thick fingers. Shaking his head, Master Gill took the excuse of Rand's appearance to turn from the table. Loyal almost always won at stones. I was beginning to worry where you were, lad. Thought you might have had trouble with some of those white-flashing traitors or run into that beggar or something. For a minute Rand stood there with his mouth open. He had forgotten all about that bundle of rags of a man. I saw him, he said finally, but that's nothing. I saw the Queen, too, and Elida. That's where the trouble is. Master Gill snorted a laugh. The Queen, eh? You don't say. We had Gareth Brynn out in the common room an hour or so ago, arm-wrestling the Lord Captain Commander of the Children, but the Queen, now. That's something. Blood and ashes, Rand growled. Everybody thinks I'm lying today. He tossed his cloak across the back of a chair and threw himself onto another. He was too wound up to sit back. He perched on the front edge, mopping his face with a handkerchief. I saw the beggar, and he saw me, and I thought— that's not important. I climbed up on a wall around a garden where I could see the plaza in front of the palace where they took Loghain in, and I fell off on the inside. I almost believe you aren't making fun, the innkeeper said slowly. Tavirin, Loyal murmured. Oh, it happened, Rand said. Light help me, it did. 
Master Gill's skepticism melted slowly as he went on, turning to quiet alarm. The innkeeper leaned more and more forward until he was perched on the edge of his chair the same as Rand was. Loyal listened impassively, except that every so often he rubbed his broad nose and the tufts on his ears gave a little twitch. Rand told everything that had happened, everything except what Elida had whispered to him, and what Gawain had said at the palace gate. One he did not want to think about. The other had nothing to do with anything. I'm Tam Althor's son, even if I wasn't born in the two rivers. I am. I'm two rivers' blood, and Tam is my father. Abruptly he realized he had stopped talking, caught up in his thoughts, and they were looking at him. For one panicky moment he wondered if he had said too much. Well, Master Gill said, there's no more waiting for your friends for you. You will have to leave the city, and fast, two days at the most. Can you get Matt on his feet in that time, or should I send for Mother Grub? Rand gave him a perplexed look. Two days? Elida is Queen Morgaze's adviser, right next to Captain General Gareth Bryn himself, maybe ahead of him. If she sets the Queen's guards looking for you, Lord Gareth won't stop her unless she interferes with their other duties. Well, the guards can search every inn in Camelin in two days. And that's saying some ill chance doesn't bring them here the first day or the first hour. Maybe there's a little time if they start over at the Crown and Lion, but none for dawdling. Rand nodded slowly. If I can't get Matt out of that bed, you send for Mother Grub. I have a little money left. Maybe enough. I'll take care of Mother Grub, the innkeeper said gruffly, and I suppose I can lend you a couple of horses. You try walking to Tarvalon, and you'll wear through what's left of your boots halfway there. You're a good friend, Rand said. It seems like we've brought you nothing but trouble, but you're still willing to help. A good friend. Master Gill seemed embarrassed. He shrugged his shoulders and cleared his throat and looked down. That brought his eyes to the stones board, and he jerked them away again. Loyal was definitely winning. Aye, well, Tom's always been a good friend to me. If he's willing to go out of his way for you, I can do a little bit too. I would like to go with you when you leave, Rand, Loyal said suddenly. I thought that was settled, Loyal. He hesitated. Master Gill still did not know the whole of the danger. Then added, You know what waits for Matt and me, what's chasing us. Dark friends, the ogre replied in a placid rumble, and I said I, and the light knows what else, or the dark one. You are going to Tarvalon, and there is a very fine grove there which I have heard the eyes said I tend well. In any case, there is more to see in the world than the groves. You truly are Taviran, Rand. The pattern weaves itself around you, and you stand in the heart of it. This man stands at the heart of it. Rand felt a chill. I don't stand at the heart of anything, he said harshly. Master Gill blinked, and even Loyal seemed taken aback at his anger. The innkeeper and the ogre looked at each other and then at the floor. Rand forced his expression smooth, drawing deep breaths. For a wonder, he found the void that had eluded him so often of late, and calmness. They did not deserve his anger. You can come, Loyal, he said. I don't know why you would want to, but I'd be grateful for the company. You... you know how Matt is. I know, Loyal said. I still cannot go into the streets without raising a mob shouting Trolloc after me. But Matt at least only uses words. He has not tried to kill me. Of course not, Rand said. Not Matt. He wouldn't go that far. Not Matt. A tap came at the door, and one of the serving maids, Jilda, stuck her head into the room. Her mouth was tight and her eyes worried. Master Gill, come quickly, please. There's white cloaks in the common room. Master Gill leaped up with an oath, sending the cat jumping from the table to stalk out of the room, tail stiff and offended. I'll come. Run tell them I'm coming, then stay out of their way, you hear me, girl? Keep away from them. Gilda bobbed her head and vanished. You would best stay here, he told Loyal. The ogre snorted, a sound like sheets ripping. I have no desire for any more meetings with the Children of the Light. 
Master Gill's eye fell on the stones board, and his mood seemed to lighten. It looks as if we'll have to start the game over later. No need for that. Loyal stretched an arm to the shelves and took down a book. His hands dwarfed the cloth-bound volume. We can take up from where the board lies. It is your turn. Master Gill grimaced. If it isn't one thing, it's another, he muttered as he hurried from the room. Rand followed him, but slowly. He had no more desire than loyal to become involved with the children. This man stands at the heart of it. He stopped at the door to the common room, where he could see what went on, but far enough back that he hoped he would not be noticed. Dead silence filled the room. Five white cloaks stood in the middle of the floor, studiously being ignored by the folk at the tables. One of them had the silver lightning flash of an under-officer beneath the sunburst on his cloak. Lamguin was lounging against the wall by the front door, intently cleaning his fingernails with a splinter. Four more of the guards Master Gill had hired were spaced across the wall with him, all industriously paying no attention at all to the white cloaks. If the children of the light noticed anything, they gave no sign. Only the under-officer showed any emotion at all, impatiently tapping his steel-backed gauntlets against his palm as he waited for the innkeeper. Master Gill crossed the room to him quickly, a cautiously neutral look on his face. "'The light illumine you,' he said with a careful bow, not too deep, but not slight enough to actually be insulting either. "'And our good Queen Morgaze. "'How may I help?' "'I've no time for your drivel, innkeeper,' the under-officer snapped. I've been to twenty inns already today, each a worse pigsty than the last, and I'll see twenty more before the sun sets. I'm looking for dark friends. A boy from the two rivers. Master Gill's face grew darker with every word. He puffed up as if he would explode, and finally he did, cutting the white cloak off in turn. There are no dark friends in my establishment. Every man here is a good queen's man. Yes, and we all know where Morgay's stands. The under-officer twisted the queen's name into a sneer. And her Tarvalan witch, don't we? The scrape of chair legs was loud. Suddenly every man in the room was on his feet. They stood still as statues, but every one staring grimly at the white cloaks. The under-officer did not appear to notice, but the four behind him looked around uneasily. It will go easier with you, innkeeper, the under-officer said if you cooperate. The temper of the times goes hard with those who shelter dark friends. I wouldn't think an inn with the dragon's fang on its door would get much custom. Might have trouble with fire with that on your door. You get out of here now, Master Gill said quietly, or I'll send for the Queen's guards to cart what's left of you to the middens. Lamguin's sword rasped out of its sheath, and the coarse scrape of steel on leather was repeated throughout the room as swords and daggers filled hands. Serving maids scurried for the doors. The under-officer looked around in scornful disbelief. The dragon's fang won't help you five, Master Gill finished for him. He held up a clenched fist and raised his forefinger. One. You must be mad, innkeeper, threatening the children of the light. White cloaks hold no writ in Camelin. Two. Can you really believe this will end here? Three. We'll be back, the under-officer snapped. And then he was hastily turning his men around, trying to pretend he was leaving in good order and in his own time. He was hampered in this by the eagerness his men showed for the door, not running, but not making secret that they wanted to be outside. Lamguin stood across the door with his sword, only giving way in response to Master Gill's frantic waves. When the white cloaks were gone, the innkeeper dropped heavily onto a chair. He rubbed a hand across his forehead, then stared at it, as if surprised that it was not covered with sweat. All over the room men seated themselves again, laughing over what they had done. Some went over to clap Master Gill on the shoulder. When he saw Rand, the innkeeper tottered off the chair and over to him. Who would have thought I had it in me to be a hero, he said wonderingly. The light illumined me. Abruptly he gave himself a shake, and his voice regained almost its normal tone. You'll have to stay out of sight until I can get you out of the city. 
With a careful look back into the common room, he pushed Rand deeper into the hall. That lot will be back, or else a few spies wearing red for the day. After that little show I put on, I doubt they'll care whether you're here or not, but they'll act as though you are. That's crazy, Rand protested. At the innkeeper's gesture, he lowered his voice. The white cloaks don't have any reason to be after me. I don't know about reasons, lad, but they're after you and Matt for certain sure. What have you been up to? Elida and the white cloaks? Rand raised his hands in protest, then let them fall. It made no sense. But he had heard the white cloak. What about you? The white cloaks will make trouble for you even when they don't find us. No worries about that, lad. The Queen's guards still uphold the law, even if they do let traitors strut around showing white. As for the knight, well, Lamguin and his friends might not get much sleep, but I could almost pity anybody who tries to put a mark on my door. Gilda appeared beside them, dropping a curtsy to Master Gill. Sir, there's... there's a lady. In the kitchens. She sounded scandalized at the combination. She's asking for Master Rand, sir, and Master Matt by name. Rand exchanged a puzzled look with the innkeeper. Lad, Master Gill said, if you've actually managed to bring the Lady Elaine down from the palace to my inn, we'll all end up facing the headsman. Gilda squeaked at the mention of the daughter heir and gave Rand a round-eyed stare. "'Off with you, girl,' the innkeeper said sharply. "'And keep quiet about what you've heard. It's nobody's business.' Gilda bobbed again and darted down the hallway, flashing glances over her shoulder at Rand as she went. "'In five minutes,' Master Gill sighed, "'she will be telling the other women you're a prince in disguise. By nightfall it will be all over the new city.' "'Master Gill,' Rand said. I never mentioned Matt to Elaine. It can't be. Suddenly a huge smile lit up his face, and he ran for the kitchens. Wait, the innkeeper called after him. Wait until you know. Wait, you fool. Rand threw open the door to the kitchens, and there they were. Moraine rested her serene eyes on him, unsurprised. Nynaeve and Egwene ran laughing to throw their arms around him, with Perrin crowding in behind them, all three patting his shoulders as if they had to be convinced that he was really there. In the doorway leading to the stable yard, Lan lounged with one boot up on the door frame, dividing his attention between the kitchen and the yard outside. Rand tried to hug the two women and shake Perrin's hand all at the same time, and it was a tangle of arms and laughter complicated by Nynaeve trying to feel his face for fever. They looked somewhat the worse for wear bruises on Perrin's face, and he had a way of keeping his eyes downcast that he had never had before. But they were alive and together again. His throat was so tight he could barely talk. I was afraid I'd never see you again, he managed finally. I was afraid you were all... I knew you were alive, Egwene said against his chest. I always knew it. Always. I did not, Nynaeve said. Her voice was sharp for just that moment, but it softened in the next, and she smiled up at him. You look well, Rand. Not overfed by any means, but well, thank the light. Well, Master Gill said behind him, I guess you know these people after all. Those friends you were looking for? Rand nodded. Yes, my friends. He made introductions all around. It still felt odd to be giving Lan and Moraine their right names. They both eyed him sharply when he did. The innkeeper greeted everyone with an open smile, but he was properly impressed at meeting a warder, and especially at Moiraine. At her he gaped openly. It was one thing knowing an Aes Sedai had been helping the boys, quite something else having her appear in the kitchen, then bowed deeply. "'You are welcome to the Queen's blessing, Aes Sedai, as my guest, though I suppose you will be staying at the palace with Elida Sedai, and the Aes Sedai who came with the false dragon.' Bowing again, he gave Rand a quick worried look. It was all very well to say he did not speak ill of Aes Sedai, but that was not the same as saying he wanted one sleeping under his roof. Rand nodded encouragingly, trying to tell him silently that it was all right. Moraine was not like Elida, with a threat hidden behind every glance, under every word. Are you sure? Even now, are you sure? I believe I will stay here, Moraine said, for the short time I remain in Camelin. 
and you must allow me to pay. A calico cat sauntered in from the hallway to strop the innkeeper's ankles. No sooner had the calico begun than a fuzzy gray sprang from under the table, arching its back and hissing. The calico crouched with a threatening growl, and the gray streaked past Lan into the stable yard. Master Gill began apologizing for the cats at the same time he protested that Moraine would honor him by being his guest, and was she sure she would not prefer the palace, which she would quite understand, but he hoped she would accept his best room as a gift. It made a jumble to which Moraine seemed to pay no attention at all. Instead, she bent down to scratch the orange and white cat. It promptly left Master Gill's ankles for hers. "'I've seen four other cats here so far,' she said. "'You have a problem with mice? Rats?' "'Rats,' Moraine said I. The innkeeper sighed. "'A terrible problem. Not that I don't keep a clean place, you understand. It's all the people. The whole city is full of people and rats. But my cats take care of it. You'll not be troubled, I promise.' Rand exchanged a fleeting look with Perrin, who put his eyes down again right away. There was something odd about Perrin's eyes, and he was so silent. Perrin was almost always slow to speak, but now he was saying nothing at all. It could be all the people, he said. With your permission, Master Gill, Moraine said, as if she took it for granted, it is a simple matter to keep rats away from this street. With luck, the rats will not even realize they are being kept away. Master Gill frowned at that last, but he bowed, accepting her offer. If you are sure you don't want to stay at the palace, I said I. Where is Matt? Nynaeve said suddenly. She said he was here, too. Upstairs, Rand said. He's not feeling well. Nynaeve's head came up. He's sick? I'll leave the rats to her and I'll attend to him. Take me to him now, Rand. All of you go up, Moraine said. I will join you in a few minutes. We are crowding Master Gill's kitchen, and it would be best if we could all be somewhere quiet for a time. There was an undercurrent in her voice. Stay out of sight. The hiding is not done yet. Come on, Rand said. We'll go up the back way. The Eamon's field folk crowded after him to the back staircase leaving the eyes Sedai and the warder in the kitchen with Master Gill. He could not get over being back together. It was nearly as if he were home again. He could not stop grinning. The same relief, almost joyous, seemed to be affecting the others. They chuckled to themselves and kept reaching out to grip his arm. Perrin's voice seemed subdued, and he still kept his head down. But he began to talk as they climbed. Moraine said she could find you and Matt, and she did. When we rode into the city, the rest of us couldn't stop staring. Well, all except Lan, of course. All the people, the buildings, everything. His thick curls swung as he shook his head in disbelief. It's all so big, and so many people. Some of them kept staring at us, too, shouting, Red or white? Like it made some kind of sense. Egwene touched Rand's sword, fingering the red wrappings. What does it mean? Nothing he said. Nothing important. We're leaving for Tarvalan, remember? Egwene gave him a look, but she removed her hand from the sword and took up where Perrin had left off. Moraine didn't look at anything any more than Lan did. She led us back and forth through all those streets so many times, like a dog hunting a scent, that I thought you couldn't be here. Then all of a sudden she took off down a street, and the next thing I knew we were handing the horses to the stableman and marching into the kitchen. She never even asked if you were here, just told a woman who was mixing batter to go tell Randall Thor and Matt Cawthon that someone wanted to see them. And there you were, she grinned, like a ball popping into the Gleeman's hand out of nowhere. Where is the Gleeman? Perrin asked. Is he with you? Rand's stomach lurched, and the good feeling of having friends around him dimmed. Tom's dead. I think he's dead. There was a fade... He could not say any more. Nynaeve shook her head, muttering under her breath. The silence thickened around them, stifling the little chuckles, flattening the joy, until they reached the head of the stairs. Matt's not sick, exactly, he said then. It's... you'll see. He flung open the door to the room he shared with Matt. Look who's here, Matt. 
Matt was still curled up in a ball on the bed, just as Rand had left him. He raised his head to stare at them. How do you know they're really who they look like? he said hoarsely. His face was flushed, the skin tight and slick with sweat. How do I know you're who you look like? Not sick? Nynaeve gave Rand a disdainful look as she pushed past him, already unslinging her bag from her shoulder. Everybody changes, Matt rasped. How can I be sure? Perrin? Is that you? You've changed, haven't you? His laugh sounded more like a cough. Oh, yes, you've changed. To Rand's surprise, Perrin dropped onto the edge of the other bed with his head in hands, staring at the floor. Matt's hacking laughter seemed to pierce him. Nynaeve knelt beside Matt's bed and put a hand to his face, pushing up his headcloth. He jerked back from her with a scornful look. His eyes were bright and glazed. You're burning, she said. But you should not be sweating with this much fever. She could not keep the worry out of her voice. Rand, you and Perrin fetch some clean cloths and as much cool water as you can carry. I'll bring your temperature down first, Matt, and— Pretty Nynaeve, Matt spat. A wisdom isn't supposed to think of herself as a woman, is she? Not a pretty woman. But you do, don't you? Now. You can't make yourself forget that you're a pretty woman now, and it frightens you. Everybody changes. Nynaeve's face paled as he spoke, whether with anger or something else Rand could not tell. Matt gave a sly laugh, and his feverish eyes slid to Egwene. Pretty Egwene, he croaked. Pretty as Nynaeve. And you share other things now, don't you? Other dreams. What do you dream about now? Egwene took a step back from the bed. We are safe from the Dark One's eyes for the time being, Moraine announced as she walked into the room with Lan at her heels. Her eyes fell on Matt as she stepped through the doorway, and she hissed as if she had touched a hot stove. Get away from him! Nynaeve did not move except for turning to stare at the eyes Sedai in surprise. In two quick steps, Moraine seized the wisdom by the shoulders, hauling her across the floor like a sack of grain. Nynaeve struggled and protested, but Moraine did not release her until she was well away from the bed. The wisdom continued her protests as she got to her feet, angrily straightening her clothes, but Moraine ignored her completely. The eyes Sedai watched Matt to the exclusion of everything else, eyeing him the way she would a viper. All of you stay away from him, she said, and be quiet. Matt stared back as intently as she. He bared his teeth in a silent, snarling rictus, and pulled himself into an ever tighter knot, but he never took his eyes from hers. Slowly, she put one hand on him, lightly, on a knee drawn up to his chest. A convulsion shook him at her touch, a shudder of revulsion spasming through his entire body, and abruptly he pulled one hand out, slashing at her face with the ruby-hilted dagger. One minute Lan was in the doorway. The next he was at the bedside, as if he had not bothered with the intervening space. His hand caught Matt's wrist, stopping the slash as if it had struck stone. Still Matt held himself in that tight ball. Only the hand with the dagger tried to move, straining against the warder's implacable grip. Matt's eyes never left Moraine, and they burned with hate. Moraine also did not move. She did not flinch from the blade only inches from her face as she had not when he first struck. "'How did he come by this?' she asked in a steel voice. "'I asked if Mordeth had given you anything. I asked and I warned you, and you said he had not.' "'He didn't,' Rand said. "'He—' "'Matt took it from the treasure room.' Moraine looked at him, her eyes seeming to burn as much as Matt's. He almost stepped back before she turned away again, back to the bed. "'I didn't know until after we were separated.' I didn't know. You did not know. Moraine studied Matt. He still lay with his knees pulled up to his chest, still snarled soundlessly at her, and his hand yet fought land to reach her with the dagger. It is a wonder you got this far carrying this. I felt the evil of it when I laid eyes on him, the touch of Mashadar. But a fade could sense it for miles. Even though he would not know exactly where, he would know it was near, and Mashadar would draw his spirit while his bones remembered that this same evil swallowed an army. 
dread lords, fades, trollocs, and all. Some dark friends could probably feel it too, those who have truly given away their souls. There could not help but be those who would wonder at suddenly feeling this, as if the very air around them itched. They would be compelled to seek it. It should have drawn them to it as a magnet draws iron filings. There were dark friends, Rand said, more than once, but we got away from them, and a fade, the night before we reached Camelon, but he never saw us. He cleared his throat. There are rumors of strange things in the night outside the city. It could be Trollocs. Oh, it's Trollocs, sheep herder, Lan said wryly, and where Trollocs are there are fades. Tendons stood out on the back of his hand from the effort of holding Matt's wrist, but there was no strain in his voice. They've tried to hide their passage, but I have seen sign for two days, and heard farmers and villagers mutter about things in the night. The murderer all managed to strike into the two rivers unseen somehow, but every day they come closer to those who can send soldiers to hunt them down. Even so, they won't stop now, sheep herder. But we're in Camelon, Egwene said. They can't get to us as long as— They can't, the warder cut her off. The fades are building their numbers in the countryside. That's plain enough from the sign, if you know what to look for. Already there are more Trollocs than they need just to watch all the ways out of the city. A dozen fists at least. There can only be one reason. When the fades have enough numbers, they will come into the city after you. That act may send half the armies of the south marching to the borderlands, but the evidence is that they're willing to take that risk. You three have escaped them too long. It looks as if you've brought a new Trolloc war to Camelon, sheep herder. Egwene gave a gasping sob, and Perrin shook his head as though to deny it. Rand felt a sickness in his stomach at the thought of Trollocs in the streets of Camelon. All those people at one another's throats, never realizing the real threat waiting to come over the walls. What would they do when they suddenly found Trollocs and Fades in their midst, killing them? He could see the towers burning, flames breaking through the domes, Trollocs pillaging through the curving streets and vistas of the inner city the palace itself in flames, Elaine and Gawain and Morghese, dead. Not yet, Moiraine said absently. She was still intent on Matt. If we can find a way out of Camelon, the Hoffman will have no more interest here. If. So many ifs. Better we were all dead, Perrin said suddenly, and Rand jumped at the echo of his own thoughts. Perrin still sat staring at the floor, glaring at it now, and his voice was bitter. Everywhere we go we bring pain and suffering on our backs. It would be better for everyone if we were dead. Nynaeve rounded on him, her face half fury and half worried fear, but Moiraine forestalled her. What do you think to gain, for yourself or anyone else, by dying? the Aes Sedai asked. Her voice was level yet sharp. If the Lord of the Grave has gained as much freedom to touch the pattern as I fear, he can reach you dead more easily than alive now. Dead you can help no one, not the people who have helped you, not your friends and family back in the two rivers. The shadow is falling over the world, and none of you can stop it dead. Perrin raised his head to look at her, and Rand gave a start. The irises of his friend's eyes were more yellow than brown. With his shaggy hair and the intensity of his gaze, there was something about him. Rand could not grasp it enough to make it out. Perrin spoke with a soft flatness that gave his words more weight than if he had shouted. We can't stop it alive either now, can we? I will have time to argue with you later, Moiraine said, but your friend needs me now. She stepped aside so they could all see Matt clearly. His eyes still on her with a rage-filled stare, he had not moved or changed his position on the bed. Sweat stood out on his face, and his lips were bloodless in an unchanging snarl. All of his strength seemed to be pouring into the effort to reach Moiraine with the dagger Lan held motionless. Or have you forgotten? Perrin gave an embarrassed shrug and spread his hands wordlessly. What's wrong with him? Egwene asked, and Nynaeve added, Is it catching? I can still treat him. 
I don't seem to catch sick, no matter what it is. Oh, it is catching, Moiraine said, and your protection would not save you. She pointed to the ruby-hilted dagger, careful not to let her finger touch it. The blade trembled as Matt strained to reach her with it. This is from Shadar Logoth. There is not a pebble of that city that is not tainted and dangerous to bring outside the walls. And this is far more than a pebble. The evil that killed Shadar Logoth is in it, and in Matt too now. Suspicion and hatred so strong that even those closest are seen as enemies, rooted so deep in the bone that eventually the only thought left is to kill. By carrying the dagger beyond the walls of Shadar Logoth, he freed it, this seed of it, from what bound it to that place. It will have waxed and waned in him, what he is in the heart of him, fighting what the contagion of Mashadar sought to make him. But now the battle inside him is almost done, and he almost defeated. Soon, if it does not kill him first, he will spread that evil like a plague wherever he goes. Just as one scratch from that blade is enough to infect and destroy, so soon a few minutes with Matt will be just as deadly. Nynaeve's face had gone white. Can you do anything? she whispered. I hope so. Moraine sighed. For the sake of the world, I hope I am not too late. Her hand delved into the pouch at her belt and came out with the silk-shrouded Ungrial. Leave me. Stay together and find somewhere you will not be seen, but leave me. I will do what I can for him. Chapter 42 Remembrance of Dreams It was a subdued group that Rand led back down the stairs. None of them wanted to talk to him now, or to one another. He did not feel much like talking either. The sun was far enough across the sky to dim the back stairwell, but the lamps had not yet been lit. Sunlight and shadows striped the stairs. Perrin's face was as closed as the others, but where worry creased everyone else's brow, his was smooth. Rand thought the look Perrin wore was resignation. He wondered why, and wanted to ask. But whenever Perrin walked through a deeper patch of shadow, his eyes seemed to gather in what little light there was, glowing softly like polished amber. Rand shivered and tried to concentrate on his surroundings, on the walnut-paneled walls and the oak stair railing, on sturdy, everyday things. He wiped his hands on his coat several times, but each time sweat sprang out on his palms anew. It'll all be all right now. We're together again, and... Light, Matt! He took them to the library by the back way that went by the kitchens, avoiding the common room. Not many travelers used the library. Most of those who could read stayed at more elegant inns in the inner city. Master Gill kept it more for his own enjoyment than for the handful of patrons who wanted a book now and then. Rand did not want to think why Moiraine wanted them to keep out of sight, but he kept remembering the white cloak under officer saying he would be back, and Elida's eyes when she asked where he was staying. Those were reasons enough, whatever Moiraine wanted. He took five steps into the library before he realized that everyone else had stopped, crowded together in the doorway, open-mouthed and goggling. A brisk blaze crackled in the fireplace, and Loyal was sprawled on the long couch, reading, a small black cat with white feet curled and half asleep on his stomach. When they entered, he closed the book with a huge finger marking his place and gently set the cat on the floor, then stood to bow formally. Rand was so used to the ogre that it took him a minute to realize that Loyal was the object of the other's stares. "'These are the friends I was waiting for, Loyal,' he said. "'This is Nynaeve, the wisdom of my village. And Perrin, and this is Egwene.' Ah, yes, Loyal boomed. Egwene, Rand has spoken of you a great deal. Yes, I am Loyal. He's an ogre, Rand explained, and watched their amazement change in kind. Even after trollocs and fades in the flesh, it was still astonishing to meet a legend walking and breathing. Remembering his own first reaction to Loyal, he grinned ruefully. They were doing better than he had. Loyal took their gaping in his stride. Rand supposed he hardly noticed it compared with a mob shouting Trolloc. And the eyes Sedai, Rand? Loyal asked. Upstairs with Matt. 
The ogre raised one bushy eyebrow thoughtfully. Then he is ill. I suggest we all be seated. She will be joining us? Yes. Then there's nothing to do but wait. The act of sitting seemed to loosen some catch inside the Eamon's field folk, as if being in a well-stuffed chair with a fire in the fireplace and a cat now curled up on the hearth made them feel at home. As soon as they were settled, they excitedly began asking the ogre questions. To Rand's surprise, Perrin was the first to speak. The steading, Loyal. Are they really havens, the way the stories say? His voice was intent, as if he had a particular reason for asking. Loyal was glad to tell about the steading, and how he came to be at the Queen's blessing, and what he had seen in his travels. Rand soon leaned back, only partly listening. He had heard it all before in detail. Loyal liked to talk, and talk at length when he had the slightest chance, though he usually seemed to think a story needed two or three hundred years of background to make it understood. His sense of time was very strange. To him, three hundred years seemed a reasonable length of time for a story or explanation to cover. He always talked about leaving the steading as if it were just a few months before, but it had finally come out that he had been gone more than three years. Rand's thoughts drifted to Matt. A dagger, a bloody knife, and it might kill him just from carrying it. Light, I don't want any more adventure. If she can heal him, we should all go, not home. Can't go home. Somewhere. We'll all go somewhere they've never heard of Aes Sedai or the Dark One. Somewhere. The door opened, and for a moment Rand thought he was still imagining. Matt stood there blinking with his coat buttoned up and the dark scarf wrapped low around his forehead. Then Rand saw Moiraine, with her hand on Matt's shoulder, and land behind them. The Aes Sedai was watching Matt carefully, as one watches someone only lately out of a sickbed. As always, Lan was watching everything, while appearing to watch nothing. Matt looked as if he had never been sick a day. His first hesitant smile included everyone, though it slipped into an open-mouthed stare at the sight of Loyal, as if he were seeing the ogre for the first time. With a shrug and a shake, he turned his attention back to his friends. I, uh, that is... He took a deep breath. It, uh, it seems I've been acting, uh, sort of oddly. I don't remember much of it, really. He gave Moiraine an uneasy look. She smiled back confidently, and he went on. Everything is hazy after Whitebridge. Tom and the... He shivered and hurried on. The further from Whitebridge, the hazier it gets. I don't really remember arriving in Camelin at all. He eyed Loyal askance. Not really. Moraine said I says I... Upstairs I... Uh... He grinned. And suddenly he truly was the old Matt. You can't hold a man to blame for what he does when he's crazy, can you? You always were crazy, Perrin said. And for a moment he too sounded as of old. No, Nynaeve said. Tears made her eyes bright, but she was smiling. None of us blames you. Rand and Egwene began talking at once then, telling Matt how happy they were to see him well and how well he looked, with a few laughing comments thrown in about hoping that he was done with tricks now that one so ugly had been played on him. Matt met banter with banter as he found a chair with all of his old swagger. As he sat down, still grinning, he absent-mindedly touched his coat as if to make sure that something tucked behind his belt was still there, and Rand's breath caught. Yes, Moraine said quietly. He still has the dagger. The laughter and talk was still going on among the rest of the Eamon's field folk, but she had noticed his sudden intake of breath and had seen what had caused it. She moved closer to his chair, where she did not have to raise her voice for him to hear clearly. I cannot take it away from him without killing him. The binding has lasted too long and grown too strong. That must be unknotted in Tarvalon. It is beyond me or any lone Aes Sedai, even with an Angreal. But he doesn't look sick any more. He had a thought and looked up at her. As long as he has the dagger, the Fades will know where we are. Dark friends, too, some of them. You said so. I have contained that after a fashion. 
If they come close enough to sense it now, they will be on top of us anyway. I cleansed the taint from him, Rand, and did what I could to slow its return, but return it will, in time, unless he receives help in Tarvalon. A good thing that's where we're going, isn't it? He thought maybe it was the resignation in his voice and the hope for something else that made her give him a sharp look before turning away. Loyal was on his feet, bowing to her. I am loyal, son of Arendt, son of Halan, I said I. The steading offers sanctuary to the servants of the light. Thank you, loyal son of Arendt, Moraine answered dryly. But I would not be too free with that greeting if I were you. There are perhaps twenty eyes said I in Camelin at this moment, and every one but I of the Red Aja. Loyal nodded sagely, as if he understood. Rand could only shake his head in confusion. He would be light-blinded if he knew what she meant. It is strange to find you here, the Aes Sedai went on. Few Ogar leave the steading in recent years. The old stories caught me, Aes Sedai. The old books filled my unworthy head with pictures. I want to see the groves, and the cities we built, too. There do not seem to be many of either still standing, but if buildings are a poor substitute for trees, they are still worth seeing. The elders think I'm odd wanting to travel. I always have, and they always have. None of them believe there is anything worth seeing outside the steading. Perhaps when I return and tell them what I've seen, they will change their minds. I hope so. In time. Perhaps they will, Moraine said smoothly. Now, Loyal, you must forgive me for being abrupt. It is a failing of humankind, I know. My companions and I have urgent need to plan our journey. If you could excuse us? It was Loyal's turn to look confused. Rand came to his rescue. He's coming with us. I promised him he could. Moraine stood looking at the ogre as if she had not heard, but finally she nodded. The wheel weaves as the wheel wills she murmured. Lan, see that we are not taken unaware. The warder vanished from the room silently but for the click of the door shutting behind him. Lan's disappearance acted like a signal. All talk was cut off. Moiraine moved to the fireplace, and when she turned back to the room every eye was on her. Slight of build as she was, her presence dominated. We cannot remain long in Camelin, nor are we safe here in the Queen's Blessing. The Dark One's eyes are already in the city. They have not found what they are searching for, or they would not still be looking. That we have to our advantage. I have set wards to keep them away, and by the time the Dark One realizes that there is a part of the city the rats no longer enter, we will be gone. Any ward that will turn a man aside, though, would be as good as a beacon fire for the Murdra'al. And there are children of the light in Camelin also looking for Perrin and Egwene. Rand made a sound and Moiraine raised an eyebrow at him. "'I thought they were looking for Matt and me,' he said. The explanation made both the Aes Sedai's eyebrows lift. "'Why would you think the White Cloaks were looking for you?' "'I heard one say they were looking for someone from the Two Rivers. Dark friends,' he said. "'What else was I supposed to think? With everything that's been happening, I'm lucky I can think at all.' "'It has been confusing, I know, Rand,' Loyal put in. But you can think more clearly than that. The children hate eyes, said I. Elida would not. Elida? Moraine cut in sharply. What has Elida said I to do with this? She was looking at Rand so hard that he wanted to lean back. She wanted to throw me in prison, he said slowly. All I wanted was a look at Loghain, but she wouldn't believe I was in the palace gardens with Elaine and Gawain just by chance. They were all staring at him as if he had suddenly sprouted a third eye, all except loyal. Queen Morgays let me go. She said there was no proof I meant any harm, and she was going to uphold the law no matter what Elida suspected. He shook his head, the memory of Morgays and all her radiance making him forget for a minute that anyone was looking at him. Can you imagine me meeting a queen? She's beautiful like the queens in stories. So is Elaine. And Gawain, you'd like Gawain, Perrin. Perrin? Matt? They were still staring. Blood and ashes, I just climbed up on the wall for a look at the false dragon. I didn't do anything wrong. That's what I always say, 
Matt said blandly, though he was suddenly grinning hard, and Egwene asked in a decidedly neutral voice, Who's Elaine? Moraine muttered something crossly. A queen, Perrin said, shaking his head. You really have had adventures. All we met were tinkers and some white cloaks. He avoided looking at Moraine so obviously that Rand saw the avoidance plain. Perrin touched the bruises on his face. On the whole, singing with the tinkers was more fun than the white cloaks. The traveling people live for their songs, Loyal said. For all songs, for that matter. For the search for them, at least. I met some Tuatha An a few years back, and they wanted to learn the songs we sing to trees. Actually, the trees won't listen to very many any more, and so not many ogre learn the songs. I have a scrap of that talent, so Elder Arendt insisted I learn. I taught the Tuatha An what they could learn, but the trees never listened to humans. For the traveling people they were only songs, and just as well received for that, since none was the song they seek. That's what they call the leader of each band, the seeker. They come to Steading Shangtai sometimes. Few humans do. If you please, loyal, Moraine said, but he cleared his throat suddenly and went on in a quick rumble as if afraid she might stop him. I've just remembered something, Aes Sedai, something I have always wanted to ask an Aes Sedai, if ever I met one, since you know many things and have great libraries in Tarvalan, and now I have, of course, and may I? If you make it brief, she said curtly. Brief, he said, as though wondering what it meant. Yes, well, brief. There was a man came to Steading Shangtai a little time back. This was not unusual in itself at the time, since a great many refugees had come to the spine of the world, fleeing what you humans call the Aiel War. Rand grinned. A little time back. Twenty years, near enough. He was at the point of death, though there was no wound or mark on him. The elders thought it might be something Aes Sedai had done. Loyal gave Moiraine an apologetic look, since as soon as he was within the steading he quickly got well. A few months. One night he left without a word to anyone, simply sneaked away when the moon was down. He looked at Moiraine's face and cleared his throat again. Yes, brief. Before he left he told a curious tale which he said he meant to carry to Tarvalon. He said the Dark One intended to blind the Eye of the World and slay the Great Serpent killed time itself. The elders said he was as sound in his mind as in his body, but that was what he said. What I have wanted to ask is, can the Dark One do such a thing, kill time itself? And the eye of the world? Can he blind the eye of the great serpent? What does it mean? Rand expected almost anything from Moiraine except what he saw. Instead of giving Loyal an answer, or telling him she had no time for it now, she stood there staring right through the ogre, frowning in thought. That's what the tinkers told us, Perrin said. Yes, Egwene said. The Aiel story. Moiraine turned her head slowly. No other part of her moved. What story? It was an expressionless look she gave them, but it made Perrin take a deep breath, though when he spoke he was as deliberate as ever. Some tinkers crossing the waste. They said they could do that unharmed. Found Aiel dying after a battle with Trollocs. Before the last Aiel died, she, they were all women apparently, told the tinkers what Loyal just said. The Dark One, they called him Sightblinder intends to blind the eye of the world. This was only three years ago, not twenty. Does it mean something? Perhaps everything, Moiraine said. Her face was still, but Rand had the feeling her mind raced behind those dark eyes. The Alzamon, Perrin said suddenly. The name cut off all sound in the room. No one appeared to breathe. Perrin looked at Rand, then at Matt, his eyes strangely calm and more yellow than ever. 
At the time I wondered where I'd heard that name before. The Eye of the World. Now I remember. Don't you? I don't want to remember anything, Matt said stiffly. We have to tell her, Perrin continued. It's important now. We can't keep it secret any longer. You see it, don't you, Rand? Tell me what? Moraine's voice was harsh, and she seemed to be bracing for a blow. Her gaze had settled on Rand. He did not want to answer. He did not want to remember any more than Matt. But he did remember. And he knew Perrin was right. I've... He looked at his friends. Matt nodded reluctantly, Perrin decisively, but at least they had done it. He did not have to face her alone. We have had... dreams. He rubbed the spot on his finger where the thorn had stuck him once, remembering the blood when he woke. Queasily remembering the sunburned feel of his face another time. Except maybe they weren't dreams, exactly. The Alzamon was in them. He knew why Perrin had used that name. It was easier than saying the Dark One had been in your dreams, inside your head. He said... He said all sorts of things, but once he said the eye of the world would never serve me. For a minute his mouth was as dry as dust. He told me the same thing, Perrin said. And Matt sighed heavily, then nodded. Rand found he had spit in his mouth again. You aren't angry with us? Perrin asked, sounding surprised. And Rand realized that Moraine did not seem angry. She was studying them, but her eyes were clear and calm, if intent. More with myself than you. But I did ask you to tell me if you had strange dreams. In the beginning, I asked. Though her voice remained level, a flash of anger crossed her eyes and was gone in an instant. Had I known after the first such, I might have been able to... There has not been a dream-walker in Tarvalon for nearly a thousand years, but I could have tried. Now it is too late. Each time the Dark One touches you, he makes the next touching easier for him. Perhaps my presence can still shield you somewhat, but even then... Remember the stories of the Forsaken binding men to them? Strong men, men who had fought the Dark One from the start. Those stories are true, and none of the Forsaken had a tenth of the strength of their master. Not Agenor or Lanfear, not Balthamal or Demandred, not even Ishamael, the betrayer of hope himself. Nynaeve and Egwene were looking at him, Rand saw, him and Matt and Perrin, all three. The women's faces were a blood-drained blend of fear and horror. Are they afraid for us, or afraid of us? What can we do? he asked. There has to be something. Staying close by me, Moraine replied, will help. Some. The protection from touching the true source extends around me a little, remember. But you cannot always remain close to me. You can defend yourself if you have the strength for it, but you must find the strength and will within yourself. I cannot give it to you. I think I've already found my protection, Perrin said, sounding resigned rather than happy. Yes, Moraine said. I suppose you have. She looked at him until he dropped his eyes, and even then she stood considering. Finally she turned to the others. There are limits to the Dark One's power inside you. Yield even for an instant and he will have a string tied to your heart, a string you may never be able to cut. Surrender and you will be his. Deny him and his power fails. It is not easy when he touches your dreams, but it can be done. He can still send halfmen against you and Trollocs and Drakkar and other things, but he cannot make you his unless you let him. Fades are bad enough, Perrin said. I don't want him inside my head again, Matt growled. Isn't there any way to keep him out? Moraine shook her head. Loyal has nothing to fear, nor Egwene, nor Nynaeve. Out of the mass of humanity, the Dark One can touch an individual only by chance, unless that person seeks it. But for a time, at least, you three are central to the pattern. A web of destiny is being woven, and every thread leads straight to you. 
What else did the Dark One say to you? I don't remember it all that well, Perrin said. There was something about one of us being chosen, something like that. I remember him laughing. He finished bleakly. About who we were chosen by. He said I... We could serve him or die. And then we'd still serve him. He said the Armalan seat would try to use us, Matt added, his voice fading as he remembered to whom he was speaking. He swallowed and went on. He said just like Tarvalin used... He had some names. Davian, I think. I can't remember very well either. Raylan Darksbane, Perrin said. Yes, Rand said, frowning. He had tried to forget everything about those dreams. It was unpleasant bringing them back. Yurian Stonebow was another. And Guerra Malassin. He stopped suddenly, hoping Moraine had not noticed how suddenly. I don't recognize any of them. But he had recognized one, now that he dredged them from the depths of memory. The name he had barely stopped himself from saying. Loghain, the false dragon. Light. Tom said they were dangerous names. Is that what Baalzaman meant? Moiraine wants to use one of us as a false dragon? Aes Sedai hunt down false dragons. They don't use them. Do they? Light help me, do they? Moiraine was looking at him, but he could not read her face. Do you know them? he asked her. Do they mean anything? The father of lies is a good name for the Dark One, Moiraine replied. It was always his way to send the worm of doubt wherever he could. It eats at men's minds like a canker. When you believe the father of lies, it is the first step toward surrender. Remember, if you surrender to the Dark One, he will make you his. An eyes Sedai never lies, but the truth she speaks may not be the truth you think you hear. That was what Tam had said and she had not really answered his question. He kept his face expressionless and held his hands still on his knees, trying not to scrub the sweat off them on his breeches. Egwene was crying softly. Nynaeve had her arms around her, but she looked as if she wanted to cry too. Rand almost wished he could. They are all Tavirin, Loyal said abruptly. He seemed brightened by the prospect looking forward to watching from close by as the pattern wove itself around them. Rand looked at him incredulously, and the ogre gave an abashed shrug, but it was not enough to dim his eagerness. So they are, Moiraine said, three of them when I expected one. A great many things have happened that I did not expect. This news concerning the eye of the world changes much. She paused, frowning. For a time the pattern does seem to be swirling around all three of you, just as Loyal says, and the swirl will grow greater before it becomes less. Sometimes being Tavirin means the pattern is forced to bend to you, and sometimes it means the pattern forces you to the needed path. The web can still be woven many ways, and some of those designs would be disastrous. For you, for the world. We cannot remain in Camelon. But by any road, Murdra Al and Trollocs will be on us before we have gone ten miles. And just at this point, we hear of a threat to the eye of the world, not from one source, but three, each seeming independent of the others. The pattern is forcing our path. The pattern still weaves itself around you three, but what hand now sets the warp? And what hand controls the shuttle? Has the Dark One's prison weakened enough for him to exert that much control? There's no need for that kind of talk, Nynaeve said sharply. You'll only frighten them. But not you? Moiraine asked. It frightens me. Well, perhaps you are right. Fear cannot be allowed to affect our course. Whether this is a trap or a timely warning, we must do what we must, and that is to reach the eye of the world quickly. The green man must know of this threat. Rand gave a start. The green man? The others stared, too, all but loyal, whose broad face looked worried. I cannot even risk stopping in Tarvalon for help, Moiraine continued. Time traps us. Even if we could ride out of the city unhindered, 
It would take many weeks to reach the Blight, and I fear we no longer have weeks. The Blight? Rand heard himself echoed in a chorus, but Moiraine ignored them all. The pattern presents a crisis, and at the same time a way to surmount it. If I did not know it was impossible, I could almost believe the Creator is taking a hand. There is a way. She smiled as if at a private joke, and turned to Loyal. There was an Ogre Grove here at Camelin, and a Waygate. The new city now spreads out over where the grove once stood, so the Waygate must be inside the walls. I know not many Ogre learn the ways now, but one who has a talent and learns the old songs of growing must be drawn to such knowledge, even if he believes it will never be used. Do you know the ways, Loyal? The Ogre shifted his feet uneasily. I do, I said I, but... Can you find the path to Faldara along the ways? I've never heard of Faldara, Loyal said, sounding relieved. In the days of the Trolloc Wars, it was known as Mephal de Daranel. Do you know that name? I know it, Loyal said reluctantly. But... Then you can find the path for us, Moiraine said. A curious turn indeed. When we can neither stay nor leave by any ordinary means, I learn of a threat to the eye, and in the same place there is one who can take us there in days. Whether it is the Creator, or Fate, or even the Dark One, the Pattern has chosen our path for us. No, Loyal said, an emphatic rumble like thunder. Everyone turned to look at him, and he blinked under the attention, but there was nothing hesitant about his words. If we enter the ways, we will all die, or be swallowed by the shadow. Chapter 43 Decisions and Apparitions The Aes Sedai appeared to know what Loyal meant, but she said nothing. Loyal peered at the floor, rubbing under his nose with a thick finger as if he was abashed by his outburst. No one wanted to speak. Why? Rand asked at last. Why would we die? What are the ways? Loyal glanced at Moiraine. She turned away to take a chair in front of the fireplace. The little cat stretched its claws scratching on the hearthstone and languidly walked over to butt its head against her ankles. She rubbed behind its ears with one finger. The cat's purring was a strange counterpoint to the Aes Sedai's level voice. It is your knowledge, Loyal. The ways are the only path to safety for us, the only path to forestalling the Dark One, if only for a time. But the telling is yours. The ogre did not appear comforted by her speech. He shifted awkwardly on his chair before beginning. During the time of madness, while the world was still being broken, the earth was in upheaval, and humankind was being scattered like dust on the wind. We ogre were scattered, too, driven from the steading into the exile and the long wandering, when the longing was graven on our hearts. He gave Moiraine another sidelong look. His long eyebrows drew down into two points. I will try to be brief, but this is not a thing that can be told too briefly. It is of the others I must speak now, those few ogre who held in their steading while around them the world was tearing apart and of the eyes Sedai. He avoided looking at Moiraine now. The male eyes Sedai, who were dying even as they destroyed the world in their madness. It was to those eyes Sedai, those who had so far managed to avoid the madness, that the steading first made the offer of sanctuary. Many accepted, for in the steading they were protected from the taint of the Dark One that was killing their kind. But they were cut off from the true source. It was not just that they could not wield the one power or touch the source. They could no longer even sense that the source existed. In the end, none could accept that isolation, and one by one they left the steading, hoping that by that time the taint was gone. It never was. Some in Tarvalan, Moraine said quietly, claim that Ogre Sanctuary prolonged the breaking and made it worse. 
Others say that if all of those men had been allowed to go mad at once, there would have been nothing left of the world. I am of the blue Aja loyal. Unlike the red Aja, we hold to the second view. Sanctuary helped to save what could be saved. Continue, please. Loyal nodded gratefully. Relieved of a concern, Rand realized. As I was saying, the ogre went on, the Aes Sedai, the male Sedai, left. But before they went, they gave a gift to the ogre in thanks for our sanctuary. The Ways Enter a waygate, walk for a day, and you may depart through another waygate a hundred miles from where you started. Or five hundred. Time and distance are strange in the ways. Different paths, different bridges lead to different places. And how long it takes to get there depends on which path you take. It was a marvelous gift, made more so by the times, for the ways are not part of the world we see around us nor perhaps of any world outside themselves. Not only did the ogre so gifted not have to travel through the world, where even after the breaking men fought like animals to live, in order to reach another steading, but within the ways there was no breaking. The land between two steading might split open into deep canyons or rise in mountain ranges, but in the way between them there was no change. When the last Aes Sedai left the steading, they gave to the elders a key, a talisman, that could be used for growing more. They are a living thing in some fashion, the ways and the way gates. I do not understand it. No ogre ever has, and even the Aes Sedai have forgotten, I am told. Over the years the exile ended for us. As those ogre who had been gifted by the Aes Sedai found a steading where ogre had returned from the long wandering. They grew away to it. With the stonework we learned during the exile, we built cities for men, and planted the groves to comfort the ogre who did the building, so the longing would not overcome them. To those groves ways were grown. There was a grove and a waygate at Mafal de Daranel, but that city was raised during the Trolloc Wars, no stone left standing on another, and the grove was chopped down and burned for Trolloc fires. He left no doubt which had been the greater crime. Waygates are all but impossible to destroy, Moraine said, and humankind not much less so. There are people at Faldara still, though not the great city the Ogre built, and the waygate yet stands. How did they make them? Egwene asked. Her puzzled look took in Moraine and Loyal both. The Aes Sedai, the men. If they couldn't use the one power in a steading, how could they make the ways? Or did they use the power at all? Their part of the true source was tainted, is tainted. I don't know much about what Aes Sedai can do yet. Maybe it's a silly question. Loyal explained. Each steading has a way gate on its border, but outside. Your question is not silly. You've found the seed of why we do not dare travel the ways. No ogre has used the ways in my lifetime and before. By edict of the elders, all the elders of all the steading, none may, human or ogre. The ways were made by men wielding power fouled by the Dark One. About a thousand years ago, during what you humans call the War of the Hundred Years, the ways began to change. So slowly in the beginning that none really noticed, they grew dank and dim. Then darkness fell along the bridges. Some who went in were never seen again. Travelers spoke of being watched from the dark. The numbers who vanished grew, and some who came out had gone mad, raving about Machin Shin, the black wind. Aes Sedai healers could aid some, but even with Aes Sedai help, they were never the same, and they never remembered anything of what had occurred. Yet it was as if the darkness had sunken into their bones. They never laughed again, and they feared the sound of the wind. For a moment there was silence but for the cat purring beside Moraine's chair, and the snap and crackle of the fire popping out sparks. 
Then Nynaeve burst out angrily. And you expect us to follow you into that? You must be mad. Which would you choose instead? Moraine asked quietly. The white cloaks within Camelon, or the Trollocs without? Remember that my presence in itself gives some protection from the Dark One's works. Nynaeve settled back with an exasperated sigh. You still have not explained to me, Loyal said, why I should break the edict of the elders. And I have no desire to enter the ways. Muddy as they often are, the roads men make have served me well enough since I left steading Shangtai. Humankind and Ogre Everything that lives. We are at war with the Dark One, Moraine said. The greater part of the world does not even know it yet, and most of the few who do fight skirmishes and believe they are battles. While the world refuses to believe, the Dark One may be at the brink of victory. There is enough power in the eye of the world to undo his prison. If the Dark One has found some way to bend the eye of the world to his use... Rand wished the lamps in the room were lit. Evening was creeping over Camelon, and the fire in the fireplace did not give enough light. He wanted no shadows in the room. "'What can we do?' Matt burst out. "'Why are we so important? Why do we have to go to the Blight? The Blight?' Moiraine did not raise her voice, but it filled the room, compelling. Her chair by the fire suddenly seemed like a throne. Suddenly even more gaze would have paled in her presence. One thing we can do. We can try. What seems like chance is often the pattern. Three threads have come together here, each giving a warning. The eye. It cannot be chance. It is the pattern. You three did not choose. You were chosen by the pattern. And you are here, where the danger is known. You can step aside and perhaps doom the world. Running, hiding will not save you from the weaving of the pattern. Or you can try. You can go to the eye of the world, three Taviran, three center points of the web, placed where the danger lies. Let the pattern be woven around you there, and you may save the world from the shadow. The choice is yours. I cannot make you go. I'll go, Rand said, trying to sound resolute. However hard he sought the void, images kept flashing through his head. Tam, and the farmhouse, and the flock in the pasture. It had been a good life. He had never really wanted anything more. There was comfort, a small comfort, hearing Perrin and Matt add their agreement to his. They sounded as dry-mouthed as he. I suppose there isn't any choice for Egwene or me, either, Nynaeve said. Moraine nodded. You were part of the pattern, too, both of you, in some fashion. Perhaps not Taviran, perhaps, but strong even so. I have known it since Berlin, and no doubt by this time the Fades know it too, and Baalzamon. Yet you have as much choice as the young men. You could remain here, proceed to Tarvalon once the rest of us have gone. Stay behind, Egwene exclaimed. Let the rest of you go off into danger while we hide under the covers. I won't do it. She caught the Aes Sedai's eye and drew back a little, but not all of her defiance vanished. I won't do it, she muttered stubbornly. I suppose that means both of us will accompany you. Nynaeve sounded resigned, but her eyes flashed when she added, You still need my herbs, Aes Sedai, unless you've suddenly gained some ability I don't know about. Her voice held a challenge Rand did not understand, but Moiraine merely nodded and turned to the ogre. Well, loyal son of Arant, son of Halan. Loyal opened his mouth twice, his tufted ears twitching before he spoke. Yes, well, the green man, the eye of the world. They're mentioned in the books, of course, but I don't think any ogre has actually seen them in, oh, quite a long time, I suppose. But must it be the ways? Moraine nodded and his long eyebrows sagged till the ends brushed his cheeks. Very well, then. I suppose I must guide you. 
Elder Haman would say it's no less than I deserve for being so hasty all the time. Our choices are made, then, Moraine said. And now that they are made, we must decide what to do about them and how. Long into the night they planned. Moraine did most of it with Loyal's advice concerning the ways, but she listened to questions and suggestions from everyone. Once dark fell, Lan joined them, adding his comments in that iron cord drawl. Nynaeve made a list of what supplies they needed, dipping her pen in the inkwell with a steady hand, despite the way she kept muttering under her breath. Rand wished he could be as matter-of-fact as the wisdom. He could not stop pacing up and down as if he had energy to burn or burst from it. He knew his decision was made, knew it was the only one he could make with the knowledge he had, but that did not make him like it. The Blight. Sheol Ghul was somewhere in the Blight, beyond the Blasted Lands. He could see the same worry in Matt's eyes, the same fear he knew was in his own. Matt sat with his hands clasped, knuckles white. If he let go, Rand thought, he would be clutching the dagger from Shadar Logoth instead. There was no worry on Perrin's face at all. But what was there was worse. A mask of weary resignation. Perrin looked as though he had fought something until he could fight it no longer and was waiting for it to finish him. Yet sometimes... We do what we must, Rand, he said. The blight. For an instant those yellow eyes lit with eagerness, flashing in the fixed tiredness of his face, as if they had a life of their own apart from the big blacksmith's apprentice. There's good hunting along the blight, he whispered. Then he shuddered, as if he had just heard what he had said, and once more his face was resigned. And Egwene. Rand drew her apart at one point over by the fireplace where those planning around the table could not hear. Egwene, I... Her eyes, like big dark pools drawing him in, made him stop and swallow. It's me the dark one's after, Egwene. Me and Matt and Perrin. I don't care what Moraine Sedai says. In the morning you and Nynaeve could start for home, or Tarvalon, or anywhere you want to go, and nobody will try to stop you. Not the Trollocs, not the Fades, not anybody. As long as you aren't with us. Go home, Egwene. Or go to Tarvalon, but go. He waited for her to tell him she had as much right to go where she wanted as he did, that he had no right to tell her what to do. To his surprise, she smiled and touched his cheek. Thank you, Rand, she said softly. He blinked and closed his mouth as she went on. You know I can't, though. Moraine said I told us what Min saw in Berlin. You should have told me who Min was. I thought, well, Min says I am part of this, too. And Nynaeve. Maybe I'm not Tavirin. She stumbled over the word. But the pattern sends me to the eye of the world, too, it seems. Whatever involves you involves me. But Egwene... Who is Elaine? For a minute he stared at her, then told the simple truth. She's the daughter heir to the throne of Andor. Her eyes seemed to catch fire. If you can't be serious for more than a minute, Randall Thor, I do not want to talk to you. Incredulous, he watched her stiff back return to the table where she leaned on her elbows next to Moiraine to listen to what the warder was saying. I need to talk to Perrin, he thought. He knows how to deal with women. Master Gill entered several times, first to light the lamps, then to bring food with his own hands, and later to report on what was happening outside. White cloaks were watching the inn from down the street in both directions. There had been a riot at the gates to the inner city, with the Queen's guards arresting white cockades and red alike. Someone had tried to scratch the dragon's fang on the front door and been sent on his way by Lamguin's boot. If the innkeeper found it odd that Loyal was with them, he gave no sign of it. He answered the few questions Moiraine put to him without trying to discover what they were planning, and each time he came he knocked at the door and waited till Lan opened it for him, just as if it were not his inn and his library. On his last visit, 
Moraine gave him the sheet of parchment covered in Nynaeve's neat hand. It won't be easy this time of night, he said, shaking his head as he perused the list, but I'll arrange it all. Moraine added a small wash-leather bag that clinked as she handed it to him by the drawstrings. Good. And see that we are wakened before daybreak. The watchers will be at their least alert then. We'll leave them watching an empty box, I said I. Master Gill grinned. Rand was yawning by the time he shuffled out of the room with the rest in search of baths and beds. As he scrubbed himself with a coarse cloth in one hand and a big yellow cake of soap in the other, his eyes drifted to the stool beside Matt's tub. The golden-sheathed tip of the dagger from Shadar Logoth peeked from under the edge of Matt's neatly folded coat. Lan glanced at it from time to time, too. Rand wondered if it was really as safe to have around as Moraine claimed. Do you think my doll ever believe it? Matt laughed, scrubbing his back with a long-handled brush. Me saving the world? My sisters won't know whether to laugh or cry. He sounded like the old Matt. Rand wished he could forget the dagger. It was pitch black when he and Matt finally got up to their room under the eaves, the stars obscured by clouds. For the first time in a long while, Matt undressed before getting into bed but he casually tucked the dagger under his pillow, too. Rand blew out the candle and crawled into his own bed. He could feel the wrongness from the other bed, not from Matt, but from beneath his pillow. He was still worrying about it when sleep came. From the first, he knew it was a dream, one of those dreams that was not entirely dream. He stood staring at the wooden door, its surface dark and cracked and rough with splinters. The air was cold and dank, thick with the smell of decay. In the distance water dripped, the splashes hollow echoes down stone corridors. Deny it. Deny him, and his power fails. He closed his eyes and concentrated on the Queen's blessing, on his bed on himself asleep in his bed. When he opened his eyes, the door was still there. The echoing splashes came on his heartbeat as if his pulse counted time for them. He sought the flame and the void as Tam had taught him, and found inner calm, but nothing outside of him changed. Slowly he opened the door and went in. Everything was as he remembered it in the room that seemed burned out of living rock, Tall arched windows led onto an unrailed balcony, and beyond it the layered clouds streamed like a river in flood. The black metal lamps, their flames too bright to look at, gleamed black yet somehow as bright as silver. The fire roared but gave no heat in the fearsome fireplace, each stone still vaguely like a face in torment. All was the same, but one thing was different. On the polished tabletop stood three small figures, the rough, featureless shapes of men, as if the sculptor had been hasty with his clay. Beside one stood a wolf, its clear detail emphasized by the crudeness of the man-shape, and another clutched a tiny dagger, a point of red on the hilt glittering in the light. The last held a sword. The hair stirring on the back of his neck, he moved close enough to see the heron in exquisite detail on that small blade. His head jerked up in panic, and he stared directly into the lone mirror. His reflection was still a blur, but not so misty as before. He could almost make out his own features. If he imagined he was squinting, he could nearly tell who it was. You've hidden from me too long. He whirled from the table, breath rasping his throat. A moment before he had been alone. But now the Alzamon stood before the windows. When he spoke, caverns of flame replaced his eyes and mouth. Too long, but not much longer. I deny you, Rand said hoarsely. I deny that you hold any power over me. I deny that you are. Baalzaman laughed, a rich sound rolling from fire. Do you think it is that easy? But then... You always did. Each time we have stood like this, 
You have thought you could defy me. What do you mean, each time? I deny you! You always do. In the beginning. This contest between us has taken place countless times before. Each time your face is different and your name. But each time it is you. I deny you. It was a desperate whisper. Each time you throw your puny strength against me, and each time in the end you know which of us is the master. Age after age you kneel to me, or die wishing you still had strength to kneel. Poor fool, you can never win against me. Liar! he shouted. Father of lies! Father of fools if you can't do better than that! Men found you in the last age, in the age of legends, and bound you back where you belong. But Alzaman laughed again, peal after mocking peal, until Rand wanted to cover his ears to shut it out. He forced his hands to stay at his sides. Void or no, they were trembling when the laughter finally stopped. You worm, you know nothing at all, as ignorant as a beetle under a rock and as easily crushed. This struggle has gone on since the moment of creation. Always men think it a new war, but it is just the same war discovered anew. Only now change blows on the winds of time. Change! This time there will be no drifting back. Those proud eyes, said I, who think to stand you up against me. I will dress them in chains and send them running naked to do my bidding or stuff their souls into the pit of doom to scream for eternity. All but those who already serve me, they will stand but a step beneath me. You can choose to stand with them, with the world groveling at your feet. I offer it one more time, one last time. You can stand above them above every power and dominion but mine. There have been times when you made that choice, times when you lived long enough to know your power. Deny him. Rand grabbed hold to what he could deny. No, I said I serve you. Another lie. Is that what they told you? Two thousand years ago I took my Trollocs across the world, and even among Aes Sedai I found those who knew despair, who knew the world could not stand before Shaitan. For two thousand years the Black Aja has dwelt among the others, unseen in the shadows. Perhaps even those who claim to help you. Rand shook his head, trying to shake away the doubts that came welling up in him, all the doubts he had had about Moraine, about what the Aes Sedai wanted with him, about what she planned for him. "'What do you want from me?' he cried. "'Deny him. Light help me deny him.' "'Kneel,' Baalzaman pointed to the floor at his feet. "'Kneel, and acknowledge me your master.' In the end you will. You will be my creature, or you will die. The last word echoed through the room, reverberating back on itself, doubling and redoubling, till Rand threw up his arms as if to shield his head from a blow. Staggering back until he thumped into the table, he shouted, trying to drown the sound in his ears. No! As he cried out, he spun, sweeping the figures to the floor. Something stabbed his hand, but he ignored it, stomping the clay to shapeless smears underfoot. But when his shout failed, the echo was still there and growing stronger. Die, 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 die. The sound pulled on him like a whirlpool, drawing him in, ripping the void in his mind to shreds. The light dimmed, 
and his vision narrowed down to a tunnel with Baalzaman standing tall in the last spot of brightness at the end, dwindling until it was the size of his hand. A fingernail. Nothing. Around and around the echo whirled him, down into blackness and death. The thump as he hit the floor woke him, still struggling to swim up out of that darkness. The room was dark, but not so dark as that. Frantically he tried to center on the flame, to shovel fear into it, but the calm of the void eluded him. Tremors ran down his arms and legs, but he held the image of the single flame until the blood stopped pounding in his ears. Matt was tossing and twisting on his bed, groaning in his sleep. Deny you, deny you, deny you. It faded off into unintelligible moans. Rand reached out to shake him awake, and at the first touch Matt sat up with a strangled grunt. For a minute Matt stared around wildly then drew a long, shuddering breath and dropped his head into his hands. Abruptly he twisted around, digging under his pillow, then sank back, clutching the ruby-hilted dagger in both hands on his chest. He turned his head to look at Rand, his face hidden in shadow. He's back, Rand. I know. Matt nodded. There were these three figures. I saw them, too. He knows who I am, Rand. I picked up the one with the dagger, and he said, So that's who you are. And when I looked again, the figure had my face. My face, Rand. It looked like flesh. It felt like flesh. Light helped me. I could feel my own hand gripping me, like I was the figure. Rand was silent for a moment. You have to keep denying him, Matt. I did, and he laughed. He kept talking about some eternal war and saying we'd met like that a thousand times before, and... Light, Rand, the Dark One knows me. He said the same thing to me. I don't think he does, he added slowly. I don't think he knows which of us... Which of us what? As he levered himself up, pain stabbed his hand. Making his way to the table, he managed to get the candle lit after three tries, then spread his hand open in the light. Driven into his palm was a thick splinter of dark wood, smooth and polished on one side. He stared at it, not breathing. Abruptly he was panting, plucking at the splinter, fumbling with haste. What's the matter? Matt asked. Nothing. Finally he had it and a sharp yank pulled it free. With a grunt of disgust he dropped it, but the grunt froze in his throat. As soon as the splinter left his fingers, it vanished. The wound was still there in his hand, though, bleeding. There was water in the stoneware pitcher. He filled the basin, his hands shaking so that he splashed water onto the table. Hurriedly he washed his hands, kneading his palm till his thumb brought more blood then washed them again. The thought of the smallest sliver remaining in his flesh terrified him. Light, Matt said. He made me feel dirty, too. But he still lay where he was, holding the dagger in both hands. Yes, Rand said. Dirty. He fumbled a towel from the stack beside the basin. There was a knock at the door, and he jumped. It came again. Yes? he said. Moraine put her head into the room. You are awake already. Good. Dress quickly and come down. We must be away before first light. Now? Matt groaned. We haven't had an hour's sleep yet. An hour? she said. You have had four. Now hurry. We do not have much time. Rand shared a confused look with Matt. He could remember every second of the dream clearly. It had begun as soon as he closed his eyes and lasted only minutes. Something in that exchange must have communicated itself to Moiraine. She gave them a penetrating look and came all the way in. What has happened? The dreams? He knows who I am, Matt said. 
The Dark One knows my face. Rand held up his hand wordlessly, palm toward her. Even in the shadowed light from the one candle, the blood was plain. The Aes Sedai stepped forward and grasped his upheld hand, her thumb across his palm covering the wound. Cold pierced him to the bone, so chill that his fingers cramped and he had to fight to keep them open. When she took her fingers away, the chill went too. He turned his hand, then stunned, scrubbed the thin smear of blood away. The wound was gone. Slowly, he raised his eyes to meet those of the eyes Sedai. Hurry, she said softly. Time grows very short. He knew she was not speaking of the time for their leaving any more. Chapter 44 The Dark Along the Ways In the darkness just before dawn, Rand followed Moiraine down to the back hall, where Master Gill and the others were waiting. Nynaeve and Egwene as anxiously as loyal, Perrin almost as calm as the warder. Matt stayed on Rand's heels, as if he were afraid to be even a little alone now, even as much as a few feet away. The cook and her helpers straightened, staring as the party passed silently into the kitchen, already brightly lit and hot with preparations for breakfast. It was not usual for patrons of the inn to be up and out at that hour. At Master Gill's soothing words, the cook gave a loud sniff and slapped her dough down hard. They were all back to tending griddles and kneading dough before Rand reached the stable-yard door. Outside, the night was still pitch black. To Rand, everyone else was only a darker shadow at best. He followed the innkeeper and Lan blindly, blind in truth, hoping Master Gill's knowledge of his own stable-yard and the warder's instincts would get them across it without someone breaking a leg. Loyal stumbled more than once. "'I don't see why we can't have just one light,' the ogre grumbled. "'We don't go running about in the dark in the steading. I'm an ogre, not a cat.' Rand had a sudden image of Loyal's tufted ears twitching irritably. The stable loomed up suddenly out of the night, a threatening mass until the stable door creaked open, spilling a narrow stream of light into the yard. The innkeeper only opened it wide enough for them to go in one at a time, and hastily pulled it to behind Perrin, almost clipping his heels. Rand blinked in the sudden light inside. The stablemen were not surprised by their appearance, as the cook had been. Their horses were saddled and waiting. Mandarb stood arrogantly, ignoring everyone but Lan, but Aldeeb stretched her nose out to nuzzle Moiraine's hand. There was a pack-horse, bulky with wicker panniers, and a huge animal with hairy fetlocks, taller even than the warder's stallion for Loyal. It looked big enough to pull a loaded haywain by itself, but compared with the ogre it seemed a pony. Loyal eyed the big horse and muttered doubtfully, My own feet have always been good enough. Master Gill motioned to Rand. The innkeeper was lending him a bay almost the color of his own hair, tall and deep of chest, but with none of the fire in his step that Cloud had had, Rand was glad to see. Master Gill said his name was Red. Egwene went straight to Bela, and Nynaeve to her long-legged mare. Matt brought his dun-colored horse over by Rand. Perrin's making me nervous, he muttered. Rand looked at him sharply. Well, he's acting strange. Don't you see it, too? I swear it's not my imagination, or... or... Rand nodded, not the dagger taking hold of him again, thank the light. He is, Matt, but just be easy. Moiraine knows about whatever it is. Perrin's fine. He wished he could believe it, but it seemed to satisfy Matt a little at least. Of course, Matt said hastily, still watching Perrin out of the corner of his eye. I never said he wasn't. Master Gill conferred with the head groom. That leathery-skinned man with a face like one of the horses knuckled his forehead and hurried to the back of the stable. The innkeeper turned to Moiraine with a satisfied smile on his round face. Raimi says the way is clear, I said I. The rear wall of the stable appeared solid and stout, lined with heavy racks of tools. Raimi and another stableman cleared away the hay forks, rakes, and shovels, then reached behind the racks to manipulate hidden latches. 
Abruptly, a section of the wall swung inward on hinges so well concealed that Rand was not sure he could find them even with the disguised door standing open. Light from the stable illuminated a brick wall only a few feet away. It's only a narrow run between buildings, the innkeeper said, but nobody outside this stable knows there's a way into it from here. White cloaks or white cockades, there'll not be any watchers to see where you come out. The Aes Sedai nodded. Remember, good innkeeper, if you fear any trouble from this, write to Shiriam Sedai of the Blue Aja in Tarvalon, and she will help. I fear my sisters and I have a good deal to put right already for those who have helped me. Master Gill laughed, not the laugh of a worried man. Why, I said I, you've already given me the only inn in all of Camelon without any rats. What more could I ask for? I can double my custom on that alone. His grin faded into seriousness. Whatever you're up to, the Queen holds with Tarvalon, and I hold with the Queen, so I wish you well. The light illumine you, I said I. The light illumine you all. The light illumine you also, Master Gill, Moiraine replied with a bow of her head. But if the light is to shine on any of us, we must be quick. Briskly she turned to Loyal. Are you ready? With a wary look at its teeth, the ogre took the reins of the big horse. Trying to keep that mouth the length of the reins from his hand, he led the animal to the opening at the back of the stable. Raimi hopped from one foot to the other, impatient to close it again. For a moment Loyal paused with his head cocked, as if feeling a breeze on his cheek. This way, he said, and turned down the narrow alley. Moraine followed right behind Loyal's horse, then Rand and Matt. Rand had the first turn leading the pack horse. Nynaeve and Egwene made the middle of the column, with Perrin behind them, and Lan bringing up the rear. The hidden door swung hastily shut as soon as Mandarb stepped into the dirt alleyway. The snick-snick of latches locking, shutting them off, sounded unnaturally loud to Rand. The run, as Master Gill had called it, was very narrow indeed, and even darker than the stable-yard, if that was possible. Tall blank walls of brick or wood lined both sides, with only a narrow strip of black sky overhead. The big woven baskets slung on the pack-horse scraped the buildings on both sides. The panniers bulged with supplies for the journey, most of it clay jars filled with oil. A bundle of poles was lashed lengthwise down the horse's back, and each had a lantern swinging at the end of it. In the ways, Loyal said, it was darker than the darkest night. The partially filled lanterns sloshed with the motion of the horse, and clinked against each other with a tinny sound. It was not a very loud noise, but in the hour before dawn Camelin was quiet, silent. The dull metallic clinks sounded as if they could be heard a mile away. When the run let out into a street, Loyal chose his direction without a pause. He seemed to know exactly where he was going now, as if the route he needed to follow was becoming clearer. Rand did not understand how the ogre could find the waygate, and Loyal had not been able to explain very well. He just knew, he said. He could feel it. Loyal claimed it was like trying to explain how to breathe. As they hurried up the street, Rand looked back toward the corner where the Queen's blessing lay. According to Lamguin, there were still half a dozen white cloaks not far down from that corner. Their interest was all on the inn, but a noise would surely bring them. No one was out at this hour for a reputable reason. The horseshoes seemed to ring on the paving stones like bells. The lanterns clattered as if the pack horse were shaking them deliberately. Not until they had rounded another corner did he stop looking over his shoulder. He heard relieved sighs from the other Eamon's fielders as they came round it too. Loyal appeared to be following the most direct path to the waygate, wherever it took them. Sometimes they trotted down broad avenues, empty save for an occasional dog skulking in the dark. Sometimes they hurried along alleys as narrow as the stable run, where things squished under an unwary step. Nynaeve complained softly about the resulting smells, but no one slowed down. The darkness began to lessen, fading toward a dark gray. Faint glimmers of dawn purled the sky above the eastern rooftops. A few people appeared on the streets, bundled up against the early cold, heads down while they yet dreamed of their beds. 
Most paid no mind to anyone else. Only a handful even glanced at the line of people and horses with loyal at its head, and only one of those truly saw them. That one man flicked his eyes at them, just like the others, already sinking back into his own thoughts, when suddenly he stumbled and almost fell, turning himself back around to stare. There was only light enough to see shapes, but that was too much. Seen at a distance by himself, the ogre could have passed for a tall man leading an ordinary horse, or for an ordinary man leading an undersized horse. With the others in a line behind him to give perspective, Loyal looked exactly as big as he was, half again as tall as any man should be. The man took one look and with a strangled cry set off running, his cloak flapping behind him. There would be more people in the streets soon, very soon. Rand eyed a woman hurrying past on the other side of the street, seeing nothing but the pavement in front of her feet. More people to notice soon. The eastern sky grew lighter. There, Loyal announced at last, it is under there. It was a shop he pointed to, still closed for the night. The tables out front were bare. The awnings over them rolled up tight, the door stoutly shuttered. The windows above where the shopkeeper lived were still dark. Under? Matt exclaimed incredulously. How in the light can we— Moiraine raised a hand that cut him off and motioned for them to follow her into the alley beside the shop. Horses and people together, they crowded the opening between the two buildings. Shaded by the walls, it was darker there than on the street, near to full night again. There must be a cellar door, Moraine muttered. Ah, yes. Abruptly light blossomed. A coolly glowing ball the size of a man's fist hung suspended over the eyes Sedai's palm, moving as she moved her hand. Rand thought that it was a measure of what they had been through, that everyone seemed to take it as a matter of course. She put it close to the doors she had found, slanted almost flat to the ground, with a hasp held by thick bolts and an iron lock bigger than Rand's hand and thick with old rust. Loyal gave the lock a tug. I can pull it off, hasp and all, but it will make enough noise to wake the whole neighborhood. Let us not damage the goodman's property if we can avoid it. Moraine studied the lock intently for a moment. Suddenly she gave the rusty iron a tap with her staff, and the lock fell open neatly. Hastily, Loyal undid the lock and swung the doors up, propping them back. Moiraine went down the ramp thus revealed, lighting her way with the glowing ball. Aldib stepped delicately behind her. "'Light the lanterns and come down,' she called softly. "'There is plenty of room. Hurry! It will be light out soon.' Rand hurriedly untied the pulled lanterns off the pack-horse, but even before the first was lit he realized he could see Matt's features. People would be filling the streets in minutes, and the shopkeeper would be coming down to open up for business, all wondering why the alleyway was crammed full of horses. Matt muttered something nervously about taking horses indoors, but Rand was glad to lead his down the ramp. Matt followed, grumbling, but no less quickly. Rand's lantern swung on the end of its pole, bumping the ceiling if he was not careful, and neither Red nor the pack horse liked the ramp. Then he was down and getting out of Matt's way. Moraine let her floating light die, but as the rest joined them, the added lanterns lit the open space. The cellar was as long and as wide as the building above, much of the space taken up by brick columns, flaring up from narrow bases to five times as big at the ceiling. The place seemed made up from a series of arches. There was plenty of room, but Rand still felt crowded. Loyal's head brushed the ceiling. As the rusted lock had foretold, the cellar had not been used in a long time. The floor was bare except for a few broken barrels filled with odds and ends, and a thick layer of dust. Moats, stirred up by so many feet, sparkled in the lantern light. Lan was last in, and as soon as he had Mandarb down the ramp, he climbed back to pull the doors shut. Blood and ashes, Matt growled. Why would they build one of these gates in a place like this? It was not always like this, Loyal said. His rumbling voice echoed in the cavernous space. Not always. No. The ogre was angry, Rand realized with a shock. 
Once trees stood here. Every kind of tree that would grow in this place, every kind of tree that Ogre could coax to grow here. The great trees, a hundred spans high. Shade of branch and cool breezes to catch the smell of leaf and flower, and hold the memory of the peace of the steading. All that, murdered for this, his fist thumped a column. The column seemed to shake under that blow. Rand was certain he heard bricks crack. Waterfalls of dry mortar slid down the column. What is already woven cannot be undone, Moraine said gently. It will not make the trees grow again for you to bring the building down on our heads. Loyal's drooping eyebrows made him look more abashed than a human face could have managed. With your help, Loyal, perhaps we can keep the groves that still stand from falling under the shadow. You have brought us to what we seek. As she moved to one of the walls, Rand realized that that wall was different from the others. They were ordinary brick. This was intricately worked stone, fanciful swirls of leaves and vines, pale even under its coat of dust. The brick and mortar were old, but something about the stone said it had stood there long, long before the brick was fired. Later builders, themselves centuries gone, had incorporated what already stood, and still later men had made it part of a cellar. One part of the carved stone wall right in the center was more elaborate than the rest. As well done as the rest was, it appeared a crude copy in comparison. Worked in hard stone, those leaves seemed soft, caught in one frozen moment as a gentle summer breeze stirred them. For all of that they had the feel of age, as much greater than the rest of the stone as the rest was older than the brick. That old and more. Loyal looked at them as if he would rather be anywhere else but there, even out in the streets with another mob. Avendasora, Moraine murmured, resting her hand on a trefoil leaf in the stonework. Rand scanned the carving. That was the only leaf of its kind he could find. The leaf of the tree of life is the key, the Aes Sedai said, and the leaf came away in her hand. Rand blinked. From behind him he heard gasps. That leaf had seemed no less a part of the wall than any other. Just as simply, the Aes Sedai set it against the pattern a handspan lower. The three-pointed leaf fit there as if the space had been intended for it, and once more it was a part of the whole. As soon as it was in place, the entire nature of the central stonework changed. He was sure now that he could see the leaves ruffled by some unfelt breeze. He almost thought they were verdant under the dust, a tapestry of thick spring greenery there in the lantern-lit cellar. Almost imperceptibly at first, a split opened up in the middle of the ancient carving, widening as the two halves slowly swung into the cellar until they stood straight out. The backs of the gates were worked as the fronts, the same profusion of vines and leaves, almost alive. Behind, where there should have been dirt or the cellar of the next building, a dull reflective shimmering faintly caught their images. I have heard, Loyal said, half mourning, half fearful, that once the way gates shone like mirrors. Once, who entered the ways walked through the sun and the sky. Once. We have no time for waiting. Moraine said. Lan went past her, leading Mandarb, pulled lantern in hand. His shadowy reflection approached him, leading a shadowy horse. Man and reflection seemed to step into each other at the shimmering surface, and both were gone. For a moment the black stallion balked, an apparently continuous rain connecting him to the dim shape of his own image. The rain tightened, and the warhorse too vanished. For a minute everyone in the cellar stood staring at the waygate. Hurry, Moraine urged. I must be the last through. We cannot leave this open for anyone to find by chance. Hurry! With a heavy sigh, Loyal strode into the shimmer. Tossing its head, his big horse tried to hold back from the surface and was hauled through. They were gone as completely as the water and Mondarb. Hesitantly, Rand poked his lantern at the waygate. The lantern sank into its reflection, the two merging until both were gone. He made himself keep on walking forward, watching the pole disappear into itself inch by inch. 
and then he was stepping into himself, entering the gate. His mouth fell open. Something icy slid along his skin as if he were passing through a wall of cold water. Time stretched out. The cold enveloped one hair at a time, shivered over his clothes thread by thread. Abruptly the chill burst like a bubble, and he paused to catch his breath. He was inside the ways. Just ahead, Lan and Loyal waited patiently by their horses. All around them was blackness that seemed to stretch on forever. Their lanterns made a small pool of light around them, too small, as if something pressed back the light, or ate it. Of a sudden anxious, he jerked at his reins. Red on the pack horse came leaping through, nearly knocking him down. Stumbling, he caught himself and hurried to the water and the ogre, pulling the nervous horses behind him. The animals wickered softly. Even Mondarb appeared to take some comfort from the presence of other horses. Go easy when you pass through a waygate, Rand, Loyal cautioned. Things are different inside the ways than out. Look. He looked back the way the ogre pointed, thinking to see the same dull shimmer. Instead, he could see into the cellar, as if through a large piece of smoked glass set in the blackness. Disturbingly, the darkness around the window into the cellar gave a sense of depth, as though the opening stood alone with nothing around or behind it but the dark. He said as much with a shaky laugh, but Loyal took him seriously. You could walk all the way around it, and you would not see a thing from the other side. I would not advise it, though. The books aren't very clear about what lies behind the way gates. I think you could become lost there and never find your way out. Rand shook his head and tried to concentrate on the waygate itself rather than what lay behind it. But that was just as disturbing in its own fashion. If there had been anything to look at in the darkness besides the waygate, he would have looked at it. In the cellar, through the smoky dimness, Moiraine and the others were plain enough, but they moved as if in a dream. Every blink of an eye seemed a deliberate, exaggerated gesture. Matt was making his way to the waygate as though walking through clear jelly, his legs seeming to swim forward. The wheel turns faster in the ways, Loyal explained. He looked at the darkness surrounding them, and his head sunk in between his shoulders. None alive, no more than fragments. I fear what I don't know about the ways, Rand. The dark one, Lan said, cannot be defeated without chancing risks. But we are alive at this moment, and before us is the hope of remaining alive. Do not surrender before you are beaten, Ogier. You would not speak so confidently if you had ever been in the ways. The normal distant thunder of Loyal's voice was muted. He stared at the blackness as if he saw things there. I never have before either. But I've seen Ogier who have been through a way gate and come out again. You would not speak so if you had. Matt stepped through the gate and regained normal speed. For an instant he stared at the seemingly endless darkness, then came running to join them, his lantern bobbing on its pole, his horse leaping behind him, almost sending him sprawling. One by one the others passed through, Perrin and Egwene and Nynaeve, each pausing in shocked silence before hurrying to join the rest. Each lantern enlarged the pool of light, but not as much as it should have. It was as if the dark became denser the more light there was, thickening as it fought against being diminished. That was not a line of reasoning Rand wanted to follow. It was bad enough just being there without giving the darkness a will of its own. Everyone seemed to feel the oppressiveness, though. There were no wry comments from Matt here, and Egwene looked as if she wished she could rethink her decision to come. They all silently watched the waygate that last window into the world they knew. Finally only Moiraine was left in the cellar, dimly lit by the lantern she had taken. The eyes Sedai still moved in that dreamlike way. Her hand crept as it found the leaf of Avendasora. It was located lower in the stonework on this side, Rand saw, just where she had placed it on the other. Plucking it free, she put it back in the original position. He wondered suddenly if the leaf on the other side had moved back too. 
The Aes Sedai came through, leading Aldeeb, as the stone gates slowly, slowly began closing behind her. She came to join them, the light of her lantern leaving the gates before they were shut. Blackness swallowed the narrowing view of the cellar. In the constrained light of their lanterns, blackness surrounded them totally. Suddenly it seemed as if the lanterns were the only light left in the world. Rand realized that he was jammed shoulder to shoulder in between Perrin and Egwene. Egwene gave him a wide-eyed look and pressed closer, and Perrin made no move to give him room. There was something comforting about touching another human being when the whole world had just been swallowed up by dark. Even the horses seemed to feel the ways, pushing them into a tighter and tighter knot. Outwardly unconcerned, Moraine and Lan swung into their saddles, and the Aes Sedai leaned forward, arms resting on her carved staff across the high pommel of her saddle. We must be on our way, Loyal. Loyal gave a start and nodded vigorously. Yes, yes, Aes Sedai, you are right. Not a minute longer than need be. He pointed to a broad strip of white running under their feet, and Rand stepped away from it hastily. All the two rivers folk did. Rand thought the floor had been smooth once, but the smoothness was pitted now, as if the stone had the pox. The white line was broken in several places. This leads from the waygate to the first guiding. From there... Loyal looked around anxiously, then scrambled onto his horse with none of the reluctance he had shown earlier. The horse wore the biggest saddle the head groom had been able to find, but Loyal filled it from pommel to cantle. His feet hung down on either side, almost to the animal's knees. Not a minute longer than need be, he muttered. Reluctantly, the others mounted. Moraine and Lan rode on either side of the ogre, following the white line through the dark. Everyone else crowded in behind as close as they could get, the lanterns bobbing over their heads. The lanterns should have given enough light to fill a house, but ten feet away from them it stopped. The blackness stopped it, as if it had struck a wall. The creak of saddles and click of horseshoes on stone seemed to travel only to the edge of light. Rand's hand kept drifting to his sword. It was not that he thought there was anything out there against which he could use the sword to defend himself. It did not seem as if there was anywhere for something to be. The bubble of light around them could as well have been a cave surrounded by stone, completely surrounded with no way out. The horses might have been walking a treadmill for the chains around them. He gripped the hilt as if the pressure of his hand there could press away the stone he felt weighing down on him. Touching the sword, he could remember Tam's teaching. For a little while, he could find the calm of the void. But the weight always returned, compressing the void until it was only a cavern inside his mind, and he had to start over again, touching Tam's sword to remember. It was a relief when something did change, even if it was only a tall slab of stone standing on end that appeared out of the dark before them, the broad white line stopping at its base. Sinuous curves of metal inlaid the wide surface, graceful lines that vaguely reminded Rand of vines and leaves. Discolored pox marked stone and metal alike. The guiding, Loyal said and leaned out of his saddle to frown at the cursive metal inlays. Ogre script, Moraine said, but so broken I can barely make out what it says. I hardly can either, Loyal said, but enough to know we go this way. He turned his horse aside from the guiding. The edges of their light caught other stoneworks, what appeared to be stone-walled bridges arcing off into the darkness, and gently sloping ramps without railings of any kind leading up and down. Between the bridges and the ramps ran a chest-high balustrade, however, as though falling was a danger there at any rate. Plain white stone made the balustrade in simple curves and rounds fitted together in complex patterns. Something about all of it seemed almost familiar to Rand, but he knew it had to be his imagination groping for anything familiar, where everything was strange. At the foot of one of the bridges, Loyal paused to read the single line on the narrow column stone there. Nodding, he rode up onto the bridge. This is the first bridge of our path, he said over his shoulder. 
Rand wondered what held the bridge up. The horse's hooves made a gritty sound, as if bits of stone flaked off at every step. Everything he could see was covered with shallow holes, some tiny pinpricks, others shallow, rough-edged craters astride across, as if there had been a rain of acid, or the stone was rotting. The guard wall showed cracks and holes, too. In places it was gone altogether for as much as a span. For all he knew, the bridge could be solid stone all the way to the center of the earth. But what he saw made him hope it would stand long enough for them to reach the other end, wherever that is. The bridge did end eventually in a place that looked no different from its beginning. All Rand could see was what their little pool of light touched, but he had the impression that it was a large space, like a flat-topped hill with bridges and ramps leaving all around it. An island, Loyal called it. There was another script-covered guiding. Rand placed it in the middle of the island, with no way of knowing if he was right or not. Loyal read, then took them up one of the ramps, curving up and up. After an interminable climb, curving continuously, the ramp led off onto another island, just like the one where it had begun. Rand tried to imagine the curve of the ramp and gave up. This island can't be right on top of the other one. It can't be. Loyal consulted yet another slab filled with Ogre script, found another signpost column, led them onto another bridge. Rand no longer had any idea in what direction they were traveling. In their huddle of light in the dark, one bridge was exactly like another, except that some had breaks in the guard walls and some did not. Only the degree of damage to the guidings gave any difference to the islands. Rand lost track of time. He was not even sure how many bridges they had crossed or how many ramps they had traveled. The warder must have had a clock in his head, though. Just when Rand felt the first stir of hunger, Lan announced quietly that it was midday and dismounted to parcel out bread and cheese and dried meat from the pack-horse. Perrin was leading the animal by that time. They were on an island, and Loyal was busily deciphering the directions on the guiding. Matt started to climb down from his saddle, but Moraine said, Time is too valuable in the ways to waste, for us much too valuable. We will stop when it is time to sleep. Lan was already back on Mondarb. Rand's appetite slipped at the thought of sleeping in the ways. It was always night there, but not the kind of night for sleeping. He ate while he rode, though, like everyone else. It was an awkward affair, trying to juggle his food, the lantern pole, and his reins. But for all of his imagined lack of appetite, he licked the last crumbs of bread and cheese off his hands when he was done, and thought fondly of more. He even began to think the ways were not so bad— not nearly as bad as Loyal made out. They might have the heavy feel of the hour before a storm, but nothing changed. Nothing happened. The ways were almost boring. Then the silence was broken by a startled grunt from Loyal. Rand stood in his stirrups to peer past the ogre, and swallowed hard at what he saw. They were in the middle of a bridge, and only a few feet ahead of Loyal. The bridge ended in a jagged gap. Chapter 45 What Follows in Shadow The light of their lanterns stretched just far enough to touch the other side, thrusting out of the dark like a giant's broken teeth. Loyal's horse stamped a hoof nervously, and a loose stone fell away into the dead black below. If there was any sound of its striking bottom, Rand never heard it. He edged Red closer to the gap. As far down as he could thrust his lantern on its pole, there was nothing. Blackness below as blackness above, shearing off the light. If there was a bottom, it could be a thousand feet down, or never. But on the other side, he could see what was under the bridge holding it up. Nothing. Less than a span in thickness, and absolutely nothing underneath. Abruptly the stone under his feet seemed as thin as paper, and the endless drop over the edge pulled at him. The lantern and pole seemed suddenly heavy enough to pull him right out of the saddle. Head spinning, he backed the bay away from the abyss as cautiously as he had approached. "'Is it to this you've brought us eyes, Sedai?' Nynaeve said. 
All this just to find out we have to go back to Camelin after all? We do not have to go back, Moraine said. Not all the way to Camelin. There are many paths along the ways to any place. We need only go back far enough for Loyal to find another path that will lead to Faldara. Loyal? Loyal! The ogre pulled himself away from staring at the gap with a visible effort. What? Oh, yes, I said I. I can find another path. I had... His eyes drifted back to the chasm and his ears twitched. I had not dreamed the decay had gone so far. If the bridges themselves are breaking, it may be that I cannot find the path you want. It may be that I cannot find a path back, either. The bridges could be falling behind us even now. There has to be a way, Perrin said, his voice flat. His eyes seemed to gather the light, to glow golden. A wolf at bay, Rand thought, startled. That's what he looks like. It will be as the wheel weaves, Moraine said, but I do not believe the decay is as fast as you fear. Look at the stone, Loyal. Even I can tell that this is an old break. Yes, Loyal said slowly. Yes, I said I. I can see it. There is no rain or wind here, but that stone has been in the air for ten years at least. He nodded with a relieved grin so happy with the discovery that for a moment he seemed to forget his fear. Then he looked around and shrugged uncomfortably. I could find other paths more easily than Mafal de Daranel. Tarvalan, for instance, or Steading Shangtai. It's only three bridges to Steading Shangtai from the last island. I suppose the elders want to talk to me by this time. Faldara, loyal, Moraine said firmly. The eye of the world lies beyond Faldara, and we must reach the eye. Faldara, the ogre agreed reluctantly. Back at the island, Loyal poured over the script-covered slab intently, drooping eyebrows drawn down as he muttered half to himself. Soon he was talking completely to himself, for he dropped into the ogre language. That inflected tongue sounded like deep-voiced birds singing. It seemed odd to Rand that a people so big had such a musical language. Finally, the ogre nodded. As he led them to the chosen bridge, he turned to peer forlornly at the signpost beside another. Three crossings to Steading Shangtai. He sighed. But he took them on past without stopping and turned on to the third bridge beyond. He looked back regretfully as they started across, though the bridge to his home was hidden in the dark. Rand took the bay up beside the ogre. When this is over, Loyal, you show me your steading and I'll show you Eamon's field. No ways, though. We'll walk or ride if it takes all summer. You believe it will ever be over, Rand? He frowned at the ogre. You said it would take two days to reach Faldara. Not the ways, Rand. All the rest. Loyal looked over his shoulder at the Aes Sedai, talking softly with Lan as they rode side by side. What makes you believe it will ever be over? The bridges and ramps led up and down and across. Sometimes a white line ran off into the dark from the guiding, just like the line they had followed from the Waygate and Camelin. Rand saw that he was not the only one who eyed those lines curiously, and a little wistfully. Nynaeve, Perrin, Matt, and even Egwene left the lines reluctantly. There was a way-gate at the other end of each of them, a gate back into the world, where there was sky and sun and wind. Even the wind would have been welcome. Leave them they did under the eyes Sedai's sharp eye, but Rand was not the only one to look back, even after dark swallowed island and guiding and line. Rand was yawning by the time Moiraine announced that they would stop for the night on one of the islands. Matt looked at the blackness all around them and snickered loudly but he got down as quickly as anyone else. Lan and the boys unsaddled and hobbled the horses, while Nynaeve and Egwene set up a small oil stove to make tea. Looking like the base of a lantern, it was what Lan said warders used in the blight, where the wood could be dangerous to burn. The warder produced tripod legs from the baskets they took off the pack horse, so the lantern poles could be set in a circle around their campsite. 
Loyal examined the guiding for a moment, then dropped down cross-legged and rubbed a hand across the dusty, pockmarked stone. Once things grew on the islands, he said sadly. All the books tell of it. There was green grass to sleep on, soft as any feather bed. Fruit trees to spice the food you'd brought with an apple or a pear or a bell fruit, sweet and crisp and juicy, whatever the time of year outside. Nothing to hunt, Perrin growled, then looked surprised that he had spoken. Egwene handed Loyal a cup of tea. He held it without drinking, staring at it as if he could find the fruit trees in its depths. Aren't you going to set wards? Nynaeve asked Moiraine. Surely there must be worse than rats in this. Even if I haven't seen anything, I can still feel. The Aes Sedai rubbed her fingers against her palms distastefully. You feel the taint, the corruption of the power that made the ways. I will not use the one power in the ways unless I must. The taint is so strong that whatever I tried to do would surely be corrupted. That made everyone as silent as loyal. Land settled down to his meal methodically as if he were stoking a fire, the food less important than fueling his body. Moiraine ate well, too, and as tidily as if they were not squatting on bare stone quite literally in the middle of nowhere, but Rand only picked at his food. The tiny flame of the oil stove gave just enough heat to boil water, but he crouched toward it as if he could soak up warmth. His shoulders brushed Matt and Perrin. They all made a tight circle around the stove. Matt held his bread and meat and cheese forgotten in his hands, and Perrin set his tin plate down after only a few bites. The mood became more and more glum, and everyone looked down, avoiding the dark around them. Moiraine studied them as she ate. Finally, she put her plate aside and patted her lips with a napkin. I can tell you one cheerful thing. I do not think Tom Marilyn is dead. Rand looked at her sharply. But the fade! Matt told me what happened in Whitebridge, the Aes Sedai said. People there mentioned a gleeman, but they said nothing of him dying. They would have, I think, if a gleeman had been killed. Whitebridge is not so big as for a gleeman to be a small thing. And Tom is a part of the pattern that weaves itself around you three. Too important a part, I believe, to be cut off yet. Too important, Rand thought. How could Moiraine know? Min? She saw something about Tom? She saw a great deal, Moiraine said wryly, about all of you. I wish I could understand half of what she saw, but even she does not. Old barriers fail. But whether what Min does is old or new, she sees true. Your fates are bound together. Tom Marilyn's too. Nynaeve gave a dismissive sniff and poured herself another cup of tea. I don't see how she saw anything about any of us, Matt said with a grin. As I remember it, she spent most of her time looking at Rand. Egwene raised an eyebrow. Oh? You didn't tell me that, Moiraine said I. Rand glanced at her. She was not looking at him, but her tone had been too carefully neutral. I talked to her once, he said. She dresses like a boy and her hair is as short as mine. You talked to her. Once. Egwene nodded slowly. Still not looking at him, she raised her cup to her lips. Min was just somebody who worked at the inn in Berlin, Perrin said. Not like Aram. Egwene choked on her tea. Too hot, she muttered. Who's Aram? Rand asked. Perrin smiled, much like Matt's smile in the old days when he was up to mischief and hid behind his cup. One of the traveling people, Egwene said casually, but red spots bloomed in her cheeks. One of the traveling people, Perrin said blandly. He dances, like a bird. Wasn't that what you said, Egwene? It was like flying with a bird? Egwene set her cup down deliberately. I don't know if anyone else is tired, but I'm going to sleep. As she rolled herself up in her blankets, Perrin reached over to nudge Rand in the ribs and winked. Rand found himself grinning back. 
burn me if I didn't come out best for a change. I wish I knew as much about women as Perrin. Maybe, Rand, Matt said slyly. You ought to tell Egwene about Farmer Grinwell's daughter, Els. Egwene lifted her head to stare first at Matt, then at him. He hastily got up to fetch his own blankets. Sleep sounds good to me right now. All the Emonsfield people began seeking their blankets then, and loyal too. Moiraine sat sipping her tea, and Lan. The warder did not look as if he ever intended to sleep, or needed to. Even rolled up for sleep, no one wanted to get very far from the others. They made a small circle of blanket-covered mounds right around the stove, almost touching one another. Rand, Matt whispered, was there anything between you and Min? I barely got a look at her. She was pretty, but she must be nearly as old as Nynaeve. What about this Els? Perrin added from the other side of him. She pretty? Blood and ashes, he mumbled. Can't I even talk to a girl? You two are as bad as Egwene. As the wisdom would say, Matt chided mockingly, watch your tongue. Well, if you won't talk about it, I'm going to get some sleep. Good, Rand grumbled. That's the first decent thing you've said. Sleep was not easily come by, though. The stone was hard, however Rand lay, and he could feel the pits through his blanket. There was no way to imagine he was anywhere but in the ways, made by the men who had broken the world, tainted by the Dark One. He kept picturing the broken bridge and the nothing under it. When he turned one way, he found Matt looking at him, looking through him, really. Mocking was forgotten when the dark around them was remembered. He rolled the other way, and Perrin had his eyes open, too. Perrin's face was less afraid than Matt's, but he had his hands on his chest, tapping his thumbs together worriedly. Moiraine made a circuit of them, kneeling by each person's head and bending down to speak softly. Rand could not hear what she said to Perrin, but it made his thumbs stop. When she bent over Rand, her face almost touching his, she said in a low, comforting voice, Even here your destiny protects you. Not even the Dark One can change the pattern completely. You are safe from him so long as I am close. Your dreams are safe. For a time yet, they are safe. As she passed from him to Matt, he wondered if she thought it was that simple, that she could tell him he was safe and he would believe it. But somehow he did feel safe, safer at least. Thinking that, he drifted into sleep and did not dream. Lan woke them. Rand wondered if the water had slept. He did not look tired, not even as tired as those who had laid some hours on the hard stone. Moraine allowed enough time to make tea, but only one cup apiece. They ate breakfast in the saddle, Loyal and the warder leading. It was the same meal as the others, bread and meat and cheese. Rand thought it would be easy to get tired of bread and meat and cheese. Not long after the last crumb was licked off a finger, Land said quietly, Someone is following us, or something. They were in the middle of a bridge, both ends of it hidden. Matt jerked an arrow from his quiver, and before anyone could stop him, loosed it in the dark behind them. I knew I shouldn't have done this, Loyal muttered. Never deal with an Aes Sedai except in a steading. Land pushed the bow down before Matt could knock another. Stop that, you village idiot. There's no way to tell who it is. That's the only place they're safe, the ogre went on. What else would be in a place like this besides something evil? Matt demanded. That's what the elders say, and I should have listened to them. We are, for one, the warder said dryly. Maybe it's another traveler, Egwene said hopefully. An ogre, perhaps. Ogre have more sense than to use the ways, Loyal growled. All but Loyal, who has no sense at all. Elder Haman always said it, and it's true. What do you feel, Lan? Moiraine asked. Is it something that serves the Dark One? The warder shook his head slowly. I don't know, he said, as if that surprised him. I cannot tell. Perhaps it's the ways and the taint. It all feels wrong. 
but whoever it is or whatever, he's not trying to catch us. He almost caught up at the last island and scampered back across the bridge so as not to. If I fall behind, I might surprise him, though, and see who or what he is. If you fall behind, Warder, Loyal said firmly, you'll spend the rest of your life in the ways. Even if you can read, Ogre, I have never heard or read of a human who could find his path off the first island lacking an Ogre guide. Can you read, Ogre? Lan shook his head again, and Warain said, So long as he does not trouble us, we will not trouble him. We have no time. No time. As they rode off the bridge onto the next island, Loyal said, If I remember the last guiding correctly, there is a path from here that leads toward Tarvalon. Half a day's journey at most. Not quite as long as it will take us to reach Mafaldadaranel. I'm sure that he cut off as the light of their lanterns reached the guiding. Near the top of the slab, deeply chiseled lines, sharp and angular, made wounds in the stone. Suddenly Lan's alertness was no longer hidden. He remained easily erect in his saddle, but Rand had the sudden impression that the warder could feel everything around him, even feel the rest of them breathing. Lan began circling his stallion around the guiding, spiraling outward. He rode as if he were ready to be attacked, or to attack himself. This explains much, Moiraine said softly, and it makes me afraid. So much. I should have guessed. The taint, the decay. I should have guessed. Guessed what? Nynaeve demanded, just as Loyal asked. What is it? Who did this? I've never seen or heard of anything like it. The eyes Sedai faced them calmly. Trollocs. She ignored their frightened gasps. Or fades. Those are Trolloc runes. The Trollocs have discovered how to enter the ways. That must be how they got to the two rivers undiscovered. Through the waygate at Manetherin. There is at least one waygate in the Blight. She glanced toward Lan before continuing. The warder was far enough away that only the faint light of his lantern could be seen. Monetherin was destroyed, but almost nothing can destroy a waygate. That is how the Fades could gather a small army around Camelin without raising an alarm in every nation between the Blight and Andor. Pausing, she touched her lips thoughtfully. But they cannot know all the paths yet, else they would have been pouring into Camelin through the gate we used. Yes. Rand shivered. Walking through the waygate to find Trollocs waiting in the dark, hundreds of them, perhaps thousands, twisted giants with half-animal faces, snarling as they leaped forward in the blackness to kill. Or worse. They don't use the ways easily, Lan called. His lantern was no more than twenty spans off, but the light of it was only a dim, fuzzy ball that seemed very distant to those around the guiding. Moiraine led the way to him. Rand wished his stomach were empty when he saw what the warder had found. At the foot of one of the bridges the frozen shapes of Trollocs reared, caught flailing about them with hooked axes and scythe like swords. Grey and pitted like the stone, the huge bodies were half sunken in the swollen, bubbled surface. Some of the bubbles had burst, revealing more snouted faces, forever snarling with fear. Rand heard someone retching behind him and swallowed hard to keep from joining whoever it was. Even for Trollocs it had been a horrible way to die. A few feet beyond the Trollocs the bridge ended. The signpost lay shattered into a thousand shards. Loyal got down from his horse gingerly, eyeing the Trollocs as if he thought they might come back to life. He examined the remains of the signpost hurriedly, picking out the metal script that had been inlaid in the stone, then scrambled back into his saddle. This was the first bridge of the path from here to Tarvalon, he said. Matt was scrubbing the back of his hand across his mouth with his head turned away from the Trollocs. Egwene hid her face in her hands. Rand moved his horse close to Bela and touched her shoulder. She twisted around and clutched him, shuddering. He wanted to shudder, too. Her holding him was the only thing that kept him from it. As well we are not going to Tarvalon yet, Moiraine said. 
Nynaeve rounded on the Aes Sedai. How can you take it so calmly? The same could happen to us. Perhaps, Moraine said serenely, and Nynaeve ground her teeth so hard Rand could hear them grate. It is more likely, though, Moraine went on unruffled, that the men, the Aes Sedai, who made the ways, protected them, building in traps for creatures of the Dark One. It is something they must have feared, then, before the Halfman and Trollocs had been driven into the Blight. In any case, we cannot tarry here, and whatever way we choose, back or ahead, is as likely to have a trap as any other. Loyal, do you know the next bridge? Yes. Yes, they did not ruin that part of the guiding, thank the light. For the first time, Loyal seemed as eager to go on as Moiraine did. He had his big horse moving before he finished speaking. Egwene clung to Rand's arm for two more bridges. He regretted it when she finally let go with a murmured apology and a forced laugh, and not just because it had felt good having her hold on to him that way. It was easier to be brave, he discovered, when someone needed your protection. Moraine might not have believed a trap could be set for them, but for all the haste she spoke of, she made them travel more slowly than before, pausing before letting them onto any bridge, or off one onto an island. She would step Aldeeb forward, feeling the air in front of her with an outstretched hand, and not even Loyal or Lan was allowed to go ahead until she gave permission. Rand had to trust her judgment about traps, but he peered into the darkness around them as if he could actually see anything more than ten feet away, and strained his ears listening. If Trollocs could use the ways, then whatever was following them could be another creature of the Dark One, or more than one. Lan had said he could not tell in the ways, but as they crossed bridge after bridge, ate a midday meal riding, and crossed still more bridges, all he could hear were their own saddles creaking, and the horse's hooves and sometimes one of the others coughing or muttering to himself. Later there was a distant wind, too, off in the black somewhere. He could not say in which direction. At first he thought it was his imagination, but with time he became sure. It'll be good to feel the wind again, even if it's cold. Suddenly he blinked. Loyal, didn't you say there isn't any wind in the ways? Loyal pulled his horse up just short of the next island and cocked his head to listen. Slowly, his face paled and he licked his lips. Much in shin, he whispered hoarsely. The black wind. The light illumine and protect us. It's the black wind. How many more bridges? Moiraine asked sharply. Loyal, how many more bridges? Two. I think two. Quickly, then, she said, trotting Aldeeb onto the island. Find it quickly. Loyal talked to himself or to anyone who was listening while he read the guiding. They came out mad, screaming about Machin Shin. Light help us. Even those eyes Sedai could heal, they... He scanned the stone hastily and galloped toward the chosen bridge with a shouted, This way! This time Moiraine did not wait to check. She urged them on to a gallop, the bridge trembling beneath the horses, lanterns swinging wildly overhead. Loyal ran his eyes over the next guiding and wheeled his big mount around like a racer almost before it had stopped. The sound of the wind became louder. Rand could hear it even over the pounding of hooves on stone. Behind them, and gusting closer. They did not bother with the last guiding. As soon as the light of the lanterns caught the white line running from it, they swung in that direction, still galloping. The island vanished behind, and there was only the pitted gray stone underfoot and the white line. Rand was breathing so hard he was no longer sure if he could hear the wind. Out of the darkness the gates appeared, vine-carved and standing alone in the black like a tiny piece of wall in the night. Moiraine leaned out of her saddle, reaching toward the carvings, and suddenly pulled back. The Avendasora leaf is not here, she said. The key is gone. Light, Matt shouted. Bloody light! Loyal threw back his head and gave a mournful cry like a howl of dying. Egwene touched Rand's arm. Her lips trembled, but she only looked at him. He put his hand on top of hers, hoping he did not look more frightened than she did. He felt it. 
Back toward the guiding, the wind howled. He almost thought he could hear voices in it, voices screaming vileness that even half understood brought bile up in his throat. Moraine raised her staff and flame lanced from the end of it. It was not the pure white flame that Rand remembered from Eamon's field and the battle before Shadar Logoth. Sickly yellow streaked through the fire and slow drifting flecks of black like soot. A thin acrid smoke drifted from the flame, setting loyal coughing and the horses dancing nervously. But Moraine thrust it at the gates. The smoke rasped Rand's throat and burned his nose. Stone melted like butter, leaf and vine withering in the flame and vanishing. The Aes Sedai moved the fire as fast as she could, but cutting an opening big enough for everyone to get through was no quick task. To Rand it seemed as if the line of melted stone crept along its arc at a snail's pace. His cloak stirred as if caught by the edge of a breeze, and his heart froze. I can feel it, Matt said, his voice quavering. Light, I can bloody feel it. The flame winked out, and Moiraine lowered her staff. Done, she said. Half done. A thin line ran across the stone carving. Rand thought he could see light, dim but still light, through the crack. But despite the cutting, the two big curved wedges of stone still stood there, half an arc out of each door. The opening would be big enough for everyone to ride through though Loyal might have to lie flat on his horse's back. Once the two wedges of stone were gone, it would be big enough. He wondered how much each weighed. A thousand pounds? More? Maybe if we all get down and push. Maybe we can push one of them over before the wind gets here. A gust tugged at his cloak. He tried not to listen to what the voices cried. As Moraine stepped back, Mandarb leaped forward, straight toward the gates, Lan crouched in the saddle. At the last instant the warhorse twisted to catch the stone with his shoulder, just as he had been taught to catch other horses in battle. With a crash the stone toppled outward, and the warder and his horse were carried by their momentum through the smoky shimmer of a waygate. The light that came through was mid-morning light, pale and thin, but it seemed to Rand as if the noonday summer sun blazed in his face. On the far side of the gate, Lan and Mandarb slowed to a crawl, stumbling in slow motion as the warder reined back around toward the gate. Rand did not wait. Pushing Vela's head toward the opening, he slapped the shaggy mare hard on the croup. Egwene had just enough time to throw a startled look over her shoulder at him before Vela carried her out of the ways. All of you, out, Moraine directed. Quickly, go! As she spoke, the Aes Sedai thrust her staff out at arm's length, pointed back toward the guiding. Something leaped from the end of the staff, like liquid light rendered to a syrup of fire, a blazing spear of white and red and yellow, streaking into the black, exploding, coruscating like shattered diamonds. The wind shrieked in agony, it screamed in rage. The thousand murmurs that hid in the wind roared like thunder, roars of madness, half-heard voices, cackling and howling promises that twisted Rand's stomach as much by the pleasure in them as by what he almost understood them to say. He booted Red forward, crowding into the opening, squeezing after the others, all forcing through the smoky glistening at once. The icy chill ran through him again, the peculiar sensation of being slowly lowered face down into a winter pond, the cold water crawling across his skin by infinitesimal increments just as before it seemed to go on forever, while his mind raced, wondering if the wind could catch them while they were held like that. As suddenly as a pricked bubble, the chill vanished, and he was outside. His horse, for one abrupt instant, moving twice as fast as he had been, stumbled and almost pitched him over his head. He threw both arms around the bay's neck and hung on for dear life. While he got back into the saddle, Red shook himself, then trotted over to join the others as calmly as if nothing at all odd had happened. It was cold, not the chill of the waygate, but welcome, natural winter cold that slowly, steadily burrowed into flesh. He pulled his cloak around him, his eyes on the dull glimmer of the waygate. Beside him, Lan leaned forward in his saddle, one hand on his sword. Man and horse were tensed as if on the point of charging back through if Moiraine did not appear. 
The way gate stood in a jumble of stones at the base of a hill, hidden by bushes except where the falling pieces had broken down the bare brown branches. Alongside the carvings on the remains of the gates, the brush looked more lifeless than the stone. Slowly the murky surface bulged like some strange long bubble rising to the surface of a pond. Moiraine's back broke through the bubble. Inchmeal, the eyes Sedai and her dim reflection backed out of each other. She still held her staff out in front of her, and she kept it there as she drew Aldib out of the waygate after her, the white mare dancing with fear, eyes rolling. Still watching the waygate, Moiraine backed away. The waygate darkened. The hazy shimmer became murkier, sinking through grey to charcoal, then to black as deep as the heart of the ways. As if from a great distance the wind howled at them, hidden voices filled with an unquenchable thirst for living things, filled with a hunger for pain, filled with frustration. The voices seemed to whisper in Rand's ears, right at the brink of understanding, and within it. Flesh so fine, so fine to tear, to gash the skin, skin to strip, to plait, so nice to plait the strips, so nice, so red the drops that fall. Blood so red, so red, so sweet, sweet screams, pretty screams, singing screams, scream your song, sing your screams. The whispers drifted, the blackness lessened, faded, and the waygate was again a murky shimmer seen through an arch of carved stone. Rand let out a long, shuddering breath. He was not the only one. He heard other relieved exhalations. Egwene had Bela alongside Nynaeve's horse, and the two women had their arms around each other, their heads on each other's shoulders. Even Lan seemed relieved, though the hard planes of his face showed nothing. It was more in the way he sat Mandarb, a loosening of the shoulders as he looked at Moiraine, a tilt of the head. It could not pass, Moiraine said. I thought it could not. I hoped it could not. <laughs> she tossed her staff on the ground and scrubbed her hand on her cloak. Char, thick and black, marked the staff for over half its length. The taint corrupts everything in that place. What was that? Nynaeve demanded. What was it? Loyal appeared confused. Why, much in Shin, of course, the black wind that steals souls. But what is it? Nynaeve persisted. Even with a trollop you can look at it, touch it if you have a strong stomach. But that, she gave a convulsive shiver. Something left from the time of madness, perhaps, Moiraine replied, or even from the war of the shadow, the war of power. Something hiding in the ways so long it can no longer get out. No one, not even among the ogre, knows how far the ways run or how deep. It could even be something of the ways themselves. As Loyal said, the ways are living things, and all living things have parasites. Perhaps even a creature of the corruption itself, something born of the decay, something that hates life and light. Stop! Egwene cried. I don't want to hear any more. I could hear it saying, she cut off, shivering. There is worse to be faced yet, Moiraine said softly. Rand did not think she meant it to be heard. The Aes Sedai climbed into her saddle wearily and settled there with a grateful sigh. This is dangerous, she said, looking at the broken gates. Her charred staff received only a glance. The thing cannot get out, but anyone could wander in. Agalmar must send men to wall it up once we reach Faldara. She pointed to the north, to towers in the misty distance above the barren treetops. Chapter 46 Faldara The country around the waygate was rolling, forested hills. But aside from the gates themselves, there was no sign of any ogre grove. Most of the trees were grey skeletons clawing at the sky. Fewer evergreens than Rand was used to dotted the forest, and of them... Dead brown needles and leaves covered many. Loyal made no comment beyond a sad shaking of his head. As dead as the blasted lands, Nynaeve said, frowning. Egwene pulled her cloak around her and shivered. 
At least we're out, Perrin said. And Matt added, Out where? Shinar, Lan told them. We're in the borderlands. In his hard voice was a note that said, Home, almost. Rand gathered his cloak against the cold. The borderlands. Then the blight was close by. The blight. The eye of the world. And what they had come to do. We are close to Faldara, Moiraine said. Only a few miles. Across the treetops, towers rose to the north and east of them, dark against the morning sky. Between the hills and the woods, the towers often vanished as they rode, only to reappear again when they topped a particularly tall rise. Rand noticed trees split open as if struck by lightning. The cold, Lan answered when he asked. Sometimes the winter is so cold here the sap freezes, and trees burst. There are nights when you can hear them cracking like fireworks, and the air is so sharp you think that might shatter too. There are more than usual this winter past. Rand shook his head. Trees bursting? And that was during an ordinary winter. What must this winter have been like? Surely like nothing he could imagine. Who says winter's past? Matt said, his teeth chattering. Why, this a fine spring, sheepherder, Lan said. A fine spring to be alive. But if you want warm, well, it will be warm in the blight. Softly, Matt muttered, Blood and ashes. Blood and bloody ashes. Rand barely heard him, but it sounded heartfelt. They began to pass farms, but though it was the hour for midday meals to be cooking, no smoke rose from the high stone chimneys. The fields were empty of men and livestock both, though sometimes a plough or a wagon stood abandoned as if the owner meant to be back any minute. At one farm close by the road, a lone chicken scratched in the yard. One barn door swung freely with the wind. The other had broken off the bottom hinge and hung at an angle. The tall house, awed to Rand's two rivers eyes, with its sharp-peaked roof of big wooden shingles running almost to the ground, was still and silent. No dog came out to bark at them. A scythe lay in the middle of the barnyard. Buckets were overturned in a heap beside the well. Moiraine frowned at the farmhouse as they rode by. She lifted Aldib's reins, and the white mare quickened her pace. The Eman's fielders were clustered with loyal a little behind the Aes Sedai and the warder. Rand shook his head. He could not imagine anything growing there ever. But then he could not really imagine the ways either. Even now that he was past them he could not. I don't think she expected this, Nynaeve said quietly with a gesture that took in all the empty farms they had seen. Where did they all go? Egwene said. Why? They can't have been gone very long. What makes you say that? Matt asked. From the look of that barn door, they could have been gone all winter. Nynaeve and Egwene both looked at him as if he were slow-witted. The curtains in the windows, Egwene said patiently. They look too light for winter curtains, even here. As cold as it is here, no woman would have had those up more than a week or two, maybe less. The wisdom nodded. Curtains, Perrin chuckled. He immediately wiped the smile off his face when the two women raised their eyebrows at him. Oh, I agree with you. There wasn't enough rust on that scythe for any more than a week in the open. You should have seen that, Matt, even if you missed the curtains. Rand glanced sideways at Perrin, trying not to stare. His eyes were sharper than Perrin's, or had been when they used to hunt rabbits together. But he had not been able to see that scythe blade well enough to make out any rust. I really don't care where they went, Matt grumbled. I just want to find some place with a fire, soon. But why did they go? Rand said under his breath. The blight was not far off here. The blight, where all the fades and trollocs were, those not down in Andor chasing them. The blight, where they were going. He raised his voice enough to be heard by those close to him. Nynaeve, 
Maybe you and Egwene don't have to go to the eye with us. The two women looked at him as if he were speaking gibberish, but with the blight so close he had to make one last try. Maybe it's enough for you to be close. Moiraine didn't say you have to go. Are you loyal? You could stay at Faldara until we come back. Or you could start for Tarvalon. Maybe there'll be a merchant train, or I'll bet Moiraine would even hire a coach. We will meet in Tarvalon when it's all over. Tavirin. Loyal sigh was a rumble like thunder on the horizon. You swirl lives around you, Randolph Thor, you and your friends. Your fate chooses ours. The ogre shrugged, and suddenly a broad grin split his face. Besides, it will be something to meet the green man. Elder Haman always talks about his meeting with the green man, and so does my father and most of the elders. So many? Perrin said. The stories say the green man is hard to find, and no one can find him twice. Not twice, no, Loyal agreed. But then I have never met him, and neither have you. He doesn't seem to avoid Ogre quite the way he does you humans. He knows so much about trees, even the tree songs. Rand said, The point I was trying to make is, the wisdom cut him off. She says Egwene and I are part of the pattern, too, all woven in with you three. If she is to be believed, there's something about the way that piece of the pattern is woven that might stop the Dark One. And I am afraid I do believe her. Too much has happened not to. But if Egwene and I go away, what might we change about the pattern? I was only trying to... Again, Nynaeve interrupted sharply. I know what you were trying to do. She looked at him until he shifted uneasily in his saddle. Then her face softened. I know what you were trying to do, Rand. I have little liking for any eyes, said I, and this one least of all, I think. I have less for going into the blight. But least of all is the liking I have for the father of lies. If you boys, you men, can do what has to be done when you'd rather do almost anything else. Why do you think I will do less? Or Egwene? She did not appear to expect an answer. Gathering her reins, she frowned toward the Aes Sedai up ahead. I wonder if we're going to reach this Faldara place soon, or does she mean us to spend the night out in this? As she trotted toward Moiraine, Matt said, She called us men. It seems like only yesterday she was saying we shouldn't be off leading strings, and now she calls us men. You still shouldn't be off your mother's apron strings, Egwene said. But Rand did not think her heart was in it. She moved Bela close to his bay, and lowered her voice so none of the others could hear, although Matt at least tried. I only danced with Aram Rand, she said softly, not looking at him. You wouldn't hold it against me dancing with somebody I will never see again, would you? No, he told her. What had made her bring it up now? Of course not. But suddenly he remembered something Min had said in Berlin, what seemed a hundred years ago. She's not for you, nor you for her, at least not in the way you both want. The town of Faldara was built on hills higher than the surrounding country. It was nowhere near as big as Camelon, but the wall around it was as high as Camelon's. For a full mile outside that wall, in every direction, the ground was clear of anything taller than grass, and that cut low. Nothing could come close without being seen from one of the many tall towers topped by wooden hoardings. Where the walls of Camelin had a beauty about them, the builders of Faldara seemed not to have cared if anyone found their wall beautiful. The grey stone was grimly implacable, proclaiming that it existed for one purpose alone, to hold. Pennants atop the hoardings whipped in the wind, making the stooping black hawk of Shinar seem to fly all along the walls. Land tossed back the hood of his cloak, and despite the cold, motioned for the others to do the same. Moiraine had already lowered hers. It's the law in Shinar, the warder said, in all the borderlands. No one may hide his face inside a town's walls. Are they all that good-looking? Matt laughed. A halfman can't hide with his face exposed, the warder said in a flat voice. Rand's grin slid off his face. Hastily, Matt pushed back his hood. 
The gates stood open, tall and covered with dark iron, but a dozen armored men stood guard in gold and yellow surcoats bearing the black hawk. The hilts of long swords on their backs peeked over their shoulders, and broadsword or mace or axe hung at every waist. Their horses were tethered nearby, made grotesque by the steel bardings covering chests and necks and heads, with lances to stirrup, all ready to ride at an instant. The guards made no move to stop Lannan Moiraine and the others. Indeed, they waved and called out happily. Daishan! one cried, shaking steel-gauntleted fists over his head as they rode past. Daishan! A number of others shouted, Glory to the builders! and Kisarai Tiwansho! Loyal looked surprised. Then a broad smile split his face, and he waved to the guards. One man ran alongside Lan's horse a little way, unhampered by the armor he wore. Will the golden crane fly again, Daishan? Peace, Ragan, was all the warder said, and the man fell away. He returned the guards' waves, but his face was suddenly even more grim. As they rode through stone-paved streets, crowded with people and wagons, Rand frowned worriedly. Faldara was bulging at the seams, but the people were neither the eager crowds of Camelin enjoying the grandeur of the city even as they squabbled, nor the milling throngs of Berlin. Packed cheek by jowl, these folks watched their party ride by with leaden eyes and faces blanked of emotion. Carts and wagons jammed every alleyway and half the streets, piled high with jumbled household furnishings and carved chests packed so tight that clothes spilled. On top sat the children. Adults kept the younglings up where they could be seen and did not let them stray even to play. The children were even more silent than their elders, their eyes bigger, more haunting in their stares. The nooks and crannies between the wagons were filled with shaggy cattle and black-spotted pigs in makeshift pens. Crates of chickens and ducks and geese fitfully made up for the silence of the people. He knew now where all the farmers had gone. Lan led the way to the fortress in the middle of the town, a massive stone pile atop the highest hill. A dry moat, deep and wide, its bottom a forest of sharp steel spikes, razor-edged and as tall as a man, surrounded the towered walls of the keep. A place for a last defense if the rest of the town fell. From one of the gate towers, an armored man called down, Welcome, Daishan. Another shouted to the inside of the fortress, The Golden Crane! The Golden Crane! Their hooves drummed on the heavy timbers of the lowered drawbridge as they crossed the moat and rode under the sharp points of the stout portcullis. Once through the gates, Lan swung down out of his saddle to lead Mandarb, signaling the others to dismount. The first courtyard was a huge square paved with big stone blocks and surrounded by towers and battlements as fierce as those on the outside of the walls. As big as it was, the courtyard appeared just as crowded as the streets, and as much in turmoil, though there was an order to the crowding here. Everywhere were armored men and armored horses. At half a dozen smithies around the court, hammers clanged and big bellows tugged by two leather-aproned men apiece made the forge fires roar. A steady stream of boys ran with new-made horseshoes for the farriers. Fletchers sat making arrows, and every time a basket was filled it was whisked away and replaced with an empty one. Liveried grooms appeared on the run, eager and smiling in black and gold. Rand hastily untied his belongings from behind the saddle and gave the bay up to one of the grooms, as a man in plate and mail and leather bowed formally. He wore a bright yellow cloak edged in red over his armor, with the black hawk on the breast and a yellow surcoat bearing a gray owl. He wore no helmet and was bareheaded, truly, for his hair had all been shaved except for a top knot tied with a leather cord. It has been very long, Moiraine Aes Sedai. It is good to see you, Daishan. Very good. He bowed again to Loyal and murmured, Glory to the builders. Kisarai Tiwansho. I am unworthy, Loyal replied formally, and the work small, Tsingu Machoba. You honor us, builder, the man said. Kisarai Tiwansho. He turned back to Lan. 
Word was sent to Lord Agelmar, Dyshan, as soon as you were seen coming. He is waiting for you. This way, please. As they followed him into the fortress, along drafty stone corridors hung with colorful tapestries and long silk screens of hunting scenes and battles, he continued, I am glad the call reached you, Dyshan. Will you raise the golden crane banner once more? The halls were stark except for the wall hangings, and even they used the fewest figures made with the fewest lines necessary to convey meaning, though in bright colors. Are things really as bad as they appear, Ingtar? Lan asked quietly. Rand wondered if his own ears were twitching like Loyal's. The man's topknot swayed as he shook his head, but he hesitated before putting on a grin. Things are never as bad as they appear, Daishan. A little worse than usual this year, that is all. The raids continued through the winter even in the hardest of it. But the raiding was no worse than anywhere else along the border. They still come in the night. But what else can be expected in the spring, if this can be called spring? Scouts return from the Blight, those who do come back, with news of Trolloc camps. Always fresh news of more camps. But we will meet them at Tarwin's Gap, Daishan, and turn them back as we always have. Of course, Lan said. But he did not sound certain. Ingtar's grin slipped, but came back immediately. Silently he showed them into Lord Agelmar's study, then claimed the press of his duties and left. It was a room as purpose-made as all the rest of the fortress, with arrow slits in the outer wall and a heavy bar for the thick door which had its own arrow piercings and was bound by iron straps. Only one tapestry hung here. It covered an entire wall and showed men armored like the men of Faldara fighting Murdraal and Trollocs in a mountain pass. A table, one chest, and a few chairs were the only furnishings, except for two racks on the wall, and they caught Rand's eye as much as the tapestry. One held a two-handed sword, taller than a man, a more ordinary broadsword, and below them a studded mace and a long kite-shaped shield bearing three foxes. From the other hung a suit of armor, complete and arranged as one would wear it, crested helmet with its barred face guard over a double male camel, male hauberk, split for riding, and leather undercoat, polished from wear, breastplate, steel gauntlets, knee and elbow cops, and half-plate for shoulders and arms and legs. Even here in the heart of the keep, weapons and armor seemed ready to be donned at any moment. Like the furniture, they were simply and severely decorated with gold. Agelmar himself rose at their entrance and came around the table, littered with maps and sheafs of paper and pens standing in ink pots. He seemed at first glance too peaceful for the room in his blue velvet coat with its tall, wide collar and soft leather boots. But a second look showed Rand differently. Like all the fighting men he had seen, Agelmar's head was shaved except for a topknot, and that pure white. His face was as hard as Lan's, the only lines creases at the corners of his eyes, and those eyes like brown stone, though they bore a smile now. Peace, but it is good to see you, Daishan, the Lord of Faldara said. And you, Moiraine Aes Sedai, perhaps even more. Your presence warms me, eyes, said I. Ninta Kaliknia, no Domashita, Agelmar Daishan, Moiraine replied formally, but with a note in her voice that said they were old friends. Your welcome warms me, Lord Agelmar. Kudoma Kaliknia, Gani eyes, said I, hey. Here is always a welcome for eyes, said I. He turned to Loyal. You are far from the steading, Oger. But you honor Faldara. Always glory to the builders. Kisarai ti wan shohei. I am unworthy, Loyal said, bowing. It is you who do me honor. He glanced at the stark stone walls and seemed to struggle with himself. Rand was glad the ogre managed to refrain from adding further comment. Servants in black and gold appeared on silent, soft-slippered feet. Some brought folded cloths damp and hot, on silver trays for wiping the dust from faces and hands. Others bore mulled wine and silver bowls of dried plums and apricots. 
Lord Agelmar gave orders for rooms to be prepared, and baths. A long journey from Tarvalon, he said. You must be tired. A short journey, the path we came, Lan told him, but more tiring than the long way. Agelmar looked puzzled when the warder said no more, but he merely said, A few days' rest will put you all in fine fettle. I ask one night's shelter, Lord Agelmar, Moiraine said, for ourselves and our horses, and fresh supplies in the morning if you can spare them. We must leave you early, I am afraid. Agelmar frowned. But I thought, Moiraine said I, I have no right to ask it of you. But you would be worth a thousand lances in Tarwin's Gap, and you, Daishan. A thousand men will come when they hear the golden crane flies once more. The seven towers are broken, Lan said harshly, and Malkir is dead. The few of her people left, scattered across the face of the earth. I am a warder, Agelmar, sworn to the flame of Tarvalon, and I am bound into the blight. Of course, Daish... Lan, of course. But surely a few days' delay, a few weeks at most, will make no difference. You are needed, you, and Moiraine Sadai. Moiraine took a silver goblet from one of the servants. Ingtar seems to believe you will defeat this threat, as you have defeated many others across the years. I Sadai, Agelmar said wryly, if Ingtar had to ride alone to Tarwin's Gap, he would ride the whole way proclaiming that the Trollocs would be turned back once more. He has almost pride enough to believe he could do it alone. He is not as confident as you think this time, Agelmar. The warder held a cup, but he did not drink. How bad is it? Agelmar hesitated, pulling a map from the tangle on the table. He stared unseeing at the map for a moment, then tossed it back. When we ride to the Gap, he said quietly, the people will be sent south to Falmoran. Perhaps the capital can hold. Peace it must. Something must hold. That bad, Lan said, and Agelmar nodded wearily. Rand exchanged worried looks with Matt and Perrin. It was easy to believe the Trollocs gathering in the Blight were after him, after them. Agelmar went on grimly. Candor, Arafel, Saldeia, the Trollocs raided them all straight through the winter. Nothing like that has happened since the Trolloc Wars. The raids have never been so fierce or so large, or pressed home so hard. Every king and council is sure a great thrust is coming out of the Blight, and every one of the Borderlands believes it is coming at them. None of their scouts and none of the warders report Trolloc massing above their borders as we have here. But they believe, and each is afraid to send fighting men elsewhere. People whisper that the world is ending, that the Dark One is loose again. Shinar will ride to Tarwin's Gap alone, and we will be outnumbered at least ten to one. At least. It may be the last in gathering of the lances. Lan, no, Daishan, for you are a diademed battle lord of Malkir, whatever you say. Daishan, the golden crane banner in the van would put heart into men who know they are riding north to die. The word will spread like wildfire, and though their kings have told them to hold where they are, lances will come from Arafel and Candor, and even from Saldeia, though they cannot come in time to stand with us in the gap. They may save Shinar. Land peered into his wine. His face did not change, but wine slopped over his hand. The silver goblet crumpled in his grip. A servant took the ruined cup and wiped the warder's hand with a cloth. A second put a fresh goblet in his hand while the other was whisked away. Land did not seem to notice. I cannot, he whispered hoarsely. When he raised his head, his blue eyes burned with a fierce light, but his voice was calm again and flat. I am a warder, Agelmar. His sharp gaze slid across Rand and Matt and Perrin to Moiraine. At first light I ride to the Blight. Agelmar sighed heavily. Moiraine Sadai, will you not come at least? An eyes Sadai could make the difference. 
I cannot, Lord Agomar. Moraine seemed troubled. There is indeed a battle to be fought, and it is not chance that the Trollocs gather above Shinar. But our battle, the true battle with the Dark One, will take place in the Blight at the Eye of the World. You must fight your battle, and we ours. You cannot be saying he is loose. Rock-like Agalmar sounded shaken, and Moraine quickly shook her head. Not yet. If we win at the Eye of the World, perhaps not ever again. Can you even find the Eye, Aes Sedai? If holding the Dark One depends on that, we might as well be dead. Many have tried and failed. I can find it, Lord Agalmar. Hope is not lost yet. Agalmar studied her and then the others. He appeared puzzled by Nynaeve and Egwene. Their farm clothes contrasted sharply with Moraine's silk dress, though all were travel-stained. They are Aes Sedai, too? he asked doubtfully. When Moraine shook her head, he seemed even more confused. His gaze ran over the young men from Eamon's field, settling on Rand, brushing the red-wrapped sword at his waist. A strange guard you take with you, Aes Sedai. Only one fighting man. He glanced at Perrin and at the axe hanging from his belt. Perhaps two. But both barely more than lads. Let me send men with you. A hundred lances, more or less, will make no difference in the gap. But you will need more than one warder and three youths. And two women will not help unless they are Aeel in disguise. The blight is worse than usual this year. It stirs. A hundred lances would be too many, Lan said, and a thousand not enough. The larger the party we take into the blight, the more chance we will attract attention. We must reach the eye without fighting if we can. You know the outcome is all but foretold when Trollocs force battle inside the blight. Agalmar nodded grimly, but he refused to give up. Fewer, then. Even ten good men would give you a better chance of escorting Moiraine Sedai and the other two women to the green man than will just these young fellows. Rand abruptly realized the Lord of Faldara assumed it was Nynaeve and Egwene who with Moiraine would fight against the Dark One. It was natural. That sort of struggle meant using the One Power, and that meant women. That sort of struggle means using the power. He tucked his thumbs behind his sword belt and gripped the buckle hard to keep his hands from shaking. No men, Moiraine said. Agalmar opened his mouth again, and she went on before he could speak. It is the nature of the eye, and the nature of the green man. How many from Faldara have ever found the green man and the eye? Ever? Agalmar shrugged. Since the War of the Hundred Years, you could count them on the fingers of one hand. No more than one in five years from all the borderlands together. No one finds the eye of the world, Moiraine said unless the green man wants them to find it. Need is the key and intention. I know where to go. I have been there before. Rand's head whipped around in surprise. His was not the only one among the Eamon's fielders, but the eyes Sedai did not seem to notice. But one among us seeking glory, seeking to add his name to those four, and we may never find it, though I take us straight to the spot I remember. You have seen the green man, Moiraine Sedai? The Lord of Faldara sounded impressed, but in the next breath he frowned. But if you have already met him once... Need is the key, Moiraine said softly, and there can be no greater need than mine, than ours. And I have something those other seekers have not. Her eyes barely stirred from Agalmar's face, but Rand was sure they had drifted toward Loyal just for an instant before the eyes Sedai pulled them back. Rand met the ogre's eyes, and Loyal shrugged. Tavirin, the ogre said softly. Agalmar threw up his hands. It will be as you say, eyes Sedai. Peace, if the real battle is to be at the eye of the world, I am tempted to take the Black Hawk banner after you instead of to the gap. I could cut a path for you. That would be disaster, Lord Agalmar, both at Tarwin's Gap and at the Eye. You have your battle, and we ours. Peace, as you say, Aes Sedai. Having reached a decision, however much he disliked it, 
The shaven-headed Lord of Faldara seemed to put it out of his mind. He invited them to table with him, all the while making conversation about hawks and horses and dogs, but with never a mention of Trollocs or Tarwin's Gap or the Eye of the World. The chamber where they ate was as stark and plain as Lord Agelmar's study had been, with little more furnishing it than the table and chairs themselves, and they were severe in line and form. Beautiful, but severe. A big fireplace warmed the room, but not so much that a man called out hurriedly would be stunned by the cold outside. Liveried servants brought soup and bread and cheese, and the talk was of books and music until Lord Agelmar realized the Eamon's field folk were not talking. Like a good host, he asked gently probing questions designed to bring them out of their quiet. Rand soon found himself competing to tell about Eamon's field and the two rivers. It was an effort not to say too much. He hoped the others were guarding their tongues, Matt especially. Nynaeve alone held herself back, eating and drinking silently. There's a song in the two rivers, Matt said, coming home from Tarwin's Gap. He finished hesitantly, as if suddenly realizing that he was bringing up what they had been avoiding, but Agelmar handled it smoothly. Little wonder. Few lands have not sent men to hold back the blight over the years. Rand looked at Matt and Perrin. Matt silently formed the word, Manetheran. Agelmar whispered to one of the servants, and while others cleared the table, that man vanished, and returned with a canister, and clay pipes for Lan, Loyal, and Lord Agelmar. Two rivers tabak, the Lord of Faldara said as they filled their pipes. Hard to come by here, but worth the cost. When Loyal and the two older men were puffing contentedly, Agelmar glanced at the ogre. You seem troubled, Builder. Not beset by the longing, I hope. How long have you been away from the steading? It is not the longing. I have not been gone such a time as that. Loyal shrugged, and the blue-gray streamer rising from his pipe made a spiral above the table as he gestured. I expected, hoped, that the grove would still be here. Some remnant of Mafalda Daranel, at least. Kisarai Tiwancho, Agelmar murmured. The Trolloc Wars left nothing but memories, loyal son of Arendt, and people to build on them. They could not duplicate the builder's work any more than could I. Those intricate curves and patterns your people create are beyond human eyes and hands to make. Perhaps we wish to avoid a poor imitation that would only have been an ever-present reminder to us of what we had lost. There is a different beauty in simplicity in a single line placed just so, a single flower among the rocks. The harshness of the stone makes the flower more precious. We try not to dwell too much on what is gone. The strongest heart will break under that strain. The rose petal floats on water, Lan recited softly. The kingfisher flashes above the pond. Life and beauty swirl in the midst of death. Yes, Agelmar said. Yes, that one has always symbolized the whole of it to me, too. The two men bowed their heads to one another. Poetry out of Lan? The man was like an onion. Every time Rand thought he knew something about the water, he discovered another layer underneath. Loyal nodded slowly. Perhaps I also dwell too much on what is gone. And yet the groves were beautiful. But he was looking at the stark room as if seeing it anew, and suddenly finding things worth seeing. Ingtar appeared and bowed to Lord Agelmar. Your pardon, Lord, but you wanted to know of anything out of the ordinary, however small. Yes, what is it? A small thing, Lord. A stranger tried to enter the town. Not of Shinar. By his accent, a Lugarder. Sometimes, at least. When the South Gate guards attempted to question him, he ran away. He was seen to enter the forest, but only a short time later he was found scaling the wall. A small thing! Agelmar's chair scraped across the floor as he stood. Peace! The tower watch is so negligent a man can reach the walls unseen, and you call it a small thing? He is a madman, Lord. Awe touched Ingtar's voice. The light shields madmen. Perhaps the light cloaked the tower watch's eyes and allowed him to reach the walls. 
Surely one poor madman can do no harm. Has he been brought to the keep yet? Good. Bring him to me here, now. Ingtar bowed and left, and Agalmar turned to Moiraine. Your pardon, I said I, but I must see to this. Perhaps he is only a pitiful wretch with his mind blinded by the light, but... Two days gone, five of our own people were found in the night trying to saw through the hinges of a horse gate. Small, but enough to let Trollocs in. He grimaced. Dark friends, I suppose, though I hate to think it of any Shinaran. They were torn to pieces by the people before the guards could take them, so I'll never know. If Shinarans can be dark friends, I must be especially careful of outlanders in these days. If you wish to withdraw, I will have you shown to your rooms. Dark friends know neither border nor blood, Moiraine said. They are found in every land, and are of none. I too am interested in seeing this man. The pattern is forming a web, Lord Agelmar, but the final shape of the web is not yet set. It may yet entangle the world or unravel and set the wheel to a new weaving. At this point, even small things can change the shape of the web. At this point I am wary of small things out of the ordinary. Agelmar glanced at Nynaeve and Egwene. As you wish, I said I. Ingtar returned with two guards carrying long bills and escorting a man who looked like a ragbag turned inside out. Grime layered his face and matted his scraggly uncut hair and beard. He hunched into the room, sunken eyes darting this way and that. A rancid smell wafted ahead of him. Rand sat forward intently, trying to see through all the dirt. You've no cause to be holding me like this, the filthy man whined. I'm only a poor destitute, abandoned by the light and seeking a place like everyone else to shelter from the shadow. The borderlands are a strange place to seek, Agelmar began, when Matt cut him off. The peddler! Padon Fane, Perrin agreed, nodding. The beggar, Rand said, suddenly hoarse. He sat back at the sudden hatred that flared in Fane's eyes. He's the man who was asking about us in Camelon. He has to be. So this concerns you after all, Moiraine said I, Agelmar said slowly. Moiraine nodded. I greatly fear that it does. I didn't want to. Fane began to cry. Fat tears cut runnels in the dirt on his cheeks, but they were unable to reach the bottom layer. He made me, him and his burning eyes. Rand flinched. Matt had his hand under his coat, no doubt clutching the dagger from Shadar Logoth again. He made me his hound, his hound, to hunt and follow with never a bit of rest. Only his hound, even after he threw me away. It does concern us all, Moiraine said grimly. Is there a place where I can talk with him alone, Lord Agelmar? Her mouth tightened with distaste. And wash him first. I may need to touch him. Agelmar nodded and spoke softly to Ingtar, who bowed and disappeared through the door. I will not be compelled. The voice was Fane's, but he was no longer crying, and an arrogant snap had replaced the whine. He stood upright, not crouching at all. Throwing back his head, he shouted at the ceiling, Never again! I will not! He faced Agelmar as if the men flanking him were his own bodyguard, and the lord of Faldara his equal rather than his captor. His tone became sleek and oily. There is a misunderstanding here, great lord. I am sometimes taken by spells, but that will pass soon. Yes, soon I will be rid of them. Contemptuously he flicked his fingers against the rags he wore. Do not be misled by these, great lord. I have had to disguise myself against those who have tried to stop me, and my journey has been long and hard. But at last I have reached lands where men still know the dangers of Baalzamon, where men still fight the Dark One. Rand stared, goggling. It was Fane's voice, but the words did not sound like the peddler at all. So you've come here because we fight Trollocs, Agelmar said, and you are so important that someone wants to stop you. These people say you are a peddler called Padan Fane, and that you are following them. Fane hesitated. 
He glanced at Moiraine and hurriedly pulled his eyes away from the Aes Sedai. His gaze ran across the Eamon's fielders, then jerked back to Agelmar. Rand felt the hate in that look and the fear. When Fain spoke again, though, his voice was unruffled. Padan Fain is simply one of the many disguises I have been forced to wear over the years. Friends of the Dark, pursue me, for I have learned how to defeat the Shadow. I can show you how to defeat him, great lord. We do as well as men can, Agelmar said dryly. The wheel weaves as the wheel wills. But we have fought the Dark One almost since the breaking of the world without peddlers to teach us how. Great lord, your might is unquestioned, but can it stand against the Dark One forever? Do you not often find yourself pressed to hold? Forgive my temerity, great lord. He will crush you in the end, as you are. I know, believe me, I do. But I can show you how to scour the shadow from the land, great lord. His tone became even more unctuous, though still haughty. If you but try what I advise, you will see, great lord. You will cleanse the land. You, great lord, can do it if you direct your might in the right direction. Avoid letting Tarvalan entangle you in its snares, and you can save the world. Great lord, you will be the man remembered through history for bringing final victory to the light. The guards held their places but their hands shifted on the long shafts of the bills as if they thought they might have to use them. "'He thinks a great deal of himself for a peddler,' Agelmar said to Lan over his shoulder. "'I think Ingtar is right. He is mad.' Fane's eyes tightened angrily, but his voice remained smooth. "'Great Lord, I know my words must appear grandiose, but if you will only—' He cut off abruptly, stepping back as Moiraine rose and started slowly around the table. Only the guards' lowered bills kept Fane from backing right out of the room. Stopping behind Matt's chair, Moiraine put a hand on his shoulder and bent to whisper in his ear. Whatever she said, the tension went out of his face, and he took his hand from under his coat. The eyes Sedai went on until she stood beside Agelmar, confronting Fane. As she came to a halt, the peddler sank into a crouch once more. "'I hate him,' he whimpered. "'I want to be free of him. I want to walk in the light again.' His shoulders began to shake, and tears streamed down his face even more heavily than before. "'He made me do it.' "'I am afraid he is more than a peddler, Lord Agelmar,' Moiraine said. "'Less than human, worse than vile.' more dangerous than you can imagine. He can be bathed after I have spoken with him. I dare not waste a minute. Come, Lan. Chapter 47 More Tales of the Wheel An itchy restlessness had Rand pacing beside the dining table. Twelve strides. The table was exactly twelve strides long, no matter how many times he stepped it off. Irritably he made himself stop keeping tally. Stupid thing to be doing. I don't care how long the bloody table is. A few minutes later he discovered that he was counting the number of trips he made up the table and back. What is he saying to Moiraine and Lan? Does he know why the Dark One is after us? Does he know which of us the Dark One wants? He glanced at his friends. Perrin had crumbled a piece of bread and was idly pushing the crumbs around on the table with one finger. His yellow eyes stared unblinking at the crumbs, but they seemed to see something far off. Matt slouched in his chair, eyes half-closed and the beginnings of a grin on his face. It was a nervous grin, not amusement. Outwardly he looked like the old Matt, but from time to time he unconsciously touched the Shadar Logoth dagger through his coat. What is Fane telling her? What does he know? Loyal, at least, did not look worried. The ogre was studying the walls. First he had stood in the middle of the room and stared, turning slowly in a circle. Now he was almost pressing his broad nose against the stone while he gently traced a particular join with fingers thicker than most men's thumbs. Sometimes he closed his eyes, as if the feeling was more important than seeing. His ears gave an occasional twitch, and he muttered to himself in ogre, appearing to have forgotten anyone else was in the room with him. 
Lord Agelmar stood talking quietly with Nynaeve and Egwene in front of the long fireplace at the end of the room. He was a good host, adept at making people forget their troubles. Several of his stories had Egwene in giggles. Once even Nynaeve threw back her head and roared with laughter. Rand gave a start at the unexpected sound, and jumped again when Matt's chair crashed to the floor. "'Blood and ashes!' Matt growled, ignoring the way Nynaeve's mouth tightened at his language. "'What's taking her so long?' He righted his chair and sat back down without looking at anyone. His hand strayed to his coat. The Lord of Faldara looked at Matt disapprovingly. His gaze took in Rand and Perrin without any improvement, then turned back to the women. Rand's pacing had taken him close to them. "'My lord,' Egwene was saying, as glibly as if she had been using titles all of her life, "'I thought he was a warder, but you call him Daishan, and talk about a golden crane banner, and so did those other men. Sometimes you sound almost as if he's a king. I remember once Moiraine called him the last lord of the Seven Towers. Who is he?' Nynaeve began studying her cup intently, but it was obvious to Rand that abruptly she was listening even more closely than was Egwene. Rand stopped and tried to overhear without seeming to eavesdrop. "'Lord of the Seven Towers,' Agelmar said with a frown. "'An ancient title, Lady Egwene. Not even the High Lords of Tyr have older, though the Queen of Andor comes close.' He heaved a sigh and shook his head. "'He will not speak of it.' Yet the story is well known along the border. He is a king, or should have been. Alan Mandragoran, Lord of the Seven Towers, Lord of the Lakes, crownless king of the Malkiri. His shaven head lifted high, and there was a light in his eye as if he felt a father's pride. His voice grew stronger, filled with the force of his feeling. The whole room could hear without straining. We of Shinar call ourselves bordermen. But fewer than fifty years ago Shinar was not truly of the borderlands. North of us, and of Arafel, was Malkir. The lances of Shinar rode north, but it was Malkir that held back the blight. Malkir peace favor her memory, and the light illumine her name. Lan is from Malkir, the wisdom said softly, looking up. She seemed troubled. It was not a question, but Agelmar nodded. Yes, Lady Nynaeve. He is the son of Alakir Mandragoran, last crowned king of the Malkiri. How did he become as he is? The beginning, perhaps, was Leon. On a dare, Leon Mandragoran, the king's brother, led his lances through the blight to the blasted lands, perhaps to Sheol Ghul itself. Leon's wife, Brianne, made that dare for the envy that burned her heart that Alakir had been raised to the throne instead of Leon. The king and Leon were as close as brothers could be, as close as twins even after the royal owl was added to Akir's name. But jealousy racked Brian. Leon was acclaimed for his deeds, and rightfully so, but not even he could outshine Alakir. He was man and king such as comes once in a hundred years, if that. Peace favor him, and Eliana. Leon died in the blasted lands with most of those who followed him, men Malkir could ill afford to lose, and Brian blamed the king, saying that Sheol Ghul itself would have fallen if Alakir had led the rest of the Malkiri north with her husband. For revenge she plotted with Cohen Gamalan, called Cohen Fairheart, to seize the throne for her son, Isam. Now Fairheart was a hero almost as well loved as Alakir himself, and one of the great lords. But when the great lords had cast the rods for king, only two separated him from Akir, and he never forgot that two men laying a different color on the crowning stone would have set him on the throne instead. Between them Cohen and Brian moved soldiers back from the blight to seize the Seven Towers, stripping the border forts to bear garrisons. But Cohen's jealousy ran deeper. Disgust tinged Agelmar's voice. Fairheart, the hero, whose exploits in the blight were sung throughout the borderlands, was a dark friend. With the border forts weakened, Trollocs poured into Malkir like a flood. King Alakir and Leon together might have rallied the land, 
They had done so before. But Leon's doom in the blasted lands had shaken the people, and the Trolloc invasion broke men's spirit and their will to resist. Too many men. Overwhelming numbers pushed the Malkiri back into the heartland. Brianne fled with her infant son Isam, and was run down by Trollocs as she rode south with him. No one knows their fate of a certainty, but it can be guessed. I can find pity only for the boy. When Cohen Fairheart's treachery was revealed and he was taken by young Jayan Charon, already called Jayan Farstrider, when Fairheart was brought to the Seven Towers in chains, the great lords called for his head on a pike. But because he had been second only to Alakir and Leon in the hearts of the people, the king faced him in single combat and slew him. Alakir wept when he killed Cohen. Some say he wept for a friend who had given himself to the shadow. And some say for Malkir. The lord of Faldara shook his head sadly. The first peal of the doom of the Seven Towers had been struck. There was no time to gather aid from Shinar or Arafel, and no hope that Malkir could stand alone with five thousand of her lances dead in the blasted lands, her border forts overrun. Alakir and his queen, Eliana, had land brought to them in his cradle. Into his infant hands they placed the sword of Malkiri kings, the sword he wears today, a weapon made by Aes Sedai during the War of Power, the War of the Shadow that brought down the Age of Legends. They anointed his head with oil, naming him Daishan, a diademed battle lord, and consecrated him as the next king of the Malkiri. And in his name they swore the ancient oath of Malkiri kings and queens. Agalmar's face hardened, and he spoke the words as if he too had sworn that oath, or one much similar. To stand against the shadow so long as iron is hard and stone abides. To defend the Malkiri while one drop of blood remains. To avenge what cannot be defended. The words rang in the chamber. Eliana placed a locket around her son's neck for remembrance, and the infant, wrapped in swaddling clothes by the queen's own hand, was given over to twenty chosen from the king's bodyguard, the best swordsmen, the most deadly fighters. Their command? To carry the child to Falmoran. Then did Alakir and Eliana lead the Malkiri out to face the shadow one last time. There they died, at Herod's crossing, and the Malkiri died, and the seven towers were broken. Shinar and Arafel and Kandor met the halfmen and the Trollocs at the stair of Jaha'an, and threw them back, but not as far as they had been. Most of Malkia remained in Trolloc hands, and year by year, mile by mile, the blight has swallowed it. Agalmar drew a heavy-hearted breath. When he went on, there was a sad pride in his eyes and voice. Only five of the bodyguards reached Falmoran alive, every man wounded, but they had the child unharmed. From the cradle they taught him all they knew. He learned weapons as other children learn toys, and the blight as other children their mother's garden. The oath sworn over his cradle is graven in his mind. There is nothing left to defend, but he can avenge. He denies his titles, yet in the borderlands he is called the Uncrowned, and if ever he raised the golden crane of Malkir, an army would come to follow. But he will not lead men to their deaths. In the blight he courts death as a suitor courts a maiden, but he will not lead others to it. If you must enter the blight, and with only a few, there is no man better to take you there nor to bring you safely out again. He is the best of the warders, and that means the best of the best. You might as well leave these boys here to gain a little seasoning and put your entire trust in Lan. The Blight is no place for untried boys. Matt opened his mouth and shut it again at a look from Rand. I wish he'd learned to keep it shut. Nynaeve had listened just as wide-eyed as Egwene, but now she was staring into her cup again, her face pale. Egwene put a hand on her arm and gave her a sympathetic look. Moiraine appeared in the doorway, Lan at her heels. Nynaeve turned her back on them. What did he say? Rand demanded. Matt rose, and Perrin too. Country oaf, 
Agalmar muttered, then raised his voice to a normal tone. Did you learn anything, I said I, or is he simply a madman? He is mad, Moiraine said, or close to it, but there is nothing simple about Padan Fain. One of the black and gold liveried servants bowed his way in with a blue wash basin and pitcher, a bar of yellow soap, and a small towel on a silver tray. He looked anxiously at Agalmar. Moiraine directed him to put them on the table. Your pardon for commanding your servants, Lord Agalmar, she said. I took the liberty of asking for this. Agalmar nodded to the servant, who put the tray on the table and left hurriedly. My servants are yours to command, I said I. The water Moiraine poured into the basin steamed as if only just off the boil. She pushed up her sleeves and began vigorously washing her hands without regard for the heat of the water. I said he was worse than vile, but I did not come close. I do not believe I have ever met someone so abject and debased, yet at the same time so foul. I feel soiled from touching him, and I do not mean for the filth on his skin. Soiled in here, she touched her breast. The degradation of his soul almost makes me doubt he has one. There is something worse to him than a dark friend. He looked so pitiful, Egwene murmured. I remember him arriving in Eamon's field each spring, always laughing and full of news from outside. Surely there's some hope for him. No man can stand in the shadow so long that he cannot find the light again, she quoted. The Aes Sedai toweled her hands briskly. I have always believed it so, she said. Perhaps Padan Fain can be redeemed. But he has been a dark friend more than forty years, and what he has done for that in blood and pain and death would freeze your heart to hear. Among the least of these, though not small to you, I suspect, he brought the Trollocs to Eamon's field. Yes, Rand said softly. He heard Egwene gasp. I should have guessed. Burn me, I should have, as soon as I recognized him. Did he bring any here? Matt asked. He looked at the stone walls around them and shivered. Rand thought he was remembering the murder owl more than Trollocs. Walls had not stopped the fade at Berlin, or at Whitebridge. If he did, Agelmar laughed, they'll break their teeth on the walls of Faldara. Many others have before. He was speaking to everyone, but obviously addressing his words to Egwene and Nynaeve, from the glances he gave them. And do not worry yourself about Halfman, either. Matt's face reddened. Every street and valley in Faldara is lit by night, and no man may hide his face inside the walls. Why would Master Fane do that? Egwene asked. Three years ago, with a heavy sigh, Moiraine sat down, folding up, as if what she had done with Fane had drained her. Three years, this summer, as far back as that. The light surely favors us, else the father of lies would have triumphed while I sat planning in Tarvalon. Three years Fane has been hunting you for the Dark One. That's crazy, Rand said. He's come into the two rivers every spring as regular as a clock. Three years? We've been right there in front of him, and he never looked at any of us twice before last year. The Aes Sedai pointed a finger at him, fixing him. Fane told me everything, Rand, or almost everything. I believe he managed to hold back something, something important, despite all I could do. But he said enough. Three years ago a halfman came for him, in a town in Murindy. Fane was terrified, of course, but it is considered a very great honor among dark friends to be so summoned. Fane believed he had been chosen for great things, and he had, though not in the manner he believed. He was brought north to the Blight, to the Blasted Lands, to Sheol Ghul, where he met a man with eyes of fire who named himself Baalzamon. Matt shifted uneasily, and Rand swallowed hard. It had to have been that way, of course, but that did not make it any easier to accept. Only Perrin looked at the Aes Sedai as if nothing could surprise him any longer. The light protect us, Agelmar said fervently. Fane did not like what was done to him at Sheol Ghul, Moiraine continued calmly. 
While we talked, he screamed often of fire and burning. It almost killed him, bringing it all out from where he had it hidden. Even with my healing, he is a shattered ruin. It will take much to make him whole again. I will make the effort, though, if for no other reason than to learn what more he still hides. He had been chosen because of where he did his peddling. No, she said quickly when they stirred, not the two rivers only, not then. The father of lies knew roughly where to find what he sought, but not much better than we in Tarvalan. Fane said he has been made the Dark One's hound, and in a way he is right. The father of lies set Fane to hunt, first changing him so he could carry out that hunt. It is the things done to bring about those changes that Fane fears to remember. He hates his master for them as much as he fears him. So Fane was sent sniffing and hunting through all the villages around Berlin, and all the way to the mountains of mist, and down to the Taran, and across into the two rivers. Three springs ago, Perrin said slowly. I remember that spring. Fane came later than usual. But what was strange was that he lingered on. A whole week he remained, idle and gnashing his teeth about laying out money for a room at the Wine Spring Inn. Fane likes his money. I remember now, Matt said. Everybody was wondering was he sick or had he fallen for a local woman. Not that any of them would marry a peddler, of course. As well marry one of the traveling people. Egwene raised an eyebrow at him and he shut his mouth. After that, Fane was taken to Sheol Ghul again, and his mind was distilled. Rand's stomach turned over at the tone in the Aes Sedai's voice. It told more of what she meant than the grimace that flashed across her face. What he had sensed was concentrated and fed back. When he entered the two rivers the next year, he was able to choose his targets out more clearly. Indeed, more clearly even than the Dark One had expected. Fane knew for a certainty that the one he sought was one of three in Eamon's field. Perrin grunted, and Matt began cursing in a soft monotone that even Nynaeve's glare did not stop. Agelmar looked at them curiously. Rand felt only the faintest chill and wondered at it. Three years the Dark One had been hunting him, hunting them. He was sure it should have made his teeth chatter. Moraine did not allow Matt to interrupt her. She raised her voice enough to be heard over him. When Fane returned to Lugard, Baalzamon came to him in a dream. Fane abased himself and performed rites that would strike you deaf to hear the half of them, binding himself even more tightly to the Dark One. What is done in dreams can be more dangerous than what is done awake. Rand stirred at the sharp warning look, but she did not pause. He was promised great rewards, power over kingdoms after Baalzamon's victory, and told that when he returned to Eamon's field he was to mark the three he had found. A halfman would be there, waiting for him with Trollocs. We know now how the Trollocs came to the two rivers. There must have been an Ogre grove and a waygate at Monetheron. The most beautiful of all, Loyal said, except for Tarvalon. He had been listening as intently as everyone else. Manetherin is remembered fondly by the Ogre. Agelmar formed the name silently, his eyebrows raised in wonder. Manetherin. Lord Agelmar, Moraine said, I will tell you how to find the waygate of Mafalda Daranel. It must be walled up and a guard set, and none allowed near. The halfmen have not learned all of the ways yet, but that waygate is to the south and only ours from Faldara. The Lord of Feldara gave himself a shake as if he were coming out of a trance. South? Peace, we don't need that, the light shine on us. It shall be done. Did Fane follow us through the ways? Perrin asked. He must have done. Moraine nodded. Fane would follow you three into the grave, because he must. When the murderer all failed at Eamon's field, it brought Fane with the Trollocs on our trail. The Fade would not let Fane ride with him. Although he thought he should have the best horse in the two rivers and ride at the head of the band, the murderer all forced him to run with the Trollocs, and the Trollocs to carry him when his feet gave out. They talked so that he could understand, arguing about the best way to cook him when his usefulness was done. 
Fane claims he turned against the Dark One before they reached the Tarran. But sometimes his greed for his promised reward seeps into the open. When we had escaped across the Tarran, the murderer Al took the Trollocs back to the closest waygate in the Mountains of Mist, and sent Fane across alone. He thought he was free then, but before he reached Berlin, another Fade found him, and that one was not so kind. It made him sleep doubled up on himself in a Trolloc kettle at night, to remind him of the price of failure. That one used him as far as Shadar Logoth. By then Fane was willing to give the murderer all his mother if it would free him, but the Dark One never willingly loosens a hold he has gained. What I did there, sending an illusion of our tracks and smell off toward the mountains, fooled the murderer all, but not Fane. The halfmen did not believe him. Afterward they dragged him behind them on a leash. Only when we seemed to keep always just ahead, no matter how hard they pressed, did some begin to credit him. Those were the four who returned to Shadar Logoth. Fane claims it was Baalzamon himself who drove the Murdra'al. Agelmar shook his head contemptuously. The Dark One? Pah! The man's lying or mad. If Heartsbane were loose, we'd all of us be dead by now, or worse. Fane spoke the truth as he saw it, Moraine said. He could not lie to me, though he hid much. His words, Baalzamon, appeared like a flickering candle flame vanishing and reappearing, never in the same place twice. His eyes seared the murderer all, and the fires of his mouth scourged us. Something, Lan said, drove four fades to where they feared to go, a place they fear almost as much as they fear the wrath of the Dark One. Agelmar grunted as if he had been kicked. He looked sick. It was evil against evil in the ruins of Shadar Logoth, Moraine continued. Foul, fighting vile. When Fane spoke of it, his teeth chattered and he whimpered. Many Trollocs were slain, consumed by Mashadar and other things, including the Trolloc that held Fane's leash. He fled the city as if it were the pit of doom at Sheol Ghul. Fane believed he was free at last. He intended to run until Baalzamon could never find him again, to the ends of the earth if necessary. Imagine his horror when he discovered that the compulsion to hunt did not lessen. Instead it grew stronger and sharper with every day that passed. He could not eat except what he could scavenge while he hunted you. Beetles and lizards snatched while he ran, half-rotten refuse dug from midden heaps in the dark of night. Nor could he stop until exhaustion collapsed him like an empty sack. And as soon as he had strength to stand again he was driven on. By the time he reached Camelin he could feel his quarry, even when it was a mile away. Here in the cells below, he would sometimes look up without realizing what he was doing. He was looking in the direction of this room. Rand had a sudden itch between his shoulder blades. It was as if he could feel Fane's eyes on him then, through the intervening stone. The eyes Sedai noticed his uneasy shrug, but she went on implacably. If Fane was half mad by the time he reached Camelin, he sank even further when he realized that only two of those he sought were there. He was compelled to find all of you, but he could do no other than follow the two who were there, either. He spoke of screaming when the waygate opened in Camelin. The knowledge of how to do it was in his mind. He does not know how it came there. His hands moved of their own accord, burning with the fires of Baalzamon when he tried to stop them. The owner of the shop, who came to investigate the noise, Fane murdered, not because he had to, but out of envy that the man could walk freely out of the cellar while his feet carried him inexorably into the ways. Then Fane was the one you sensed following us, Egwene said. Len nodded. How did he escape the... the black wind? Her voice shook. She stopped to swallow. It was right behind us at the waygate. He escaped, and he did not, Moraine said. The black wind caught him, and he claimed to understand the voices. Some greeted him as like to them. Others feared him. No sooner did the wind envelop Fane than it fled. The light preserve us, Loyal's whisper rumbled like a giant bumblebee. Pray that it does, 
Moiraine said. There is much yet hidden about Padanfain which I must learn. The evil goes deeper in him and stronger than in any man I have yet seen. It may be that the Dark One, in doing what he did to Fain, impressed some part of himself on the man, perhaps even unknowing, some part of his intent. When I mentioned the Eye of the World, Fain clamped his jaws shut, but I felt something knowing behind the silence. If only I had the time now. But we cannot wait. If this man knows something, Agelmar said, I can get it out of him. His face held no mercy for dark friends. His voice promised no pity for Fane. If you can learn even a part of what you will face in the Blight, it's worth an extra day. Battles have been lost for not knowing what the enemy intends. Moraine sighed and shook her head ruefully. My lord, if we did not need at least one good night's sleep before facing the Blight, I would ride within the hour, though it meant the risk of meeting a Trolloc raid in the dark. Consider what I did learn from Fane. Three years ago the Dark One had to have Fane brought to Shale Ghoul to touch him, despite the fact that Fane is a dark friend dedicated to his marrow. One year ago the Dark One could command Fane, the dark friend, through his dreams. This year Baal Zemun walks in the dreams of those who live in the light, and actually appears, if with difficulty, at Shadar Logoth. Not in his own body, of course, but even a projection of the Dark One's mind, even a projection that flickers and cannot hold is more deathly dangerous to the world than all the Trolloc hordes combined. The seals on Shale Ghoul are weakening desperately, Lord Agelmar. There is no time. Agelmar bowed his head in acquiescence, but when he raised it again, there was still a stubborn set to his mouth. I said I, I can accept that when I lead the lances to Tarwin's Gap we will be no more than a diversion or a skirmish on the outskirts of the real battle. Duty takes men where it will, as surely as does the pattern, and neither promises that what we do will have greatness. But our skirmish will be useless, even should we win if you lose the battle. If you say your party must be small, I say well and good. But I beg you to make every effort to see that you can win. Leave these young men here, I said I. I swear to you that I can find three experienced men with no thought of glory in their heads to replace them. Good swordsmen who are almost as handy in the blight as Lan. Let me ride to the gap knowing that I have done what I can to help you be victorious. I must take them and no others, Lord Agelmar, Moiraine said gently. They are the ones who will fight the battle at the eye of the world. Agelmar's jaw dropped, and he stared at Rand and Matt and Perrin. Suddenly the Lord of Faldara took a step back, his hand groping unconsciously for the sword he never wore inside the fortress. They aren't. You are not Red Aja, Moraine, said I. But surely not even you would. Sudden sweat glistened on his shaven head. They are Taviran, Moraine said soothingly. The pattern weaves itself around them. Already the Dark One has tried to kill each of them more than once. Three Taviran in one place are enough to change the life around them as surely as a whirlpool changes the path of a straw. When the place is the eye of the world, the pattern might weave even the father of lies into itself and make him harmless again. Agelmar stopped trying to find his sword, but he still looked at Rand and the others doubtfully. Moraine said I, if you say they are, then they are. But I cannot see it. Farm boys. Are you certain, I said I? The old blood, Moraine said, split out like a river, breaking into a thousand times a thousand streams. But sometimes streams join together to make a river again. The old blood of Manetherin is strong and pure in almost all these young men. Can you doubt the strength of Manetherin's blood, Lord Agelmar? Rand glanced sideways at the eyes, said I. Almost all. He risked a look at Nynaeve. She had turned back to watch as well as listen, though she still avoided looking at Lan. He caught the wisdom's eye. She shook her head. She had not told the eyes, said I, that he was not two rivers born. What does Moraine know? 
Manetherin, Agelmar said slowly, nodding. I would not doubt that blood. Then more quickly. The wheel brings strange times. Farm boys carry the honor of Manetherin into the blight. Yet if any blood can strike a fell blow at the Dark One, it would be the blood of Manetherin. It shall be done as you wish, I said I. Then let us go to our rooms, Moiraine said. We must leave with the sun, for time grows short. The young men must sleep close to me. Time is too short before the battle to allow the Dark One another strike at them. Too short. Rand felt her eyes on him, studying him and his friends, weighing their strength. And he shivered. Too short. Chapter 48 The Blight The wind whipped Land's cloak, sometimes making him hard to see even in the sunlight, and Ingtar and the hundred lances Lord Agelmar had sent to escort them to the border in case they met a Trolloc raid made a brave display in double column with their armor and their red pennants and their steel-clad horses led by Ingtar's gray owl banner. They were easily as grand as a hundred of the Queen's guards, but it was the towers just in sight ahead of them that Rand studied. He had all morning to watch the Shinaran lances. Each tower stood tall and solid atop a hill, half a mile from its neighbor. East and west others rose, and more beyond those, a broad walled ramp spiraled around each stone shaft, winding all the way around by the time it reached the heavy gates halfway to the crenellated top. A sortie from the garrison would be protected by the wall until it reached the ground, but enemies striving to reach the gate would climb under a hail of arrows and stones and hot oil from the big kettles poised on the outward flaring ramparts above. A large steel mirror, carefully turned down, away from the sun now, glittered atop each tower below the high iron cup where signal fires could be lit when the sun did not shine. The signal would be flashed to towers further from the border, and by those to still others, and so relayed to the heartland fortresses from where the lances would ride to turn back the raid. Were times normal, they would. From the two nearest tower tops men watched them approach, just a few men on each, peering curiously through the crenels. In the best of times, the towers were only manned enough for self-defense, depending more on stone walls than strong arms to survive. But every man who could be spared and more was riding to Tarwin's Gap. The fall of the towers would not matter if the lances failed to hold the gap. Rand shivered as they rode between the towers. It was almost as if he had ridden through a wall of colder air. This was the border. The land beyond looked no different from Shinar, but out there, somewhere beyond the leafless trees, was the blight. Ingtar lifted a steel fist to halt the lances short of a plain stone post in the sight of the towers. A border post, marking the boundary between Shinar and what once was Malkir. Your pardon, Moiraine Aes Sedai. Pardon, Daishan. Pardon, Builder. Lord Agelmar commanded me to go no further. He sounded unhappy about it, disgruntled at life in general. That is as we planned, Lord Agelmar and I, Moiraine said. Ingtar grunted sourly. Pardon, I said I, he apologized, not sounding as if he meant it. To escort you here means we may not reach the gap before the fighting is done. I am robbed of the chance to stand with the rest and at the same time I am commanded not to ride one step beyond the border post, as if I had never before been in the blight, and my lord Agelmar will not tell me why. Behind the bars of his face guard, his eyes turned the last word into a question to the eyes Sedai. He scorned to look at Rand and the others. He had learned they would accompany Lan into the blight. He can have my place, Matt muttered to Rand. Lan gave them both a sharp look. Matt dropped his eyes, his face turning red. Each of us has his part in the pattern, Ingtar, Moraine said firmly. From here we must thread ours alone. Ingtar's bow was stiffer than his armor made it. As you wish it, I said I. I must leave you now and ride hard in order to reach Tarwin's Gap. At least I will be allowed 
to face Trollocs there. Are you truly that eager, Nynaeve asked, to fight Trollocs? Ingtar gave her a puzzled look, then glanced at Lan as if the warder might explain. That is what I do, lady, he said slowly. That is why I am. He raised a gauntleted hand to Lan, open palm toward the warder. Zoravya Ninto Manshima Taishita Daishan. Peace favor your sword. Pulling his horse around, Ingtar rode east with his bannermen and his hundred lances. They went at a walk, but a steady pace, as fast as armored horses could manage with a far distance yet to go. What a strange thing to say, Egwene said. Why do they use it like that? Peace. When you have never known a thing except to dream, Lan replied, healing Mandarb forward, it becomes more than a talisman. As Rand followed the warder past the stone border post, he turned in his saddle to look back, watching Ingtar and the lances disappear behind barren trees, and the border post vanish, and last of all the towers on their hilltops looking over the trees. All too soon they were alone, riding north under the leafless canopy of the forest. Rand sank into watchful silence, and for once even Matt had nothing to say. That morning the gates of Faldara had opened with the dawn. Lord Agelmar, armored and helmeted now like his soldiers, rode with the Black Hawk banner and the three foxes from the east gate toward the sun, still only a red sliver above the trees. Like a steel snake undulating to mounted kettle drums, the column wound its way out of the town four abreast, Agelmar at its head hidden in the forest before its tail left Faldara Keep. There were no cheers in the streets to speed them on their way. Only their own drums and their pennants cracking in the wind. But their eyes looked toward the rising sun with purpose. Eastward they would join other steel serpents from Falmoran, behind King Izar himself with his sons at his side, and from Ancor Dale, that held the eastern marches and guarded the spine of the world, from Moshirara and Falcyon and Camran Ka'an, and all the other fortresses in Shinar, great and small, joined into a greater serpent they would turn north to Tarwin's Gap. Another exodus had begun at the same time, using the king's gate that led out on the way to Falmoran. Carts and wagons, people mounted and people afoot, driving their livestock, carrying children on their backs, faces as long as the morning shadows. Reluctance to leave their homes, perhaps forever, slowed their feet, yet fear of what was coming spurred them so that they went in bursts, feet dragging, then breaking into a run for a dozen paces, only to fall back once more to shuffling through the dust. A few paused outside the town to watch the soldiers' armored line winding into the forest. Hope blossomed in some eyes, and prayers were muttered. Prayers for the soldiers, prayers for themselves, before they turned south again, trudging. The smallest column went out of the Malkir gate, Left behind were a few who would remain, soldiers and a sprinkling of older men, their wives dead and their grown children making the slow way south. A last handful, so that whatever happened in Tarwin's Gap, Faldara would not fall undefended. Ingtar's grey owl led the way, but it was Moiraine who took them north, the most important column of all, and the most desperate. For at least an hour after they passed the border post there was no change in land or forest. The warder kept them at a hard pace, as fast a walk as the horses could maintain, but Rand kept wondering when they would reach the blight. The hills became a little higher, but the trees and the creepers and the underbrush were no different than what he had seen in Shinar, grey and all but leafless. He began to feel warmer, warm enough to sling his cloak across the pommel of his saddle. This is the best weather we've seen all year, Egwene said, shrugging out of her own cloak. Nynaeve shook her head, frowning as if listening to the wind. It feels wrong. Rand nodded. He could feel it too, though he could not say what it was exactly he was feeling. The wrongness went beyond the first warmth he could remember out of doors this year. 
It was more than the simple fact that it should not be so warm this far north. It must be the blight. But the land was the same. The sun climbed high, a red ball that could not give so much warmth despite the cloudless sky. A little while later he unbuttoned his coat. Sweat trickled down his face. He was not the only one. Matt took his coat off, openly displaying the golden ruby dagger, and wiped his face with the end of his scarf. Blinking, he rewound the scarf into a narrow band low over his eyes. Nynaeve and Egwene fanned themselves. They rode slumped as if they were wilting. Loyal undid his high-collared tunic all the way down, and his shirt as well. The ogre had a narrow strip of hair up the middle of his chest, as thick as fur. He muttered apologies all around. You must forgive me. Steading Shangtai is in the mountains and cool. His broad nostrils flared, drawing in air that was becoming warmer by the minute. I don't like this heat and damp. It was damp, Rand realized. It felt like the mire in the depths of summer back in the two rivers. In that boggy swamp every breath came as if through a wool blanket soaked in hot water. There was no soggy ground here, only a few ponds and streams, trickles to someone used to the water wood, but the air was like that in the mire. Only Perrin, still in his coat, was breathing easily. Perrin and the warder. There were a few leaves now on trees that were not evergreen. Rand reached out to touch a branch and stopped with his hand short of the leaves. Sickly yellow mottled the red of the new growth, and black flecks like disease. I told you not to touch anything. The warder's voice was flat. He still wore his shifting cloak as if heat made no more impression on him than cold. It almost made his angular face seem to float unsupported above Mundarb's back. Flowers can kill in the blight, and leaves maim. There's a little thing called a stick that likes to hide where the leaves are thickest, looking like its name, waiting for something to touch it. When something does, it bites, not poison. The juice begins to digest the stick's prey for it. The only thing that can save you is to cut off the arm or leg that was bitten. But a stick won't bite unless you touch it. Other things in the blight will. Rand jerked his hand back, leaves untouched, and wiped it on his pants leg. Then we're in the blight, Perrin said. Strangely, he did not sound frightened. Just the fringe, Lan said grimly. His stallion kept moving forward, and he spoke over his shoulder. The real blight still lies ahead. There are things in the blight that hunt by sound, and some may have wandered this far south. Sometimes they cross the mountains of doom, much worse than sticks. Keep quiet and keep up if you want to stay alive. He continued to set a hard pace, not waiting for an answer. Mile by mile the corruption of the blight became more apparent. Leaves covered the trees in ever greater profusion, but stained and spotted with yellow and black, with livid red streaks like blood poisoning. Every leaf and creeper seemed bloated, ready to burst at a touch. Flowers hung on trees and weeds in a parody of spring, sickly pale and pulpy, waxen things that appeared to be rotting while Rand watched. When he breathed through his nose, the sweet stench of decay, heavy and thick, sickened him. When he tried breathing through his mouth, he almost gagged. The air tasted like a mouthful of spoiled meat. The horse's hooves made a soft squishing as rotten ripe things broke open under them. Matt leaned out of his saddle and spewed until his stomach was empty. Rand sought the void, but calmness was little help against the burning bile that kept creeping up his throat. Empty or not, Matt heaved again a mile later, bringing up nothing, and yet again after that. Egwene looked as if she wanted to be sick too, swallowing constantly, and Nynaeve's face was a white mask of determination, her jaw set and her eyes fixed on Moiraine's back. The wisdom would not admit to feeling ill unless the eyes Sedai did first. But Rand did not think she would have to wait long. Moiraine's eyes were tight, and her lips pale. Despite the heat and damp, Loyal wrapped a scarf around his nose and mouth. When he met Rand's gaze, the ogre's outrage and disgust were plain in his eyes. I had heard, he began, his voice muffled by the wool, 
then stopped to clear his throat with a grimace. Pfft! It tastes like pfft! I had heard and read about the blight, but nothing could describe. His gesture somehow took in the smell as well as the eye-sickening growth. That even the Dark One should do this to trees. <laughs> the warder was not affected, of course, at least not that Rand could see. But to his surprise, neither was Perrin, or rather, not in the way the rest of them were. The big youth glared at the obscene forest through which they rode as he might have at an enemy, or the banner of an enemy. He caressed the axe at his belt as if unaware of what he was doing, and muttered to himself, half growling in a way that made the hair on Rand's neck stir. Even in full sunlight his eyes glowed, golden and fierce. The heat did not abate as the bloody sun fell toward the horizon. In the distance to the north mountains rose, higher than the mountains of mist, black against the sky. Sometimes an icy wind from the sharp peaks gusted far enough to reach them, the torrid humidity leached away most of the mountain chill, but what remained was winter cold compared to the swelter it replaced, if just for a moment. The sweat on Rand's face seemed to flash into beads of ice. As the wind died, the beads melted again, running angry lines down his cheeks, and the thick heat returned harder than before by comparison. For the instant the wind surrounded them, it swept away the fetter. Yet he would have done without that too if he could have. The cold was the chill of the grave, and it carried the dusty must of an old tomb newly opened. We cannot reach the mountains by nightfall, Lan said, and it is dangerous to move at night, even for a warder alone. There is a place not far off, Moiraine said. It will be a good omen for us to camp there. The warder gave her a flat look, then nodded reluctantly. Yes, we must camp somewhere. It might as well be there. The eye of the world was beyond the high passes when I found it, Moiraine said. Better to cross the mountains of doom in full daylight, at noon, when the Dark One's powers in this world are weakest. You talk as if the eye isn't always in the same place. Egwene spoke to the eyes Sedai, but it was Loyal who answered. No two among the ogre have found it in exactly the same place. The green man seems to be found where he is needed, but it has always been beyond the high passes. They are treacherous, the high passes, and haunted by creatures of the Dark One. We must reach the passes before we need worry about them, Lan said. Tomorrow we will be truly into the blight. Rand looked at the forest around him, every leaf and flower diseased, every creeper decaying as it grew and he could not repress a shudder. If this isn't truly the Blight, what is? Land turned them westward, at an angle to the sinking sun. The warder maintained the pace he had set before, but there was reluctance in the set of his shoulders. The sun was a sullen red ball, just touching the treetops when they crested a hill and the warder drew rain. Beyond them to the west lay a network of lakes, the waters glittering darkly in the slanting sunlight, like beads of random size on a necklace of many strings. In the distance, circled by the lakes, stood jagged-topped hills thick in the creeping shadows of evening. For one brief instant the sun's rays caught the shattered tops, and Rand's breath stilled. Not hills. The broken remnants of seven towers. He was not sure if anyone else had seen it. The sight was gone as quickly as it came. The warder was dismounting, his face as lacking in emotion as a stone. Couldn't we camp down by the lakes? Nynaeve asked, patting her face with her kerchief. It must be cooler down by the water. Light, Matt said. I'd just like to stick my head in one of them. I might never take it out. Just then something roiled the waters of the nearest lake the dark water phosphorescing as a huge body rolled beneath the surface. Length on man-thick length sent ripples spreading, rolling on and on until at last a tail rose, waving a point like a wasp's stinger for an instant in the twilight, at least five spans into the air. All along that length fat tentacles writhed like monstrous worms, as many as a centipede's legs. 
It slid slowly beneath the surface and was gone, only the fading ripples to say it had ever been. Rand closed his mouth and exchanged a look with Perrin. Perrin's yellow eyes were as disbelieving as he knew his own must be. Nothing that big could live in a lake that size. Those couldn't have been hands on those tentacles. They couldn't have been. On second thought, Matt said faintly, I like it right here just fine. I will set guarding wards around this hill, Moiraine said. She had already dismounted from Aldeeb. A true barrier would draw the attention we do not want like flies to honey. But if any creation of the Dark One or anything that serves the shadow comes within a mile of us, I will know. I'd be happier with the barrier, Matt said as his boots touched the ground, just as long as it kept that... that... thing on the other side. Oh, do be quiet, Matt, Egwene said curtly, at the same time as Nynaeve spoke. And have them waiting for us when we leave in the morning? You are a fool, Matrim Cawthon. Matt glowered at the two women as they climbed down, but he kept his mouth shut. As he took Bela's reins, Rand shared a grin with Perrin. For a moment it was almost like being home, having Matt saying what he should not at the worst possible time. Then the smile faded from Perrin's face. In the twilight his eyes did glow, as if they had a yellow light behind them. Rand's grin slipped away, too. It isn't like home at all. Rand and Matt and Perrin helped Lan unsaddle and hobble the horses, while the others began setting up the camp. Loyal muttered to himself as he set up the warder's tiny stove, but his thick fingers moved deftly. Egwene was humming as she filled the tea kettle from a bulging water bag. Rand no longer wondered why the warder had insisted on bringing so many full water skins. Setting the base saddle in line with the others, he unfastened his saddlebags and blanket roll from the cantle, turned, and stopped with a tingle of fear. The ogre and the women were gone. So was the stove and all the wicker panniers from the pack horse. The hilltop was empty except for evening shadows. With a numb hand he fumbled for his sword, dimly hearing Matt curse. Perrin had his axe out, his shaggy head swiveling to find the danger. Sheep herders, Lan muttered. Unconcernedly, the warder strode across the hilltop, and at his third step he vanished. Rand exchanged wide-eyed looks with Matt and Perrin, and then they were all darting for where the warder had disappeared. Abruptly, Rand skidded to a halt, taking another step when Matt ran into his back. Egwene looked up from setting the kettle atop the tiny stove. Nynaeve was closing the mantle on a second lit lantern. They were all there, Moiraine sitting cross-legged, Lan lounging on an elbow, Loyal taking a book out of his pack. Cautiously, Rand looked behind him. The hillside was there as it had been, the shadowed trees, the lakes beyond sinking into darkness. He was afraid to step back, afraid they would all disappear again, and perhaps this time he would not be able to find them. Edging carefully around him, Perrin let out a long breath. Moraine noticed the three of them standing there gaping. Perrin looked abashed and slipped his axe back into the heavy belt loop as if he thought no one might notice. A smile touched her lips. It is a simple thing, she said, a bending, so any eye looking at us sees around us instead. We cannot have the eyes that will be out there seeing our lights tonight, and the blight is no place to be in the dark. Moraine Sedai says I might be able to do it. Egwene's eyes were bright. She says I can handle enough of the one power right now. Not without training, child, Moraine cautioned. The simplest matter concerning the one power can be dangerous to the untrained, and to those around them. Perrin snorted, and Egwene looked so uncomfortable that Rand wondered if she had already been trying her abilities. Nynaeve set down the lantern. Together with the tiny flame of the stove, the pair of lanterns gave a generous light. When you go to Tarvala, Egwene, she said carefully, perhaps I'll go with you. The look she gave Moiraine was strangely defensive. It will do her good to see a familiar face among strangers. She'll need someone to advise her besides Aes Sedai. Perhaps that would be for the best wisdom, Moiraine said simply. 
Egwene laughed and clapped her hands. Oh, that will be wonderful. And you, Rand, you'll come too, won't you? He paused in the act of sitting across the stove from her, then slowly lowered himself. He thought her eyes had never been bigger or brighter or more like pools that he could lose himself in. Spots of color appeared in her cheeks, and she gave a smaller laugh. Perrin, Matt, you two will come, won't you? We'll all be together. Matt gave a grunt that could have signified anything, and Perrin only shrugged, but she took it for assent. You see, Rand, we'll all be together. Light, but a man could drown in those eyes and be happy doing it. Embarrassed, he cleared his throat. Do they have sheep in Tarvalin? That's all I know, herding sheep and growing tabak. I believe, Moiraine said, that I can find something for you to do in Tarvalin. For all of you. Not herding sheep, perhaps, but something you will find interesting. There, Egwene said, as if it were settled. I know. I will make you my warder when I'm an Aes Sedai. You would like being a warder, wouldn't you? My warder? She sounded sure, but he saw the question in her eyes. She wanted an answer. Needed it. I'd like being your warder, he said. She's not for you, nor you for her. Why did Min have to tell me that? Darkness came down heavily, and everyone was tired. Loyal was the first to roll over and ready himself for sleep, but others followed soon after. No one used their blankets except for a pillow. Moiraine had put something in the oil of the lamps that dispelled the stench of the blight from the hilltop, but nothing diminished the heat. The moon gave a wavering, watery light, but the sun might have been at its zenith for all the cool the night had. Rand found sleep impossible. Even with the eyes Sedai stretched out not a span away to shield his dreams, it was the thick air that kept him awake. Loyal's soft snores were a rumble that made Perrin seem non-existent, but they did not stop weariness from claiming the others. The warder was still awake, seated not far from him with his sword across his knees, watching the night. To Rand's surprise, so was Nynaeve. The Wisdom looked at Lan silently for a long time, then poured a cup of tea and brought it to him. When he reached out with a murmur of thanks, she did not let go right away. I should have known you would be a king, she said quietly. Her eyes were steady on the warder's face, but her voice trembled slightly. Lan looked back at her just as intently. It seemed to Ran that the warder's face actually softened. I am not a king, Nynaeve, just a man, a man without as much to his name as even the meanest farmer's croft. Nynaeve's voice steadied. Some women don't ask for land or gold, just the man. And the man who would ask her to accept so little would not be worthy of her. You are a remarkable woman, as beautiful as the sunrise, as fierce as a warrior. You are a lioness, Wisdom. A Wisdom seldom weds. She paused to take a deep breath, as if stealing herself. But if I go to Tarvalon, it may be that I will be something other than a Wisdom. I Sedai marry as seldom as Wisdoms. Few men can live with so much power in a wife, dimming them by her radiance, whether she wishes to or not. Some men are strong enough. I know one such. If there could have been any doubt, her look left none as to whom she meant. All I have is a sword, and a war I cannot win, but can never stop fighting. I've told you I care nothing for that. Light, you've made me say more than is proper already. Will you shame me to the point of asking you— I will never shame you. The gentle tone, like a caress, sounded odd to Rand's ears in the warder's voice, but it made Nynaeve's eyes brighten. I will hate the man you choose, because he is not me, and love him if he makes you smile. 
No woman deserves the sure knowledge of widow's black as her bride price. You least of all. He set the untouched cup on the ground and rose. I must check the horses. Nynaeve remained there kneeling after he had gone. Sleep or no, Rand closed his eyes. He did not think the wisdom would like it if he watched her cry. Chapter 49 The Dark One Stirs Dawn woke Rand with a start, the sullen sun pricking his eyelids as it peeked reluctantly over the treetops of the blight. Even so early, heat covered the spoiled lands in a heavy blanket. He lay on his back, with his head pillowed on his blanket roll, staring at the sky. It was still blue, the sky. Even here, that at least was untouched. He was surprised to realize that he had slept. For a minute the dim memory of a conversation overheard seemed like part of some dream. Then he saw Nynaeve's red-rimmed eyes. She had not slept, obviously. Land's face was harder than ever, as if he had resumed a mask and did not intend to let it slip again. Egwene went over and crouched beside the wisdom, her face concerned. He could not make out what they said. Egwene spoke, and Nynaeve shook her head. Egwene said something else, and the wisdom waved her away dismissively. Instead of going, Egwene bent her head closer, and for a few minutes the two women talked even more softly, with Nynaeve still shaking her head. The wisdom ended it with a laugh, hugging Egwene, and by her expression making soothing talk. When Egwene stood, though, she glared at the warder. Lan did not seem to notice. He did not look in Nynaeve's direction at all. Shaking his head, Rand gathered his things and gave his hands and face and teeth a hasty wash with the little water Len allowed for such things. He wondered if women had a way of reading men's minds. It was an unsettling thought. All women are eyes sedai. Telling himself he was letting the blight get to him, he rinsed out his mouth and hurried to get the bay saddled. It was more than a little disconcerting having the campsite disappear before he reached the horses. But by the time his saddle girth was tight, everything on the hill winked back into view. Everyone was hurrying. The seven towers stood plain in the morning light, distant broken stumps like huge rough hills that merely hinted at grandeur gone. The hundred lakes were a smooth, unruffled blue. Nothing broke the surface this morning. When he looked at the lakes and the ruined towers, he could almost ignore the sickly things growing around the hill. Land did not seem to be avoiding looking at the towers any more than he seemed to be avoiding Nynaeve, but somehow he never did, as he concentrated on getting them ready to go. After the wicker panniers were fastened on the pack horse, after every scrap and smudge and track were gone, and everyone else was mounted, the Aes Sedai stood in the middle of the hilltop with her eyes closed, not even seeming to breathe. Nothing happened that Rand could see, except that Nynaeve and Egwene shivered despite the heat, and rubbed their arms briskly. Egwene's hands suddenly froze on her arms, and she opened her mouth, staring at the wisdom. Before she could speak, Nynaeve also ceased her rubbing, and gave her a sharp look. The two women looked at one another. Then Egwene nodded and grinned, and after a moment Nynaeve did too, though her smile was only half-hearted. Rand scrubbed his fingers through his hair, already more damp with sweat than with the water he had splashed in his face. He was sure there was something in the silent exchange that he should understand, but that feather-light brush across his mind vanished before he could grasp it. "'What are we waiting for?' Matt demanded, the low band of his scarf across his forehead. He had his bow across the pommel of his saddle with an arrow knocked, and his quiver pulled around on his belt for an easy reach. Moiraine opened her eyes and started down the hill. For me to remove the last vestige of what I did here last night. The residues would have dissipated on their own in a day, but I will not take any risk I can avoid now. We are too close, and the shadow is too strong here. Lan? The warder only waited for her to settle in Aldib's saddle before he led them north, toward the mountains of doom, looming in the near distance. Even under the sunrise the peaks rose black and lifeless like jagged teeth, 
In a wall they stretched, east and west as far as the eye could see. Will we reach the eye today, Moiraine Sedai? Egwene asked. The eyes Sedai gave Loyal a sidelong look. I hope that we will. When I found it before, it was just the other side of the mountains, at the foot of the high passes. He says it moves, Matt said, nodding at Loyal. What if it isn't where you expect? Then we will continue to hunt until we do find it. The green man's senses need, and there can be no need greater than ours. Our need is the hope of the world. As the mountains drew closer, so did the true blight. Where a leaf had been spotted black and mottled yellow before, now foliage fell wetly while he watched, breaking apart from the weight of its own corruption. The trees themselves were tortured, crippled things, twisted branches clawing at the sky as if begging mercy from some power that refused to hear. Ooze slid like pus from bark cracked and split. As if nothing truly solid was left to them, the trees seemed to tremble from the passage of the horses over the ground. Look as if they want to grab us, Matt said nervously. Nynaeve gave him an exasperated, scornful look, and he added fiercely, Well, they do look it. And some of them do want it, the Aes Sedai said. Her eyes over her shoulder were harder than Land's for an instant. But they want no part of what I am, and my presence protects you. Matt laughed uneasily, as if he thought it a joke on her part. Rand was not so sure. This was the blight, after all. But trees don't move. Why would a tree grab a man, even if it could? We're imagining things, and she's just trying to keep us alert. Abruptly he stared off to his left into the forest. That tree, not twenty paces away, had trembled, and it was none of his imagination. He could not say what kind it was or had been, so gnarled and tormented was its shape. As he watched, the tree suddenly whipped back and forth again, then bent down, flailing at the ground. Something screamed, shrill and piercing. The tree sprang back straight, its limbs entwined around a dark mass that writhed and spat and screamed. He swallowed hard and tried to edge red away, but trees stood on every side and trembled. The bay rolled his eyes, whites showing all the way around. Rand found himself in a solid knot of horseflesh as everyone else tried to do the same as he. Keep moving, Lan commanded, drawing his sword. The warder wore steel-backed gauntlets now and his grey-green scaled tunic. Stay with Moraine Sedai. He pulled Mandarb around, not toward the tree and its prey, but in the other direction. With his color-shifting cloak, he was swallowed by the blight before the black stallion was out of sight. Close, Moraine urged. She did not slow her white mare, but she motioned the others to huddle nearer to her. Stay as close as you can. A roar sprang up from the direction the water had gone. It beat at the air, and the trees quivered from it, and when it faded away it seemed to echo still. Again the roar came, filled with rage and death. Lan, Nynaeve said, he— The awful sound cut her off, but there was a new note in it. Fear. Abruptly it was gone. Lan can look after himself, Moraine said. Ride, Wisdom. From out of the trees the warder appeared, holding his sword well clear of himself and his mount. Black blood stained the blade, and steam rose from it. Carefully, Lan wiped the blade clean with a cloth he took from his saddlebags, examining the steel to make sure he had gotten every spot. When he dropped the cloth, it fell apart before it reached the ground, even the fragments dissolving. Silently, a massive body leaped out of the trees at them. The warder spun Mandar, but even as the warhorse reared, ready to strike with steel-shod hooves, Matt's arrow flashed, piercing the one eye in a head that seemed mostly mouth and teeth. Kicking and screaming, the thing fell, one bound short of them. Rand stared as they hurried past. Stiff hair like long bristles covered it, and it had too many legs, joining a body as big as a bear at odd angles. Some of them, at least, those coming out of its back, had to be useless for walking, but the finger-long claws at their ends tore the earth in its death agony. Good shooting, sheepherder. Land's eyes had already forgotten what was dying behind them, 
and were searching the forest. Moiraine shook her head. It should not have been willing to come so close to one who touches the true source. Agelmar said the blight stirs, Lan said. Perhaps the blight also knows a web is forming in the pattern. Hurry! Moiraine dug her heels into Aldeeb's flanks. We must get over the high passes quickly. But even as she spoke, the blight rose against them. Trees whipped in, reaching for them, not caring if Moiraine touched the true source or not. Rand's sword was in his hand. He did not remember unsheathing it. He struck out again and again, the heronmark blade slicing through corrupted limbs. Hungry branches jerked back severed, writhing stumps. He almost thought he heard them scream. But always more came, wriggling like snakes, attempting to snare his arms, his waist, his neck. Teeth bared in a rictus snarl, he sought the void and found it in the stony, stubborn soil of the two rivers. Manetharan! He screamed back at the trees till his throat ached. The heron-marked steel flashed in the strengthless sunlight. Manetharan! Manetharan! Standing in his stirrups, Matt sent arrow after arrow flashing into the forest, striking at deformed shapes that snarled and gnashed uncounted teeth on the shafts that killed them, bit at the clawed forms fighting to get over them, to reach the mounted figures. Matt, too, was lost to the present. Karayan Kaldazar! he shouted, as he drew fletchlings to cheek and loosed. Karayan Alessandra! Al Elisandra! Mordero da gain pastuente cuebiar! Al Elisandra! Perrin also stood in his stirrups, silent and grim. He had taken the lead, and his axe hewed a path through forest and foul flesh alike, whichever came before him. Flailing trees and howling things shied from the stocky axeman, shying as much from the fierce golden eyes as from the whistling axe. He forced his horse forward, step by determined step. Fireballs streaked from Moiraine's hands, and where they struck a writhing tree became a torch. A toothed shape shrieked and beat with human hands, rent its own flaming flesh with fierce claws, until it died. Again and again the warder took Mandarb into the trees, his blade and gauntlets dripping with blood that bubbled and steamed. When he came back now, more often than not there were gashes in his armor, bleeding gashes in his flesh, and his warhorse stumbled and bled too. Each time the Aes Sedai paused to lay her hands on the wounds, and when she took them away only the blood was left on unmarked flesh. "'I light signal fires for the halfman,' she said bitterly. "'Press on! Press on!' They made their way one slow pace at a time. If the trees had not struck into the mass of attacking flesh as much as at the humans, if the creatures no two alike had not fought the trees and one another as much as to reach them, Rand was sure they would have been overwhelmed. He was not certain it would not happen still. Then a fluting cry arose behind them. Distant and thin, it cut through the snarling from the denizens of the blight around them. In an instant the snarling ceased, as if it had been sliced off with a knife. The attacking shapes froze. The trees went still. As suddenly as the things with legs had appeared, they melted away, vanishing into the twisted forest. The reedy shrill came again like a cracked shepherd's pipe, and was answered in kind by a chorus, half a dozen singing among themselves far behind. Worms, Lan said grimly, bringing a moan from Loyal. They've given us a respite, if we have time to use it. His eyes were measuring the distance yet to the mountains. Few things in the blight will face a worm, can it be avoided. He dug his heels into Mondarb's flanks. Ride! The whole party plunged after him through a blight that suddenly seemed truly dead except for the piping behind. They were scared off by worms, Matt said incredulously. He was bouncing in his saddle, trying to sling his bow across his back. A worm. There was a sharp difference in the way the warder said it from the way Matt had. Can kill a fade, if the fade hasn't the dark one's own luck with it. We have an entire pack on our trail. Ride! Ride! The dark peaks were closer now. An hour, Rand estimated, at the pace the warder was setting. Won't the worms follow us into the mountains? Egwene asked breathlessly, 
and Len gave a sharp laugh. They won't. Worms are afraid of what lives in the high passes. Loyal moaned again. Rand wished the ogre would stop doing that. He was well aware that Loyal knew more about the Blight than any of them except Lan, even if it was from reading books in the safety of a steading. But why does he have to keep reminding me that there's worse yet than we've seen? The Blight flowed past, weeds and grasses splashing rotten under galloping hooves. Trees of the kinds that had earlier attacked did not so much as twitch, even when they rode directly under the twisted branches. The mountains of doom filled the sky ahead, black and bleak, and almost near enough to touch, it seemed. The piping came both sharp and clear, and there were squishing sounds behind them, louder than the things crushed under hooves. Too loud, as if half-decayed trees were being crushed by huge bodies slithering over them. Too near. Rand looked over his shoulder. Back there treetops whipped and went down like grass. The land began sloping upward toward the mountains, tilting enough so that he knew they were climbing. We are not going to make it, Len announced. He did not slow Mondarb's gallop, but his sword was suddenly in his hand again. Watch yourself in the high passes, Moiraine, and you'll get through. No, Len, Nynaeve called. Be quiet, girl. Len, even you cannot stop a worm pack. I will not have it. I will need you for the eye. Arrows, Matt called breathlessly. The worms wouldn't even feel them, the warder shouted. They must be cut to pieces. Don't feel much but hunger, sometimes fear. Clinging to his saddle with a death grip, Rand shrugged, trying to loosen the tightness in his shoulders. His whole chest felt tight, until he could hardly breathe, and his skin stung in hot pinpricks. The blight had turned to foothills. He could see the route they must climb once they reached the mountains, the twisting path and the high pass beyond, like an axe blow cleaving into the black stone. Light, what's up ahead that can scare what's behind? Light, help me, I've never been so afraid. I don't want to go any further. No further. Seeking the flame and the void, he railed at himself. Fool, you frightened, cowardly fool. You can't stay here and you can't go back. Are you going to leave Egwene to face it alone? The void eluded him, forming, then shivering into a thousand points of light, reforming and shattering again, each point burning into his bones until he quivered with the pain and thought he must burst open. Light, help me, I can't go on. Light, help me. He was gathering the bay's reins to turn back, to face the worms or anything rather than what lay ahead, when the nature of the land changed. Between one slope of a hill and the next, between crest and peak, the blight was gone. Green leaves covered peacefully spreading branches. Wildflowers made a carpet of bright patches in grasses stirred by a sweet spring breeze. Butterflies fluttered from blossom to blossom, with buzzing bees and birds trilled their songs. Gaping, he galloped on, until he suddenly realized that Moiraine and Lan and Loyal had stopped, the others too. Slowly he drew rein, his face frozen in astonishment. Egwene's eyes were about to come out of her head, and Nynaeve's jaw had dropped. We have reached safety, Moiraine said. This is the green man's place and the eye of the world is here. Nothing of the blight can enter here. I thought it was on the other side of the mountains, Rand mumbled. He could still see the peaks filling the northern horizon, and the high passes. You said it was always beyond the passes. This place, said a deep voice from the trees, is always where it is. All that changes is where those who need it are. A figure stepped out of the foliage, a man-shape as much bigger than Loyal as the ogre was bigger than Rand, a man-shape of woven vines and leaves, green and growing. His hair was grass flowing to his shoulders, his eyes huge hazelnuts, his fingernails acorns. Green leaves made his tunic and trousers, seamless bark his boots. Butterflies swirled around him, lighting on his fingers, his shoulders, his face. Only one thing spoiled the verdant perfection. A deep fissure ran up his cheek and temple across the top of his head, and in that the vines were brown and withered. The green man, Egwene whispered, and the scarred face smiled. 
For a moment it seemed as if the birds sang louder. Of course I am. Who else would be here? The hazelnut eyes regarded Loyal. It is good to see you, little brother. In the past many of you came to visit me, but few of recent days. Loyal scrambled down from his big horse and bowed formally. You honor me, tree brother. Tsingu Machoshi, Tingshan. Smiling, the green man put an arm around the yogur's shoulders. Alongside Loyal, he looked like a man beside a boy. There is no honoring, little brother. We will sing tree songs together and remember the great trees and the steading, and hold the longing at bay. He studied the others, just now getting down from their horses, and his eyes lit on Perrin. A wolf brother. Do the old times truly walk again, then? Rand stared at Perrin. For his part, Perrin turned his horse so it was between him and the green man, and bent to check the girth. Rand was sure he just wanted to avoid the green man's searching gaze. Suddenly the green man spoke to Rand. Strange clothes you wear, child of the dragon. Has the wheel turned so far? Do the people of the dragon return to the first covenant? But you wear a sword. That is neither now nor then. Rand had to work moisture in his mouth before he could speak. I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean? The green man touched the brown scar across his head. For a moment he seemed confused. I cannot say. My memories are torn and often fleeting, and much of what remains is like leaves visited by caterpillars. Yet I am sure... No, it is gone. But you are welcome here. You, Moiraine, said I, are more than a surprise. When this place was made, it was made so that none could find it twice. How have you come here? Need, Moiraine replied. My need, the world's need. Most of all is the world's need. We have come to see the eye of the world. The green man sighed, the wind sighing through thick-leafed branches. Then it has come again. That memory remains whole. The dark one stirs. I have feared it. Every turning of years the blight strives harder to come inside. And this turn, the struggle to keep it out, has been greater than ever since the beginning. Come. I will take you. Chapter 50 Meetings at the Eye Leading the bay, Rand followed the green man with the other Eamons fielders, all staring as if they could not decide whether to look at the green man or the forest. The green man was a legend, of course, with stories told about him and the Tree of Life, in front of every fireplace in the two rivers, and not just for the children. But after the blight, the trees and flowers would have been a wonder of normality, even if the rest of the world was not still trapped in winter. Perrin hung a little to the rear. When Rand glanced back, the big curly-haired youth looked as if he did not want to hear anything else the green man had to say. He could understand that. Child of the Dragon Warily he watched the green man, walking ahead with Moraine and Lan, butterflies surrounding him in a cloud of yellows and reds. What did he mean? No, I don't want to know. Even so, his step felt lighter, his legs springier. The uneasiness still lay in his gut, churning his stomach, but the fear had become so diffuse it might as well be gone. He did not think he could expect more, not with the blight half a mile away even if Moiraine was right about nothing from the blight being able to enter here. The thousands of burning points piercing his bones had winked out. At the very moment he came within the green man's domain, he was sure. It's him that winked them out, he thought. The green man and this place. Egwene felt it, and Nynaeve too, the soothing peace, the calm of beauty. He could tell... They wore small, serene smiles and brushed flowers with their fingers, pausing to smell and breathing deep. When the green man noticed, he said, Flowers are meant to adorn. 
The plants or humans, it is much the same. None mine, so long as you don't take too many. And he began plucking one from this plant and one from that, never more than two from any. Soon Nynaeve and Egwene wore caps of blossoms in their hair, pink wild rose and yellow bell and white morning star. The wisdom's braids seemed a garden of pink and white to her waist. Even Moiraine received a pale garland of morning star on her brow, woven so deftly that the flowers still seemed to be growing. Rand was not sure they were not growing. The green man tended his forest garden as he walked, while he talked softly to Moiraine, taking care of whatever needed care without really thinking about it. His hazelnut eyes caught a crooked limb on a climbing wild rose, forced into an awkward angle by the blossom-covered limb of an apple tree, and he paused, still talking, to run his hand along the bend. Rand was not sure if his eyes were playing tricks or if thorns actually did bend out of the way so as not to prick those green fingers. When the towering shape of the green man moved on, the limb ran straight and true, spreading red petals among the white of apple blossoms. He bent to cup one huge hand around a tiny seed lying on a patch of pebbles, and when he straightened, a small shoot had roots through the rocks to good soil. All things must grow where they are according to the pattern, he explained over his shoulder as if apologizing, and faced the turning of the wheel. But the Creator will not mind if I give just a little help. Rand led red around the chute, careful not to let the bay's hooves crush it. It did not seem right to destroy what the green man had done just to avoid an extra step. Egwene smiled at him, one of her secret smiles, and touched his arm. She was so pretty, with her unbound hair full of flowers, that he smiled back at her until she blushed and lowered her eyes. I will protect you, he thought. Whatever else happens, I will see you safe, I swear it. Into the heart of the spring forest the green man took them, to an arched opening in the side of a hill. It was a simple stone arch, tall and white, and on the keystone was a circle halved by a sinuous line, one half rough, the other smooth. The ancient symbol of Aes Sedai. The opening itself was shadowed. For a moment everyone simply looked in silence. Then Moiraine removed the garland from her hair and gently hung it on the limb of a sweetberry bush beside the arch. It was as if her movement restored speech. It's in there? Nynaeve asked. What we've come for? I'd really like to see the Tree of Life, Matt said, not taking his eyes off the halved circle above them. We can wait that long, can't we? The green man gave Rand an odd look, then shook his head. Avendasora is not here. I have not rested beneath its ungentle branches in two thousand years. The Tree of Life is not why we came, Moraine said firmly. She gestured to the arch. In there is. I will not go in with you, the green man said. The butterflies around him swirled as if they shared some agitation. I was set to guard it long, long ago, but it makes me uneasy to come too close. I feel myself being unmade. My end is linked with it somehow. I remember the making of it, some of the making, some. His hazelnut eyes stared, lost in memory, and he fingered his scar. It was the first days of the breaking of the world when the joy of victory over the Dark One turned bitter with the knowledge that all might yet be shattered by the weight of the shadow. A hundred of them made it men and women together. The greatest Aes Sedai works were always done so, joining Sayedin and Sayedar as the true sources joined. They died all to make it pure, while the world was torn around them. Knowing they would die, they charged me to guard it against the need to come. It was not what I was made for, but all was breaking apart and they were alone, and I was all they had. It was not what I was made for, but I have kept the faith. He looked down at Moiraine, nodding to himself. I have kept faith until it was needed, and now it ends. You have kept the faith better than most of us who gave you the charge the Aes Sedai said. Perhaps it will not come as badly as you fear. 
The scarred, leafy head shook slowly from side to side. I know an ending when it comes, I said I. I will find another place to make things grow. Nut-brown eyes swept sadly over the green forest. Another place, perhaps. When you come out, I will see you again if there is time. With that he strode away, trailing butterflies, becoming one with the forest more completely than land's cloak ever could. What did he mean? Matt demanded. If there's time. Come, Moiraine said, and she stepped through the arch. Lan went at her heels. Rand was not sure what he expected when he followed. The hair stirred uneasily on his arms and rose on the back of his neck. But it was only a corridor, its polished walls rounded overhead like the arch, winding gently downward. There was headroom enough and to spare for Loyal. There would have been room enough for the green man. The smooth floor slicked to the eye like oiled slate, yet somehow gave a sure footing. Seamless white walls glittered with uncounted flecks and untold colors, giving a low, soft light even after the sunlit archway vanished around a curve behind. He was sure the light was no natural thing, but he sensed it was benign, too. Then why is your skin still crawling? Down they went, and down. There, Moiraine said at last, pointing, ahead. And the corridor opened into a vast domed space, the rough living rock of its ceiling dotted with clumps of glowing crystals. Below it, a pool took up the entire cavern, except for the walkway around it, perhaps five paces wide. In the oval shape of an eye, the pool was lined about its rim with a low, flat edging of crystals that glowed with a duller, yet fiercer light than those above. Its surface was as smooth as glass and as clear as the wine-spring water. Rand felt as if his eyes could penetrate it forever, but he could not see any bottom to it. The Eye of the World Moiraine said softly beside him. As he looked around in wonder, he realized that the long years since the making, three thousand of them, had worked their way while no one came. Not all the crystals in the dome glowed with the same intensity. Some were stronger, some weaker, some flickered, and others were only faceted lumps to sparkle in a captured light. Had all shown, the dome would have been as bright as noonday. But they made it only late afternoon now, Dust coated the walkway and bits of stone and even crystal. Long years waiting, while the wheel turned and ground. But what is it? Matt asked uneasily. That doesn't look like any water I ever saw. He kicked a lump of dark stone the size of his fist over the edge. It— The stone struck the glassy surface and slid into the pool without a splash or so much as a ripple. As it sank, the rock began to swell— growing ever larger, larger and more attenuated, a blob the size of his head that Rand could almost see through, a faint blur as wide as his arm was long. Then it was gone. He thought his skin would creep right off his body. What is it? he demanded, and was shocked at the hoarse harshness of his own voice. It might be called the essence of Syedine. The Aes Sedai's words echoed around the dome. The essence of the male half of the true source, the pure essence of the power wielded by men before the time of madness. The power to mend the seal on the Dark One's prison, or to break it open completely. The lights shine on us and protect us, Nynaeve whispered. Egwene clutched her as if she wanted to hide behind the wisdom. Even Lan stirred uneasily, though there was no surprise in his eyes. Stone thudded into Rand's shoulders, and he realized he had backed as far as the wall, as far from the eye of the world as he could get. He would have pushed himself right through the wall if he could have. Matt, too, was splayed out against the stone as flat as he could make himself. Perrin was staring at the pool with his axe half-drawn. His eyes shone yellow and fierce. I always wondered, Loyal said uneasily, when I read about it. I always wondered what it was. Why? Why did they do it? And how? No one living knows. Moiraine no longer looked at the pool. 
She was watching Rand and his two friends, studying them, her eyes weighing. Neither the how nor more of the why than that it would be needed one day, and that that need would be the greatest and most desperate the world had faced to that time, perhaps ever would face. Many in Tarvalon have attempted to find a way to use this power, but it is as untouchable for any woman as the moon is for a cat. Only a man could channel it, but the last male eyes to die is nearly three thousand years gone. Yet the need they saw was a desperate one. They worked through the taint of the Dark One on Saedin to make it, and make it pure, knowing that doing so would kill them all. Male eyes Sedai and female together. The green man spoke true. The greatest wonders of the Age of Legends were done in that way. Saedin and Sayadar together. All the women in Tarvalon. All the eyes Sedai in all the courts and cities, even with those in the lands beyond the waste, even counting those who may still live beyond the Arath Ocean could not fill a spoon with the power, lacking men to work with them. Rand's throat rasped as if he had been screaming. Why did you bring us here? Because you are Taviran? The Aes Sedai's face was unreadable. Her eyes shimmered and seemed to pull at him. Because the Dark One's power will strike here, and because it must be confronted and stopped, or the shadow will cover the world. There is no need greater than that. Let us go out into the sunlight again while there is yet time. Without waiting to see if they would follow, she started back up the corridor with Lan, who stepped perhaps a bit more quickly than usual for him. Egwene and Nynaeve hurried behind her. Rand edged along the wall. He could not make himself get even one step closer to what the pool was, and scrambled into the corridor in a tangle with Matt and Perrin. He would have run if it had not meant trampling Egwene and Nynaeve, Moiraine and Lan. He could not stop shaking even when he was back outside. "'I do not like this, Moiraine,' Nynaeve said angrily when the sun shone on them again. "'I believe the danger is as great as you say, or I would not be here. But this is—' "'I have found you at last.' Rand jerked as if a rope had tightened around his neck. The words, the voice— for a moment he believed it was Baalzamon, but the two men who walked out of the trees, faces hidden by their cowls, did not wear cloaks the color of dried blood. One cloak was a dark gray, the other almost as dark a green, and they seemed musty even in the open air. And the men were not fades. The breeze stirred their cloaks. "'Who are you?' Lance's stance was cautious, his hand on his sword-hilt. How did you come here? If you are seeking the green man, he guided us. The hand that pointed to Matt was old and shriveled to scarcely human, lacking a fingernail and with knuckles gnarled like knots in a piece of rope. Matt took a step back, eyes widening. An old thing, an old friend, an old enemy. But he is not the one we seek. The green-cloaked man finished. The other man stood as if he would never speak. Moiraine straightened to her full height, no more than shoulder-high to any man there, but suddenly seeming as tall as the hills. Her voice rang like a bell, demanding, Who are you? Hands pushed back hoods and Rand goggled. The old man was older than old. He made Ken Buya look like a child in the bloom of health. The skin of his face was like crazed parchment drawn tight over a skull, then pulled tighter still. Wispy tufts of brittle hair stood at odd places on his scabrous scalp. His ears were withered bits like scraps of ancient leather. His eyes sunken, peering out of his head as if from the ends of tunnels. Yet the other was worse. A tight black leather carapace covered that one's head and face completely, but the front of it was worked into a perfect face a young man's face, laughing wildly, laughing insanely, frozen forever. What is he hiding if the other shows what he shows? Then even thought froze in his head, shattered to dust and blew away. I am called Aginor, the old one said, and he is Balthamel. He no longer speaks with his tongue. 
The wheel grinds exceedingly fine over three thousand years imprisoned. His sunken eyes slid to the arch. Balthamel leaned forward, his mask's eyes on the white stone opening, as if he wanted to go straight in. So long without, Agenor said softly. So long. The light protect, Loyal began, his voice shaking, and cut off abruptly when Agenor looked at him. The Forsaken, Matt said hoarsely, are bound in Sheol Ghul. Were bound. Agenor smiled, his yellowed teeth had the look of fangs. Some of us are bound no longer. The seals weaken, I said I. Like Ishamael, we walk the world again, and soon the rest of us will come. I was too close to this world in my captivity, I and Balthamel, too close to the grinding of the wheel. But soon the great Lord of the Dark will be free and give us new flesh, and the world will be ours once more. You will have no Luz Theron Kinslayer this time, no Lord of the Morning to save you. We know the one we seek now, and there is no more need for the rest of you. Lan's sword sprang from its scabbard too fast for Rand's eye to follow. Yet the warder hesitated, eyes flickering to Moiraine, to Nynaeve. The two women stood well apart. To put himself between either of them and the Forsaken would put him further from the other. Only for a heartbeat the hesitation lasted, but as the warder's feet moved, Agenor raised his hand. It was a scornful gesture, a flipping of his gnarled fingers as if to shoo away a fly. The warder flew backwards through the air as though a huge fist had caught him. With a dull thud, Lan struck the stone arch, hanging there for an instant before dropping in a flaccid heap, his sword lying near his outstretched hand. No! Nynaeve screamed. Be still, Warren commanded. But before anyone else could move, the wisdom's knife had left her belt, and she was running toward the Forsaken, her small blade upraised. The light blind you! she cried, striking at Agenor's chest. The other Forsaken moved like a viper, while her blow still fell, Balthamel's leather-cased hand darted out to seize her chin, fingers sinking into one cheek while thumb dug into the other, driving the blood out with their pressure and raising the flesh in pale ridges. A convulsion racked Nynaeve from head to toe, as if she had been cracked like a whip. Her knife dropped uselessly from dangling fingers as Balthamel lifted her by his grip, brought her up to where the leather mask stared into her still-quivering face. Her toes spasmed a foot above the ground. Flowers rained from her hair. I have almost forgotten the pleasures of the flesh. Agenor's tongue crossed his withered lips, sounding like stone on rough leather. But Balthamel remembers much. The laughter of the mask seemed to grow wilder, and the wail that left Nynaeve burned Rand's ears like despair ripped from her living heart. Suddenly Egwene moved and Rand saw that she was going to help Nynaeve. Egwene, no! he shouted, but she did not stop. His hand had gone to his sword at Nynaeve's cry, but now he abandoned it and threw himself at Egwene. He thudded into her before she took her third step, carrying them both to the ground. Egwene landed under him with a gasp, immediately thrashing to get free. Others were moving too, he realized. Perrin's axe whirled into his hands, and his eyes glowed golden and fierce. "'Wisdom!' Matt howled, the dagger from Shadar Logoth in his fist. "'No!' Rand called. "'You can't fight the Forsaken!' But they ran past him as if they had not heard, their eyes on Nynaeve and the two Forsaken. Agenor glanced at them, unconcernedly, and smiled. Rand felt the air above him like the crack of a giant's whip. Matt and Perrin, not even halfway to the Forsaken, stopped as if they had run into a wall bounced back to sprawl on the ground. Good, Agenor said, a fitting place for you. If you learn to abase yourself properly in worship of us, I might let you live. Hastily, Rand scrambled to his feet. Perhaps he could not fight the Forsaken. No ordinary human could. But he would not let them believe for a minute that he was groveling before them. He tried to help Egwene up, but she slapped his hands away and stood by herself, angrily brushing off her dress. Matt and Perrin had also stubbornly pushed themselves unsteadily erect. You will learn, 
Agenor said, if you want to live. Now that I have found what I need, his eyes went to the stone archway, I may take the time to teach you. This shall not be. The green man strode out of the trees with a voice like lightning striking an ancient oak. You do not belong here. Agenor spared him a brief contemptuous glance. Begone. Your time is ended. All your kind but you long since dust. Live what life is left to you, and be glad you are beneath our notice. This is my place, the green man said, and you shall hurt no living thing here. Balthamel tossed Nynaeve aside like a rag, and like a crumpled rag she fell, eyes staring, limp as if all her bones had melted. One leather-clad hand lifted, and the green man roared as smoke rose from the vines that wove him. The wind in the trees echoed his pain. Agenor turned back to Rand and the others as if the green man had been dealt with, but one long stride and massive leafy arms wrapped themselves around Balthamel, raising him high, crushing him against a chest of thick creepers, black leather mask laughing into hazelnut eyes dark with anger. Like serpents, Balthamel's arms writhed free, his gloved hands grasping the green man's head as though he would wrench it off. Flames shot up where those hands touched, vines withering, leaves falling. The green man bellowed as thick, dark smoke poured out between the vines of his body. On and on he roared, as if all of him were coming out of his mouth with the smoke that billowed between his lips. Suddenly, Balthamel jerked in the green man's grasp. The Forsaken's hands tried to push him away instead of clutching him. One gloved hand flung wide, and a tiny creeper burst through the black leather. A fungus, such as rings trees in the deep shadows of the forest, ringed his arm, sprang from nowhere to full grown, swelling to cover the length of it. Balthamel thrashed, and a shoot of stinkweed ripped open his carapace. Lichens dug in their roots and split tiny cracks across the leather of his face. Nettles broke the eyes of his mask. Death's head mushrooms tore open the mouth. The green man threw the forsaken down. Balthamel twisted and jerked as all the things that grew in the dark places, all the things with spores, all the things that loved the dank, swelled and grew, tore cloth and leather and flesh. Was it flesh? seen in that brief moment of verdant rage, to tattered shreds, and covered him until only a mound remained, indistinguishable from many in the shaded depths of the green forest, and the mound moved no more than they. With a groan like a limb breaking under too great a weight, the green man crashed to the ground. Half his head was charred black. Tendrils of smoke still rose from him like gray creepers. Burned leaves fell from his arm as he painfully stretched out his blackened hand to gently cup an acorn. The earth rumbled as an oak seedling pushed up between his fingers. The green man's head fell, but the seedling reached for the sun, straining. Roots shot out and thickened, delved beneath the ground and rose again, thickened more as they sank. The trunk broadened and stretched upward, bark turning gray and fissured and ancient. Limbs spread and grew heavy, as big as arms, as big as men, and lifted to caress the sky, thick with green leaves, dense with acorns. The massive web of roots turned the earth like plows as it spread. The already huge trunk shivered, grew wider, round as a house. Stillness came, and an oak that could have stood five hundred years covered the spot where the green man had been, marking the tomb of a legend. Nynaeve lay on the gnarled roots, grown curved to her shape, to make a bed for her to rest upon. The wind sighed through the oak's branches. It seemed to murmur farewell. Even Agenor seemed stunned. Then his head lifted, cavernous eyes burning with hate. Enough. It is past time to end this. Yes, Forsaken, Moraine said, her voice as cold as deep winter ice. 
pastime. The Aes Sedai's hand rose, and the ground fell away beneath Agenor's feet. Flame roared from the chasm, whipped to a frenzy by wind howling in from every direction, sucking a maelstrom of leaves into the fire, which seemed to solidify into a red-streaked yellow jelly of pure heat. In the middle of it Agenor stood, his feet supported only by air. The Forsaken looked startled, but then he smiled and took a step forward. It was a slow step, as if the fire tried to root him to the spot. But he took it, and then another. Run, Moiraine commanded. Her face was white with strain. All of you, run! Agenor stepped across the air toward the edge of the flames. Rand was aware of others moving, Matt and Perrin dashing away at the edge of his vision, Loyal's long legs carrying him into the trees. But all he could really see was Egwene. She stood there, rigid, face pale and eyes closed. It was not fear that held her, he realized. She was trying to throw her puny, untrained wielding of the power against the Forsaken. Roughly he grabbed her arm and pulled her around to face him. Run! he shouted at her. Her eyes opened, staring at him, angry with him for interfering, liquid with hate for Agenor, with fear of the Forsaken. Run! he said, pushing her toward the trees hard enough to start her. Run! Once started, she did run. But Agenor's withered face turned toward him, toward the running Egwene behind him, as the Forsaken walked through the flames, as if what the Aes Sedai was doing did not concern Agenor at all. Toward Egwene. Not her, Rand shouted. The light burn you, not her. He snatched up a rock and threw it, meaning to draw Agenor's attention. Halfway to the Forsaken's face, the stone turned to a handful of dust. He hesitated only a moment, long enough to glance over his shoulder and see that Egwene was hidden in the trees. The flames still surrounded Agenor, patches of his cloak smoldering. But he walked as if he had all the time in the world and the fire's rim was near. Ran, turned and ran. Behind him, he heard Moiraine begin to scream. Chapter 51 Against the Shadow the land tended upward the way Rand went, but fear lent his legs strength, and they ate ground in long strides, tearing his way through flowering bushes and tangles of wild rose, scattering petals, not caring if thorns ripped his clothes or even his flesh. Moiraine had stopped screaming. It seemed as if the shrieks had gone on forever, each one more throat-wrenching than the last, but he knew they had lasted only moments altogether, moments before Agenor would be on his trail. He knew it would be him that Agenor followed. He had seen the certainty in the Forsaken's hollow eyes, in that last second before terror whipped his feet to run. The land grew ever steeper, but he scrambled on, pulling himself forward by handfuls of undergrowth, rocks and dirt and leaves spilling down the slope from under his feet, finally crawling on hands and knees when the slant became too great. Ahead, above, it leveled out a little. Panting, he scrabbled his way the last few spans, got to his feet and stopped, wanting to howl aloud. Ten paces in front of him, the hilltop dropped away sharply. He knew what he would see before he reached it, but he took the steps anyway, each heavier than the one before, hoping there might be some track, a goat path, anything. At the edge he looked down a sheer hundred-foot drop, a stone wall as smooth as planed timber. There has to be some way. I'll go back and find a way around. Go back and... When he turned, Agenor was there, just reaching the crest. The Forsaken topped the hill without any difficulty, walking up the steep slope as if it were level ground. Deep sunken eyes burned at him from that drawn parchment face. Somehow it seemed less withered than before, more fleshed, as if Agenor had fed well on something. Those eyes were fixed on him, Yet when Agenor spoke, it was almost to himself. The Alzaman will give rewards beyond mortal dreaming for the one who brings you to Sheol Ghul. Yet my dreams have always been beyond those of other men, 
and I left mortality behind millennia ago. What difference if you serve the great Lord of the Dark alive or dead? None to the spread of the shadow. Why should I share power with you? Why should I bend knee to you? I, who faced loose Theron Telamon in the hall of the servants itself. I, who threw my might against the Lord of the Morning and met him stroke for stroke. I think not. Rand's mouth dried like dust. His tongue felt as shriveled as Agonor. The edge of the precipice grated under his heels, stone falling away. He did not dare look back, but he heard the rocks bounding and rebounding from the sheer wall, just as his body would if he moved another inch. It was the first he knew that he had been backing up, away from the Forsaken. His skin crawled until he thought he must see it writhing if he looked, if he could only take his eyes off the Forsaken. There has to be some way to get away from him, some way to escape. There has to be some way. Suddenly he felt something saw it, though he knew it was not there to see. A glowing rope ran off from Agenor behind him, white like sunlight seen through the purest cloud, heavier than a blacksmith's arm, lighter than air, connecting the Forsaken to something distant beyond knowing, something within the touch of Rand's hand. The rope pulsed, and with every throb Agenor grew stronger, more fully fleshed, a man as tall and strong as himself, a man harder than the warder, more deadly than the blight. Yet beside that shining cord the Forsaken seemed almost not to exist. The cord was all. It hummed. It sang. It called Rand's soul. One bright finger strand lifted away, drifted, touched him, and he gasped. Light filled him and heat that should have burned yet only warmed as if it took the chill of the grave from his bones. The strand thickened. I have to get away. No, Agenor shouted. You shall not have it. It is mine. Rand did not move, and neither did the Forsaken, yet they fought as surely as if they grappled in the dust. Sweat beaded on Agenor's face, no longer withered, no longer old that of a strong man in his prime. Rand pulsed with the beating in the cord like the heartbeat of the world. It filled his being. Light filled his mind, till only a corner was left for what was himself. He wrapped the void around that nook, sheltered in emptiness. Away! Mine! Agenor cried. Mine! Warmth built in Rand, the warmth of the sun, the radiance of the sun, bursting, the awful radiance of light, of the light, away. Mine! Flame shot from Agenor's mouth, broke through his eyes like spears of fire, and he screamed, away. And Rand was no longer on the hilltop. He quivered with the light that suffused him. His mind would not work. Light and heat blinded it. The light. In the midst of the void, the light blinded his mind, stunned him with awe. He stood in a broad mountain pass, surrounded by jagged black peaks like the teeth of the Dark One. It was real. He was there. He felt the rocks under his boots, the icy breeze on his face. Battle surrounded him or the tail end of battle, armored men on armored horses, shining steel dusty now, slashed and stabbed at snarling trollocs wielding spiked axes and scythe-like swords. Some men fought afoot, their horses down, and barded horses galloped through the fight with empty saddles. Fades moved among them all, night-black cloaks hanging still, however their dark mounts galloped, and wherever their light-eating swords swung, men died. Sound beat at Rand, beat at him and bounced from the strangeness that had him by the throat. The clash of steel against steel, the panting and grunting of men and trollocs striving, the screams of men and trollocs dying. Over the din banners waved in dust-filled air, the black hawk of Faldara, the white heart of Shinar, others. 
and Trolloc banners. In just the little space around him he saw the horned skull of the Davul, the blood-red trident of the Kobal, the iron fist of the Daimon. Yet it was indeed the tail end of battle, a pausing, as humans and Trollocs alike fell back to regroup. None seemed to notice Rand as they paid a few last strokes and broke away, galloping or running in a stagger to the ends of the pass. Rand found himself facing the end of the pass where the humans were reforming, pennants stirring beneath gleaming lance points. Wounded men wavered in their saddles, riderless horses reared and galloped. Plainly, they could not stand another meeting, yet just as plainly they readied themselves for one final charge. Some of them saw him now. Men stood in their stirrups to point at him. Their shouts came to him as tiny piping. Staggering, he turned. The forces of the Dark One filled the other end of the pass. Bristling black pikes and spear points swelling up onto mountain slopes made blacker still by the great mass of Trollocs that dwarfed the army of Shinar. Fades in hundreds rode across the front of the horde, the fierce muzzled faces of Trollocs turning away in fear as they passed, huge bodies pulling back to make way. Overhead, Drakkar wheeled on leathery pinions, shrieks challenging the wind. Halfman saw him now too, pointed and Drakkar spun and dove. Two, three, six of them, crying shrilly as they plummeted toward him. He stared at them. Heat filled him, the burning heat of the touched sun. He could see the Drakkar clearly, soulless eyes in pale men's faces on winged bodies that had nothing of humanity about them. Terrible heat, crackling heat. From the clear sky lightning came, each bolt crisp and sharp, searing his eyes, each bolt striking a winged black shape. Hunting cries became shrieks of death, and charred forms fell to leave the sky clean again. The heat, the terrible heat of the light. He fell to his knees. He thought he could hear his tears sizzling on his cheeks. No! He clutched at tufts of wiry grass for some hold on reality. The grass burst in flame. Please, no! The wind rose with his voice, howled with his voice, roared with his voice down the pass, whipping the flames to a wall of fire that sped away from him and toward the Trolloc host faster than a horse could run. Fire burned into the Trollocs, and the mountains trembled with their screams, screams almost as loud as the wind and his voice. It has to end. He beat at the ground with his fist, and the earth tolled like a gong. He bruised his hands on stony soil, and the earth trembled. Ripples ran through the ground ahead of him in ever-rising waves, waves of dirt and rock towering over Trollocs and Fades, breaking over them as the mountains shattered under their hooved feet. A boiling mass of flesh and rubble churned across the Trolloc army. What was left standing was still a mighty host, but now no more than twice the human army in numbers, and milling in fright and confusion. The wind died. The screams died. The earth was still. Dust and smoke swirled back down the pass to surround him. The light blind you, Baalzamon! This has to end! It is not here. It was not Rand's thought making his skull vibrate. I will take no part. Only the Chosen One can do what must be done, if he will. Where? He did not want to say it, but he could not stop himself. Where? The haze surrounding him parted, leaving a dome of clear, clean air ten spans high, walled by billowing smoke and dust. Steps rose before him, each standing alone and unsupported, stretching up into the murk that obscured the sun. Not here. Through the mist as from the far end of the earth came a cry. The light wills it! 
The ground rumbled with the thunder of hooves as the forces of humankind launched their last charge. Within the void his mind knew a moment of panic. The charging horsemen could not see him in the dust. Their charge would trample right over him. The greater part of him ignored the shaking ground as a petty thing beneath concern. Dull anger driving his feet, he mounted the first steps. It has to be ended. Darkness surrounded him, the utter blackness of total nothing. The steps were still there, hanging in the black, under his feet and ahead. When he looked back, those behind were gone, faded away to nothing, into the nothingness around him. But the cord was yet there, stretching behind him, the glowing line dwindling and vanishing into the distance. It was not so thick as before, but it still pulsed, pumping strength into him, pumping life, filling him with the light. He climbed. It seemed forever that he climbed, forever and minutes. Time stood still in nothingness. Time ran faster. He climbed until suddenly a door stood before him, its surface rough and splintered and old, a door well remembered. He touched it, and it burst to fragments. While they still fell, he stepped through, bits of shattered wood falling from his shoulders. The chamber, too, was as he remembered. The mad striated sky beyond the balcony, the melted walls, the polished table, the terrible fireplace with its roaring, heatless flames. Some of those faces that made the fireplace, writhing in torment, shrieking in silence, tugged at his memory as if he knew them. But he held the void close, floated within himself in emptiness. He was alone. When he looked at the mirror on the wall, his face was there as clear as if it was him. There is calm in the void. Yes, Baal Zaman said from in front of the fireplace. I thought Agenor's greed would overcome him. But it makes no difference in the end. A long search, but ended now. You are here, and I know you. In the midst of the light the void drifted, and in the midst of the void floated Rand. He reached for the soil of his home, and felt hard rock, unyielding and dry, stone without pity where only the strong could survive, only those as hard as the mountains. I am tired of running. He could not believe his voice was so calm. Tired of you threatening my friends. I will run no more. Baalzamon had a cord too, he saw, a black cord, thicker by far than his own, so wide it should have dwarfed the human body, yet dwarfed by Baalzamon instead. Each pulse along that black vein ate light. You think it makes any difference whether you run or stay? The flames of Baalzamon's mouth laughed. The faces in the hearth wept at their master's mirth. You have fled from me many times, and each time I run you down and make you eat your pride with sniveling tears for spice. Many times you have stood and fought, then groveled in defeat, begging mercy. You have this choice, worm, and this choice only. Kneel at my feet and serve me well, and I will give you power above thrones. Or be Tarvalan's puppet fool and scream while you are ground into the dust of time. Rand shifted, glancing back through the door as if seeking a way to escape. Let the Dark One think that. Beyond the doorway was still the black of nothing, split by the shining thread that ran from his body. And out there Baalzamon's heavier cord ran as well, so black that it stood out in the dark as if against snow. The two cords beat like heart veins in countertime against each other, the light barely resisting the waves of dark. There are other choices, Rand said. The wheel weaves the pattern, not you. 
Every trap you've laid for me I have escaped. I've escaped your fades and trollocs, escaped your dark friends. I tracked you here and destroyed your army on the way. You do not weave the pattern. Baal Zaman's eyes roared like two furnaces. His lips did not move, but Rand thought he heard a curse screamed at Agenor. Then the fires died, and that ordinary human face smiled at him in a way that chilled even through the warmth of the light. Other armies can be raised, fool. Armies you have not dreamed of will yet come. And you tracked me. You slug under a rock, track me. I began the setting of your path the day you were born, a path to lead you to your grave, or here. Aeel allowed to flee and one to live, to speak the words that would echo down the years. Jayan Farstrider, a hero, he twisted the word to a sneer, whom I painted like a fool and sent to the Ogre, thinking he was free of me. The Black Aja, wriggling like worms on their bellies across the world to search you out. I pull the strings, and the Armalan seat dances and thinks she controls events. The Void trembled, hastily ran Firmden again. He knows it all. He could have done. It could be the way he says. The light warmed the void. Doubt cried out and was stilled, till only the seed remained. He struggled, not knowing whether he wanted to bury the seed or make it grow. The void steadied, smaller than before, and he floated in calm. Baalzaman seemed to notice nothing. It matters little if I have you alive or dead except to you and to what power you might have. You will serve me, or your soul will. But I would rather have you kneel to me alive than dead. A single fist of Trolloc sent to your village when I could have sent a thousand. One dark friend to face you where a hundred could come on you asleep. And you, fool, you don't even know them all. Neither those ahead, nor those behind, nor those by your side. You are mine, have always been mine, my dog on a leash. And I brought you here to kneel to your master, or die and let your soul kneel. I deny you. You have no power over me, and I will not kneel to you alive or dead. Look, Baalzaman said. Look. Unwilling, Rand yet turned his head. Egwene stood there, and Nynaeve, pale and frightened with flowers in their hair. And another woman, little older than the wisdom, dark-eyed and beautiful, clothed in a two-rivers dress, bright blossoms embroidered round the neck. Mother? he breathed, and she smiled, a hopeless smile, his mother's smile. No, my mother is dead, and the other two are safe away from here. I deny you. Egwene and Nynaeve blurred, became wafting mist, dissipated. Kari Thor still stood there, her eyes big with fear. She, at least, Baalzamon said, is mine to do with as I will. Rand shook his head. I deny you. He had to force the words out. She is dead, and safe from you in the light. His mother's lips trembled. Tears trickled down her cheeks. Each one burned him like acid. The Lord of the Grave is stronger than he once was, my son, she said. His reach is longer. The Father of Lies has a honeyed tongue for unwary souls. My son, my only darling son, I would spare you if I could. But he is my master now, his whim, 
the law of my existence. I can but obey him and grovel for his favour. Only you can free me. Please, my son, please help me, help me, help me, please! The wail ripped out of her as bare-faced fades, pale and eyeless, closed round. Her clothes ripped away in their bloodless hands, hands that wielded pincers and clamps and things that stung and burned and whipped against her naked flesh. Her scream would not end. Rand's scream echoed hers. The void boiled in his mind. His sword was in his hand, not the heronmark blade, but a blade of light, a blade of the light. Even as he raised it, a fiery white bolt shot from the point as if the blade itself had reached out. It touched the nearest fade, and blinding canescence filled the chamber, shining through the halfman like a candle through paper, burning through them, blinding his eyes to the scene. From the midst of the brilliance he heard a whisper. Thank you, my son. The light, the blessed light. The flash faded, and he was alone in the chamber with Baalzamun. Baalzamun's eyes burned like the pit of doom, but he shied back from the sword as if it truly were the light itself. Fool! You will destroy yourself. You cannot wield it so, not yet. Not until I teach you. It is ended, Rand said, and he swung the sword at Baalzamun's black cord. Baalzamun screamed as the sword fell, screamed till the stone walls trembled and the endless howl redoubled as the blade of light severed the cord. The cut ends rebounded apart as if they had been under tension. The ends stretching into the nothingness outside began to shrivel as it sprang away. The other whipped back into Baalzamun, hurling him against the fireplace. There was silent laughter in the soundless shrieks of the tortured faces. The walls shivered and cracked, the floor heaved, and chunks of stone crashed to the floor from the ceiling. As all broke apart around him, Rand pointed the sword at Baalzaman's heart. It is ended. Light lanced from the blade, coruscating in a shower of fiery sparks like droplets of molten white metal. Wailing, Baalzaman threw up his arms in a vain effort to shield himself. Flames shrieked in his eyes, joining with other flames as the stone ignited, the stone of the cracking walls, the stone of the pitching floor, the stone showering from the ceiling. Rand felt the bright thread attached to him thinning, till only the glow itself remained. But he strained harder, not knowing what he did or how, only that this had to be ended. It has to be ended. Fire filled the chamber, a solid flame. He could see Baalzaman withering like a leaf, hear him howling, feel the shrieks grating on his bones. The flame became pure white light, brighter than the sun. Then the last flicker of the thread was gone, and he was falling through endless black and Baalzaman's fading howl. Something struck him with tremendous force, turning him to jelly, and the jelly shook and screamed from the fire raging inside, the hungry cold burning without end. Chapter 52 There is neither beginning nor end. He became aware of the sun first, moving across a cloudless sky, filling his unblinking eyes. It seemed to go by fits and starts, standing still for days, then darting ahead in a streak of light, jerking toward the far horizon, day falling with it. Light. That should mean something. Thought was a new thing. I can think. It means me. Pain came next, the memory of raging fever, the bruises where shaking chills had thrown him around like a rag doll, and a stink. A greasy burn smell filling his nostrils and his head. With aching muscles he heaved himself over, pushed up to hands and knees. Uncomprehending he stared at the oily ashes in which he had been lying, ashes scattered and smeared over the stone of the hilltop. Bits of dark green cloth lay mixed in the char, 
edge-blackened scraps that had escaped the flames. Agenor. His stomach heaved and twisted. Trying to brush black streaks of ash from his clothes, he lurched away from the remains of the Forsaken. His hands flapped feebly, not making much headway. He tried to use both hands and fell forward. A sheer drop loomed under his face, a smooth rock wall spinning in his eyes, depth pulling him. His head swum, and he vomited over the edge of the cliff. Trembling, he crawled backwards on his belly until there was solid stone under his eyes, then flopped over onto his back, panting for breath. With an effort, he fumbled his sword from its scabbard. Only a few ashes remained from the red cloth. His hands shook when he held it up in front of his face. It took both hands. It was a Heronmark blade. Heronmark? Yes, Tam, my father. But only steel for that. He needed three wavering tries to sheathe it again. It had been something else. Or there was another sword. My name, he said after a while, is Rand Althor. More memory crashed back into his head like a lead ball, and he groaned. The Dark One, he whispered to himself. The Dark One is dead. There was no more need for caution. Shayatan is dead. The world seemed to lurch. He shook in silent mirth until tears poured from his eyes. Shayatan is dead. He laughed at the sky. Other memories. Egwene. That name meant something important. Painfully he got to his feet, wavering like a willow in a high wind, and staggered past Agenor's ashes without looking at them. Not important any more. He fell more than climbed down that first steep part of the slope, tumbling and sliding from bush to bush. By the time he reached more level ground, his bruises ached twice as much, but he found strength enough to stand barely. Egwene. He broke into a shambling run. Leaves and flower petals showered around him as he blundered through the undergrowth. Have to find her. Who is she? His arms and legs seemed to flail about more like long blades of grass than go as he wanted them to. Tottering, he fell against a tree, slamming against the trunk so hard that he grunted. Foliage rained on his head while he pressed his face to the rough bark, clutching to keep from falling. Egwene. He pushed himself away from the tree and hurried on. Almost immediately he tilted again, falling, but he forced his legs to work faster, to run into the fall so that he was staggering along at a good clip, all the while one step from falling flat on his face. Moving made his legs begin to obey him more. Slowly he found himself running upright, arms pumping, long legs pulling him down the slope in leaps. He bounded into the clearing, half filled now by the great oak marking the green man's grave. There was the white stone arch, marked with the ancient symbol of the Aes Sedai, and the blackened, gaping pit where fire and wind had tried to trap Agenor, and failed. Egwene! Egwene, where are you? A pretty girl looked up with big eyes from where she knelt beneath the spreading branches, flowers in her hair, and brown oak leaves. She was slender and young and frightened. Yes, that's who she is. Of course. Egwene, thank the light you're all right. There were two other women with her, one with haunted eyes and a long braid, still decorated with a few white morning stars. The other lay outstretched, her head pillowed on folded cloaks, her own sky-blue cloak not quite hiding her tattered dress. Charred spots and tears in the rich cloth showed, and her face was pale, but her eyes were open. Moiraine. Yes, the Aes Sedai. And the wisdom Nynaeve. All three women looked at him, unblinking and intent. You are all right, aren't you? Egwene? He didn't harm you. He could walk without stumbling now. The sight of her made him feel like dancing, bruises and all. 
but it still felt good to drop down cross-legged beside them. I never even saw him after you pushed. Her eyes were uncertain on his face. What about you, Rand? I'm fine. He laughed. He touched her cheek and wondered if he had imagined a slight pulling away. A little rest and I'll be new made. Nynaeve? Moiraine Sedai? The names felt new in his mouth. The Wisdom's eyes were old, ancient in her young face, but she shook her head. A little bruised, she said, still watching him. Moiraine is the only... the only one of us who was really hurt. I suffered more injury to my pride than anything else, the Aes Sedai said irritably, plucking at her cloak blanket. She looked as if she had been a long time ill or hard used but despite the dark circles under them, her eyes were sharp and full of power. Agenor was surprised and angry that I held him as long as I did, but fortunately he had no time to spare for me. I am surprised myself that I held him so long. In the Age of Legends, Agenor was close behind the Kinslayer and de Chamael in power. The Dark One and All the Forsaken, Egwene quoted in a faint, unsteady voice, are bound in Sheol Ghul, bound by the Creator. She drew a shuddering breath. Agenor and Balthamel must have been trapped near the surface. Moraine sounded as if she had already explained this, impatient at doing so again. The patch on the Dark One's prison weakened enough to free them. Let us be thankful no more of the Forsaken were freed. If they had been, we would have seen them. It doesn't matter, Rand said. Agenor and Balthamel are dead, and so is Shea, the Dark One, the Aes Sedai cut him off. Ill or not, her voice was firm, and her dark eyes commanding. Best we still call him the Dark One, or Baalzamon at least. He shrugged. As you wish, but he's dead. The Dark One's dead. I killed him. I burned him with... The rest of memory flooded back then leaving his mouth hanging open. The One Power. I wielded the One Power. No man can... He licked lips that were suddenly dry. A gust of wind swirled fallen and falling leaves around them, but it was no colder than his heart. They were looking at him, the three of them, watching, not even blinking. He reached out to Egwene, and there was no imagination in her drawing back this time. Egwene? She turned her face away, and he let his hand drop. Abruptly she flung her arms around him, burying her face in his chest. I'm sorry, Rand, I'm sorry, I don't care, truly I don't. Her shoulders shook. He thought she was crying. Awkwardly patting her hair, he looked at the other two women over the top of her head. The wheel weaves as the wheel wills, Nynaeve said slowly. But you are still Randall Thor of Eamon's Field. But the light help me. The light help us all. You are too dangerous, Rand. He flinched from the wisdom's eyes, sad, regretting, and already accepting loss. What happened? Moraine said. Tell me everything and with her eyes on him, compelling, he did. He wanted to turn away, to make it short, leave things out, but the eyes Sedai's eyes drew everything from him. Tears ran down his face when he came to Karyal Thor, his mother. He emphasized that. He had my mother. My mother. There was sympathy and pain on Nynaeve's face, but the eyes Sedai's eyes drove him on, to the sword of light, to severing the black cord and the flames consuming Baalzamon. Egwene's arms tightened around him as if she would pull him back from what had happened. But it wasn't me, he finished. The light pulled me along. It wasn't really me. Doesn't that make any difference? I had suspicions from the first, Moraine said. Suspicions are not proof, though. After I gave you the token, the coin, and made that bonding. 
You should have been willing to fall in with whatever I wanted. But you resisted, questioned. That told me something, but not enough. Manetheran blood was always stubborn, and more so after Aemon died, and Eldraine's heart was shattered. Then there was Bela. Bela, he said. Nothing makes any difference. The Aes Sedai nodded. At Watch Hill, Bela had no need of me to cleanse her of tiredness. Someone had already done it. She could have outrun Mondarb that night. I should have thought of who Bela carried. With Trollocs on our heels, a Drakkar overhead, and a Halfman the light alone knew where. How you must have feared that Egwene would be left behind. You needed something more than you had ever needed anything before in your life. And you reached out to the one thing that could give it to you. Syedine. He shivered. He felt so cold his fingers hurt. If I never do it again, if I never touch it again, I won't... He could not say it. Go mad. Turn the land and people around him to madness. Die rotting while he still lived. Perhaps, Moraine said. It would be much easier if there was someone to teach you. But it might be done with a supreme effort of will. You can teach me. Surely you... He stopped when the Aes Sedai shook her head. Can a cat teach a dog to climb trees, Rand? Can a fish teach a bird to swim? I know Sayadar, but I can teach you nothing of Sayadin. Those who could are three thousand years dead. Perhaps you are stubborn enough, though. Perhaps your will is strong enough. Egwene straightened, wiping reddened eyes with the back of her hand. She looked as if she wanted to say something, but when she opened her mouth, nothing came out. At least she isn't pulling away. At least she can look at me without screaming. The others? he said. Lan took them into the cavern, Nynaeve said. The eye is gone, but there's something in the middle of the pool, a crystal column, and steps to reach it. Matt and Perrin wanted to look for you first. Loyal did too. But Moiraine said... She glanced at the Aes Sedai, troubled. Moiraine returned her look calmly. She said we mustn't disturb you while you were... His throat constricted until he could hardly breathe. Will they turn their faces the way Egwene did? Will they scream and run away like I'm a fade? Moiraine spoke as if she did not notice the blood draining from his face. There was a vast amount of the one power in the eye. Even in the Age of Legends, few could have channeled so much unaided without being destroyed. Very few. You told them, he said hoarsely. If everybody knows... Only Lan, Moraine said gently. He must know. And Nynaeve and Egwene, for what they are and what they will become. The others have no need yet. Why not? The rasp in his throat made his voice harsh. You will be wanting to gentle me, won't you? Isn't that what I said I do to men who can wield the power? Change them so they can't? Make them safe? Tom said men who have been gentle die because they stop wanting to live. Why aren't you talking about taking me to Tarvalon to be gentled? You are Taviran, Moraine replied. Perhaps the pattern is not finished with you. Rand sat up straight. In the dreams, Baalzamon said Tarvalon and the Amarlin seat would try to use me. He named names, and I remember them now. Raelan Darksbane, and Gwer Amalasin, Urian Stonebow, Davian, Loghain. The last was the hardest of all to say. Nynaeve went pale, and Egwene gasped, but he pressed on angrily. Every one a false dragon. Don't try to deny it. Well, I won't be used. I am not a tool you can throw on the midden heap when it's worn out. A tool made for a purpose is not demeaned by being used for that purpose. Moraine's voice was as harsh as his own. But a man who believes the father of lies demeans himself. You say you will not be used. And then you let the dark one set your path like a hound sent after a rabbit by his master. 
His fists clenched, and he turned his head away. It was too close to the things Baalzamon had said. I am no one's hound. Do you hear me? No one's. Loyal and the others appeared in the arch, and Rand scrambled to his feet, looking at Moiraine. They will not know, the Aes Sedai said, until the pattern makes it so. Then his friends were coming close. Lan led the way, looking as hard as ever, but still somewhat the worse for wear. He had one of Nynaeve's bandages around his temples, and a stiff-backed way of walking. Behind him, Loyal carried a large gold chest, ornately worked and chased with silver. No one but an ogre could have lifted it unaided. Perrin had his arms wrapped around a big bundle of folded white cloth, and Matt was cupping what appeared to be fragments of pottery in his two hands. So you're alive after all. Matt laughed. His face darkened, and he jerked his head at Moiraine. She wouldn't let us look for you. Said we had to find out what the eye was hiding. I'd have gone anyway, but Nynaeve and Egwene sided with her and almost threw me through the arch. You're here now, Perrin said, and not too badly beaten about by the look of you. His eyes did not glow, but the irises were all yellow now. That's the important thing. You're here, and we're done with what we came for, whatever it was. Moraine Sedai says we're done, and we can go. Home, Rand. The light burned me, but I want to go home. Good to see you alive, sheepherder, Lan said gruffly. I see you hung on to your sword. Maybe you'll learn to use it now. Rand felt a sudden burst of affection for the warder. Lan knew, but on the surface at least nothing had changed. He thought that perhaps for Lan nothing had changed inside either. I must say... Loyal said, setting the chest down, that traveling with Taviran has turned out to be even more interesting than I expected. His ears twitched violently. If it becomes any more interesting, I will go back to steading Shangtai immediately, confess everything to Elder Haman, and never leave my books again. Suddenly the ogre grinned, that wide mouth splitting his face in two. It is so good to see you, Randall Thor. The warder is the only one of these three who cares much at all for books, and he won't talk. What happened to you? We all ran off and hid in the woods until Moiraine Sedai sent land to find us. But she would not let us look for you. Why were you gone so long, Rand? I ran and ran, he said slowly, until I fell down a hill and hit my head on a rock. I think I hit every rock on the way down. That should explain his bruises. He tried to watch the Aes Sedai and Nynaeve and Egwene, too, but their faces never changed. When I came to, I was lost, and finally I stumbled back here. I think Agenor is dead, burned. I found some ashes and pieces of his cloak. The lies sounded hollow in his ears. He could not understand why they did not laugh with scorn and demand the truth. But his friends nodded accepting, and made sympathetic sounds as they gathered around the Aes Sedai to show her what they had found. Help me up, Moraine said. Nynaeve and Egwene lifted her until she was sitting. They had to support her even then. How could these things be inside the Eye, Matt asked, without being destroyed like that rock? They were not put there to be destroyed, the Aes Sedai said curtly and frowned away their questions while she took the pottery fragments, black and white and shiny, from Matt. They seemed like rubble to Rand, but she fitted them together deftly on the ground beside her, making a perfect circle the size of a man's hand. The ancient symbol of the Aes Sedai, the flame of Tarvalon, joined with the dragon's fang, black siding white. For a moment Moiraine only looked at it, her face unreadable. Then she took the knife from her belt and handed it to Lan, nodding to the circle. The warder separated out the largest piece, then raised the knife high and brought it down with all his might. A spark flew, the fragment leaped with the force of the blow, and the blade snapped with a sharp crack. He examined the stump left attached to the hilt, then tossed it aside. The best steel from Tyr he said dryly. 
Matt snatched the fragment up and grunted, then showed it around. There was no mark on it. Quendiar, Moraine said. Heartstone. No one has been able to make it since the Age of Legends, and even then it was made only for the greatest purpose. Once made, nothing can break it. Not the one power itself, wielded by the greatest Aes Sedai who ever lived, aided by the most powerful Sa'an Grial ever made. Any power directed against Heartstone only makes it stronger. Then how... Matt's gesture with the piece he held took in the other bits on the ground. This was one of the seven seals on the Dark One's prison, Moraine said. Matt dropped the piece as if it had become white hot. For a moment Perrin's eyes seemed to glow again. The eyes Sedai calmly began gathering the fragments. It doesn't matter any more, Rand said. His friends looked at him oddly, and he wished he had kept his mouth shut. Of course, Moraine replied. But she carefully put all the pieces into her pouch. Bring me the chest. Loyal lifted it closer. The flattened cube of gold and silver appeared to be solid, but the Aes Sedai's fingers felt across the intricate work, pressing, and with a sudden click, a top flung back as if on springs. A curled gold horn nestled within. Despite its gleam, it seemed plain beside the chest that held it. The only markings were a line of silver script inlaid around the mouth of the bell. Moraine lifted the horn out as if lifting a babe. This must be carried to Ilion, she said softly. Ilion? Perrin growled. That's almost to the Sea of Storms, nearly as far south of home as we are north now. Is it? Loyal stopped to catch his breath. Can it be? You can read the old tongue? Moraine asked. And when he nodded, she handed him the horn. The ogre took it as gently as she had, delicately tracing the script with one broad finger. His eyes went wider and wider, and his ears stood up straight. Tia mi aven moridin, isenda vadin, he whispered. The grave is no bar to my call. The Horn of Valir. For once the warder appeared truly shaken. There was a touch of awe in his voice. At the same time, Nynaeve said in a shaky voice, to call the heroes of the ages back from the dead to fight the Dark One. Burn me, Matt breathed. Loyal reverently laid the horn back in its golden nest. I begin to wonder, Moraine said. The eye of the world was made against the greatest need the world would ever face. But was it made for the use to which we put it? Or to guard these things. Quickly, the last, show it to me. After the first two, Rand could understand Perrin's reluctance. Lan and the ogre took the bundle of white cloth from him when he hesitated, and unfolded it between them. A long white banner spread out, lifting on the air. Rand could only stare. The whole thing seemed of a piece, neither woven nor dyed nor painted. A figure like a serpent, scaled in scarlet and gold, ran the entire length, but it had scaled legs and feet with five long golden claws on each, and a great head with a golden mane and eyes like the sun. The stirring of the banner made it seem to move, scales glittering like precious metals and gems, alive, and he almost thought he could hear it roar defiance. What is it? he said. Moraine answered slowly. The banner of the Lord of the Morning, when he led the forces of light against the shadow. The banner of Luz Theron Telamon. The banner of the dragon. Loyal almost dropped his end. Burn me, Matt said faintly. We will take these things with us when we go, Moraine said. They were not put here by chance, and I must know more. 
Her fingers brushed her pouch, where the pieces of the shattered seal were. It is too late in the day for starting now. We will rest and eat, but we will leave early. The blight is all around here, not as along the border, and strong. Without the green man this place cannot hold long. Let me down, she told Nynaeve and Egwene. I must rest. Rand became aware of what he had been seeing all along, but not noticing. Dead brown leaves falling from the great oak. Dead leaves rustling thick on the ground in the breeze, brown mixed with petals dropped from thousands of flowers. The green man had held back the blight, but already the blight was killing what he had made. It is done, isn't it? he asked Moraine. It is finished. The Aes Sedai turned her head on its pillow of cloaks. Her eyes seemed as deep as the eye of the world. We have done what we came here to do. From here, you may live your life as the pattern weaves. Eat, then sleep, Randall Thor. Sleep and dream of home. Chapter 53 The Wheel Turns Dawn revealed devastation in the green man's garden. The ground was thick with fallen leaves, almost knee-deep in places. All the flowers were gone except a few clinging desperately to the edge of the clearing. Little could grow in the soil under an oak, but a thin circle of flowers and grass centered on the thick trunk above the green man's grave. The oak itself retained only half its leaves, and that was far more than any other tree had as if some remnant of the green man still fought to hold there. The cool breezes had died, replaced by a growing, sticky heat. The butterflies were gone, the birds silent. It was a silent group who prepared to leave. Rand climbed into the bay's saddle with a sense of loss. It shouldn't be this way. Blood and ashes we won! I wish he had found his other place. Egwene said, as she mounted Bela. A litter, fashioned by Lan, was slung between the shaggy mare and Aldib to carry Moraine. Nynaeve would ride beside, with the white mare's reins. The wisdom dropped her eyes whenever she saw Lan glance at her, avoiding his gaze. The warder looked at her whenever her eyes were averted, but he would not speak to her. No one had to ask who Egwene meant. It is not right. Loyal said, staring at the oak. The ogre was the only one still not mounted. It is not right that Tree Brother should fall to the blight. He handed the reins of his big horse to Rand. Not right. Lan opened his mouth as the ogre walked to the great oak. Moraine, lying on the litter, weakly raised her hand, and the warder said nothing. Before the oak, Loyal knelt closing his eyes and stretching out his arms. The tufts on his ears stood straight as he lifted his face to the sky. And he sang. Rand could not say if there were words or if it was pure song. In that rumbling voice it was as if the earth sang. Yet he was sure he heard the birds trilling again, and spring breezes sighing softly and the sound of butterfly wings. Lost in the song, he thought it lasted only minutes. But when Loyal lowered his arms and opened his eyes, he was surprised to see the sun stood well above the horizon. It had been touching the trees when the ogre began. The leaves still on the oak seemed greener and more firmly attached than before. The flowers encircling it stood straighter, the morning stars white and fresh, the lover's knots a strong crimson. Mopping sweat from his broad face, Loyal rose and took his reins from Rand. His long eyebrows drooped, abashed, as if they might think he had been showing off. I've never sung so hard before. I could not have done it if something of Tree Brother was not still there. My tree songs do not have his power. When he settled himself in his saddle, there was satisfaction in the look he gave the oak and the flowers. This little space, at least, will not sink into the blight. The blight will not have, Tree Brother. You are a good man, Ogre, Lan said. 
Loyal grinned. I will take that as a compliment, but I do not know what Elder Haman would say. They rode in a single file, with Matt behind the warder where he could use his bow to effect if needed, and Perrin bringing up the rear with his axe across the pommel of his saddle. They crested a hill, and in an eye blink, the blight was all around them, twisted and rotted in virulent rainbow hues. Rand looked over his shoulder, but the green man's garden was nowhere to be seen, only the blight stretching behind them as before. Yet he thought, just for a moment, that he saw the towering top of the oak tree, green and lush, before it shimmered and was gone. Then there was only the blight. He half expected they would have to fight their way out as they fought their way in, but the blight was as quiet and still as death. Not a single branch trembled as if to lash at them. Nothing screamed or howled, neither nearby nor in the distance. The blight seemed to crouch, not to pounce. But as if it had been struck a great blow and waited for the next to fall. Even the sun was less red. When they passed the necklace of lakes, the sun hung not far past its zenith. Land kept them well away from the lakes and did not even look at them. But Rand thought the seven towers seemed taller than when he first saw them. He was sure the jagged tops were further from the ground, and above them something almost seen, seamless towers gleaming in the sun, and banners with golden cranes flying on the wind. He blinked and stared, but the towers refused to vanish completely. They were there at the edge of vision, until the blight hid the lakes once more. Before sunset the warder chose a campsite, and Moraine had Nynaeve and Egwene help her up to set wards. The Aes Sedai whispered in the other women's ears before she began. Nynaeve hesitated, but when Moraine closed her eyes, all three women did so together. Rand saw Matt and Perrin staring, and wondered how they could be surprised. Every woman is an Aes Sedai, he thought mirthlessly. The light helped me, so am I. Bleakness held his tongue. Why is it so different? Perrin asked, as Egwene and the Wisdom helped Moiraine to her bed. It feels... His thick shoulders shrugged as if he could not find the word. We struck a mighty blow at the Dark One, Moiraine replied, settling herself with a sigh. The shadow will be a long time recovering. How? Matt demanded. What did we do? Sleep, Moraine said. We are not out of the blight yet. But the next morning still nothing changed that Rand could see. The blight faded as they rode south, of course. Twisted trees were replaced by straight. The stifling heat diminished. Rotting foliage gave way to the merely diseased. And then not diseased, he realized. The forest around them became red with new growth, thick on the branches. Buds sprouted on the undergrowth, creepers covered the rocks with green, and new wildflowers dotted the grass as thick and bright as where the green man walked. It was as if spring, so long held back by winter, now raced to catch up to where it should be. He was not the only one who stared. A mighty blow, Moraine murmured, and would say no more. Climbing wild rose entwined the stone column marking the border. Men came out of the watchtowers to greet them. There was a stunned quality to their laughter, and their eyes shone with amaze, as if they could not believe the new grass under their steel-clad feet. The light has conquered the shadow. A great victory in Tarwin's Gap. We have had the message. Victory! The light blesses us again. King Izar is strong in the light. Lan replied to all their shouts. The watchman wanted to tend Moiraine, or at least send an escort with them, but she refused it all. Even flat on her back on a litter, the Aes Sedai's presence was such that the armored men fell back, bowing and acceding to her wishes. Their laughter followed as Rand and the others rode on. In the late afternoon they reached Faldara, to find the grim-walled city ringing with celebration. Ringing in truth! Rand doubted if there could be a bell in the city not clanging, from the tiniest silver harness chime to great bronze gongs in their tower tops. The gates stood wide open, 
and men ran laughing and singing in the streets, flowers stuck in their topknots and the crevices of their armor. The common people of the town had not yet returned from Falmoran, but the soldiers were newly come from Tarwin's Gap, and their joy was enough to fill the streets. Victory in the Gap! We won! A miracle in the Gap! The age of legends has come back! Spring! A grizzled old soldier laughed as he hung a garland of morning stars around Rand's neck. His own topknot was a white cluster of them. The light blesses us with spring once more. Learning they wanted to go to the keep, a circle of men clad in steel and flowers surrounded them, running to clear a way through the celebration. Ingtar's was the first face Rand saw that was not smiling. I was too late, Ingtar told Lan with a sour grimness. Too late by an hour to see. Peace. His teeth ground audibly, but then his expression became contrite. Forgive me. Grief makes me forget my duties. Welcome, Builder. Welcome to you all. It is good to see you safely out of the blight. I will bring the healer to Moiraine Sedai in her chambers, and inform Lord Agelmar. Take me to Lord Agelmar, Moiraine commanded. Take us all. Ingtar opened his mouth to protest and bowed under the force of her eyes. Agelmar was in his study, with his swords and armor back on their racks, and his was the second face that did not smile. He wore a troubled frown that deepened when he saw Moiraine carried in on her litter by liveried servants. Women in the black and gold fluttered over bringing the Aes Sedai to him without a chance to freshen herself or be brought the healer. Loyal carried the gold chest. The pieces of the seal were still in Moiraine's pouch, Loose Theron Kinslayer's banner was wrapped in her blanket roll and still tied behind Aldib's saddle. The groom who had led the white mare away had received the strictest orders to see the blanket roll was placed untouched in the chambers assigned to the Aes Sedai. Peace, the Lord of Faldara muttered. Are you injured, Moiraine Sedai? Ingtar, why have you not seen the Aes Sedai to her bed and brought the healer to her? Be still, Lord Agelmar, Moiraine said. Ingtar has done as I commanded him. I am not so frail as everyone here seems to think. She motioned two of the women to help her to a chair. For a moment they clasped their hands, exclaiming that she was too weak, that she should be in a warm bed, and the healer brought, and a hot bath. Moiraine's eyebrows lifted. The women shut their mouths abruptly and hurried to aid her into the chair. As soon as she was settled, she waved them away irritably. I would speak with you, Lord Agelmar. Agelmar nodded, and Ingtar waved the servants from the room. The Lord of Faldara eyed those who remained expectantly. Especially, Rand thought, loyal and the golden chest. We hear, Moiraine said as soon as the door shut behind Ingtar, that you won a great victory in Tarwin's Gap. Yes, Agelmar said slowly, his troubled frown returning. Yes, I said I, and no. The half-men and their trollocs were destroyed to the last, but we barely fought. A miracle, my men call it. The earth swallowed them. The mountains buried them. Only a few drakkar were left, too frightened to do else but fly north as fast as they could. A miracle indeed, Moiraine said. And spring has come again. A miracle, Agelmar said, shaking his head. But— Moiraine said I, men say many things about what happened in the Gap, that the light took on flesh and fought for us, that the Creator walked in the Gap to strike at the shadow. But I saw a man, Moiraine said I. I saw a man, and what he did cannot be, must not be. The wheel weaves as the wheel wills, Lord of Faldara. As you say, Moiraine said I. And Paran Fain, he is secure? I must speak with him when I am rested. He is held as you commanded, I said I, whining at his guards half the time and trying to command them the rest, but— Peace, Moiraine said I, what of you in the blight? You found the green man. I see his hand in the new things growing. We found him, she said flatly. The green man is dead, Lord Agelmar, and the eye of the world is gone. There will be no more quests by young men seeking glory. The Lord of Faldara frowned, shaking his head in confusion. 
Dead? The green man? He cannot be. Then you were defeated? But the flowers and the growing things. We won, Lord Agelmar. We won, and the land freed from winter is the proof. But I fear the last battle has not yet been fought. Rand stirred, but the Aes Sedai gave him a sharp look, and he stood still again. The blight still stands, and the forges of Thakandar still work below Sheol Ghul. There are many halfmen yet, and countless Trollocs. Never think the need for watchfulness in the borderlands is gone. I did not think it so, Aes Sedai, he said stiffly. Moraine motioned for Loyal to set the gold chest at her feet, and when he did she opened it, revealing the horn. The horn of Valir, she said, and Agelmar gasped. Rand almost thought the man would kneel. With that, Moraine said I, it matters not how many halfmen or Trollocs remain. With the heroes of old come back from the tomb, we will march to the blasted lands and level Sheol Ghul. No! Agelmar's mouth fell open in surprise, but Moraine continued calmly. I did not show it to you to taunt you, but so that you will know that in whatever battles yet come, our might will be as great as that of the shadow. Its place is not here. The horn must be carried to Ilion. It is there, if fresh battles threaten, that it must rally the forces of the light. I will ask an escort of your best men to see that it reaches Ilion safely. There are dark friends still, as well as Halfman and Trollocs, and those who come to the horn will follow whoever wins it. It must reach Ilion. It shall be as you say, I said I. But when the lid of the chest closed, the Lord of Faldara looked like a man being denied his last glimpse of the light. Seven days later bells still rang in Faldara. The people had returned from Falmoran, adding their celebration to that of the soldiers, and shouts and singing blended with the pealing of the bells on the long balcony where Rand stood. The balcony overlooked Agelmar's private gardens, green and flowering. But he did not give them a second look. Despite the sun high in the sky, spring in Shinar was cooler than he was used to, yet sweat glistened on his bare chest and shoulders as he swung the heronmark blade, each move precise yet distant from where he floated in the void. Even there he wondered how much joy there would be in the town if they knew of the banner Moraine still kept hidden. Good sheepherder. Leaning against the railing with his arms folded across his chest, the warder watched him critically. You are doing well, but don't push so hard. You can't become a blade master in a few weeks. The void vanished like a pricked bubble. I don't care about being a blade master. It's a blade master's blade, sheepherder. I just want my father to be proud of me. His hand tightened on the rough leather of the hilt. I just want Tam to be my father. He slammed the sword into its scabbard. Anyway, I don't have a few weeks. Then you've not changed your mind? Would you? Land's expression had not altered. The flat planes of his face looked as if they could not change. You won't try to stop me? Or Moraine Sadai? You can do as you will, sheepherder, or as the pattern weaves for you. The warder straightened. I leave you now. Rand turned to watch Lan go and found Egwene standing there. Changed your mind about what, Rand? He snatched up his shirt and coat, suddenly feeling the cool. I'm going away, Egwene. Where? Somewhere. I don't know. He did not want to meet her eyes, but he could not stop looking at her. She wore red wild roses twined in her hair, flowing about her shoulders. She held her cloak close dark blue and embroidered along the edge with a thin line of white flowers in the Shinaran fashion, and the blossoms made a line straight up to her face. They were no paler than her cheeks. Her eyes seemed so large and dark. Away. I'm sure Maureen Sedai will not like you just going off. After, after what you've done, you deserve some reward. Maureen does not know I am alive. I have done what she wanted, and that's an end to it. She doesn't even speak to me when I go to her. 
Not that I've tried to stay close to her, but she's avoided me. She won't care if I go, and I don't care if she does. Moraine is still not completely well, Rand. She hesitated. I have to go to Tarvalon for my training. Nynaeve is coming, too. And Matt still needs to be healed of whatever binds him to that dagger, and Perrin wants to see Tarvalon before he goes... wherever. You could come with us. And wait for some ice Sedai besides Moraine to find out what I am and gentle me? His voice was rough, almost a sneer. He could not change it. Is that what you want? No. He knew he would never be able to tell her how grateful he was that she had not hesitated before answering. Rand, you aren't afraid. They were alone, but she looked around and still lowered her voice. Moraine well, Sadai says you don't have to touch the true source. If you don't touch Sayedin, if you don't try to wield the power, you'll be safe. Oh, I won't ever touch it again. Not if I have to cut my hand off first. What if I can't stop? I never tried to wield it, not even at the eye. What if I can't stop? Will you go home, Rand? Your father must be dying to see you. Even Matt's father must be dying to see him by now. I'll be coming back to Eamon's Field next year. For a little while, at least. He rubbed his palm over the hilt of his sword, feeling the bronze heron. My father. Home. Light, how I want to see. Not home. Some place where there aren't any people to hurt if I can't stop myself. Somewhere alone. Suddenly it felt as cold as snow on the balcony. I'm going away, but not home. Egwene, Egwene, why did you have to be one of those? He put his arms around her and whispered into her hair. Not ever home. In Agalmar's private garden, under a thick bower dotted with white blossoms, Moraine shifted on her bedchair. The fragments of the seal lay on her lap, and the small gem she sometimes wore in her hair spun and glittered on its gold chain from the ends of her fingers. The faint blue glow faded from the stone, and a smile touched her lips. It had no power in itself, the stone, but the first use she had ever learned of the one power as a girl in the royal palace in Kyrienne was using the stone to listen to people when they thought they were too far off to be overheard. The prophecies will be fulfilled, the eyes Sedai whispered. The dragon is reborn. The End of the First Book of the Wheel of Time Glossary A note on dates in this glossary. The Toman calendar, devised by Toma Dur Ahmed, was adopted approximately two centuries after the death of the last male eyes Sedai, and recorded years after the breaking of the world, A.B. Many records were destroyed in the Trolloc Wars, so much so that with the end of the wars there was argument about the exact year under the old system. A new calendar was proposed by Tiam of Gezar, celebrating the supposed freedom from the Trolloc threat, and recording each year as a free year, F.Y. The Gezeran calendar gained wide acceptance within twenty years after the war's end, Arthur Hawkwing attempted to establish a new calendar based on the founding of his empire, F.F., from the founding, but this is now known and referred to only by historians. After the widespread destruction, death, and disruption of the War of the Hundred Years, a fourth calendar was devised by Urun Dinjubai, Soaring Gull, a scholar of the sea folk, and promulgated by the Panark Farid of Tarabon. The Farid calendar dating from the arbitrarily decided end of the War of the Hundred Years and recording years of the new era, N.E., is currently in use. Aden, Heron, Governor of Berlin, Eyes Sedai, Wielders of the One Power. Since the time of madness, all surviving Eyes Sedai are women. Widely distrusted and feared, even hated, they are blamed by many for the breaking of the world and are generally thought to meddle in the affairs of nations. At the same time, few rulers will be without an Aes Sedai advisor, even in lands where the existence of such a connection must be kept secret. 
used as an honorific, so, Shiriam Sadai, and as a high honorific, so, Shiriam I Sadai. See also Aja, Amarlan Seat. Age Lace, see Pattern of an Age. Age of Legends The age ended by the War of the Shadow and the breaking of the world, a time when Aes Sedai performed wonders now only dreamed of. See also Wheel of Time. Agalmar, Lord Agalmar of House of Jagged, Lord of Faldara, his sign is three running red foxes. Ail, the people of the Ail Waste, fierce and hardy, also called Ailman. They veil their faces before they kill, giving rise to the saying, acting like a black-veiled Ail, to describe someone who is being violent. Deadly warriors with weapons or with nothing but their bare hands, they will not touch a sword. Their pipers play them into battle with the music of dances, and Ailmen call battle the dance. Ail Waste, the harsh, rugged, and all but waterless land east of the spine of the world, Few outsiders venture there, not only because water is almost impossible to find for one not born there, but because the Ail consider themselves at war with all other peoples and do not welcome strangers. Aja Societies among the Aes Sedai to which all Aes Sedai belong. They are designated by colors, blue Aja, red Aja, white Aja, green Aja, brown Aja, yellow Aja, and gray Aja. Each follows a specific philosophy of the use of the one power and purposes of the Aes Sedai. For example, the Red Aja bends all its energies to finding and gentling men who are attempting to wield the power. The Brown Aja, on the other hand, forsakes involvement with the world and dedicates itself to seeking knowledge. There are rumors, hotly denied and never safely mentioned in front of any Aes Sedai, of a Black Aja, dedicated to serving the Dark One. Alelisanda, in the old tongue, for the rose of the sun. Aldib, in the old tongue, west wind, the wind that brings the spring rains. Almira, Nynaeve, the wisdom of Eamon's field. Althor, Rand, a young farmer and sheepherder from the two rivers. Alvir, Egwene, youngest daughter of the innkeeper in Eamon's field. Amarlan Seat, 1. The title of the leader of the Aes Sedai, elected for life by the Hall of the Tower, the highest council of the Aes Sedai, which consists of three representatives from each of the seven Ajas. The Amarlan Seat has, theoretically at least, almost supreme authority among the Aes Sedai. She ranks as the equal of a king or queen. 2. The throne upon which the leader of the Aes Sedai sits. Andor the realm within which the two rivers lies. The sign of Andor is a rampant white lion on a field of red. Angrial, a very rare object which allows anyone capable of channeling the one power to handle a greater amount of the power than would be safely possible unaided. Remnants of the Age of Legends, the means of their making is no longer known. See also Sa'angrial. Arafel, one of the borderlands, the sign of Arafel is three white roses on a field of red, quartered with three red roses on a field of white. Aram, a young man of the Tuatha'an. Avandasora, in the old tongue, the tree of life, mentioned in many stories and legends. Ebara, Perrin, a young blacksmith's apprentice from Eman's field. Baalzamon, in the Trolloc tongue, heart of the dark believed to be the Trolloc name for the Dark One. Berlin, a city in Andor on the road from Camelin to the mines and the mountains of mist. Baron Doral, the wisdom in Eman's field prior to Nynaeve Almira. Beltine, spring festival in the two rivers. Bite me, a small, almost invisible biting insect. Black Aja, sea Aja. Blasted lands, desolated lands surrounding Sheol Ghul, beyond the Great Blight. Blight, the. See Great Blight, the. Blue Aja, see Aja. Borderlands, the. The nations bordering the Great Blight. Saldea, 
Arafel, Candor, and Shinar. Bornhald, Dayan, an officer of the Children of the Light, son of Lord Captain Jephram Bornhald. Bornhald, Jephram, a Lord Captain of the Children of the Light. Breaking of the World, the When Luce Theron Telamon and the Hundred Companions resealed the Dark One's prison, the counterstroke tainted Saedin. Eventually, every male Aes Sedai went horribly insane. In their madness, these men, who could wield the one power to a degree now unknown, changed the face of the earth. They caused great earthquakes, leveled mountain ranges, raised new mountains, lifted dry land where seas had been, made the ocean rush in where dry land had been. Many parts of the world were completely depopulated, and the survivors were scattered like dust on the wind. This destruction is remembered in stories, legends, and history as the breaking of the world. See also Hundred Companions, the Bryn, Gareth, Captain General of the Queen's Guard in Andor, also serves as Morghese's first Prince of the Sword. His sign is three golden stars, each of five rays. Bayar, Jarrett, an officer of the Children of the Light. Camelin, the capital city of Andor. Kyrian, both a nation along the spine of the world and the capital city of that nation. The city was burned and looted during the Aiel War, 976 to 978 NE. The sign of Kyrian is a many-rayed golden sun rising from the bottom of a field of sky blue. Karayan Kaldazar. In the old tongue, for the honor of the Red Eagle, the ancient battle cry of Manetheran. Karayan Alessandra. In the old tongue, for the honor of the Rose of the Sun, the battle cry of the last king of Manetheran. Cawthon, Matrim, Mat. A young farmer from the two rivers. Channel, one, verb, to control the flow of the one power. Two, noun, the act of controlling the flow of the one power. Charon, Jayan. See Farstrider, Jayan. Children of the Light, a society holding strict ascetic beliefs dedicated to the defeat of the Dark One and the destruction of all Dark Friends. Founded during the War of the Hundred Years by Lothair Mantilar to proselytize against increasing numbers of Dark Friends. They evolved during the war into a completely military organization, extremely rigid in their beliefs and completely certain that only they know the truth and the right. They hate Aes Sedai, considering them and any who support or befriend them Dark Friends. They are known disparagingly as White Cloaks. Their sign is a golden sunburst on a field of white. Covenant of the Ten Nations a union formed in the centuries after the breaking of the world, circa 200 A.B., dedicated to the defeat of the Dark One, broken apart by the Trolloc Wars. Quendiar, see Hearthstone, Damadred, Lord Galadadrid, only son of Tarangale Damadred and Tigrain, half-brother to Elaine and Gawain. His sign is a winged silver sword, point down. Damadred, Prince Tarangale, a royal prince of Kyrian, he married Tigrain and fathered Galadadrid. When Tigrain disappeared and was declared dead, he married Morghese and fathered Elaine and Gawain. He vanished under mysterious circumstances and has been presumed dead for many years. His sign was a golden, double bitted battle axe. Dark One, most common name used in every land for Shaitan the source of evil, antithesis of the Creator. Imprisoned by the Creator at the moment of creation, in a prison at Sheol Ghul. An attempt to free him from that prison brought about the War of the Shadow, the tainting of Sayedin, the breaking of the world, and the end of the Age of Legends. Dark One, naming the... Saying the true name of the Dark One, Shaitan, draws his attention inevitably bringing ill fortune at best, disaster at worst. For that reason many euphemisms are used, among them the Dark One, Father of Lies, Sight Blinder, Lord of the Grave, Shepherd of the Night, Heart's Bane, Heart Fang, Grass Burner and Leaf Blighter. 
Someone who seems to be inviting ill fortune is often said to be naming the Dark One. Dark Friends Those who follow the Dark One and believe they will gain great power and rewards when he is freed from his prison. Daughter Heir Title of the Heir to the Throne of Andor The eldest daughter of the Queen succeeds her mother on the throne. Without a surviving daughter, the throne goes to the nearest female blood relation of the Queen. Davol Daimon See Trollocs. Jevik Keshar, in the Trolloc tongue, the Dying Ground, the Trolloc name for the Aeel Waste. Doman, Vale, the Captain of the Spray. Dragon, The, the name by which Luz Theron Telamon was known during the War of the Shadow. In the madness which overtook all male Aes Sedai, Luz Theron killed every living person who carried any of his blood as well as everyone he loved, thus earning the name Kinslayer. A saying is now used, taken by the dragon or possessed of the dragon, to indicate that someone is endangering those around him or threatening them, especially if without cause. See also Dragon Reborn. Dragon False Occasionally men claim to be the Dragon Reborn, and sometimes one of them gains following enough to require an army to put it down. Some have begun wars that involved many nations. Over the centuries, most have been men unable to channel the one power, but a few could. All, however, either disappeared or were captured or killed without fulfilling any of the prophecies concerning the rebirth of the dragon. These men are called false dragons. See also Dragon Reborn. Dragon Reborn According to prophecy and legend, the dragon will be born again at mankind's greatest hour of need to save the world. This is not something people look forward to, both because the prophecies say the dragon reborn will bring a new breaking to the world, and because Luz Theron Kinslayer, the dragon, is a name to make men shudder, even more than three thousand years after his death. See also Dragon the Dragon False. Dragon's Fang the a stylized mark, usually black, in the shape of a teardrop balanced on its point. Scrawled on a door or a house, it is an accusation of evil against the people inside. Dreadlords Those men and women who, able to channel the One Power, went over to the Shadow during the Trolloc Wars, acting as commanders of the Trolloc forces. Izar, King Izar of House Togita King of Shinar his sign is a white heart, which, according to Shinaran custom, is held also to be a sign of Shinar along with the Black Hawk. Elida, an Aes Sedai who advises Queen Morgaze of Andor. Elaine, Queen Morgaze's daughter, the daughter heir to the throne of Andor. Her sign is a golden lily. Els, Els Grinwell, a farmer's daughter met on the Camelin Road. Eilis, the, see Murdra'al. Fade, see Murdra'al. Fain, Padan. A peddler who arrives in Eamon's field just before winter night. Fardarai's Mai, literally maidens of the spear. One of a number of warrior societies of the Aeel. Unlike any of the others, it admits women and only women. A maiden may not marry and remain in the society, nor may she fight while carrying a child. Any child born to a maiden is given to another woman to raise, in such a way that no one knows who the child's mother was. You may belong to no man, nor may any man belong to you, nor any child. The spear is your lover, your child, and your life. These children are treasured, for it is prophesied that a child born of a maiden will unite the clans and return the Aeel to the greatness they knew during the Age of Legends. Farstrider, Jayan, a hero of the northern lands who journeyed to many lands and had many adventures, the author of several books as well as being the subject of books and stories. He vanished in 994 N.E. after returning from a trip into the Great Blight which some said had taken him all the way to Sheol Ghul. Father of Lies, see Dark One. First Prince of the Sword, title normally held by the eldest brother of the Queen of Andor, who has been trained since childhood to command the Queen's armies in time of war, 
and to be her adviser in time of peace. If the queen has no surviving brother, she will appoint someone to the title. Fist. The basic military unit of the Trollocs, varying in number, always more than one hundred, but never more than two hundred. A fist is usually, but not always, commanded by a murdra'al. Five powers, the. There are threads to the one power, and each person who can channel the one power can usually grasp some threads better than others. These threads are named according to the sorts of things that can be done using them, earth, air, fire, water, and spirit, and are called the five powers. Any wielder of the one power will have a greater degree of strength with one or possibly two of these, and lesser strength in the others. Some few may have great strength with three, but since the age of legends, no one has had great strength with all five. Even then this was extremely rare. The degree of strength can vary greatly between individuals, so that some who can channel are much stronger than others. Performing certain acts with the one power requires ability in one or more of the five powers. For example, starting or controlling a fire requires fire, and affecting the weather requires air and water, while healing requires water and spirit. While spirit was found equally in men and in women, great ability with earth and or fire was found much more often among men, with water and or air among women. There were exceptions, but it was so often so that earth and fire came to be regarded as male powers, air and water as female. Generally, no ability is considered stronger than any other, though there is a saying among Aes Sedai, There is no rock so strong that water and wind cannot wear it away, no fire so fierce that water cannot quench it, or wind snuff it out. It should be noted this saying came into use long after the last male Aes Sedai was dead. Any equivalent saying among male Aes Sedai is long lost. Flame of Tarvalon The symbol of Tarvalon and the Aes Sedai a stylized representation of a flame, a white teardrop with the point upward. Forsaken, the. Name given to thirteen of the most powerful Aes Sedai ever known, who went over to the Dark One during the War of the Shadow in return for the promise of immortality. According to both legend and fragmentary records, they were imprisoned along with the Dark One when his prison was resealed. Their names are still used to frighten children. Galad. See Domadred, Lord Galadadrid. Gawain, Queen Morgesa's son, Elaine's brother, who will be first prince of the sword when Elaine ascends the throne. His sign is a white boar. Gentling, the act performed by Aes Sedai of shutting off a male who can channel from the one power. This is necessary because any man who learns to channel will go insane from the taint upon Sayedin, and will almost certainly do horrible things with the power in his madness. A man who has been gentled can still sense the true source, but he cannot touch it. Whatever madness has come before gentling is arrested by the act of gentling, but not cured by it, and if it is done soon enough, death can be averted. Gleeman, a traveling storyteller, musician, juggler, tumbler, and all-around entertainer. Known by their trademark cloaks of many-colored patches, they perform mainly in the villages and smaller towns, since larger towns and cities have other entertainments available. Great Blight, the. A region in the far north entirely corrupted by the Dark One. A haunt of Trollocs, murder all, and other creatures of the Dark One. Great Hunt of the Horn, the. A cycle of stories concerning the legendary search for the Horn of Valir, in the years between the end of the Trolloc Wars and the beginning of the War of the Hundred Years. If told in their entirety, the cycle would take many days. Great Lord of the Dark The name by which dark friends refer to the Dark One, claiming that to use his true name would be blasphemous. Great Pattern The Wheel of Time weaves the patterns of the ages into the Great Pattern, which is the whole of existence and reality, past, present, and future, also known as the Lace of Ages. See also Pattern of an Age, Wheel of Time. Great Serpent, a symbol for time and eternity, ancient before the age of legends began, consisting of a serpent eating its own tail. Halfman, see Murdra'al. Hawkwing, Arter, a legendary king who united all the lands west of the spine of the world as well as some lands beyond the Aeel Waste. 
He even sent armies across the Arath Ocean, but all contact with these was lost at his death, which set off the War of the Hundred Years. His sign was a golden hawk in flight. See also War of the Hundred Years. Hartfang, Hartsbane. See Dark One. Heartstone. An indestructible substance created during the Age of Legends. Any known force used in an attempt to break it is absorbed, making Heartstone stronger. Horn of Valir. The legendary object of the Great Hunt of the Horn. The Horn supposedly can call back dead heroes from the grave to fight against the Shadow. Hundred Companions, the One hundred male eyes Sedai, among the most powerful of the Age of Legends, who, led by Luz Theron Telamon, launched the final stroke that ended the War of the Shadow by sealing the Dark One back into his prison. The Dark One's counterstroke tainted Sayedin. The Hundred Companions went mad and began the breaking of the world. Ilion A great port on the Sea of Storms, capital city of the nation of the same name. The sign of Ilion is nine golden bees on a field of dark green. Ingtar, Lord Ingtar of House Shinoa, a Shinaran warrior met at Faldara. Kandor, one of the borderlands. The sign of Kandor is a rearing red horse on a field of pale green. Kinch, Hyam, a farmer met on the Camelin Road. Kobol, see Trollocs. Lace of Ages, see Great Pattern, the. Lan, a Lan Mandragoran, a warrior from the north, Moiraine's companion. Leaf Blighter, see Dark One. League, a measure of distance equal to four miles. See also Mile. Luke, Lord Luke, of House Mantiar. Tigraine's brother, who would have been her first Prince of the Sword when she ascended the throne. His disappearance in the Great Blight is believed to be in some way connected to Tigraine's later disappearance. His sign was an acorn. Lurk, see Murdraal. Machira, Elias. A man encountered by Perrin and Egwene in the forest. Mahdi, in the old tongue Seeker, title of the leader of a Tuatha An caravan. Malkir, a nation once one of the borderlands, now consumed by the blight. The sign of Malkir was a golden crane in flight. Mandarb, in the old tongue, Blade. Manetheran, one of the ten nations that made the Second Covenant, and also the capital city of that nation. Both city and nation were utterly destroyed in the Trolloc Wars. Maradon, the capital city of Saldeia. Merilyn, Tom, a gleeman who comes to Eamon's field to perform at Beltine. Mile, a measure of distance equal to one thousand spans. Four miles make one league. See also span. Min, a young woman encountered at the Stag and Lion in Berlin. Moiraine, a visitor to Eamon's field who arrives just before winter night. Morgaze, by the grace of the light queen of Andor, high seat of House Trakund, her sign is three golden keys. The sign of House Trakund is a silver keystone. Murdraal, creatures of the Dark One, commanders of the Trollocs, twisted offspring of Trollocs in which the human stock used to create the Trollocs has resurfaced, but tainted by the evil that made the Trollocs. Physically they are like men except that they have no eyes but can see like eagles in light or dark. They have certain powers stemming from the Dark One, including the ability to cause paralyzing fear with a look, and the ability to vanish wherever there are shadows. One of their few known weaknesses is that they are reluctant to cross running water. In different lands they are known by many names, among them Halfman, the Eyeless, Shadowman, Lurk, and Fade. One Power, The the power drawn from the true source. The vast majority of people are completely unable to learn to channel the one power. A very small number can be taught to channel, and an even tinier number have the ability inborn. For these few there is no need to be taught. 
They will touch the true source and channel the power whether they want to or not, perhaps without even realizing what they are doing. This inborn ability usually manifests itself in late adolescence or early adulthood. If control is not taught or self-learned, extremely difficult with a success rate of only one in four, death is certain. Since the time of madness, no man has been able to channel the power without eventually going completely horribly mad. And then, even if he has learned some control, dying from a wasting sickness which causes the sufferer to rot alive, a sickness caused, as is the madness, by the Dark One's taint on Sayedin. For a woman the death that comes without control of the power is less horrible, but it is death just the same. I Sedai search for girls with the inborn ability as much to save their lives as to increase I Sedai numbers, and for men with it, in order to stop the terrible things they inevitably do with the power in their madness. See also Channel, Time of Madness, True Source. Pattern of an Age the wheel of time weaves the threads of human lives into the pattern of an age, which forms the substance of reality for that age, also known as age lace. See also Taviran. Questioners, the. An order within the children of the light. Their avowed purposes are discovering the truth in disputations and uncovering dark friends. In the search for truth and the light as they see it, they are even more zealous than the children of the light as a whole. Their normal method of inquiry is by torture, their normal attitude that they know the truth already and must only make their victim confess to it. The questioners refer to themselves as the hand of the light, and at times act as if they were entirely separate from the children and the council of the anointed, which commands the children. The head of the questioners is the high inquisitor, who sits on the council of the anointed. Red Aja, see Aja. Sa'angrial, an extremely rare object which allows an individual to channel much more of the one power than would otherwise be possible or safe. A Sa'angrial is like unto, but much, much more powerful than, an Angrial. Remnants of the Age of Legends, the means of their making is no longer known. Sayadar, Sayadin, see True Source. Saldeya, one of the borderlands. The sign of Saldeia is three silver fish on a field of dark blue. Sea folk, inhabitants of islands in the Arath Ocean and the Sea of Storms, they spend little time on those islands, living most of their lives on their ships. Most seaborne trade is carried by the sea folk's ships. Second Covenant. See Covenant of the Ten Nations. Shadar Logoth. In the old tongue, the place where the shadow waits. A city abandoned and shunned since the Trolloc Wars, also called Shadows Waiting. Shadowman, see Murdra'al. Shayatan, see Dark One. Sheol Ghul, a mountain in the blasted lands, the site of the Dark One's prison. Shepherd of the Night, see Dark One. Shiriam, an Aes Sedai of the Blue Aja. Shinar, one of the borderlands. The sign of Shinar is a stooping black hawk. Shufa, a garment of the Ail, a cloth, usually the color of sand or rock, that wraps around the head and neck, leaving only the face bare. Sightburner, see Dark One. Span, a measure of distance equal to two paces. A thousand spans make a mile. Spine of the World, the A towering mountain range with only a few passes, which separates the Ail Waste from the lands to the west. Steading, an Ogre homeland. Many Steading have been abandoned since the breaking of the world. They are portrayed in story and legend as havens, and with reason. They are shielded in some way, no longer understood, so that within them no eyes Sedai can channel the One Power, nor even sense that the true source exists. Attempts to wield the one power from outside a steading have no effect inside a steading boundary. No Trolloc will enter a steading unless driven, and even a Murdra'al will do so only at the greatest need, and then with the greatest reluctance and distaste. Even dark friends, if truly dedicated, feel uncomfortable within a steading. Stone of Tear 
the fortress guarding the city of Tyr, said to be the earliest fortress built after the time of madness, and said by some to have been built during the time of madness. See also Tyr. Sunday, a feast day and festival in midsummer, widely celebrated. Tabak, a weed widely cultivated. The leaves of it, when dried and cured, are burned in wooden holders called pipes, the fumes being inhaled. Talonvor, Martin, guardsman lieutenant of the Queen's Guard, met in Camelon. Tamara Lylan, in the old tongue, Web of Destiny. Tanrial, Arter Payendrag, see Hawkwing, Arter. Tarvalan, a city on an island in the river Erinine, the center of Aes Sedai power and location of the Amarlan seat. Taviran, a person around whom the wheel of time weaves all surrounding life threads, perhaps all life threads, to form a web of destiny. See also Pattern of an Age. Tyr, a great seaport on the Sea of Storms. The sign of Tyr is three white crescents on a field of red and gold. Telamon, Luz Theron. See also Dragon, the. Thakandar, an eternally fog-shrouded valley below the slopes of Sheol Ghul. Tigrain, as daughter heir of Andor, she married Tarangale Damadred and bore his son Galadadrid. Her disappearance in 972 N.E., shortly after her brother Luke vanished in the Blight, led to the struggle in Andor called the Succession, and caused the events in Kyrian which eventually brought on the Aiel War. Her sign was a woman's hand gripping a thorny rose stem with a white blossom. Time of Madness. See Breaking of the World. The. Tinkers. See Tuatha'an. Traveling People. See Tuatha'an. Trolloc Wars, a series of wars beginning about 1000 A.B. and lasting more than 300 years, during which Trolloc armies ravaged the world. Eventually the Trollocs were slain or driven back into the Great Blight, but some nations ceased to exist while others were almost depopulated. All records of the time are fragmentary. See also Covenant of the Ten Nations. Trollocs, Creatures of the Dark One, created during the War of the Shadow. Huge in stature, vicious in the extreme, they are a twisted blend of animal and human stock, and kill for the pure pleasure of killing. Sly, deceitful, and treacherous, they can be trusted only by those they fear. They are omnivorous and will eat any kind of meat, including human flesh and the flesh of other Trollocs. Largely of human origin, they are able to interbreed with humankind, but the offspring are usually stillborn and those which are not often fail to survive. They are divided into tribe-like bands, chief among them being the Afreyat, Algol, Banshian, Davol, Daimon, Dijinan, Gargael, Gobelin, Goalum, Graemlan, Kobal, and the Nomon. True Source The driving force of the universe, which turns the wheel of time, it is divided into a male half, Sayedin, and a female half, Sayedar, which work at the same time with and against each other. Only a man can draw on Sayedin, only a woman on Sayedar. Since the beginning of the time of madness, Sayedin has been tainted by the Dark One's touch. See also One Power. Tuatha'an, a wandering folk also known as the Tinkers and as the Traveling People, who live in brightly painted wagons and follow a totally pacifist philosophy called the Way of the Leaf. Things mended by tinkers are often better than new, but the Tuatha'an are shunned by many villages because of stories that they steal children and try to convert young people to their beliefs. Village Council In most villages, a group of men elected by the townsmen and headed by a mayor who are responsible for making decisions which affect the village as a whole, and for negotiating with the councils of other villages over matters which affect the villages jointly. They are at odds with the women's circle in so many villages that this conflict is seen as almost traditional. See also Women's Circle. War of the Hundred Years A series of overlapping wars among constantly shifting alliances, 
precipitated by the death of Arthur Hawkwing and the resulting struggle for his empire. It lasted from FY 994 to FY 1117. The war depopulated large parts of the lands between the Arath Ocean and the Aeel Waste, from the Sea of Storms to the Great Blight. So great was the destruction that only fragmentary records of the time remain. The empire of Arthur Hawkwing was pulled apart, and the nations of the present day were formed. War of the Shadow Also known as the War of Power, it ended the Age of Legends. It began shortly after the attempt to free the Dark One, and soon involved the whole world. In a world where even the memory of war had been forgotten, every facet of war was rediscovered, often twisted by the Dark One's touch on the world, and the One Power was used as a weapon. The war was ended by the resealing of the Dark One into his prison. Warder A warrior bonded to an Aes Sedai. The bonding is a thing of the One Power, and by it he gains such gifts as quick healing, the ability to go long periods without food, water, or rest, and the ability to sense the taint of the Dark One at a distance. So long as a warder lives, the Aes Sedai to whom he is bonded knows he is alive however far away he is, and when he dies she will know the moment and manner of his death. The bonding does not tell her how far he is, though, nor in what direction. While most Ajas believe an Aes Sedai may have one warder bonded to her at a time, the Red Aja refuses to bond any warders at all, while the Green Aja believes an Aes Sedai may bond as many warders as she wishes. Ethically, the warder must accede to the bonding, but it has been known to be done involuntarily. What the Aes Sedai gain from the bonding is a closely held secret. See also Aes Sedai. Web of Destiny a great change in the pattern of an age, centered around one or more people who are Taviran. Wheel of Time, the. Time is a wheel with seven spokes, each spoke an age. As the wheel turns, the ages come and go, each leaving memories that fade to legend, then to myth, and are forgotten by the time that age comes again. The pattern of an age is slightly different each time an age comes, and each time it is subject to greater change, but each time it is the same age. White Aja, see Aja. White Tower, the palace of the Amarlan seat in Tarvalan. White Cloaks, see Children of the Light. Wisdom. In villages, a woman chosen by the women's circle to sit in the circle for her knowledge of such things as healing and foretelling the weather, as well as for common good sense, a position of great responsibility and authority, both actual and implied. She is generally considered the equal of the mayor, and in some villages his superior. Unlike the mayor, she is chosen for life, and it is very rare for a wisdom to be removed from office before her death, almost traditionally in conflict with the mayor. See also Women's Circle. Women's Circle a group of women elected by the women of a village responsible for deciding such matters as are considered solely women's responsibility, for example, when to plant the crops and when to harvest. Equal in authority to the village council, with clearly delineated lines and areas of responsibility, often at odds with the village council. See also Village Council.